This is Vincent Price. Have you ever had one of those days where nothing goes right from the moment you first wake up? Len Doyle is having just such a day. First he overslept, then there was no hot water for his shower. He nicked himself shaving, popped a button on his shirt, lost a cufflink, and broke a shoelace. Len would like nothing more than to crawl right back into bed. And he would, if only... Len! Len, hurry up! You're going to miss your plane! I know, Helen, I know. I'm hurrying as fast as I can. Where, where's my breakfast? Don't, don't I get any breakfast? Here, orange juice and a piece of toast. Oh, but You'll please. have to eat it on the way. You haven't got time, Lynn. Oh, all right. Have you got my plane ticket? Yes, and your bag's in the car. Now, let's get going. Wait. I, I think I hear the telephone. Let it ring. Oh, I better answer it. It might be the office. You get the car. Hello? And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Long Distance by Steve Sharon. Our stars, Janet Waldo and Lou Horn. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. Motorcraft battery, it's all right. You saved my life one dreadful night. When I told Big Dutch I want to fight, he said, how about now? He broke a table over a chair. I went from a coop to go anywhere. My lights had been on while I was there. Motorcraft, don't fail me now. I turned the key as it came to the door. My motorcraft made the engine roar. Then I heard Big Dutch as he stamped and swore. Going to get me a motorcraft battery for sure. Quality parts for all makes of cars. Motorcraft for sure. I like pepperoni, but it doesn't like me. Feel better fast with Digel. With the ingredients in Digel, relief from acid indigestion and gas starts in less than a minute. I like corned beef. I like cabbage. I like franks. I like beans. I like spaghetti. And meatballs. But they don't like me. If you like something that doesn't like you. Feel better fast with Digel. Digel relief starts in less than a minute. For occasional use only as directed. Len Doyle, a young Denver real estate appraiser, is just leaving for the airport when the phone rings. Len is already in danger of missing his flight, but he goes back to answer the phone on the chance that the call may be important. Hello? Hello. Hello, Leonard. Aunt Gertrude? Is that you? Yes, dear. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. But I'm afraid I can't talk to you right now. I'm on my way to St. Louis. On business, actually. But, <laughs> well, you've spoiled the surprise. You see, I was going to stop by to visit you while I'm in town. Oh, I've got to go now, Aunt Gertrude. Helen's waiting for me in the car. I'll call you as soon as I arrive in St. Louis. And don't worry about picking me up at the airport. I'll get a cab. Leonard, wait. You mustn't fly. It isn't safe. Do you hear me? You mustn't fly to St. Louis. Yes, dear. Now, now, don't worry. I'm sure I'll be fine. Oh, I've got to go. I'll see you this afternoon. Leonard, wait! Bye! I'm coming, I'm coming! You didn't say who called. Oh, eh. It was Aunt Gertrude. Aunt Gertrude? Yeah, can you beat that? Here I am on my way to St. Louis thinking what a surprise it'll be when I show up at her door. And she calls me right before I leave. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I told her I was coming. Oh, why? You still could have surprised her. Mm, yeah, but it wouldn't have been the same. 
<sighs> it was good to hear the old girl's voice again, but her timing sure could have been better. <laughs> Now I am really late. Oh, the traffic's not that bad. We'll make it. Did she say why she called? Well, there really wasn't time to chat. <gasps> oh, but when I told her I was coming, she said not to fly. You're kidding. <laughs> I didn't I ever tell you? It, it all started when Amelia Earhart disappeared. Oh. Yeah, ever since then, Gertie has been afraid to fly. <laughs> That's why she took the bus to Denver for our wedding. Oh, I love your aunt. She's such a character. Yeah. I've been thinking about her a lot lately. You know, she's the only family I've got left. I worry about her being all alone. If we both didn't have jobs here, I'd move back to St. Louis. Lan, why don't you ask Aunt Gertrude to move to Denver? She can live with us. We got plenty of room. Do you mean that? Why not? I'm home most of the day working on my illustrations. I could use a company. Besides, it'd be a real hoot having someone like Aunt Gertrude around. You know, if you weren't driving this car, I would give you the biggest kiss. <laughs> Shall I pull over? Oh, don't tempt me. <laughs> We're late enough as it is. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago, now boarding at gate 24. Here's your ticket. Oh, yeah. I can't go anywhere without that. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll see you in two days. Oh. Mm -hmm. You better hurry. Bye. Call me when you get to St. Louis. Yeah, I will. <sighs> Dr. Williams. Please report to the Union Airline desk. Oh, hey, excuse me. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, a flight 405 to St. Louis. Has it left yet? 405. Yes. Well, uh, no, that leaves in three minutes. Oh, but it can't. I I'm supposed to be on it. Look, here's my ticket. Well, we ask our passengers to check in at least a half hour before departure, Mr. Uh, Doyle. Yes, I know that, but, but I overslept. Look, I've got to get to St. Louis. Well, we do have a later flight. Oh. I see. Yes, yes, leaves at 11.42. Oh. Shall I reserve a seat for no, you? No, no, I have a business appointment this morning. Look, can't you call and make them hold the plane? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but that's against company policy. Oh. Isn't there any way I can get on that flight? Well, there's always a chance of a delay while the passengers are boarding, but you'll have to run for it if you're going to make it. Oh, thanks. Uh, Mr. Doyle, what, your ticket! Uh, do you have any baggage? No. Oh, uh, yes, this overnight bag. Well, you can carry that on board. Oh, please hurry. There you are. Thanks. Have a nice flight. Global Flight 201, now arriving from Mexico City at Gate 12. Uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me, please. Hey, why don't you look where you're going, fella? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me. Can I get by? I'm, I'm, I'm late. Ex excuse me. Hold it. Huh? Just where do you think you're going? Uh, 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 gate 37. Uh, I'm on the flight for St. Louis. Uh-uh, not till you go through the metal detector. Oh, yes, of course, but 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 I'm already late. Mister, everybody goes through the metal detector, no exception. Yes, I understand that, and I'm perfectly willing to go through it if you'll just hurry up. You see all these people here? They're all waiting to go through just like you, only they were here first. So, if you just step to the end of the line... Oh, but I'm late. That's not my fault. Just step to the end of the line. But I have to... To the end of the line. Oh, great. Just great. Gertie, I love you dearly, but why? Why did you have to call this morning? I beg your pardon. <laughs> What a morning. My poor man. We interrupt to bring you the special news bulletin. Union Airlines Flight 405 bound for St. Louis has crashed on takeoff from Denver's Stapleton <gasps> International Airport oh, only minutes ago. Len! Len! No! <laughs> Reach out! 
Reach out and touch someone. This is Sarah Vaughn for the Bell System. I've been reaching out for years because it seems like I'm always away from someone I love. You treat your folks tenderly? Give them a call. It's important. Reach out, call up, and just say. Who care so much, keeping in touch? Oh, reach out, reach out and touch someone. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Reach out and touch. Reach out. A frantic rush to the airport. A quick farewell. And now Helen Doyle hears on her car radio the painful news that she may have said goodbye to her husband for the last time. And police and fire officials have closed off the area. The number of passengers aboard the flight is not known at this time, but Union Airline officials are expected to release the information shortly. This latest tragedy brings the number of airline crashes this year to a total of. Uh, I've, I've got to. To get back to the airport, find out. They don't give you any information said, around here. Please, I, can't you tell me anything about my I need husband? Some information. His name is Doyle. Leonard Doyle. I, I'm sorry, madam, but what, what about I, my partner, George Baker? Is, is there any news about him? Is my yes. daughter Julia Warren on your passenger well, list? Now, let me... She was supposed to leave for school today. I'll see if I can. I, I can't remember what uh, flight she was on. But please, madam, the oh. airline's doing the best it can. Oh, if you please, were doing your I've best, no, this wouldn't have happened. Well, I'm sorry, no, I didn't no. mean. Well, I know, I know how hard this must be on all of you. But we are trying to find out as much as we can about the accident and who was involved. So please, folks, will you please will be you patient? Please check this as quickly as possible. Well, now. Oh, when do you suppose they're going to tell us? I. I, I don't know. Computers. That's the trouble. Getting computers to talk. Yes, I, I suppose so. It's, uh, it's your partner you're waiting to hear about, is it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's not quite the same as you waiting to hear about your husband, but... My husband! That's what I mean. It's not the same, of course. Is it? That man in the phone booth over there. Huh? Yes, it is. Excuse me. Oh. Oh. Oh, it is. Oh, it sure is. Oh, yes, that house to be jacked. It'd be land, all right. Land. Land. Helen. Oh. Oh, thank God. Oh. Oh, oh. oh it's... It's, it's all right. I'm alive. I'm, it's all right now. Oh, I, I, I thought you were dead. I know, I know. I, I was praying you hadn't heard. Oh, I've been calling the house again and again. There's, there was no answer. They would, they would tell me if you were on board. I, I was too late for the flight. I ran as fast as I could, but I was too late. <laughs> no, it's all right now. It's all right. Oh, I'm so glad I was too late. Please don't go to St. Louis. No, no, of course I won't go. I'll stay. I'll stay. I won't leave now. I don't ever want you to leave me. No, no. I'm feeling much better, Mr. Adams, really. Well, it's just that under the circumstances, I think it's better if I didn't go to St. Louis right now. That's quite all right, Len. I understand. Uh, You see, I I promised Helen I'd stay with her. and, And to tell you the truth, I'm... I'm not too crazy about flying anywhere right now. I don't blame you. All of us here at the office are just relieved that you weren't aboard that flight. Yeah. 
you know, it hasn't quite hit me yet, just, just how close I came to... Well, anyway, if it's all right with you, I, I'd like to take the rest of the week off. You take all the time you need, Len, and don't worry about St. Louis. The appraisal can be postponed. Now, I'll call and let them know the situation. Oh, thanks, Mr. Adams. You just take care of yourself and, and, and give my best to Helen. I will. Thank you. Uh, I'll see you Monday. Bye-bye. Oh, I guess it gave Mr. Adams quite a shock when he heard about the crash. But he's glad I'm safe. Oh, and uh, I have the rest of the week off. Oh, good. I think you can use it. Oh, we can both use it. Oh, Helen, turn up the volume on the TV. I want to see if they've got anything more on the crash. Oh, okay. The cause of which is still under investigation by Federal Aviation Authorities. Meanwhile, Union Airlines has released a list of the passengers on board Flight 405. There were no survivors in the crash. Those poor people. Of those names now appearing on your screen, all but six were residents of the Denver, Colorado Springs area. Helen, look. What? My name. It's on that list. Oh, no. Oh, where's the number of that airline? But how, how, how could they make such a mistake? Well, you gave them your name at the airline, didn't you? Well, of course I wanted to find out if you were... Well, a... with all the confusion, they probably think you're still there with the other relatives. That you've already been notified. And we forgot to tell them you were too late to board the plane. Ah, uh, here it is. <laughs> Helen, see if there's any more news about the passengers. Oh, hello? Union Airlines. Yes. Uh, I'd like to speak to and someone in charge of releasing information are being allowed about to continue crash. as scheduled. Yes, sir. In other uh, news, the Middle Leonard East Doyle, situation took a positive a step forward today. Both Israeli and Egyptian sources confirm that negotiations are continuing oh, and an agreement is that. pending. Yes. I, yeah, I understand. And, and I'm sorry for the mix-up, too. Yeah, it, it was my fault. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, the airline is going to notify the wire services and the local news media to have my name taken off the list. Oh, good. I just hope they can correct it before our friends see it. Otherwise, you'll be deluged with sympathy calls. Len? Hmm? What about Aunt Gertrude? Holy smoke, I forgot. Oh, she'll have a heart attack if she hears about the crash. Oh. I'd better call. Oh, yes. There's no answer. Uh, I'll try again later. In the meantime, why don't we go out to dinner? It'll take our minds off what's happened. Oh, oh, I'd love to, but what if Aunt Gertrude phones while we're gone? Mm, we really ought to stay home just in case. Yeah, you're right. But I don't think you should have to cook dinner. No problem. I can reheat the spaghetti sauce that's in the refrigerator. Oh, but you'll have to go to the store and get some more spaghetti. <laughs> I will if you'll promise to lie down and take a nap before dinner. Oh. After what you've been through, I think you could use it. Mm. It's a deal. I'm so glad you called. We've been trying to telephone you. Um, th there, there's been a, a, a change of plans. Len won't be there until some other time. He, um, he, he missed the plane. I told Leonard not to fly. Oh, yes. Yes, you did, didn't you? Oh, it's a good thing he wasn't on that plane, because... I'd better let Len tell you about it when he gets back. I sent him to the store to get some spaghetti for dinner. Are you still cooking on that old stove I gave you? Oh, well, yes. As a matter of fact, we are. You shouldn't cook on that stove. It isn't safe. It's too old. Oh, nonsense. It has character. Besides, it uses gas. And nowadays, that's so much more economical. You take my advice, Helen. Don't use that old stove. <laughs> it isn't safe anymore. Oh, and Gertrude, I have to run. I smell something burning in the kitchen. 
Um, look, I'll have Len call you when he gets back, and we can have a nice long talk then, okay? Helen, don't <laughs> use that. Bye now. <sighs> What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. Our anniversary, Charlie, and you're not eating. You're not talking. My mouth hurts. I got canker sores. On our anniversary? Oh, honey, stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique. Just a touch of medically effective Camphophonique stops pain of canker sores instantly. Helps speed healing by killing infectious germs and forming a protective Amalgam shield. You're still not talking. No, but I'm eating. Stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique. The little green bottle full of first aid. Use only as directed. Because Len Doyle ignored his aunt's warning not to fly to St. Louis as he had planned, he just missed becoming a fatality in the crash of a jet airliner. And now his wife, Helen, has also received a warning. Honey, I'm back. You didn't say what size package I should get, so... So... What the... Guess! Oh. Helen! Helen, where are you? Oh. <laughs> Helen! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, for God's sake, where are you? <laughs> Helen! Helen! Wake up! Can you hear me? Wake up! Oh, oh I've got to get her out, outside. <coughs> Take another deep breath. That's it. That's it. Force all the gas out of your lungs. Oh, you feel any better? Uh, a little. Maybe I, I'd better call a doctor. Uh, no. No, no, no. I'll, I'll be all right. Are you sure? Yes, yes. <sighs> what happened? Oh, mm. flame on the stove burner must have blown out. Oh. I came back and the house was filled with gas. Oh. When you mm. didn't answer, I thought it was too late. Oh, I was, I was taking a nap. <laughs> it's my fault. I, I shouldn't have left the kitchen, but I, I didn't think it would hurt to let the sauce simmer a while. Oh, it's that old stove. Oh. It just isn't safe anymore. Len, that that's just what Aunt Gertrude said. Aunt Gertrude? Yes, she called just after you left. I I told her you weren't coming to St. Louis. Did, did and... you tell her why? No. Why, well, I thought you'd better explain that. <sighs> anyway, she, she started telling me the stove isn't safe and that I, I should be cooking on it. Well, she was certainly right about that. <sighs> Well, now that Gertie knows I won't be coming, we don't have to stick around here and wait for her to call. We'll go to dinner and give the house a chance to air out. Yeah. Well, it's not as good as your cooking, but I'm too hungry to be picky. Oh, thank you, darling. You know, it's funny how your Aunt Gertrude knew about the stove. Well, it's an old stove. She was probably just surprised to find out we're still using it. Yeah, but don't you think it's strange that something should go wrong with it right after she called? Oh, it's just a coincidence. Maybe. And maybe not. I I might believe it if if it only happened once, but she also warned you not to fly in that plane, you know? Helen, Gertie was hardly specific. I told you about that plane phobia of hers. I certainly don't think she's psychic, if that's what you're hinting at. Well... I'm just trying to make some sense out of all this, that's all. Has, um, uh, has your aunt ever shown any signs of being precognizant? Pre- 
Oh, sure. Oh? Yeah. When I was a kid, Aunt Gertrude used to read tea leaves. Oh. Oh, now let me see. Um, can I remember any of her predictions? Oh, tea leaves. That's hardly... She said I was going to be tall. Oh. Well, I'm 6'3". She was right about that. Oh. And she said I was going to be handsome. Oh. <laughs> and I refuse to admit she was wrong there. Lan, I am trying to be serious. Oh, and once when I was in high school, after I broke up with my girlfriend, she told me I would meet someone else. Her exact words were, Don't fret if you get stranded on the highway of love now and then, because there'll be another bus along in five minutes. <laughs> Very funny. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Aunt Gertrude is drinking a better brand of tea nowadays. Oh, yeah. <laughs> After all, most of her predictions did come true, especially the one about my being handsome. How would you like this salad in your lap? <laughs> Sorry, the number you have reached is not in service at this time. Please check your directory carefully and dial again. This is a recording. Oh, damn. What's the matter? That is the second time I've dialed Aunt Gertrude's number, and I keep getting a recording saying her phone is out of order. Well, maybe you better go through the operator. Mm. Operator, may I help you? Yes, I'm having trouble getting through to a number. Could you please dial it for me? What's the number, please? It's long distance to St. Louis. Area code 314-555-2522. One moment, please. Thank you. I hope she has better luck. I'm sorry. The number you have reached is not in service at this time. Please check your directory carefully and dial again. Operator. Yes, sir. Now, I know that number is in service because I've received two calls from there today. Is there any way I can get through? I'm sorry, sir. The problem is at the St. Louis end of the line. It may be only temporary. I'll report it, and I suggest you try again in the morning. Uh, well, I guess I don't have much choice, do I? All right. Uh, thank you for your help. You're welcome. Oh, no luck, huh? Ah, the line's all screwed up. I'll have to try again tomorrow. Well, I wouldn't worry. At least we tried. Someone's at the front door. It's kind of late for visitors. Yeah. Leonard Doyle? That's right. Good evening. I'm Marion Haynes from the Denver Express. I'd like to ask you a few questions about the airline crash this morning. Oh, well, it's, it's pretty late. Uh, can it wait until tomorrow? I'm sorry about that, but I've got a deadline to meet for the morning edition. I tried to call, but... Yeah, uh, all right. Um, well, come on in. Thanks. It won't take long. Uh, this is my wife, Helen. How do you do, Mrs. Doyle? Uh, hello, Miss Haynes. Uh, please sit down. Thanks. I suppose you know that the airline released a fatality list with your name on it this morning, Mr. Doyle. Uh, since you are obviously alive and well, can you explain how your name got on the list? You did check in at the Union Airlines desk this morning, didn't you? Yes, but I never actually got on the plane. You see, I was going to St. Louis on business. And we were just so happy to see each other that we forgot to tell the airline that I wasn't on the plane. I see. Well, that certainly clears up the discrepancy. Oh, uh, honey, hmm? you didn't tell her about the call. Oh, you Helen. stopped to answer a phone call from your aunt. That's why you were late. Yes, you mentioned that. Oh, but uh, he didn't tell you that she warned him not to fly. Oh? And then this afternoon, she called no, uh, and... It, it was really nothing. Uh, uh, Helen seems to think my aunt's fear of flying is proof that she's psychic. Oh, well, thanks anyway, but I think I've got the angle I need. Now, I'd better be going if I want to meet my deadline. Thanks again for talking to me at such a late hour. Oh, that's okay. It was no problem. You will. Good night. Good night. Good night. Helen, I thought we had all that psychic business settled. Why'd you have to bring it up again in front of that reporter? She probably thinks we're a couple of kooks. Well, I'm sorry, Len, but it bothers me. Aunt Gertrude warned us twice, and both times she was right. I just think there may be more to it than coincidence. All right. If you really feel that way, why don't we drive to see Aunt Gertrude? Oh, do, do you mean it? Why not? 
I still have to go to St. Louis to make that land appraisal. Yeah? I can take care of business, and you can have your curiosity satisfied. <laughs> Besides, the drive will do us both good. People work and study and train Because AFCO is me Money is key to people's lives And when you deal with them on that basis You have to assume a lot of personal responsibility 9,000 people rack 9,000 brains Because AFCO is me We're not just lenders, we're often counselors And at AFCO Financial Services We feel that we are more professional 9,000 people are all working for we feel we have a better quality person in our particular field than any competitor because we train harder. Our people put you in the best company because AFCO is me. I do my homework, I guarantee you. Because AFCO. Ron Wozelcheck, Somerset, Pennsylvania. Is me. The AFCO people in your town put you in the best company. Look in the phone book for the office nearest you. Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of Long Distance. Please check your directory carefully and dial again. This is... Damn. What's the matter? Oh, it's that stupid recording again. Oh. You'd think the phone company would have Gertie's telephone fixed by now. How am I supposed to let her know we're coming? Well, you wanted to surprise her. Anyway, we can always stop on the way and call her... Hey, did you put the bags in the car? Yeah. We can go as soon as you're ready. What's the matter? You look like you don't want to go. No. No, it, it's not that. I I, I, I want to go. Well, what then? Oh, don't tell me you're having second thoughts about this. You're the one that wanted to have your curiosity satisfied, remember? I know. It's just that I have those book illustrations to finish. So you'll bring your work with you. Uh, now, come on. Now, let's get out of here. Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Helen, is Leonard there? Oh, Aunt Gertrude. Oh, yes, he's here. Oh, Aunt Gertrude, we were just trying to get you. We've been... Uh, just a minute. Hey, Len, it's Aunt Gertrude. Oh, good. L let, let me talk to her. Hello, Aunt Gertrude? Yes, dear. It's me. Oh, I have had a heck of a time trying to reach you. Did you know your phone's been out of order? I've been very worried about both of you. Yes, and we've been worried about you. As a matter of fact, that's why Helen and I have decided to drive over to St. Louis for a visit. No, you mustn't drive. What? Why not? What's she saying? She doesn't want us to drive. It what? isn't safe to drive your car. Leonard, do you hear me? Don't drive your car. Uh, yes, dear, I, I hear you, but I don't understand. What makes you think something's wrong with the car? You must not drive your car, Leonard. And Gertrude, how did you know about the plane and, and about the stove? How, how did you... Don't drive your car, Leonard. It isn't safe. Oh, but that's ridiculous. You, you can't just... Hello? Hello? Oh, for crying out loud. What happened? She hung up. But what did she say? I don't know. Something about not driving the car. Oh. She said it isn't safe. Oh, Len. Oh, no. come on, Helen. You're not going to tell me we should take her advice seriously. Yes. Yes, I am. She, she warned you not to get on that plane and about the stove. And what if she's right about the car, too? Oh. How could she be, honey? How could she know anything was wrong with the car when she's hundreds of miles away? But, but maybe... I, I know. I know she's psychic. Len, what are we going to do? Hey, uh, Mr. Doyle, she's ready to roll. Have you checked everything thoroughly? Yes, sir. I went over this car of yours. From headlights to taillights, there ain't a thing wrong with her. Just needed a few bolts tightened here and there. Mm hmm You hear that, Helen? There is nothing wrong with the car. And Gertrude didn't know what she was talking about. 
Well, maybe you're right. This, uh, Aunt Gertrude, she a mechanic? Oh, no, no. She's just an eccentric relative, I'm afraid. Uh, well, how much do I owe you? Oh, 30 bucks ought to cover it, plus an extra 10 for making me come out to your place to pick up the car. Hmm. All right. I just put it on this credit card. I'll get your receipt. 40 bucks just to prove to you that Gertie isn't psychic. And to prove it to yourself. Yeah, well, I'll have to admit, I was beginning to wonder. But that is all over with, right? Well, I, I, I don't know. Oh, Helen, believe me. The car has been checked out and everything is all right. But we can't let a few coincidences start to run our lives. If we do that, we might as well lock ourselves up in the house and never go out. Now, will you drive with me to St. Louis? <sighs> You're right, Lynn. Let's go to Aunt Gertrude's. Mm, that's my girl. Lan, do you mind if I turn the radio off? Lan? Hmm? The radio. Can I turn it off? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, you look sleepy. Do you want me to drive for a while? No, 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 I can make it. We'll, uh, uh, we'll stop at the next town and, uh, spend the night. Oh, good idea. I'll get the map out and see how far it is. Now, if I can, if I can get this, this flashlight to work. Just a minute. There. There we go. Let's see now. Uh, where are we? Um, Interstate 70. Hmm. We should be in Selena in about... Oh, look out! Hey, hey. Oh, whoosh. Oh, I must have dozed off at the wheel. Oh, honey, if you hadn't seen that truck... Len, it's happening. It's happening just like your aunt said it would. Well, I don't understand how, how she could know. Then, do something. I don't want to drive any further. Please, do something. I'd like two train tickets to St. Louis, please. Thank you. Well, any luck? No. All I get is that stupid recording. Mm. Her phone is still out of order. Well, we'll just have to go on then. But we've got to get hold of her, Lynn. Why? What if it isn't safe to go on the train? <sighs> what if something is supposed to happen to us while we're on the train? Oh, honey. Well, we can't stay here. Don't. Don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. And stop fidgeting. You're making me nervous. I can't help it. I keep thinking about... Well, don't. Think of something else. I don't know how you can be so calm. Because I am trying not to think about what might happen. Then you do believe that Aunt Gertrude is... is... Clairvoyant? Yes. I don't know. Maybe it's like those astrology columns in the newspapers. Practically anything that happens to a person can be made to fit those astrology forecasts because they're so general. Aunt Gertrude was very specific, Lynn. Don't fly, don't cook, don't drive. Look, honey, maybe we're trying too hard to attach some personal meaning to what's really just a series of bizarre coincidences. Only we could have asked Aunt Gertrude about taking the train. Well, it's too late now. We made our decision, logically and intelligently, on our own. And if we're wrong... And we can kiss logic and intelligence goodbye. The conclusion of our story after these words. If you consider paint as more than just a covering for your walls, consider quality True Test paints from True Value hardware stores. 
Hi, Pat Summerall to tell you that True Test Easy Care Flat Latex Wall and Trim Finish actually helps protect your walls from stains and finger marks with its durable, scrubbable finish. Or choose True Test Satin Hue Flat Latex for a velvety finish that will soften your rooms and enhance the furnishings. Get True Test Easy Care or Satin Hue only at participating True Value Hardware stores. According to this magazine, Stanley, we don't kiss enough. Look, I get these cold sores. It hurts to kiss. Stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique. Just a touch of medically effective Camphophonique instantly stops pain of cold sores, helps speed healing by killing infectious germs and forming a protective amalgam shield. Bet our scores improved since a week ago. Mm, way above average. Stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique, the little green bottle full of first aid. Use only as directed. Keep the change, driver. Lynn, she's painted the front door again. Well, we made it. Safe and sound. Thank God. <laughs> Thank Aunt Gertrude. Maybe she isn't home. No, well, she should be. I know she doesn't go out much these days. Aunt Gertrude? Excuse me. Who's that? I don't know. Excuse me. You folks looking for Gertrude Cullen? Uh, yes, we are. Uh, I'm her nephew, Leonard Doyle, and this is my wife, Helen. Oh. I didn't know she had any relatives. Well, we're a little worried about her. You see, we've been trying to get hold of her. Her telephone seems to be out of order. Oh, it's not out of order. Line's been disconnected for the last two days. What do you mean? I, I, I talked to Aunt Gertrude just yesterday. I don't think so. We both talked to her. You don't know, do you? Know what? What, what, what is going on here? Where is my aunt? Uh, I hate to be the one to tell you this. Your, uh, your Aunt Gertrude. She died a week ago today. A performance story from Phillips Petroleum. Prospecting for oil used to be a whole lot tougher. You had to lug miles of heavy seismic cables everywhere. Some places, you flat didn't go. Then Phillips came up with a way to search for oil without all that heavy cable. So here I am, Clyde Barroso, packing 38 pounds of RTU, a remote transmission unit, up a mountain. Our new equipment lets us look places where it was too hard to search before. And I'm glad we're doing that looking here at home in the States. Because any oil we find could be that much less we have to buy from some foreign country. Phillips Petroleum. Good things for cars and the people who drive them. Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Long Distance, was written by Steve Sharon and produced and directed by Fletcher Martin. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Janet Waldo and Lou Horn. Featured in the cast were Louise Fitch, Sidney Swire, Jerry Hausner, William Zucker, Stanley Director, Robin Braxton, and June Whitley-Taylor. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us again tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces.
This is Leonard Nimoy. You're on the largest oil tanker ever built. Right now, it's fully loaded and traveling the waters of the Southern Ocean through the night on its way to the United States. In the dark night, the captain hears and then sees a helicopter with its landing lights on, flying over the ship, hovering over the landing pad. This is an alert. Helicopter landing. Form an armed party and find out who they are. A small crew of seven men scramble for their rifles and run across the immense deck, running to where the helicopter hovers. Unseen by the captain or any of the crew, a second helicopter hovers, lights off, directly above the bridge, and five armed men are lowered to the roof of the bridge. Distracted by the first helicopter, no one has seen the landing of the second one. Captain, please raise your hands very slowly. On a dark night in the Southern Ocean, the world's largest oil tanker has just been hijacked. And that's only in the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Ship, by Andre Stoika. Our stars, Brock Peters and John Daner. An encouraging report on the computer industry. The discouraging word about Gasahaw. A major new trend in corporate restructuring. The downturn in home prices. Articles like these on every phase of business are found every business day in the Wall Street Journal. If you need vital business information, have a pencil ready for an important offer from the Wall Street Journal. The Journal recently reported on the long-term impact of the Soviet grain embargo. You would have read about metal mania, its sweeping America, and why the expectations aren't so great for steel stocks. The Wall Street Journal. It's all the business news you need when you need it. Right now, you can get 20 weeks of the journal, that's 100 copies, for just $26, a real money-saving offer. So in the continental U.S., call this toll-free number now, 800-331-1000. That's 800-331-1000, except in Oklahoma. You'll be billed later. That's 800-331-1000. The hijack crew takes over the oil tanker. The regular crew is locked in the ship's brig, and the new captain takes charge and adjusts his course. Several hundred miles away, there's a small, sparsely populated island, and on the island is a lonely man who knows nothing of what has happened. Yet his life is about to be changed by these events. Here's his story. Twenty years is a long time to be in a place, but I've been here that long. When I came to this island, it was with other men from my home. We had heard that the fish ran strong in these waters, and the women believed anything you told them. It was true. But twenty years is twenty years, and now the fish have run out, and the women are wiser. And how do I account for my time? It is true that I have grown. I started as a fisherman, and now I own a store, a provisional. Well, that's not too bad. In fact, that is how I met Conklin. Maybe a year ago. Hey, Sanduro. (laughs) How many poles have you got stuck in the sand there? I have ten. Ten poles? What do you do with all those fish? With my luck, I'll only catch one. The rest of the poles keep the odds in my favor. Ah, (laughs) ha, ha, ha. I did that once. I put out 50 poles and lines, all baited, and can you guess? They all caught something, fed a whole village, and I, I, I was just looking for supper. Lucky man. I am a lucky man, and you are lucky too. Why am I lucky? 
I have brought you my business. In such a way, I met Conklin, an expansive man. He bought much fishing gear from me, but somehow I don't believe he fished, for I never saw his catch. Some men expand on the truth in their stories, but we don't call them liars. It's just their nature. On the other hand, we don't believe them a lot either. Would you like some coffee? Of course. Did I tell you I was in Sydney? That's a long sail. By myself. You handled the boat alone? By myself, through a thousand miles of sea. Once the waves rose over a hundred feet and I played them like a game. Dangerous. A game. I played and won. I got there and I got back. What is Sydney like? You never been there? No. Yeah. It's marvelous. The, the women are very nice. Proper, but I know my way around them. One has to be... <laughs> one has to be skillful. You are skillful? Very skillful. Uh, tell me, Provisioner, could you outfit a fishing fleet? Of course. I've done it many times. How big a fleet? Maybe six boats. Full crew. Where'd you get your provisions? From a boat. It comes every three weeks. Hmm. That's too bad there's no airfield. Who wants to fly here? Ah, who indeed? <laughs> That's a good question. I am staring at you. And I am seeing a very rich man. I should be so lucky. I'm not talking about luck. I'm talking about fate. We're fated to be together, Sanduro, and this will bring us both a great deal of wealth. I believe in fate. I've often wondered why I was fated to live on this island. With no wife. There are plenty of women. Ah, but they're smarter now. <laughs> For their own protection. But the, the women in Sydney, oh, they're more beautiful. You've just been to Sydney? And brought back fate. For you, my friend, and for me. Let's hope fate brings us supper. I had a strike just then and pulled her in. No fight to speak of, but enough size for dinner for two. I invited Conklin to join me, and he agreed. After dinner, we sat on the porch and watched the lights of a small boat at anchor. What is the largest ship you've ever seen? The largest? Not many around here. A big freighter lost her course once. What is the largest ship you have seen? You wouldn't believe me. I might. Well, I'll test you. The largest ship I ever saw was nearly 1,400 feet long. Where did you see it? Two years ago in Japan. They were just building her. For what? Oil. An oil tanker, a huge one. It's the largest ship in the whole world. And you swear this is true? It is true. You will see her. Me see her? What would she do here? She's coming here at this very moment, my friend. She will be here in two days, and then you will see her. But she cannot stop here. There is no depth to the bay. Oh, not in the bay. Out at sea. Two miles out, it is deep. But why? Because, my friend, I have already hijacked her. Hijacked? You? Yes. And now you will join with me. Well, what do you need from me? You're a provisioner. We need provisions. You will provide. My friend... What you are doing is against the law. What law are you referring to? Have I stolen in anything from anyone on this island? Have I an enemy on this island? Do I harm this island? International laws? Probably, say. probably. But what is more important, law or oil? I think we'll find out, and you will be with us. I have never violated a law in my life. For me to do this would make me a criminal. My dear friend, you have been here on this island for 20 years, and what have you got? Small life, a very small life. What I'm offering you is a chance for change, a change to a very big life, 
The owners of that ship want it back. I want to give it back. They will make a nice exchange, and we will all be rich. How rich would that be? Ha <laughs> The businessman in you shows. Your share will not be less than 50,000 Swiss francs. That much money would surely make a change for me. Well, what must I do for it? You will supply food, clothing, water to the crew of the ship. You will get it through your normal supplier, and you will secretly bring it to the ship when she arrives here. That is all. You are paying a high price for food. I am paying a high price for your trust, your loyalty, your discretion. These things are more priceless than food. And if I refuse? You will not refuse. But if I do? I must kill you. But I swear that I do not wish to do that. I would rather make you a rich man. It would make me very rich. You might wish to leave this island, return home, or perhaps Sydney. I could introduce you to uh, women there. <laughs> oh, oh, what women. They are much smarter than the women here. Oh, yes, yes, they are. But by then, you would be... Uh, uh, <laughs> A very rich man. <laughs> if you consider paint as more than just a covering for your walls, consider quality True Test paints from True Value hardware stores. Hi, Pat Summerall to tell you that True Test Easy Care Flat Latex Wall and Trim Finish actually helps protect your walls from stains and finger marks with its durable, scrubbable finish. Or choose True Test Satin Hue Flat Latex for a velvety finish that will soften your rooms and enhance the furnishings. Get True Test Easy Care or Satin Hue only at participating True Value Hardware stores. Our anniversary, Charlie, and you're not eating. You're not talking. My mouth hurts. I got canker sores. On our anniversary? Oh, honey, stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique. Just a touch of medically effective Camphophonique stops pain of canker sores instantly. Helps speed healing by killing infectious germs and forming a protective Amadian shield. You're still not talking. No, but I'm eating. Stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique. The little green bottle full of first aid. Use only as directed. Life is full of choices, and Sanduro, a lonely man on a lonely island, has made his choice. He has chosen to side with Conklin and assist in hijacking the world's largest oil tanker. And Conklin has given him money, cash to be used in increasing his inventory of supplies. His timing was perfect, for the next day the supply boat to all these islands came into the bay, and I purchased extra provisions. Mr. Chow, the owner, seemed a little surprised at my order, but he filled it. Very large order, Sandoro. Very large. Like the old days. Perhaps the old days have returned. The fish are running well again? They are running better. I will spread the word. No. What? They are running better than before, and already there are more fishermen. Don't spread the word. Let these men make a living. It has been some time since fishermen could make a living around here. Let them make it. Don't bring more boats here. What do you care? You sell to whoever buys. New fisherman, old fisherman, what do you care? I care. Please. I see. Your order is very expensive. Of course, you have my credit, but... Do you have some money for me in advance, a little down, just in case your judgment has failed you? My judgment has not failed. But yes, I, I have money for you. You do? Oh, very well. I shall not spread the word. Chow was a very suspicious man. He suspected everything. And he was a talkative man. News around the islands travels by radio and by boat, and so when Chow delivers supplies, he delivers news. I tried to keep his suspicions away. After all, 
What could he suspect? That a great ship full of oil was approaching? So I made my excuses and he seemed to believe me. He seemed to believe me more when I gave him the money. Sandoro, here is my bill for your supply. You are charging me double the price. It would seem so. Double the price. You do not wish to pay it? You wish to argue? It is not fair. What is fair? Fair is what I can get. You will pay, won't you? Or do you wish to argue? I'll pay. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You? You say there are fish. Others say there are none. You say you wish to have fishermen. There are no fishermen. Look at this bay. Where are the boats? They are They are out at sea. And I didn't see them? No. You have something else in mind. What is it? Why do you need these supplies? Tell me. I will keep your secret. I have no secret. You have no secret. But you will pay double price, won't you? I will pay. Give me the money. Good. You will not talk. I will not talk. Money in hand, he ordered his men to untie his boat... I stood on the dock watching him back up and swing the nose of his boat out toward the ocean. My eyes and mind played tricks on me, for I thought I saw a shadow of something at the mouth of the bay. But it was an illusion. I worried. He knew I was up to something, but could he know about the ship? Would he be truthful to his word, or might a word slip out to someone on one of the other islands? Would others be curious? My mind worried as his boat slipped away. Perhaps I should have told him the truth. Perhaps I should have made him a partner with me and demanded his silence. Perhaps I am too slow sometimes. And this time I was angry at myself for not having thought of something smarter. His boat reached the edge of land and moved out of the bay to the sea. It picked up speed. And I imagined that he was hurrying. Hurrying to tell someone that I had a secret. I wanted to wave him back, but he could not see me, for his boat now was very small. The speck of the boat turned bright orange and disappeared in an instant. A few puffs of smoke rose from the water where the boat had been. It happened so fast that I wondered whether it happened at all. But I knew it had. The boat had blown up, and Mr. Chow and his crew were all dead. The money I had paid him was at the bottom of the sea, and it had happened in an instant. I knew Chow, and I knew the explosion couldn't be an accident. And if the explosion wasn't an accident, it must have been on purpose. I was very much afraid. The next day, Conklin arrived, and I told him of the explosion and my fear. He expressed great sympathy for the crew, but he knew nothing else about it. Together, we loaded the supplies onto my boat, and midday, we set out to sea to meet the great ship. Keep a steady course, my friend. The hole at 240 degrees. We'll lower in the water from the cargo. Well, we'll lighten her soon. Fog ahead. Don't worry, I've got a true bearing, and of course, I've got this... What is it? Kind of radar. I can sight that ship in the fog even if my bearing is wrong. In the fog? You must show me. I will. Straighten her up, my friend. It is lucky that this is a calm sea. I told you, you're a lucky man. The fog surrounded us close and thick. At times I could not even see Conklin, who stood with his radar only seven feet away. I grew tired. It is not difficult to run my boat under most conditions, but fully loaded it lay close to the water, and each change in course I made with difficulty. I could not see where we were heading, but Conklin didn't mind. He worked with his box, and after a few minutes, a sound came from it. What is it, Conklin? The radar is working. It's working perfectly. 
Change course to 242 degrees. My boat would not fail me. We had been through a great deal, and I have shown her respect. And now she showed me respect. She worked harder than she was used to, but she did it. We moved through the fog, and my eyes watched the compass constantly, for there was not more to be seen. And then Conklin shouted to me, Stop! Here! We have reached the ship. I can't see it. We have not reached the ship. We've reached a point on the chart. A very small point, but an important one. You see, my friend, the ship will reach us. Seeking you will find is what the pundits say. So we, my friend, are seeking to make this your day. The trumpet's call. They tell it all. It's gonna be a great day. Hey, with all that lies in store, what are you waiting for? It's gonna be a great day, a great day. Let the careless war watch the old spirit soar. Calling you for a great day. Calling you, K little E double L and O is double good. Start in careless way. Good days start with breakfast, and great days can start with Kellogg's. Corn flakes to crackling bran, Rice Krispies to most. Kellogg's has the cereal to start your day off right. Trust your morning to Kellogg's. It's not far away. Kellogg's will help you say, there's going to be a great day. We're going to say a great day. Hey, 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 hey. There's going to be a great day. Fogs at sea can lie thick and dense, swirling walls of white, blinding the traveler. In such a fog, two men wait for a monster ship. Conklin hunched over his radar box, and his face froze in concentration. Several times I wanted to talk with him, but his concentration was so deep that I was afraid to disturb him. The fog was so thick I could not watch the waves, and it seemed wrong to want to fish, so I sat with my thoughts and waited silently. I thought of Sydney and how I would be there soon, rich and respected. I thought of the beautiful women of Sydney and how they would swoon over me. And I thought, I will be nice to them, not like some rich men I have heard of. I will be very nice, and they will be very nice, and then Conklin spoke for the first time in two hours. It is here. What? The ship is here. I don't see anything. Look on the screen. Yes. See how this sweeps? I see it. Now, watch. Now, over here. See the blip of green? That is the ship? That's it. About five miles from us. It'll be here in less than an hour. We sat waiting. Conklin looking at his radar and me looking at the fog. I could see nothing, and the silence of the fog began to wear on me. You hear? Yes, Conklin. It's coming. Conklin, are we safe? Safe? Of course. But a ship as big as you say, if it were to hit us, it would break our boat apart and suck us beneath the bow. It could, but it won't. We're very safe here, because while I'm watching them on this radar, they're watching us on their radar. We're very safe. That is, we're safe if they're hungry for this food. My eyes searched the fog for a sign. In my mind, I thought the ship would run over us, but Conklin seemed so certain that it wouldn't. I was not sure. One moment, I was certain it would run over us, and I began to tremble. And then the fog began to thin, and the thinning slowly became a lifting. And with the lifting, I could see the ship. In my wildest imagination, I could not have imagined a thing like that ship. I could see the bow, but the stern was so far away. Conklin was right. It towered above us so that unless I looked straight up, my vision was all black with the hull. And 
Conklin was also right in that we were in no danger, for it was not angled toward us. It had come to a complete stop in the water. It was a monster. I raised the sea anchors and started the engine and headed for the monster ship. Its shadow fell nearly a quarter of a mile port side, and we moved into it so that while it was still day, we were moving into darkness. Conklin directed me, and he motioned upward to the deck. They gave him a signal, and he told me to stop the engines. From above on the deck, a crane swung out over us, carrying a large wooden platform. When we could reach it, Conklin and I guided it to our deck, and the two of us loaded it with the supplies. Three times we loaded the platform, and three times it was carried up to the deck, unloaded and lowered again to us. The fourth time completed the delivery of the supplies. Conklin packed his radar box and put his things on top of the boxes of supplies. Full and complete delivery, my friend. You've done a fine job of it. If I start back to the shore now, I'll have light most of the way. Start back? Aren't you curious to see the ship? I'm curious, but I think it is safer for me to leave now. Remember, I must find another source of supply. My friend, you have delivered as promised. Now please step onto the platform. We'll both take a ride up to the deck. Then I must fix the anchor or she will float away. Oh, don't concern yourself with that. You'll have no more need for your boat. No more need. On to the platform. From somewhere he had pulled out a gun and he pointed it at me. I had no time to think and so I did as he told me and stepped onto the platform. He stepped on the other side and still holding his gun at me, made a signal. The crane pulled us up and I looked down at my boat as it got smaller and smaller, as we rose higher and higher until finally the crane swung us away from the water and lowered us onto the deck of the ship. As I stepped off the platform onto the deck, Conklin motioned to another man, and he also had a gun in his hand. Here's our provisioner. Take him below with the crew. Right. You will walk ahead of me. Conklin... What is happening? My friend Sanduro, your life on the island has kept you far from, uh, what, the greed of man? <laughs> you are an innocent. I admire that quality. You have served your purpose, and I'm afraid we're finished with you. Finished with me? Mm. You, you promised me 50,000 Swiss francs. I lied. You lied to me? Ah, what can I say? You know I'm a born liar, and <laughs> lying, lying to you wasn't difficult. Now, I'm afraid there are no 50,000 Swiss francs for you, and I'm sorry to say your life itself is in some question, but you may be certain I'll do what I can for you. My boat? Your boat will be destroyed. It is the final link between the food supply and the ship, and when your boat is destroyed, there will be no way of finding us out here at sea. Conklin, you are a very bad man. Me? Bad? Ah, oh, I suppose you're right. I was led from the deck of the ship to the control building, and the man behind me pushed on an elevator button, and we waited. We stood on a deck just below the bridge of the ship, and I could see out, down to the water, and my boat which had floated away from the great tanker. Then, just as the elevator door opened, my boat turned bright orange, just as Mr. Chow's boat had done. My boat was gone without a trace. My boat which had served me so well. I wanted to cry with anger, but the armed man pushed me into the elevator and the door closed, shutting me off from the world. I could not guess what was ahead of me, but in my mind I kept thinking, my life is over, my life is over, and I truly thought it was. Every
every time I shop, it seems prices have gone up. Well, I found a way to save money without sacrificing my family's nutrition. A few times a week, I serve an egg dish for dinner. Scrambled eggs, omelets, the cookbooks are full of recipes. And egg dishes are high in protein. Eggs are one of today's best food buys. For instance, when eggs cost 75 cents a dozen, they're only 50 cents a pound. The incredible edible egg. The American Egg Board. Runway clear. Flight 49, you're cleared for landing. Some people can't afford a sore throat. Doctors recommend chloroseptic lozenges with anesthetic action to deaden pain fast. In a medical study, adults preferring chose chloroseptic three to one over the other leading lozenge for quick, temporary relief of minor sore throat pain. Flight 63, do you read me? Loud and clear. If you can't afford a sore throat, get chloroseptic lozenges or fast acting chloroseptic liquid. Use only as directed. <laughs> Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of The Ship. Tricked you. Serves you right. How does it feel to be behind these bars? I was too greedy, Captain. I think I should have suspected something. Well, greed gets to all of us at one time or another. Think of the greed of those guys on the bridge who took over my ship. I wonder what they're planning to do with us. I think... I think they will kill us. I think so, too. This, uh... This island you come from, how far would you make it? Two miles. Maybe a little bit more. You hear that? Two miles on a calm sea? It's a possible swim. But we would have to... to be out of here to be able to swim. Oh, we can get out all right. We just didn't know there was an island out there to get to. And now you know. And now I think it's time for us to leave this ship. Yeah. Me too? Why? After all, you were on their side. I paid for it. My boat is lost. It, it was a big loss for me. <laughs> I'm sure it was. I have a home on the island. There is food, water, and a radio. Uh, Captain, <clears throat> we could radio our position. We could... Or he could be setting us up for something. Tell me, Sandero, are you setting a trap for us? Still working for them? Well, if he is, he'll be with us. It's the same trap. The captain took some tools from somewhere. And with the help of the crew, broke the lock on the prison door. Beyond this was a large metal door, and the captain broke through this its lock, too. It was so easy, I could see that they could have escaped at any time they wanted to. They simply had no place to escape to. We slipped through the empty corridors of the great ship unnoticed until we found a stairway. We moved up the stair past landings and doors. The captain knew his ship, and finally on one landing at one door, he stopped us. Okay, we're on the starboard side. Fifty feet from this door is a ladder to water level. That's a long climb down. Take it slow, you'll be okay. Now remember, the real workout is the swim after we get down. You got it? It's going to be dark out there. So we'll hold on to one another until we get there. What if they uh, spot us? If they spot us, just hurry. I figure they're mostly on the bridge. It'll take them ten minutes at least to get to the side. By that time, we'll be part way down. Once we're in the water, we'll be hard to find. Yeah. While we're on that ladder, we'll be like sitting ducks. The captain opened the door, and we stepped onto the deck. It was good to be in the fresh air of the sea, and I breathed deeply as we crept along the side of the ship. Then a strange thing happened. The black sky was suddenly bright with flares. Are they crazy? Using flares near an oil tanker? The flares lit up the sky and the ship, and I thought for sure we would be seen. Prepare to be boarded. We have you covered. Come within 50 yards of us. We'll blow you out of the water. 
What's happening, Captain? Sounds like someone's trying to hijack the hijackers. What do we do? Keep moving. If they start shooting, this whole ship could blow up. I don't want to think about that. We got to the ladder. One by one, we slipped over the side of the great tank. The attention of the bridge was on the other ship to port, and they never saw us. It was such a long way down, rung by rung. We climbed down very slowly and more and more painfully. And the farther down we were, the less and less we could hear of what was going on between the ships. We climbed down, and as I moved, I thought of the oil that was just beyond the metal plating of the ship, inches from my face, and that it was getting ready to explode. Okay, men. Now you've got your direction. The only thing I can tell you is to swim. And let's hope we get out of here before they find us. The worst that the whole thing goes. Two miles. Only two miles. Let's put on some distance. We all swam, each at his own pace. I am not a fast swimmer, and in the darkness, I felt that everyone had swum ahead of me. But even though I am not fast, I am constant. And in a while, I turned back to see how far I had swum. The dark shape of the ship could be seen under the light of the flares. I had swum a good distance. I looked for the captain, and I looked for the crew, but could not see them, and I thought it would not be smart to call out to them. So I turned back toward the island and began swimming again. My arms were heavy, but I thought, it is my wind. I will be better. And I swam on until something made me stop again, and I turned back to see the ship. What the captain had said might happen had really happened. What I saw was a great ball of fire rise from the middle of the ship into the air. And then a second ball of fire rose from the bow of the ship. And then another and another explosion until instead of a ship, I was looking only at fire. And within the fire I thought I could see the ship rise into the air. the heat and I knew I must continue to swim, for such explosion would cause a wave of water and if I'm caught I will drown. I swam as hard as I could and my mind was a blank with only one thought in it, to reach my island before the wave. But I was not strong enough and in the darkness I could hear the wave coming for me, rushing for me. And then I felt caught up in it, twisted by it, enveloped in it. I was spinning in the dark water, and after I gasped for air, the black night and the black water closed onto me. I gasped for my life. My lungs filled, and I tried to cry out, but my mind went blank, and I slipped into another world. Of what happened after my body reached the shore of my island... I know only from stories of the villagers. I heard that there was a wall of fire around the island from the oil, and it was a mile high and lasted a week. But I do not believe it. I heard that the men of the island pulled their boats ashore to keep them from burning because the whole ocean was on fire. But my boat was already destroyed, and so I can only tell what has been told to me. I heard that the tides and wind shifted so that the ocean of oil floated away from our island. But I saw none of these things, for I lay unconscious for nearly two weeks, tended by the islanders. And there was talk among them that I was failing, and that soon I would die. The conclusion of our story... After these words, an encouraging report on the computer industry, the discouraging word about Gasahaw, a major new trend in corporate restructuring, the downturn in home prices. Articles like these on every phase of business are found every business day in the Wall Street Journal. If you need vital business information, have a pencil ready for an important offer from the Wall Street Journal. The journal recently reported on the long-term impact of the Soviet grain embargo. You would have read about metal mania, its sweeping America, and why the expectations aren't so great for steel stocks. 
The Wall Street Journal. It's all the business news you need when you need it. Right now, you can get 20 weeks of the journal. That's 100 copies for just $26, a real money-saving offer. So in the continental U.S., call this toll-free number now, 800-331-1000. That's 800-331-1000, except in Oklahoma. You'll be billed later. That's 800-331-1000. <laughs> One morning, after two weeks of unconsciousness, my eyes opened and I slowly began to see my home on the island. Casey, one of the fishermen, came in to look after me, and he told me of what happened. You should have seen it. He tried to tell me of everything that had happened, but my mind was on the captain, and I stopped his talk to learn about the crew. They are gone. Dead? No, a helicopter came for them. I've never seen such a huge helicopter. And they were all alive. Well, almost one died in the wave. Let me tell you about the wave. Only one dead. A miracle. It's all a miracle. Will you let me tell you about it? And he told me about it. But I was too weak to listen. And when I was well, he told me again. By the time I was out of bed, the island was normal again. A month later, some money came for me from the company that owned the tanker. It was a reward for saving the captain and most of his crew. It wasn't a large sum, but it was enough to buy another boat. Since Mr. Chow died, I took over his route. Now I am supplier to all the islands here. It is not a big life for me, but it is better than before. I have stopped dreaming of Sydney and the beautiful women. They were only dreams. I have my own life, and it is here. Sometimes, I think back to Conklin. Poor Conklin. And what he told me. Perhaps I am a lucky man. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck & Company. There's no other deodorant soap more effective than Dial. You get that clean, fresh, confident feeling all day long with Dial. You'll be glad Dial's active deodorant ingredient keeps working all day long. That clean, fresh, confident feeling all day long with Dial. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Ship, was written by Andre Stoika and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Deboy. Our stars were Brock Peters and John Daner. Featured in the cast were Tyler McVeigh, Marvin Miller, and Andre Stoika. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears. A name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lauren Green. 
Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Vincent Price. We're in a packed courtroom awaiting the verdict. To my left is Arno Lucas, the defendant, nervously drumming his fingers on the arm of his chair. Seems impossible that this slight, almost unobtrusive old man, virtually lost behind stacks of legal documents and reams of depositions, is a powerful underworld figure. Yet the government's case was strong because of the testimony of the man to my right, protected by two U.S. Marshals, the star witness for the prosecution. He is Frank Egan, Lucas's former associate. It was Egan's knowledge of illegal gambling, fraudulent transactions, and bribery that provided the federal attorney with solid evidence. <clears throat> Will the defendant please rise? The frame up, it's a fix. Mr. Lucas, I understand the concern for your father. However, your lawyers have had ample opportunity to present a defense. Ah, uh, this is a kangaroo court. Mr. Lucas, any further outburst and you will be removed from this court. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. Arno Henry Lucas... You have been tried by a jury of your peers and found guilty of extortion, racketeering, and mail fraud. You stand convicted of using your influence to the detriment of others. The time has come to serve notice on you and other men who show disrespect for the law. Therefore, it is the decision of this court that you be fined $100,000 and remanded to the custody of the federal authorities at the United States Penitentiary at Leavenworth for a period of no less than 15 years. What? It's a fix! You hear me? It's a fix! Bailiff! Clear the court! A frame up by a rotten stoolie! You're going to pay for this, Egan! You hear me, Egan? You're not going to get away with this! I'll get you! I swear I'll get you, Egan! Order! Order! The courtroom is a sea of confusion as the reporters dash to the telephones and spectators mill about. Frank Egan and Carl Lucas face each other across the room. Lucas's eyes bore into Egan's with an unspeakable hatred. Suddenly Egan bolts from the chamber, terrified. He knows his life will always be in jeopardy. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Double Exposure, by Ken Gerard. Our stars, Vic Perrin and Mary Jane Croft. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. Save now on tools that have earned the right to wear the name Craftsman. Save $20 on a Craftsman 3 8 inch variable speed reversible drill. Or on a Craftsman variable speed saber saw with manual scrolling action. Or on a Craftsman dual action pad sander with built-in dust pickup. Now only $29.99 each during Sears National Hardware Week sale, where America shops for value. Sale ends March 15th. These are the minimum savings nationally. Regular prices vary in some markets. 
I found an answer to high food prices right in my refrigerator. Eggs and leftovers. Eggs are economical. And when I use leftover chicken, ham, or vegetables in a quiche or as a filling for an omelet, I get a nutritious meal for little more than pennies a serving. Eggs are one of today's best food buys. For instance, when eggs cost 75 cents a dozen, they're only 50 cents a pound. The Incredible Edible Egg. The American Egg Board. Minutes after Arno Lucas was sentenced to prison, Frank Egan was en route to a safe house run by, shall we say, quasi-governmental agencies. Although shaken by Carl Lucas's threat, he felt safe. But now we find Egan in different circumstances, disheveled and frightened, hiding in a seedy hotel. Where are you, Kern? You got me into this mess, now get me out. Where are you? Some special agent... You were going to protect me, huh? <laughs> they left you alone, Frank. Stuck you out there like a clay pigeon. Left you for Carl Lucas and... I don't know. Think, 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 think. Okay? Okay, I'll show them. I'll write to the newspapers, to that reporter that covered the trial. What was his name? Ah, Coster. Yeah, yeah, he'll know what to do with this story. He'll know that... Where's my pad? Dear Mr. Coster, I'm writing to you because I've got nobody else to turn to. Maybe by the time you get it, I'll be dead. I guess all the strange stuff started right after Arnold Lucas was sentenced. I was leaving the courtroom with Agent Stuart Kern. Come on, Mr. Kern. I want to get out of here. Lucas isn't going to hurt you. Are you crazy? I just put his old man in the slammer. Frank, will you play it our way, huh? He's coming. You better hold on to him, Frank. Real tight. What do you want, Lucas? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Your father had a fair trial. Shut up, Kern. You, Egan. Stooley. I won't forget. Are you threatening a government witness? Oh, no way. I'm offering advice. I want your boy to remember me. And what he did to an old man. He treated you like a son, huh, Frank? You were part of our family, huh? I want to get out of here. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead, you're free. Walk the streets, sit in the park, enjoy yourself. You got Kern and his people to protect you, huh? Carl, please. They made me testify. I didn't want to. I didn't believe me. Liar. I didn't have a choice. Oh, I feel sorry for you. You're going to be living like a king on the outside while my father rots in a snake in prison. But, Frank, you're the one who's in prison, not him. Oh, no, not him. I was scared. I knew Carl Lucas had hunt me down. I wondered, why did Kern let him have a crack at me? I ran out of the courtroom, but Kern and the U.S. Marshals caught me in the hall... All I remember was struggling and then a pinprick on my neck and the whole building started to swim. The next thing I know, I'm in a hospital and this beautiful woman is sitting beside my bed. Oh, oh, my head. Lie back, Mr. Egan. Oh, I feel like I've been asleep for days. Would you like some water? Yeah, yeah. My face. I've got bandages all over my head. What happened? Take it easy. Why are all these tubes in me? I, I'm covered with bandages. That, was there an accident? You're all right now. Come on, please, lie back. <laughs> That's better. <coughs> You're fine, just fine. What is this place? Where's Kern? I want to see Kern. He'll be in shortly. I don't like this. You're safe. We've moved you to one of our clinics. We've uh, performed some cosmetic surgery. You did what? We altered your appearance what? for security reasons. It's standard procedure for special witnesses. You people are crazy. The surgery is part of your cover. We're giving you a whole new identity, new face, new job skills, a new life. Why, you'll be able to walk in front of Carl Lucas. He'd never recognize you. Who, who do I look like? Nobody. Anybody. Does it matter? I guess not. Ah, 
Don't take it so badly. It's like being reborn. Tell me, how do you figure in this? I'm going to be traveling with you for a while, for security, and liaison with our office. When do I get out of here? Oh, not for some time. The surgery is only part of your cover. We'll provide you with an entire new identity. Your new face has to be matched with a new personality. And when you're ready, we'll begin psychological retraining. In a few months, we'll have removed all traces of Frank Egan. It's a successful program. Trust me, Frank. Trust me. I sank into the bed, confused and apprehensive. Everything she'd said swam in my brain. They'd operated on me, given me a new face. They were going to make me into somebody else. I didn't even know where I was. I... Suddenly, my eyes filled with tears. And I felt alone. Alone and very frightened. There's never been a story to equal America's. The pioneers who came here for freedom. Except one. The epic story of the first settlers of my country, Australia. They came in chains. Dell proudly announces The Australians, the breathtaking new series from the creator of John Jake's Kent Family Chronicles. The Australians, beginning with book one, The Exiles. They were exiles. Some convicts, some just dirt poor shipped out of England like so much cargo to a strange violent land. The women had it hardest of all, like Jenny Taggart in The Exiles. Jenny's fight for love and freedom is just the beginning of a story filled with the same passion it took to build your country. When you read The Exiles, you'll be glad there are more books and more memorable Australians to come. The Australians, an epic book series that begins with The Exiles. Now, a Dell paperback bestseller. I felt alone and very frightened. Frank Egan looked at the words he had just written to a newspaper reporter he barely knew. Again, he was alone, isolated, in hiding. A barking dog shattered the stillness of the night, and Egan shivered in fear. How could anyone believe his tale? He wasn't Frank Egan anymore. He was now, but let him tell the rest of his story. I think I was in one of their hospitals in the south, but I really wasn't sure. They never let me have a newspaper or watch television. She said it was part of the sanitizing process. Oh. oh, thank God. Thank God, Kern's found me. He's going to pull me out of here. Hello, Kern? Uh, Ann, is that you? Who's on this line? Talk. Talk, talk. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's them. <sighs> They're out there waiting, waiting. I'd better finish this letter. I'm going to let the whole story get out. Yeah, I'll have it splashed all over the newspapers. All right. Her name was Ann Harmon. She was Kern's assistant and in charge of my program. Feeling better, Frank? I guess so, I... You know, it's creepy. I can't get used to looking at that face in the mirror. It's strange. I mean, it's a handsome face, but... Well, you understand, don't you, that your old life is over. Now you're Taylor Shaw. That's my name? Well, I don't like it. It sounds... Well, it's not me. Goes with your looks. And when we're finished with your reprogramming, you'll be that man. Okay. Better than Carl Lucas chasing Frank Egan the rest of my life. He'll never see you again. Now, let's start with some basic trait corrections. We want you to undergo certain tests. Nothing harmful, just subconscious relearning procedures. The next few weeks, if they were weeks, sped by. I was turned inside out. I learned to talk differently 
to walk with a bigger stride. And in the end, I was thinking like Taylor Shaw. After a while, I enjoyed it, but deep down, I was afraid. And then the nightmare started. I never told them about that. I, maybe I should have. No, no, Frank. You graduated from Lafayette College, not uh, State. Sorry. Sorry. They're just too much to remember. Yes, well, take your time. We can go over your background tomorrow, but you better review your notes this evening. Well, when am I going to graduate? You know, leave this place. Soon. Very soon. A week? Two weeks? Oh, come on, Miss Harmon. It can't be that secret. Uh, I imagine two weeks is a good bet. All right. Where am I going to be sent? First you get your personal history down, Pat. Then we'll talk about it. I'll lay you odds. Taylor Shaw doesn't lay odds. I'm sorry. Uh, I would guess that I'm going up north, somewhere on the Middle West. And my cover, an office job. No, uh, middle management in a manufacturing company. Am I close? <laughs> you are too smart. <laughs> Is class dismissed for the day? I don't know. I may never graduate. Cheer up, Mr. Shaw. You're going to be released tomorrow. You're kidding. Tomorrow? You and Miss Harmon are leaving for California in the morning. When did you make this decision? I didn't. Mr. Lassiter changed the plan. That's a major alternative. I don't think Mr. Ann, Lass- can we discuss this later? There's a staff briefing at 4.30. In the meantime, I want Frank, uh, Mr. Shaw, to get some rest. I feel this is too sudden. Ann. Oh, well, everything's okay, isn't it? I, I mean, I'm... I'm still covered, aren't I? Uh, yes, of course. There's nothing to worry about. When you and Ann get to San Diego... San Diego? When you get there, you'll go right to our safe house. Everything's arranged. Safe house? It's part of your cover. The head of the company feels you'd be more productive in Southern California. Level with me, Kern. I'm in trouble. There's been a security leak, right? No. You're protected. Safe. Sometimes these things happen. Trust me, Frank. We know what we're doing. Trust him? What a joke. It was a setup all the way. And I was the target the whole time. What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. At the store, they told me there's a powerful anti-itch drug I can buy without a doctor's prescription. Now, I use Bicozine Cream as directed. No more burning, embarrassing itching. No more scratching. Bicozine actually speeds healing. Bicozine Cream. What a relief. Now you can soften hard, calloused skin without painful cutting or scraping. Apply stainless Dermasoft Cream to your feet as directed. Insist on Dermasoft Cream. Frank Egan, the man on the run, sits hunched over a desk in a sleazy hotel. Frantically, he writes out his story. It is a desperate attempt to relate the events that have brought him to San Diego, events that destroyed his real identity and turned his world inside out. He stops writing and stares into the fearful blackness of the night. His face glistens with a cold sweat. I should have known that I was being set up. But the idea of winding up in California pleased me. And having Ann Harmon as a traveling companion was okay, too. We landed in San Diego on the 19th. Another change in plans. We had jobs at the safe house. (laughs) Safe house? It was a diner. I was the counterman and she was the waitress. Give me a BLT, right toast... And what do you want to drink? Coffee. I never saw you here before. What happened to the regular guy? Oh, he quit. Booze, you know. Cream? Uh, No, thanks. You from back east? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. 
You look just like a guy I knew from Detroit. Never been there. Hey, Taylor, give me a hand with this table. Sure. Now your order's up, fella. Here you go. Enjoy yourself. Thanks. You sure you're not from Detroit? No, I'm sure. Who's your buddy? I don't know. Some jerk thinks he knows me. You recognize him? No. Let me carry the tray. You take the glass. Well, you better take a look at him again. Why? You think he's one of Lucas's boys? Well, is he? He's turned this way. Just go to the kitchen. Go to the kitchen. I took the tray and hurried into the kitchen. Ann started to talk to the guy. He nodded his head a couple of times. Finally, he paid the check and left. So who is he? I'm not certain. You better run a check on him. In the meantime, go back to the apartment and start packing. Well, what about you? I'll meet you there. Uh, give me an hour. Well, maybe I should stay here? Do as I say. Now. All right. All right. Leave by the back door. Don't run. Be cool. Yeah, I'll try. Hiya, Mr. <laughs> Shaw. How you doing? Where'd you come from? Just been waiting for you. Look, I don't know you. I don't want to know you. Oh, sure, sure. Tell me all about it, Mr. Shaw. I don't have any money. I... Here, take the watch. Oh, come on. Drop the act. Oh, act? What? You think I'm somebody else? Look, man, I know you. We've been waiting months until you show. Did Carl send you? Did he send you? Carl? We don't have any business with any Carl. It's just Franco and me in this part of the world. Well, you made a mistake. No way. You're Taylor Shaw. You're my man. Uh, Franco, uh, down the alley! You got it! Uh, that, that, that way! Uh, I got him. Uh, what do you want? No, don't. Don't uh, do that again. Never, never. Oscar, are you sure this, this is the guy? Roll up his sleeve. Yeah. Uh, the left one, dummy. Uh. There it is. Three dots tattooed above the wrist. They did that to me at the clinic. Oh, shut up. Uh, Franco, get the car. Yeah. We'll take him to the warehouse. We can talk in private. Right, Mr. Shaw? <laughs> A nice, quiet talk between friends. Oscar slammed me against a brick wall and I slumped to the ground. They threw me into the back seat of a car. Then the lights went out. The next thing I knew, somebody was slapping my face. Up, up. Come on. That's better. Come on, Joe. Sit up. Oh, oh, oh my head. God, I Drink this. Go ahead. Uh. <coughs> oh, you... You guys made a mistake. It's not what you think. Sure. Tell me about it, punk. Now, where's our dough? Franco. Uh. Take it easy. No need for the rough stuff. We're all friends. Isn't that right, Mr. Shaw? Just good buddies. What do you want? Money? Oh, man, if that isn't a joke. Shh. Control yourself. That's right. We would like our money, just as promised. We delivered, now you come across. It's business, Mr. Shaw. Nothing else. I don't understand what you're talking about. $300,000, that's what. It's our dough. Oh, easy, Franco. Easy. Uh, He's right, Mr. Shaw. You owe us. For what? Hey, let me take him out. Uh, not yet. What's not the yet. use? Now, we're, we're not getting anywhere with now this creep. back off. I don't want this to wind up like the other one. What's the difference, Oscar? He's going to die anyway. No. Let's just get the money. That's all That's all we're entitled to. Uh, I don't want another killing on our hands. Go ahead. This can be short and sweet or damn painful. Now, where's the $300,000? I don't have $300,000. Mr. Shaw, we performed our end of the bargain. We brought in a shipload of heroin. We killed a well, Coast Guardsman. We did everything your people wanted. And now we, Franco and I, want to get paid. I am not Taylor Shaw. <laughs> Damn it, save that garbage for somebody else. The dough. Just get us our share, understand? You got the wrong guy. No, sir. We've waited for you. You're a month overdue. A month. Look, I'm Frank Egan. Egan. They they changed my identity for for protection. I was a government witness, and the girl, the waitress in the diner, she's a special agent. <laughs> Annie, 
Yeah, Ann Harmon. She'll tell you. Franco, you hear that? And he's a fed. No kidding. Well, next time I got to see her shield. <laughs> she wears a badge, huh, sure. Uh, look, look, it's a mistake. Just let me out of here, and, and and I won't tell anybody, all right? I can't get over sweet little Annie working for Uncle Sam. Well, it's true. It isn't. Because Ann works with us. She's the one that brought you out west, right? She's a runner for the syndicate. No, no, no. She's with the FBI. Come on. Hey, sure. Cut the double talk. Now, we are tired of waiting. Now, tomorrow, all of us are going to the bank, and you are withdrawing our money. What bank? The one that has our 300 Gs. Cool it. Now, look, Shaw. We know you've got a safe deposit box somewhere in town. Just open it, and this whole stinking mess will be finished. I am Frank Egan. Don't open your mouth again. Now, don't. Please, please believe me. His punch flattened me. I don't know how long I was out, but the next thing I knew, Ann Harmon was standing over me. Lie still, Taylor. Uh, oh. Franco, give me that washcloth. Oh, here you go. Now, doesn't that feel better? Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry the boys had to be forceful. Just keep that on your cheek. But you haven't been cooperative, have you? Uh, and, and tell them the truth. Tell them who I am, please. Oh, uh, we won't get anywhere this way. Let her try, huh? You're not making this easy on yourself. It's a waste of time. Oscar, call Mr. J. Get him down Shut here. Up. No more. Look, we've taken all the risks so far. Now, you call him. He can deal with his creep. Franco, will you shut up? Mr. J? What are you talking about? Nothing, nothing. Now, just forget it. Tell her. Franco. Mr. J is our partner, silent partner in this business. Listen, will you keep your mouth shut? No. I've had it. I thought you ran this racket alone. Mr. J put up the bread for the boat, the lab, distribution. We're only transportation. And I thought you were running this show. What you didn't know didn't hurt you. Well, I'm tired of taking the heat. Now, Oscar, call the man. Let him take care of Shaw. Do it, Oscar. It's his money, isn't it? Oh, all right. I'll make the call. I am not part of this. I'm I'm Frank Egan. Uh, <laughs> and please... You open your face once more and you'll regret it. You understand? Uh, you're with them, aren't you? Here, Annie. Hold my gun on him. I want to hear what Oscar's going to tell him. Talk. The man from Detroit is here. I know. I saw him at the diner. You were there? Talk, Oscar. What's the problem? He says he's not our man. You check for the tattoo? It's there. So, let him take you to the safe deposit box. He doesn't know anything about it. What are you trying to pull? Nothing. We've worked him over and he's still saying he's some guy, uh, Frank Egan. Yeah, yeah, Egan. The guy who fingered old man Lucas? How do I know? Listen, Mr. J, you, you gotta come down. We want to turn him over to you. This is getting sticky. You were paid to make the delivery, then to take Shaw to the bank, not do it. No, no, it's out of control. Okay. Here's what you do. Make this guy talk. If he's sure and holding out for a slice of the action, I want to know. But if there's been a switch or something, and he's Egan, well, keep him alive. He's worth a hell of a lot more than 300000 And I know just who to call. Yes, sir. You in the warehouse? Right. Give me an hour. I'll be there. Well, he's coming. But first, we need some questions answered. I watched Oscar put down the phone And then he looked at me His stare sent a chill through my body I acted quickly Anne had turned away from me I grabbed her gun He's got the pistol Stay back Get him, Oscar Don't do it, Frank He's getting away Head him off there, Franco Use the back stairs I ran like a wild man into the night I didn't know where to go I was alone And I was afraid She'd maneuvered me into a trap, but why? Why? It pounded in my head. Any way I looked at it, I knew I was a marked man. I would never leave San Diego alive.
Now from General Motors, the option for the 80s. Thinking about buying a new GM car or light duty truck? GM has something you should think about. The GM Continuous Protection Plan. It offers comprehensive protection against the cost of major repairs, towing, emergency road service, and rental car expenses for three years or 36,000 miles. It makes good sense, but GM wants you to know there are other plans. We say compare. Look carefully at what parts are covered. Ask about the towing, road service, and rental car allowance. Then compare it to the GM Continuous Protection Plan. We don't think you'll find another plan that even comes close. Look for more details in an informative choice in our ad in many major magazines. And remember, when you go to your GM dealer, compare and don't settle for less than the GM Continuous Protection Plan. It takes care of you as well as your car. You want me? You come get me. Frank, are you all right? Kern, how'd you find me? They locked your call into a tracer. But, But it was out of service. Frank... Always known where you were. Oh, nothing with you makes sense. You know they're after me. You gotta save me. I'll try. Try? What kind of answer is that? Now, please, please, I'm in room 303. I want you to get me now. Do you understand? We have to let the string run out. Just stay put. Let her make the next move. Anne? Well, you know your girl's part of a heroin ring. She's not with you. You've got to wait. Why? Whose side are you on? Do you have a gun? Maybe. Maybe not. Stay away from the windows. Oh, you got me into something else, huh? I never had anything to do with drugs. Kern! Kern! I gotta get out of here. I'll go down the fire escape. The gun, I... Okay. Steady, Frank. You're almost... Maybe Kern. Yeah? Frank, get out of the room. The whole thing's gone sour. How'd you find me? Never mind. Move. He's on his way. Oh, you set this up with Kern, huh? Yes, yes. Oh, I'm not leaving this place. No way. If you tell me to split, then I know it's got to be safe. You got another target. We've had you staked out from the beginning, Frank. You mean set up? There's no time to explain. Oscar and Frank are on their way. You tell it to the Marines. Sure. Sure, you want me on the outside. No way. I'm not leaving this room. I'm going to call the police. Yeah? Night, manager. Bull. Don't kill him, Franco. Mr. J wants this clown alive. Untie his hands. Ah, how you feeling, Mr. Shaw? Is that your real name? Yeah. You know, you've caused us a lot of trouble and time, Shaw. Now, we're going to get paid one way or the other. It's simple, basic business. These boys bring in the heroin. I, well, I underwrite the venture, and then your people come up with the money. I don't know what you're talking about. I I haven't got $300,000. Could be. But we have to find out. I'm not your man. Whose man are you? Mr. Oscar here tells me you said you were Frank Egan, huh? That's right. Well, the only Egan I heard of was a fink, a stoolie, who sent old man Lucas to the slammer. You that Egan? No, 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 of course not. I don't know any Lucas. Well, could be. But we'll cross that bridge later. Whoever you are, I want my money. I delivered the junk, you pay. No more stalling. I'm not your man. I don't have it. Let's try that again. Think carefully, huh? You... You can work me over all you want. I'm not your connection. Okay, okay. Let's find out who you are. Because if you're not from the Detroit branch and you don't have any share, well, let's see if you're Frank Egan. Oscar, get our visitor. Yeah, Egan, interesting name. A friend of mine's been looking for a Frank Egan, looking real hard. He's over here, Mr. J. Well, Carl, is this a man? It doesn't look like him. 
He's had his nose fixed. You, uh, check him for facial scars? No, let's take a look. Keep your hands off me. Hold your head still. I said still. Ah, come here. Yeah, is that what you mean? He's got small incisions near the hairline. Yeah. Yeah, he's had cosmetic surgery. You talk. You're holding the wrong guy. He said he's eager. What do you think? I'm not forking out 500 grand till you can prove this creep's my boy. Now, if he's the one, you get the bounty. If not, sorry. Listen, Carl, I wouldn't have brought you out here for nothing. He's eager. Prove it. All right. Bring him here. I'm tired of horsing around with you, fella. Just give us your real name, huh? No double talk, no wise answers, you understand? Yes. Great, let's have it. Frank Shaw. What kind of answer is that? Talk. 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 From his stumble bum. Get your head straight. Let me handle it, Mr. J. I know just what to do. Shh, 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 shh. Now, easy, boys. Not yet. I'll let them beat it out of him. If he's sure, you get your three big ones. If he's eager, I'll pay. You can't lose, Mr. J, but you've got to prove it to me. He's eager. Don't worry, I will. Tie him to that chair. Now, give me a turn. Now I need a 38. Here, use mine. Okay, big shot. We're going to play a game. It's called a truth game. Very simple. All you need is a gun, liar, and one bullet. Yeah, you see? It's like an enforced game of Russian roulette, except I hold the gun right at your head. Simple, no? Yeah. Good, I think you got the picture. Now, this can be a short game or a long one. You see, fella, at this point, I'm playing for big dough. If you kill me, there's no payoff. The only way you collect is if I stay alive. He's right. I'm not paying for a corpse. Let's see how far this joker's bravery goes, huh? You'll get the truth. Is your real name Taylor or Shaw? Yes. No. Uh, sorry. Are you Frank Egan? Yes. No. The odds are running against you. You better come clean. You can't win. Shut up. I don't give a damn about that money anymore. Egan Shaw, whoever the hell you are, you're going to die. Don't, Mr. J. Let us have him. What? You beat him up, he'll say anything. Oh, no. I'm going to blow his brains all over this warehouse. I'm finished. I've had it. All right, cool it. If he's eager, I want him. Our family wants him alive. Do it again. Okay, okay. Don't press your luck. Start talking. Frank Shaw. Give me the gun. I'll handle this. Mr. Jay, there's a couple of cars coming up the road. Now don't bother me, yeah? Now, I want some answers. The truth. You got a phony store and you've had cosmetic surgery and I'm tired of these half-baked answers, you hear me? Hey, 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 the cars are stopping in front of the building. Some people are getting out. I think... I think you're Frank Egan, am I right? Frank Shaw. Okay, smart boy, I got this pistol right against your temple. Feel it, huh? Huh? Our last chance. I know you don't want to die. Give it to me straight. I'm going to count to three and then... Don't. Don't. One. Please. Two. You got to believe me. I didn't want to. Three. I'm Frank Egan. I am. I am. Don't shoot me, Carl. They made me testify. I didn't mean to hurt your father. They said he wouldn't be sent up. You rotten fake. I should blow your special agent card. Uh, The building is surrounded. Come out with your hands up. Ted, kill the light. Get down. Where's the back door? This way. What about him? I'll take care of it. Come out with your hands up. You, You know where you can go. Wait a minute, I want to nail our friend here. Forget him. Hey, kids! Stop! Stop! I give up! Finish! Get those lights on. It's over! Over! Now get their guns, Rossiter. Take the men and find the other two. Stuart, over here. It's Egan. Is he dead? No, just beaten pretty badly. Lucas tried to kill me. I told him. I told him. It's finished. We'll take care of you. Trust me, Frank. Trust me. The 
conclusion of our story after these words. Sneers, thumb, 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 thumbs up, jeans that fit men real fine. Are now, 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 now on, on sale. sale. Trim fits $8.99. And we got bigger cuts to fit bigger guys. Save three bucks on every size. Trim fit and jeans, $8.99 a pair. Yep, now's the time and Sneers is where. To get your thumb, 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 th
This is Leonard Nimoy. Fifty-nine years ago, a rebel chieftain arose in the Rift Mountains of Morocco. His name was Abdul Krim, and for five years he fought against the combined French and Spanish armies with remarkable success. He was a colorful and, some said, a romantic sort of figure, a desert warrior. In fact, his exploits inspired a light opera of the time, The Desert Song. But while guerrilla warfare may be colorful, the color of flowing blood, it's not in the least romantic. For example, in 1921, the Spanish army in Morocco numbered 19,000 troops. Abdul Krim's furious tribesmen massacred 16,000 of them. Abdul Krim was a cruel and violent man, and he had an uncontrollable lust for blood. Well, Abdul Krim's been dead for 17 years now, but the legend lives on, and so does his family. One of his grandsons, more ruthless and even more violent, is trying to take over where Abdul Krim left off. He's in the Rift Mountains, gathering an army together, and he, too, has an uncontrollable lust for blood. John, this is Helen. I'm off to Morocco for a week or two. I want to interview Hamid Krim before he either gets too big to answer questions or gets killed off. I'll be out of touch for a while, but when I come back, it'll be with an exclusive... Good. Thank you, John. Helen West, one of the best foreign correspondents in the business. She's no fool, but she's rushing in where angels, if they had any sense at all, would very definitely fear to tread. It's liable to cost her her life, and that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, North from Marrakesh, by Alan Caillou. Our stars, Hans Conry, Antoinette Bauer, and Len Berman. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, they're Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. How many cold tablets do you take a day? Two? More. Four? More. Six? Yeah. A day? Uh-huh. And they're more at night? Right. Why? Well, they're new. Take contact. One capsule helps all your congestive symptoms up to 12 hours. All day? And all night while you sleep. That's the wonder of contact. Hey, you're the guys on TV. <laughs> yeah, we're the guys on TV. Take your contact. Take it fast. Give your code to contact. Take only as direct. In spite of all reports to the contrary, there are still some young people around today who want to get married. I like that. Of course, there are sometimes obstacles to be overcome even before you start out. Well, hi there, Virgil. Hi, Norma. Oh, what beautiful flowers. What are they, roses or something? Uh, yes. Is Helen home? No. Oh. Well, maybe I can come in and wait for her. Sure, Virgil. Anything you say, come on in. Hey, that's a great fire she's got going there. It's cold tonight. Oh, is it? I didn't know. I'm always warm. You want a drink? 
Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Is she going to be long? Who? Helen, Norma. Oh, Helen. Yeah, I guess so. Well, how long, Norma? Um, she figured a couple of weeks. I'm house sitting for her. A couple of weeks? Yeah, she left yesterday. I have to feed the budgie and water all those house plants. Oh my! Where'd she go this time? Oh, a place called Morocco. Uh, that's in、um, Marrakesh. Norma, I know where Marrakesh is. Oh, what's she doing there? I mean, I came to propose to her. You know what a proposal is, Norma? It's kind of old-fashioned these days. Oh, sure, I know. I'm not dumb. I get them all the time. <laughs> Cheers. Marrakesh. Oh, I need this drink.、Uh, she went there to interview a man named Abdul Krim. He's going to take over all of North Africa and give the Western world a really bad time. Norma Abdul Krim has been dead for nearly twenty years. Yes, that's what she said. Where does Abdul Krim come into all this? Oh, oh, I remember. Well, this guy she went to interview is his grandfather's grandson. That could apply to a lot of people, Norma.、Mm-hmm. Well, he's a rebel chieftain in the Rift Mountains. Wait, wait, wait! Are we talking about Hamid Krim? That's what I said, Virgil Hamid Krim. And Helen thinks he's taking over. Hey, she's on to a very good thing. Now, why didn't I think of that? Can I use the phone, Norma? I have to call my office. Oh, sure, Virgil. You can use anything you like. You know that. Yeah. Charlie Virgil, listen, Helen West, you know Helen West from the opposition. Charlie, I suggest there are some things you don't know. Okay, make a note. Helen West is on her way to Marrakesh to interview Hamid Krim, grandson of the legendary Abdel Krim, and I'm going out there too to get that exclusive out from right under her nose. When's the next flight to Morocco, Charlie? Okay, that gives me lots of time. Have a ticket for me there at Kennedy, and send a cable for me to Magda. Do you know Magda? Oh, shut up, Charlie! Tell her I'm on flight, whatever it is, and have her meet me. Great. See you. Who's Magda Virgil? Well, now Magda runs a thing called Unified Press in Morocco.、It、takes care of all us foreign correspondents. She's really very cute, and she thinks I'm fantastic. Virgil, you don't really care who you marry, do you? Well, now、uh, let's examine that comment. I really do have my mind set on Helen right now. Why don't you marry me instead? We'd go great together, and I'm right here, not in Morocco. Norma, I have to say it: you're a wonderful woman. I、still. don't want to be a wonderful woman. I want to be a wife. Norma, let me tell you about Helen. She's got a great face, but well, it's the kind of face that if the body's great too, okay, then she's terrific. You know what I mean? I got both of them going for me, Virgil. <laughs> yes, well, Norma. Sometimes I think you're not as dumb as I most times think you are. But two hours from now, I have to hightail it to the airport to fly to Marrakesh. Two hours. <laughs> you want another drink? <laughs> Now from General Motors, the option for the '80s. Thinking about buying a new GM car or light-duty truck? GM has something you should think about: the GM Continuous Protection Plan. It offers comprehensive protection against the cost of major repairs, towing, emergency road service, and rental car expenses for three years or thirty-six thousand miles. It makes good sense, but GM wants you to know there are other plans. We say compare. Look carefully at what parts are covered. Ask about the towing, road service, and rental car allowance. Then compare it to the GM Continuous Protection Plan. We don't think you'll find another plan that even comes close. Look for more details in an informative chart. In our ad, in many major magazines, and remember, when you go to your GM dealer, compare and don't settle for less than the GM Continuous Protection Plan. 
The Rif Mountains of Morocco are a long, long way from home. They're harsh, rugged, forbidding. Nothing can live here except goats and bandits. And Helen West is blithely on her way to a rendezvous with disaster. She's not even aware of the great danger she's in. Mustafa, do you really think this decrepit old jeep is going to get us there? Oh, yes, Missy. It's very good jeep. Little time now we find in camp of Hamid Krim. Very dangerous man. He's killing everybody. Maybe he cut our throats, too. Well, frankly, I doubt that. Everybody says he's some kind of barbarous maniac, and yet if he were really so terrible, you wouldn't have agreed so readily to find him for me. Don't you think that makes sense? Uh, when we see what people like me will do for money, it is best to be sad and not think at all. This a very dangerous business, Missy, for both of us. I won't believe it, Mustafa. The great Abdel Krim fought against colonial oppression. All his sons were educated in Europe, even his brother. And his grandsons. Hamid Krim was educated at Sandhurst Military Academy in England. He's practically a British army officer. He cannot be the ruthless maniac he's made out to be. And that's what I want to find out about. Hamid Krim is still Berber, Missy. A Berber of the Barbary states as I am. And the Berbers are the most dangerous people in the world today. Magda! Virgil, over here! Magda! Oh, my, it's great to see you again. You look fantastic. Uh, a new hairstyle, you like? Fantastic, how I mm. Great. It's so good to see you, Virgil. Come over here. Unified Press Office on Sharia Bulim. Would you care for some arak? It's all I have here. Great. So, what are you doing in Morocco, Verger? The cable said absolutely nothing. I'm looking for Helen West. You know her? Sure, I know her. But she's not in Morocco. She'd have checked with me. Cheers. Cheers. She's after an exclusive. Ah, then she would not have checked with me. With whom? Hamid Krim. What? With Hamid Karim? Yeah. She's crazy. We all know that. But she's not on her way up into the Reef Mountain... To talk with him, I hope. I can only assume that she is. Oh, my Lord. Well, I guess we have to write Helen West off. A pity. She had a great future ahead of her. Stripped of all the adverse publicity he's been getting lately, how bad is he, Magda? Truly. His grandfather, Abdel Karim, was one of the most violent men in history. Hamid is far, far worse. Let me tell you just what kind of man he is. There were two French journalists here recently. They went up there to interview him, too. Now, Hamid Karim has maybe 2,000 men with him, 10 or 20,000 rifles, a lot of rocket launchers. Heavens only knows how many bazookas, and he's got seven tanks and one aircraft, and a little balanca he hijacked. Well, he took those two French journalists up in his plane, and he dropped them on Marrakesh, Virgil, from 5,000 feet, without benefit of parachutes. This is the man your Helen has gone to interview. But Helen is a woman, and a very attractive woman at that, so maybe she'll last a little longer. Hamid is quite a man for the ladies. But don't expect to see her again, Virgil. Ever. Just write her off. Then somehow i got to get her out of there. Impossible. There's got to be a way. Can I get help from the military? Not a chance. He's got an absolute fortress up there. And everyone knows where it is, but it's, it's really quite impregnable. And the bizarre gossip is that the Moroccan Air Force is about to mount an aerial attack on his camp. 
and blow him sky high. When? We can't be sure. But it could be any moment now. Then I have to get up there fast, don't I? How do I do that? Well, if you've got your heart set on suicide, there is a mad American pilot in town. His name is Bendix. Aloysius Bendix. If you can find him, and if he's drunk enough, he'll fly you up to the Rift Mountains. But you need a bodyguard, too. Can I give you a name? Magda, I need all the help I can get. A man named Suleiman. He was a police inspector, but he just got fired. He's tough and knowledgeable, and he'll do anything for money. You'll need him, Virgil, if you're ever going to get out of there alive. Can I trust him? But as far as you can throw him, and he's a very heavy man. But if you give him some money up front and promise him a great deal more when you get back, if you get back, maybe it will work out. I don't know. It's a pretty small chance, Virgil. I have to take it. So tell me where to find this Suleiman. Number 32, Sharia Fulani. Okay. Thanks for the help, Magda. Virgil, hmm? if I never see you again. You bet. So long, Magda. This is Mazda. Get a message up to Hamid Karim at once. Tell him there's another one on his way up there. A man named Virgil Fraser. Nine thousand people work and study and train. Because AFCO is me. Money is key to people's lives. And when you deal with them on that basis, you have to assume a lot of personal responsibility. Nine thousand people rack nine thousand brains. Because AFCO is me. We're not just lenders, we're often counselors. And at AFCO Financial Services, we feel that we are more professional. 9,000 people are all working for the chance to prove that when you borrow, we know more. We feel we have a better quality person in our particular field than any competitor because we train harder. Our people put you in the best company because AFCO is me. I do my homework, I guarantee you. Because AFCO. Ron Wozelcheck, Somerset, Pennsylvania. Here's me. The AFCO people in your town put you in the best company. Look in the phone book for the office nearest you. You know, it's sometimes very easy to walk all unsuspecting into dangers that you can't walk out of quite so easily. And Helen West, a young, attractive, and very sure of herself foreign correspondent, is walking into just that kind of trouble. It's all part of the necessary business of keeping the public informed about what's going on throughout the world. Sometimes, it's easy to forget that a number of good reporters have lost their lives doing just that. Mustafa, there's a man up there on, on the bluff, a man with a rifle. Oh, yes, Missy. Another one over there, you see? And over there, and over there. For half an hour now, there. Everywhere around us. And listen, listen. His horses, I think. Oh, yes, many horses. No. No, I think we have very bad trouble. They tell us to get down, Missy. Better we do that, I think. Okay, but I want my equipment. My camera. I my, have my it. tape recorder. I have it, I have it. What yes. are they trying to do? They throw the jeep over the cliff, Missy. We're lucky they don't throw us over, too. No! Oh, it was a good jeep. Come, Missy. We go with them to Hamid Krim's camp. Yes, well, 
That is what we came all this way for, isn't it? But I have to admit I'm frightened now. No, no, no. Do, do not be frightened, Missy. You must not be frightened. You must have courage. Because mine is all gone. <laughs> You were recommended to me, Mr. Suleiman, by Mad Esborn over at Unified Press. She said you were tough and knowledgeable and would do anything for money. Oh, how kind of her. Really a very perspicacious lady, if I may say so. She also said you'd recently been fired from the police department. I'm sure it's none of my damn business, so I won't ask why. Oh, but I insist you know, Mr. Fraser. I was treated most abominably. I was fired for corruption. For corruption, Mr. Fraser. And I must postulate, sir, that it is not customary anywhere in the civilized world to dismiss a respected police officer for such a trifle. <laughs> Corruption, indeed. It is merely that I was getting bribes my commanding officer thought should be his. And what shall I do now? I have twelve children. I must eat three times a day, and I have no money. Eat three times a day? Oh, you mean feed. Precisely, Mr. Fraser. I have to feed on them three times a day like a good father. And the little beasts are always hungry. Money, Mr. Fraser, it is always a question of money. An honest man simply cannot live without the bribes he has become accustomed to. Uh, yes. Well, Magda suggested I might hire your services as sort of, uh, I don't know, guide and bodyguard, I suppose, for a trip into the Rift Mountains. Ah. Ah. Uh, there is nothing in the Rift Mountains to interest a foreign journalist, Mr. Fraser, except... Except Hamid Krim, yes. I want to go to his camp. Did Magda tell you also that Hamid Krim's men murdered my father? No. No, she didn't. And if that means... Yet they attacked my village, Mr. Fraser. And my father, my four brothers, two uncles, and seven women of my family. They were all killed in the massacre. A village called Sarit. Remember the name. Sarit. I'm sorry, Solomon, I didn't know. Well, thanks for the drink, anyway. Oh, wait, wait, Mr. Fraser. Your business with Hamid Krim is to his advantage? Probably not. Ah, uh, then, given sufficient uh, impetus, I will take you there. Impetus? Money, Mr. Fraser, is not, as you Westerners say, the root of all evil. It is merely one of its most beautiful flowers. Oh. Well, I thought 50 bucks a day for two or three days would be about right. If I were to parade my 12 starving children before you, Mr. Fraser, I am convinced you would reflect on the insufficiency of that offer. Come look at their bloated bellies. Solomon, I already saw some of your damn kids. They don't have bloated bellies. They're just fat. A hundred a day, then, plus a sizable bonus when we return. Done. Okay. Tell me where I can find a man named Aloysius Bendix, a pilot. Captain Bendix? Ah, at this time of day, Mr. Fraser, uh, Captain Bendix will be in the bazaar getting drunk. Well, let's go find him, shall we? I'd like you to know, Hamid Krim, I'm very upset just now. Oh, really? And why should that be? Because your men threw my jeep over a cliff. I'll never get back to Marrakesh without it. How true. But you won't need it now, Miss West. You came looking for me, you found me, and now you will stay a while. Long enough for an interview, yes. Oh, yes, the interview. It will be well publicized. Very well, yes. In that case, I agree. The more people learn of my bland, Miss West the more they will stand in fear of me. And fear is a very powerful weapon that I know how to use. But I must leave you now. I'm expecting a visit from the Moroccan home in the village. We Berbers are known for our hospitality. And there's an execution you may want to watch to photograph for your gutta press. But remember that, like this miserable Mustafa here, you are my prisoner. Don't try to escape. We are also known for our marksmanship, too. Hassan, eh? Sheikh. Why should I want to escape, Hamid Krim? I came here to get your philosophies down on tape. When I've done that, I'll worry about getting home. Not before. Oh, you are a very aggressive young woman, aren't you? And it isn't my only virtue, I assure you. 
We shall consider your virtue tonight. All right, Mustafa. Let's take a look at the village. I want to get some shots before we lose the light. I don't like it, Missy. This is a very dangerous man. I don't think we get out of here alive. Nonsense. It's all just bluster. Ah! What was that? Hamid Krim said an execution, Missy. Oh, my God. Listen. Isn't that a plane? Miss, this a plane. I think they shoot it down now. Better you have camera ready, Missy. Captain Bendix, they hit us. Yeah, yeah. We took a couple of shots there. Everybody all right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Well, at least we found the camp. A lot of very angry men there, Mr. Fraser. With guns. Well, don't worry about it. We're coming into the valley now. A little valley called Wadi Minfa. Okay. That's where I'm going to drop you off. You have maybe two hours climbing to Hamid Krim's camp. Hey, Captain Bendix, your fuel tanks. Well, what about them? The gauges say empty. Hell, those gauges, they haven't been working for five years. We got plenty of gas. Okay, fasten your seat belts. We're going down. <laughs> what am I saying? We don't have any seat belts. Okay, everybody out. I'll be here tomorrow at first light. I don't really believe you'll be, but the deal's a deal. You got any idea just how you're going to get your girlfriend out of there? I wish I had. Play it off the cuff, I guess. Well, I'd volunteer to help you, except for one thing. Oh, and what's that, Bendix? <laughs> I got more sense. I'll see ya. It looks like a long, hard climb, doesn't it? Never mind, Mr. Fraser. Think of the great reward that is waiting for us at the end of it. All those angry men with their guns. And here they come now, Mr. Fraser. But they're not firing. That is absolutely correct. It means they want us alive. And shall I tell you what they might do to us? No, I'm trying very hard not to think about that. Listen, if you're an investor who's tired of being too late, too late when investments are heading up, too late when they're heading down, listen. Barron's is the National Business and Financial Weekly published by Dow Jones. Every week, Barron's gives its readers more useful investment information than any other publication anywhere. Days, weeks, even months ahead. Every week, 34 pages of market statistics, in-depth studies of individual companies, exclusive analyses of companies and industries covering the whole world of investing, and more. Every week, all you need to know not to be too late. Every week in Barron's. And listen, if you phone 800-228-5000, you can get a year's subscription to Barron's for just $43. Phone right now, and you'll also get free an informative booklet called Understanding Technical Forecasting that shows you how to use Barron's the way the professional investors use it. A year of Barron's plus a revealing and useful booklet for only $43. Phone 800-228-5000 toll-free. Now, before it's too late. Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of North from Marrakesh. Well, Miss West, did you photograph that execution? No, I did not. Oh, well, I can easily arrange another one for you if you wish. Do you really want the whole world to see that sort of thing? Yes, I told you, and you don't listen, do you? I told you, the more people who fear me, the better I like it. They must learn that I am not a man to be trifled with, that this is the fate of anyone who stands in my way. 
Mm. Oh, come. We sit here on the sand, and you may interview me. Photographs? Tape recorder? Of course. I want my ambitions to be known to the whole of your damned Western world. Okay, we're recording. First, Hamid Krim, will you repeat that last comment, please? I want the Western world to know that anyone who stands in the way of my ambitions will be removed. And what are your ambitions, Hamid Krim? First, the conquest of my own country, Morocco. Then the subjugation of Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. By force of arms. You are a very foolish young woman if you believe there is any other way. Then you're talking about all-out war. In the desert, yes. We Berbers are very good in the desert. In the cities, by more devious methods. By selective assassination. By selective assassination? What do you mean exactly? I mean the present rulers and their minions who are all pawns of Western imperialism. From Marrakesh all the way to Cairo. I have more than a hundred names all marked down for assassination. For the record, Hamid Krim, can we call that murder? Call it what you will, dear lady. Death has as many names as it has forms. As my army grows, my power grows. And so will my list of victims till there is not one man left who would dare stand against me. There is one war in the lexicon of all great rulers that must never be forgotten. And that war is kill. Hamid Krim, will you tell me how many men you have under your command? No comment. I will say only that when my illustrious grandfather, Abdel Krim, died in exile, mark you, he still had 400,000 adherents to his cause. Soon I will have far, far more. And then... I... Well, Mr. Virgil Fraser, I do believe. Virgil! Helen, thank God I found you. I'm a trip. You know my name. I was expecting you, Mr. Fraser. I'm kept well informed about the machinations of my enemies. Enemies? I'm not your enemy, Hamid Krim. I just came here to, uh, well, to help Helen out with her interview. Virgil, I don't need help. Then sit down, Mr. Fraser. Where were we, Miss West? You were saying you'd kill anyone who stood in your way. Oh, yes, of course. And about that, what about those two French reporters? What French reporters? Shut up, darling. Why did you murder them, Hamid Krim? Why? Because I thought they might perhaps be spies. As both of you might well be, too. Wait, wait, I have to flip the tape. Hold the thought. Okay, off the top. Virgil? Why did you murder those two French journalists, Hamid Krim? All they wanted was an interview from you. I executed them, Mr. Fraser, because I thought they might be spies, as you might well be, too. And at the moment, for the record, I'm wondering what I should do with you. I might have you buried in the sand up to your necks for the children to throw stones at. You're forgetting one thing, Hamid Krim. Oh? And what is that? You said it yourself. You want the whole world to hear your philosophies, as it will. You can't afford to kill us. And is that what you are counting on? Yes. I thought as much. Your manner has been arrogant and offensive ever since you first came here. Yes, I want to see that tape made public, but I can easily send it down to my friends at Unified Press. It does not need your physical presence. He's got a point there, Virgil. In the morning, I will decide what is to be done with you both. Tonight, Mr. Fraser, you will sleep here under guard. Miss West will sleep with me. I can't permit that, Ahmed Krim. You can't permit it? You have no say in the matter at all. She is my prisoner. And I do with my prisoners as I wish. And in her case... That's the Moroccan Air Force, Hamid Krim. Come to bomb you the hell and gone out of here. I know. it. There is a cave a hundred yards behind you. Take Miss West there. I send a guard with you. Ali, Romagum! Suleiman, Mustafa, come with us! Okay, we should be safe here. This cave's a natural, natural air raid shelter. Suleiman, our guard, 
You think he speaks English? No, Mr. Fraser. A mountain man, which is to say, an ignoramus. Okay. When I belt him in the gut, you grab that machine pistol. And then we'll all get the hell out of here. Please, Mr. Fraser, allow me to handle this delicate matter for you. You see, Mr. Fraser, there is nothing in the world more formidable than the anger of a righteous man. And if you would like me to cut his throat, I would be most happy to oblige. Really, very happy indeed. No, no he's out cold. Suleiman, can you and Mustafa guide us down the mountainside in the dark? Virgil, where to? We can't just walk out of here. It's 200 miles to Marrakesh. There's a plane coming for us at dawn. A place called Wadi Minfa. Wadi Minfa? It means the valley of dried out bones. Watch out, rock slide. Dear Lord, I nearly fell. It's an awfully long way to fall. Where's Mustafa? He's not with us anymore. Do not worry about Mustafa, Miss West. He knows where Wadi Minfa is. He will catch up. Oh. Will they come looking for us, Solomon? Oh, yes, if they survive that bombing. But this is a very large mountain, Miss West, and they will not know where to look. It will be for them like looking for a haystack with a needle. And we are there. Wadi Minfa. Oh. Better you sleep now till the plane arrives. I will keep watch. Mr. Fraser! Mr. Fraser, wake up! Uh-huh. We have trouble. We have adversity crawling towards us on its hands and knees. Uh-huh. A man out there. And where there is one, there may be many others. Oh, my God. Oh, what a lovely Shh, morning. Shh, we've been discovered. Oh, no. Wait. It, it, it's Mustafa. And he's been hurt. I will go to help him. Virgil, I'm scared. Yes, me too. Are you sure this plane is coming for us? I'm hoping. He's been shot, Mr. Fraser! He is dying! Miss... Missy West, is she here? I'm here, Mustafa. What happened? I... I, be, I betrayed you. I told... told Hamid Krim... That plane come for you this morning to Wadi Minfa. I, I'm hoping, hoping for a reward. But Hamid Krim become very angry and he, he shot me dead and leave me there. All night long I crawled down mountain to tell you my revenge. Mustafa, tell uh, us what? Wait, my dying breath. Hamid Krim. I think he may be come here soon. Looking for you. Very angry man. Uh, 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 Oh, God. He is dead, Miss West. We will leave him here for the jackals to feed on. They too will die and the vultures will feed on them. And when the vultures die and fall to earth as they must, it will be a turn of the ants to feed on them. It is what is called in your language ecology. And I brought him here. Hey, that's Bendix. Virgil! Virgil, they're on the mountains. Horses! Yes, it is Hamid Krim and some of his men. Bendix! Come on in! Hamid, cream and four men. Do not worry, Miss West. I have a good machine pistol. Hey, you guys, hurry it up. We got all kinds of trouble riding down on Come on. Fast. Now hurry it up, will ya? Helen, get up there, fast. Come on, honey, move your Solomon, tail. come on. No, I wait for them to get within range, Mr. Fraser. Are you crazy? Get aboard. Yes, something. It is better you take off now, Mr. Fraser, without me. There is something I must do now. Solomon, get on board! Hamid Krim, remember Sarit? Sarit, my village, remember the name... The 
conclusion of our story after these words. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck & Company. Sinus flares up. I'm clogged up. Headaches. My whole face hurts. Help. Send for... Sign off. Sign off helps relieve your pain, helps clear congestion, ease sinus pressure and post nasal drip. Sign off does it all. Send for. Sign off. And for the fastest known form of congestion relief, sign off spray. S I N E O F F. Sign off. The sinus medicines in the bright red box. Is here. For occasional use only as directed. cease to wonder what a submachine gun can do in the hands of a capable man. You okay, Suleiman? No, he's been shot. Okay, Suleiman, grab my arm. Uh, you think, Mr. Freeman, this is the first time my poor buddy has been the recipient of barbarian's bullets? No, I have had in my time a nemiety of them. Nemiety? Suleiman, why don't you just speak English like the half-civilized savage you are? Okay, boys and girls, let's go. Yeah. Uh. Hey, well, some kind soul, you want, want to pass me the bourbon bottle that's under the seat there? Me first, Captain Bendix. Two things, Helen, in order of their relative importance. Do we still have the tape? And will you marry me? Yes, Virgil. And yes. The Confessions of a Former IRS Tax Specialist. His tips may help you save money and avoid headaches. If you missed this informative article, you haven't been reading the Wall Street Journal. Every business day, the journal reports to you in-depth on every phase of business. Recent articles told why experts actually are encouraged by U.S. Steel's record loss and a troubling report on the Energy Department. You would have read a progress report on the Windfall Profits Oil Tax, the outlook on consumer prices, articles on broker stocks, the bond market, and what experts call the best bets for making money in the commodities market. The Wall Street Journal. It's all the business news you need, when you need it. Right now, you can get 20 weeks of the journal, that's 100 copies, for just $26. So in the continental U.S., call this toll-free number now, 800-331-1000. That's 800-331-1000 except in Oklahoma. You'll be billed later. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, North from Marrakesh, was written by Alan Caillou and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Hans Conry, Antoinette Bauer, and Len Berman. Featured in the cast were Peggy Weber, Shepard Bankin, Richard Peel, and Alan Caillou. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lauren Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now.
This is Vincent Price. Our story is about a mask, a facial covering that has known many uses, been the facade for many feelings. All of the peoples of the earth use masks in one way or another. This is the story of an African mask named Oshango Batala. Oshango Batala was an old mask carved by a mischievous master carver in the last century and had been present at many ceremonies, both frivolous and serious, as his mood suited him. Because he had been found over the years to be an untrustworthy mask capable of placing inappropriate expressions on the face of the person responsible for him, the people of his village placed him on the back wall of their mask house, between two well-behaved masks, hoping that they could talk some sense into his wooden face. Neither the people of the village nor the two masks flanking Oshango Batala had any notion that their village would ever become famous, renowned for the excellence of its carvings. But perhaps Oshango Batala knew, he with his tricky ways and love of fire. I've seen stuff from every hut in the village except that one. There is nothing of value there, sir. Why not let me decide, hmm? I mean, after all, I'm the guy making this village rich, right? With my urge to collect my export-import business. There is really nothing there, Mr. Palmer, I assure you, except for a few old masts, uh, badly carved. Old masts? How old? Uh, very badly carved, but, Mr. Palmer. But very old. Uh, well, uh, you know, masts from the past. I'd like to see them. Uh, it is not permitted. I'll give you 50 shares to let me take a look. Uh, the people would not like it. They 100. Would... And that's my final offer. Well, it would have to be done after the people have found sleep for the night. Uh, Mr. Bob. Yeah. I must warn you. One or two of these are not nice masts. What's nice? I felt I should warn you. Okay. I've been warned. Too bad sometimes that we can't see beneath the surface, go behind the beyond, understand the personalities of those faces we call masks. And that's how we begin our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Mask, by Odie Hawkins. Our stars, Jim Mapp and David Downing. Nine thousand people will put in a long day. Because AFCO is me. Well, there have been times when a customer's come into AFCO Financial Services on, say, a Friday night with a personal problem, so we've kept the office open and closed the loan. Nine thousand people will go out of their way. Because AFCO is me. We make it a point to process paperwork real quick. Get you the money in one day if we can. I guess you could say we have a service attitude. Nine thousand people simply want rest. Till they're the people when you borrow, you like best. If a customer needs some special help or some kind of personal attention, we'll go that extra distance. Our people put you in the best company because AFCO is me. Well, I've even been known to make house calls. Because AFCO. Scott Chamberlain, Stone Mountain, Georgia. Is me. The AVCO people in your town put you in the best company. Look in the phone book for the office nearest you. Ralph Palmer, entrepreneur, veteran of a thousand business deals, finds himself in search of another bargain in a remote corner of Africa. It will be interesting to see what the ultimate profit will be. Mr. Palmer, uh, over here, over here. Whew, talk about dark nights. 
Please be quiet. The people would be very disturbed about this if they found out. Uh, do you have the 100 shetties? Do you have a flashlight? Yes, I have a torch. We must wait until we are inside the mask house. Do you have the money? Do you know something, Bruno? I kind of get the impression that you like money. I like the options that it offers. After all, I am only a poor, corrupt village official trying to feed a large family. Nah, seems like I've heard that somewhere before. Here, you want a county? Oh, I trust you. Now, come, follow me closely. We will have to circle behind the village. Here, push gently. We must close it to keep the light from being seen. Right. Phew. It's awfully close in here. No one has been in here for five years or more, at least. Smells like it. Let's have some light. Over here. Shine your light over here. Oh, good Lord. These are incredible. Incredible. I thought you said they were badly carved. Perhaps not so badly carved, but they represent... Here, here, shine your light over here. On that one. Yes, that one. It's magnificent. Uh, that is the trickster mask called Oshango Batala. I want it. I have to have it. Why are those two masks on each side facing us? They are talking to him, asking him to behave. Bad guy, huh? I love it. Have to have it. Uh, please, Mr. Palmer, we must leave. We cannot stay. Someone might discover us. Bruno, I want that mask. Now, who would I have to see to make a deal? Uh, that one is not for sale. There is no one who you can see to buy that one, especially that one. You don't understand me too well. I want that mask. And I'm willing to pay for it. Now, who should I talk to? Uh, please, Mr. Palmer, we must go. I'm not leaving here without it. Uh, but you don't understand. This I'll give you 200 uh, cheddars to help me get it out of here. And I'm not going to bargain with you now. That's my first and final offer. I, I, I don't want Look, to. Look, let's, I... let's be sensible. Now, you need money to feed your large family. I need this mask for my collection. How long did you say it had been here? For five years or so. I... All right, five years. It's a sense that it might not be missed for another five years or so. And by that time, no one will know what happened to it. The mask will know. Okay, okay, the mask will know. Big deal. It'll be hanging on the wall in my den. Good light, pleasant surroundings, and... Uh, did you say 300 shillings? No, I said 250. Now, give me a hand. Help me take it down. Uh, do you have the money now? Of course not. I'll give it to you when you get back to the hotel. Hold that light steady. Ooh, this thing is really heavy. Someone comes. Ay, oh, that was close. What happened? We were caught coming out of here with this. In the old days, we would be killed. Uh, uh, well, it's a good thing it isn't the old days. Uh, come on, give me a hand. Paging Mr. Palmer. Paging Mr. Ralph Palmer. Please come to the message desk, please. I'm Palmer. You have a message for me? Yes. Here you are, sir. My husband, Brunkein Guy, asked that I send you this before your departure. My husband is in hospital. Suffering from burns on his chest and arms. The doctors have assured us that his injuries are not permanent. The accident was caused by an exploding oil stove. He thanks you for allowing him the privilege of being your guide during the time you were in our village. He also asks you to be careful of the mask. Sincerely yours, Mrs. Mary Ingai. I 
just bought a new Cougar XR7, and I'm proud of it. If there ever was a car you could be proud of, it's the totally new Cougar XR7. And right now, when you buy an XR7, you get $500 back, direct to you from Lincoln Mercury Division. And you get mileage ratings that are improved for 1980. With 18 EPA estimated MPG, 26 estimated highway. Use the 18 number for comparison. Your actual mileage may differ. Highway in California mileage lower. Get the exciting Cougar XR7, get great mileage ratings, get $500 back. But hurry, offer applies to new cars delivered to you between February 11th and March 22nd, and cars ordered from production by March 1st. Cougar XR7, fuel efficiency, built in America, $500 back. Now that's something to be proud of. At the sign of the cat. We're your Lincoln Mercury dealers, our pride is shining through. The story of Oshango Batala, The Mask, continues. Ralph, I'm telling you for the third time, that thing winked at me, and I want it out of this house. Oh, come on, Ivan. Now be sensible. How could a wooden mask wink at you? That's a good question, Mom. How could a wooden mask wink at you? Yeah, Mom, how could a wooden mask wink at you? Okay, okay, you guys. Maybe it didn't wink at me, but it did something else. I was lighting a cigarette yesterday in the den, and the light flamed up suddenly, and the eyes in that thing seemed to light up, too, as though it were happy to see the flame. In addition, I almost had my eyelashes singed off. <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe it's the kind of wooden mask that gets excited when it sees oh, fire. Well, <laughs> maybe you ought to wear shorter eyelashes, Mom. You know what I can't understand, Dad? Why is it with all the beautiful African lady statuettes, you'd have to come away with the face of a dirty old man with brass tacks around his mouth? Now who's talking nonsense? Eric, uh, I'd have to give you a question. Very careful consideration. But seriously, Ivana... What's really the uh, the problem with you, huh? And this particular piece? I mean, after all, we, we have at least 20 or 30 other masks around the house. Now, what's so disturbing about this mm, one? I, I don't know. It's, it's grotesque. That's what it is. It's grotesque. Look, Max is dropping in this evening, remember? The last thing I'd like to have is a major league collector come into a family that's panning the products. Major league collector, minor league collector, or whatever... You've got to do something with that thing. Now, why don't we get back to this tomorrow, hmm? Put it on hold, okay? Whenever. But let's have it clearly understood. I want it out. Hark! If I'm not mistaken, our Major League Collector is here. Open it, will you, Adrian? Max seems to pop in on a better mood when you open the door for him. It's Mr. Falcon! Hi, go right on in. Oh, my, 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 Adrian, you certainly changed. Oh, <laughs> since last month. Well, Ralph Oldstick, welcome back. Yvonne, I must say you are becoming more and more... Oh, new. come now, Max, you always say that. <laughs> Can I fix you a drink? <laughs> yes, yeah, gin and tonic. Well, Eric, how's, uh, how's football treating you? So far, so good. I'll know when the season starts. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I've uh, somehow formed the conclusion that American football is like the weather. It's always there, but no one can do anything about it. Hmm? Ah, thank you, Yvonne. Well, Ralph, uh, I can tell from that devastatingly perkish smile that you've got a surprise or two for the old falcon, eh? Well, maybe I haven't. Maybe I haven't. Well, why don't we take a peek? Bring your drink. I placed the new pieces here in the den. Daddy, why don't you deal in materials more? I mean, you have a point there, Adrian. African fashions Well, are... I must say, Ralph, quite an extraordinary gathering, quite. And this superb piece here, with its somewhat malevolent expression, now that is a real find. One could say that it was simply ugly. Oh, oh. If one had to say something like that... Now, now, please, please, old stick, don't try to cancel out real emotions. That's one of the beauties of the African mask. Some people simply cannot get past that enigmatic facade. I smell smoke. Hmm? Smoke? Hey, now, just a minute. I know some people don't like long dresses, but this is... I'm, I'm sorry, Mom, but the hem of your dress was smoking. What? See? Hmm. Guess I'll have to give up smoking or start wearing shorter dresses. Ivana, are you okay? 
tail feathers singed, but okay, I think. My word, what on earth happened? I mean, how could the train of your dress... Ca- how do things like this happen? By accident, right? Right. No other explanation, sheer accident. Damn it, I, I can't figure it out. Life just seems to be one accident after another these days. Yvonne burning a dress last week. Adrian burning her hands on a skillet handle that she wasn't even over a flame. And now Eric's VW catching fire. This keeps up with me needing my own personal burn unit. Mr. Palmer? Mr. Palmer? Oh, oh. Who is it? Where are you? Look up here, Mr. Palmer. Me. The mask. Hey, no, no, don't give me that. Okay, Eric, that's enough now. Knock it off. I got a lot on my mind. I don't need this kind of distraction. This is not your son, Eric. This is Oshango Batala. The mask. I must be losing my mind. Mask, don't talk. You're right. Not usually. But that's been one of my bad habits ever since I was car. Wait. Before you say another word, now, let me stiffen my drink. I need it. There is no need to be afraid. I come in peace. Okay. Great. I'm talking to a mask on my den wall, and it's telling me you you're telling me that you come in peace. I don't understand. Now what could you do to me? could make life very hot for you, for the people around you. You you could make life hot for me? For the people around me? Yes. I won't explain how, but I thought you should know that. I think I'm already aware. In that case, I won't have to spend a lot of time beating around the tree. I want to go home. Oh, come on. Now, be sensible. You've got to beautiful room with a view yet. Everybody admires... No, they do not like me. They hate me and they think I'm ugly and I want to go home. Now, just a minute. Can't we put our heads together and reason this out? Don't really think so. Do what I say or suffer the consequences. What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, they're Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck & Company. If you use a long-lasting nasal spray, you ought to check the package. If it has a big 12 on it, you're getting the longest-lasting relief you can get. You're using Duration Nasal Spray. Duration is different because Duration has the longest-lasting nasal decongestant. So Duration gives you up to 12 hours of relief. That's up to 2 to 4 hours longer relief than most other long-lasting nasal sprays. Look for the nasal spray with the big 12 on it. Duration. The proof is on the package. The package with the big 12 on it. For occasional use only as directed. Someone once said that we, all of us, are the faces that we show to the world. Is there a possibility that remark might also apply to masks? Eric, come in here and close the door. Adrian, pour me a stiff one, will you, honey? What's wrong, Mom? You're really wired up. There's something I have to tell you both. It's the kind of thing that would upset anybody. It's about your father. Here you go. Is he... Is he... Is he what, Eric? Well, I don't know. I just thought that maybe he Eric, was... please! Can't you see you're distracting her? Yes, you are distracting me, and I'm already distracted enough. Well, calm down, Mom. Take it easy and tell us. What about Daddy? Well, I, I hardly know where to begin. Uh, Freshen this up for me, will you, dear? Hmm. Thank you, Adrian. 
Oh, incidentally, how are your hands? Oh, they're okay. Doctor tells me that there's no problem. Purely superficial. The skin will renew itself in a few weeks. Oh, oh, oh. Could we sort of get to the reason for us being here? I have to go check on my VW. The upholstery looks like some Boy Scouts forgot to douse the fire. Okay, take a deep breath and listen closely. I don't know if I can repeat myself. Last evening, I passed the den and your father was talking to that mask. What? He was doing what? He was talking to that awful mask that he brought back from Africa. Oh, well, what were they talking about? Don't make light of this. It's the truth. I actually heard him speaking to it. What was he saying? What was he saying? Well, it seemed, it sounded as though he were trying to work out a deal with the mask about something. You know, in a way, I uh, only had myself to blame for being caught in a situation like this. The mask house elders have been warning me for years that I would be exiled if I didn't behave myself. What caused you to misbehave in the first place? Who can say, really? I've heard several theories. One of them is that the man who carved me blasphemed before I was done. Someone also said that the wood from which I was made had not been properly blessed. And there was another point of view which said that I was made from the wrong wood. How do I know? All I know is this. I want to go home. Oh, haven't you heard? You can never go home again. What? I don't understand. What are you talking about? Nothing. Look, forget about going back. Now, just a minute. I think it's terribly unfair of you to be so stubborn about this. Not being stubborn. I just simply fail to see any advantage for your return. But you don't understand. I'll be back where I belong. That's advantage enough. You call being locked up in a dark hut an advantage? Yes. I'm surrounded by others who have my best interests at heart. Not like here, where people stare at me as though I were a freak. Oh, come on now. That would be the case almost anywhere. Let's face it. You are strange looking. I am not. I look exactly like the way I'm supposed to look. The people who are looking at me, talking about how weird I look, are the ones who look weird. You've got a point there. But look, why let these things bother you? You're the main attraction here. I don't want to be the main attraction for a bunch of idiots who think I'm ugly. I think you're too sensitive. Who thinks you're ugly? Your wife does. She thinks I'm ugly. She comes in here from time to time, stands in front of me and thinks... How ugly. Well, how do you know she thinks that? I can read her mind. You can read her mind? You can read minds? Well, not everybody's mind, but... What kind of mind do you read? Oh, I'd say the ones that have definite ideas, notions. Like, uh, let's say you had someone standing in front of you, thinking in a very definite way about a matter that dealt with money. Could you read that? No. No, I'm not going to do it. I won't be a part of anything like that, no. You want to go back home, don't you? Yes, of course. I told you that. I do miss my wives. Your wives? Yes. You didn't meet them. They were sleeping in another section of our hut when you stole me. Oh. Do you realize I've aged ten years at least since you've been here? Look at this wrinkle in my forehead. If you really wanted to return... You would listen to my proposition. That's about the gist of it. Your father is blackmailing that mask. Wow. You lost me, Mom. Yeah, that's a little heavy for me, too. Mind slipping it back through? Simple. He's blackmailed the mask into working for him. The deal seems to involve the mask doing a bit of mind reading before he can... The mask reads minds? As I understand it, it can read some minds. It has obviously read minds. Whoa, let me get the straight of this. Dad has a mask hanging in his den that reads minds? Yes. I mean, what does... What does he want the mask to do? Well, as you know, the last three deals your father has been involved with haven't worked out. He has propositioned the mask into helping him recover his losses. 
The deal seems to be that in return for its help, the mask will be returned to its home. No. No, I don't believe this. Double that. Well, I'm quite pleased that you invited me over this evening, old sock. I've been wanting to discuss the Anderson deal with you. Um, where's the family? He lies. He is not pleased to be here. He'd rather be at home. The family, oh, oh, uh, well, Yvonne has a Wednesday evening backgammon group, and Eric and Adrian are playing tennis down at the club. Brandy? Uh, just a tot. Now then, as I understand it, about the Anderson deal, we're talking about a straight split down the middle. No silent partners, no backstabbing, none of the usual business practices. The rip-off has already been set up. He's going to ask you for another five thou to take care of a matter. Well, I'm glad we've had a frank discussion. It makes it easier for me to tell you that to finalize a matter, we uh, urgently need, oh, hoo, hoo, something in the neighborhood of uh, five thou to tie everything up neat and clean. You know, when you're dealing with the kind of people we're dealing with, the uh, bribe comes first. He lies. He has a gambling debt to be paid. Offer him... Two thousand. He'll take it. How about two thousand? Mm, well, uh, yes, all right. Yes, we've got a deal. Ah, nothing like a glass of fresh juice to start your day. Dad, we know. About fresh juice? About your deal with the mask. A deal with what mask? Daddy, we all know. We've all heard you talking to the mask. Did you hear what it said to me? No. I didn't hear anything. Neither did I. What? What do you mean, you didn't hear anything? The mask? How would you know that I had a deal with a mask if you didn't hear? We could figure out what the deal was because of what you were saying. Ralph, you have to take it back. It's too soon. But, Dad, I heard you promised the mask you'd return it in exchange for help in reversing some business losses. We happen to know, for a fact, that the last two weeks have put us in another tax bracket. Give it a break, Daddy. Take it back. Are you people insane? Are you going to try to make me believe that a mask is responsible for my recent successes? Frankly, dear, I don't know. All I can see is that there is a connection between you and that mask, and I don't like it. Take it back to wherever it wants to go. Well, not take the mask anywhere, and that's the end of it. Well, I thought my family was pretty intelligent bunch of guys. You really surprised me. No! That's it! I told you the last time, no more! Shh! Lower your voice. Why should I? You're the only one who can hear me. Yes, right. I forgot. Now, look. This is the deal the century for. Don't you understand? There are only ten authentic Nubian statues in the world. And I have a chance to get my hands on six of them. I could practically corner the market. And don't you see what this means? I don't care. I want to get back home. You won't reconsider? No. That's my final word. As you say, the bottom line. Stubborn, huh? Now I can see why they kept you in that hut. I want to go home. Maybe if I stuck you away somewhere for a few days, you'd be more charitable. I don't care what you do. I just want to go home. Well, in that case, let's see what the basement will do for your bad temper. I don't care. I don't care. Put me down. Put me down. I want to go home. Put me down. I hit Hmm. Now, that's what I call a real down-home southern fried chicken dinner. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I decided to make it for you to celebrate the disappearance of that mask. Decided to take our advice, huh, Daddy? Well, I thought about it, and it seemed to me that I was being, was being a bit stubborn. I mean, um, well, it's only a mask. What did you do with it, Dad? Oh, I got rid of it. You know, the, the usual... What's for dessert? Peach cobbler. Mmm, great. (laughs) 
Oh, it's been a long day. You can say that again. It's been a long... Oh, Ralph, stop that. You know what I mean. I know, I know. Just fine. Listen, why don't we start making preparations for that vacation we put off before my last buying trip? Ralph, I'd love to. But just a minute. This sounds like something I've heard before. Please don't flip my spirits up if you don't mean it. Oh, honey, I do mean it. Let's face it. Not neither one of us is getting any younger. Time is passing us by. Why not take a vacation? The islands. I want to go to the islands. Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados. Sun, clean, clear water, beautiful beaches. When do we leave? Hold on. It can't be tomorrow. I've got a really important deal to finalize before. How long will it take? Really anxious to take off, huh? Shouldn't take more than two weeks. I'll start making arrangements tomorrow. Oh, I don't know why, but it seems that this has been a very wearing month. You feel that way? Uh Uh-huh. Well, it's almost over now. Time to go night-night. Dream about something good. Night, honey. Night, Ralph. I'm so happy. It seems like ages since we had a vacation yeah. together. Ages. Mom, Dad, hey, wake hey, Dad, up! Dad, wake up! There's a fire! Open up! The house is on fire! This is Ashford. And Simpson for the Bell System. Know how good it is to hear from faraway friends? Well, turn the tables on them. Pick up the phone and let them hear from you. You don't need a special reason except that you care. I care. Come on and reach out. Reach out and touch someone. Reach out. Call up and just say hi. again, and here's the fourth act of Oshango Bakala, The Mask. You were lucky, Mr. Palmer. Another five minutes and that fire would have swept through your place like I don't know what. What caused it? Well, as far as we can make out at this point, electrical shortage, a few sparks can sometimes fall on combustible material, things like that. Where did it start? In the basement, one of the usual places. Like I said, you're lucky the damage is minor. Now, if you don't mind the smell of burnt wood, you're perfectly free to go back inside the dangerous past. In the basement, did you say? The fire started in the basement? Right, that's right, sir. In the basement. Now, if people were more careful not to store combustibles, well, then they're... In the basement? Ralph? Are you all right? What's the matter, Daddy? Uh, Nothing, nothing, nothing. I was just thinking of the cleanup job we have to do. thought you'd burn to a crisp down here. Nope. As you can see, I am still where you left me, and I still want to go home. Oh, now this is silly. You're being unnecessarily stubborn. Now if you... No, I will not, and that's final. Now you listen to me, you thick-headed chunk of wood. Ralph, what are you doing that... Oh, no! I thought you'd gotten rid of that thing. You see, that's why I want to leave. Nobody cares for me here. I thought I'd just store it down here in the basement. But you you said you'd gotten rid of it. Well, as you can see, I haven't. And I can't yet. There's too much at stake. What are you talking about? What's at stake? 
All I can see is that you're going off your bird about a damn mask and endangering your family's life in the process. She's right. This isn't like you, Yvonne. I can't make myself believe that an intelligent, modern-thinking person like yourself would... Get rid of it! Do something with it, Ralph. Take it out of our lives before... before it burns us all up. Well, I must say I'm quite surprised, old Bean. Quite. Considering the authenticity of the piece, I, uh... I really have to feel that I'm getting more than my money's worth. Um, may I be so bold as to inquire, why are you selling it? Well, I knew that you were drawn to the piece. Well, I'd like to say that uh, that is the case with a number of things that you have. Now, come, now, tell me the truth. Yvonne couldn't stand to have it around, hmm? You are absolutely right. Hmm. There seems to be something about this mass that burns her up when she's around it. Yes, I quite understand. Well, now, will you stay for a glass of Madeira? I'd love to, but uh, I'm late for an important meeting. Oh, well, yes, of course. Well, cheerio, pip-pip and all that, right? <laughs> and <laughs> right. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Jolly good. I want to go home. Hmm? What? Oh, I must have dozed off. Too much Madeira, I suppose. I want to go home. What? <laughs> no, I must be dreaming. I told Ralph Farmer, and now I'm telling you, Max Falcon. I'm bored here, and I want to go home. I miss my friends and wives in the mask house. My word, it, it's speaking to me. Yes, to you. I can't believe it. What's so unbelievable? I'm bored, I'm lonesome, and I want out. Well, now, now, for your job, now, 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 just a moment, Mask. Now, I am not the sort you can order about. Oh, we'll see about that. Listen to this. Author and well-known art collector Max Falcon, 62 years old, was taken to Bellwood Hospital for treatments of a heart condition. Mr. Falcon also sustained second-degree burns of his hands and chest. Mr. Falcon declines to offer any explanation for the presence of the burns. He's in satisfactory condition. Sounds like Mr. Falcon nodded off with a glass of something in one hand and a cigar in the other. Ralph, did you... did you sell? Yes, I hate to admit it, but... Take it back, Ralph, for heaven's sakes, take it back! I'm on my way. Shed is to help me smuggle this thing back into... Please, please, Mr. Palmer, please lower your voice. Someone might hear us. Why should I pay you twice as much to help me return this as I paid to take it out? Uh, two reasons, sir. Inflation and the fact that I know where the mask house has been moved. What do you mean, moved? Uh, periodically, the mask house is moved just to keep the mask from becoming bored or being in one spot. And I'm the one who knows which hut it is. Bruno... You're great. Here. You want to count it? Oh, no, no, I, I trust you. Come with me. The conclusion of our story after these words. A performance story from Phillips Petroleum. I'm inside a test car about 150 yards from a new kind of highway crash barrier. It's designed so a car and a skid could hit it at 50 miles an hour and the driver could walk away. The nose cone for this barrier has to be shatterproof so there's not a lot of stuff flying around in a wreck. The designers picked a plastic that Phillips Petroleum developed. Phillips asked me to carry this recorder during the test. I'm starting for the barrier. 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. The, the thing works. Phillips Petroleum. Good things for cars and the people who drive them. 
Yes, right there. Look at that. It's magnificent. Mr. Palmer, that mask Stop. is... Stop! You don't have to tell me. Let's go. Wake up! Everybody! I'm back! We can see you're back. You should have seen me. A room of my own, admirers by the hundreds, a fireplace to stare into. If you keep on boasting in this manner, we will make arrangements to have you sent back. We know how lonesome you have been, and how badly you wanted to return to your own kind. Just because you're a mask doesn't mean you have to tell lies. You're absolutely right. I've been miserable, really miserable. I just come from a place where it seems that they change places every hour, sometimes every half hour, and you can never know what they really think. It's good to be back with honest faces again. Uh, let's talk about it tomorrow. Now's the time for sleep. <sighs> This is so beautiful. The water is so blue. The sky is so blue. It's just what we needed. What are you smiling about? I was just thinking about Max in the hospital. How vulnerable he looked. He didn't offer the slightest protest when I suggested that the mass be returned. Ralph, do you... Do you really think that the mask was actually responsible for those fires? For Max's burns? No, no, I don't. Ouch! What's wrong? Back is sunburned. I wonder Daddy! How... Check this out for me. There's this guy down the base setting his mask for five bucks stage. What do you think? Take it back. Take it back! And now on sale. Trim fit $8.99. And we got bigger cuts to fit bigger guys. Save three bucks on every size. Trim fit jeans $8.99 a pair. Yep, now's the time and spares as well. To get your thumb bump, the thumb bump, thumb thumbs up. Trim fit $8.99. Sale ends March 22nd. Sears, where America shops for value. Available in most Sears retail stores. <laughs> How many cold tablets do you take a day? Two? More. Four? More. Six? Yeah. A day? Uh-huh. And then more at night? Right. Why? Well, they're new. Take contact. One capsule helps all your congestive symptoms up to 12 hours. All day? And all night while you sleep. That's the wonder of contact. Hey, you're the guys on TV. <laughs> yeah, we're the guys on TV. Take your contact. Take it fast. Give your code to contact. Take only as direct. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Mask, was written by Odie Hawkins and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Jim Mapp and David Downing. Featured in the cast were Mady Norman, Robin Braxton, Ben Wright, Don Blakely, and Ray Tosco. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces.
This is Leonard Nimoy. The day is June 15th, the year 3115. You're about to attend a wedding. Those 62,515 men are about to marry those 62,515 women at the 2 o'clock ceremony. At 2.30, a like number of men and women will be wed. This is not an unusual happening. It's common practice to marry people during the month of June. June, you see, is the only month when you're allowed to marry in the year 3115. What happens is, you and your chosen mate make application to the Central Marriage Permission Board. And once they get an okay from the computers who ration out living space, well, then, you and your chosen one show up at the marriage coliseum at the time assigned your wedding. You're each given a short shift or tunic and a garland of artificial flowers to wear or carry. And you take your places in the Coliseum for this glorious event. May I have your attention? May I have your attention? We are gathered at this time to join these men and these women in holy matrimonies. It's a touching ceremony, as those things always are, were, and will be. If you'll focus your attention on that corner, near where an end zone might have been in a different time, you'll see the young man and the young woman who specifically are the principles of our story. What you're about to hear is a true tale of the future. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story? Yes, sir, that's my baby by Elliot Lewis. Our stars? Herb Vigran, Noel North, and Robert Towers. A performance story from Phillips Petroleum. Prospecting for oil used to be a whole lot tougher. You had to lug miles of heavy seismic cables everywhere. Some places, you flat didn't go. Then Phillips came up with a way to search for oil without all that heavy cable. So here I am, Clyde Barroso, packing 38 pounds of RTU, a remote transmission unit, up a mountain. Our new equipment let us look places where it was too hard to search before. And I'm glad we're doing that looking here at home in the States. Because any oil we find could be that much less we have to buy from some foreign country. Phillips Petroleum. Good things for cars and the people who drive them. Permission to marry was something every young person hoped for in those far distant times, and Edward 23, Glendon 55, and Helga 7, Anderson 5 were not exceptions. Young, in love, they desperately waited. Their application was finally acknowledged. Attention, your attention, please. Helga 7 and Edward 23 gave their attention. The proper authorities acting under the permission to marry at section 7, subsection 15, paragraph 11, line 8. Do now then grant to Helga 7, Anderson 5, and Edward 23, Glendon 59, permission to marry. Helga 7 squealed with delight, and proud Edward 23 beamed, and so... They were married at the two o'clock ceremony with 62,514 other couples. And here's what happened. To whom it may concern, this document is included in the package to explain the contents, or at least to clarify what's here, so that whoever has to open it and deal with it will be kind and just. My name is Edward 23, Glendon 55, and this is recorded in the year 3115. I am married to Helga 7, Anderson 5. 
On our wedding day, we went directly from the ceremony to the living tower to which we'd been assigned. We were delighted to find we were to live in rooms 11, for that suite contained two bedrooms. And since resources are strictly limited with space and atmosphere assigned, that could mean only one thing. We've been assigned a family living unit. Mm. That means they'll let us have a baby. Now, we mustn't jump to conclusions. We haven't received our card yet. Oh, it's probably waiting for us in our rooms. And I don't much care whether it's a blue card or a pink card. Do you? No. Just think. A little baby all our own. A little teeny baby. That's all we cared about, you see. Raising our own little family. And so we waited in our three-room living quarters for our card. We sat in our womb chairs and stared at the message wall and waited for the word. Each day, the great sunlights would blaze on in the morning and simulate old Sol, and then in the evening, the pale moonlights would come on and we'd know it was night. Then, one day... Attention, Mr. and Mrs. Edward Penny Glendon Penny will report this afternoon between 2.30 and 2.35 to the family card issuance unit. We quickly dressed and reported at precisely 2.30, taking our place at the end of one of the many lines. Ahead of us was the machine which distributed the cards. You simply told it your name and what you wanted, and it passed you a blue or a pink card. If you really don't care whether it's pink or blue, then let's ask for pink, all right? Before I could reply, the machine passed us our card. It was yellow. Oh, no! No, 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 no. there, there. Oh, no! no, no, no. <laughs> I led Helga from the room. The other young people who had seen what had happened murmured their sympathy. S so that you will fully understand the extent of our despair, a blue card entitles you to a baby boy, a pink card a baby girl. A yellow card meant that in place of a cuddly baby, you were to take into your family unit an older person who had just been unfrozen. We were about to become the parents of an old thaw -y. Well, there's a well-known rule of thumb that if you've got a problem, you go to the source. For example, if your face itches, you scratch it, or more to the point, if you want a little baby and you're ordered to accept a thawed-out person, find out who gave that order and go to him, which my wife and I did. His name was Mr. Lawrence, 33. Good day. Your card, please. Why can't I have a little baby? Please. Your family unit will include Mr. Ralph Began. Mr. Began was frozen on March 12, 1975, when his heart stopped beating. He was 75 years old at the time. He is to be thawed out this afternoon and will be delivered to you tomorrow morning. Our earliest delivery should bring him to Building 90, Rooms 11 at 7.30, just after the sunlights have been turned on. How can I cuddle a 75-year-old man? Dear, dear. Neither of you knows how important it is for a girl to hold her little baby and feed it and help it grow. And you can't do that with a 75-year-old man who is probably still a little bit cold from having been frozen so long. Ah, uh, Mr. Began will be at nearly body temperature within a few days. It's just not true that these old folks remain icy cold for long periods of time. <laughs> but I just want a little baby. That's certainly not a great deal to ask. If there's room in our quarters and we have food supply to nourish three people, and we've been told another little human being won't disturb the person to atmosphere ratio, then why can't I have a little baby? Madam, the acceptance of an elderly thawee does not preclude your having an infant child of your own at some later date. I want a baby while I'm young. I don't want a 75-year-old man when I'm young and a little infant when I'm old. That's all wrong. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Your government has need for Mr. Began's expertise. The matter is closed. And that was that. No appeal, no changing the orders. So, what we had to do was make the best of it. It wasn't easy. We left the card issuance unit and went directly to our living quarters, trying to see the bright side of things. It's absolutely dreadful. Oh, just, just remember what he said. Including an old thawy in our family unit doesn't preclude your having a child of your own at some future date. Oh, well... It's lucky I didn't let you throw away our pills. Did you know? Is that why? No, no, no. I, I just thought better safe than sorry. There's no reason to get into trouble with the authorities at this point in our lives. C can you imagine what would have happened if you'd thrown away our pills and you'd gotten pregnant? Wow, trouble. I suppose. <laughs> For the first time since our marriage, we slept without touching. Each of us huddled on the side of the wedding bed, half awake, wondering what our life would become in the morning when Mr. Began arrived. We rose with the sunlights, and at 7.30 we were seated in our womb chairs in the first room when... 
Anybody home? Is this the right place? Hey. Is that? Well, yeah, good morning. Uh, you're the young fella, right? I'm Edward 23, Glendon 55. <laughs> Glad to meet you, Ralph Began. Won't you come in? Right. They told me to tell you there's more chairs and a bed coming. Oh, you're the lady of the house, right? Welcome. Well, put her there. Oh. Yeah, still a little cold. Yeah, I feel it myself. Like I got a chill. Ooh, you know. <laughs> They, they said it would take a couple of days. I, I see. Well, who would have believed it, huh? Here I am. And then this pump that they gave me, this is a real blessing in disguise. They told me that it never wears out. Lifetime guarantee. Can you imagine? <laughs> no more heartburn. Pump burn, maybe. <laughs> Just think. I am going to be with you from now on out. <laughs> What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. According to this magazine, Stanley, we don't kiss enough. Look, I get these cold sores. It hurts to kiss. Stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique. Just a touch of medically effective Camphophonique instantly stops pain of cold sores, helps speed healing by killing infectious germs and forming a protective Amalian shield. Bet our scores improved since a week ago. Mm, way above average. Stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique, the little green bottle full of first aid. Use only as directed. One of life's most cherished moments is the birth of a child. New life begins, a new person is born in the image of his parents. But this was not to be in the case of Edward 23 Glendon 55 and his pretty wife Helga 7 Anderson 5. They received neither a blue card nor a pink card, but instead the dreaded yellow card. And now, Newly arrived and still not completely thawed, the occupant of their extra room sits, rubbing his old hands together for warmth. Ooh, ooh it's cold. Hey, any idea how long this lasts? I don't know. They didn't tell us. Attention. Your attention. Huh? Rooms 11. Open your number four. Shoot for eight. Delivery. Huh? What's that? Uh, it's the monitor. It delivers messages. <laughs> Bed and womb chair and a second chair for in here. Imagine that. Fantastic. They didn't have any furniture for you because we were expecting a permission to bear a child card and, well, we wouldn't have needed anything for nine months. Actually, of course. We thought we were going to be allowed to have a little baby. Uh, newlyweds, correct? Yes. Of course, and you're going to have a baby. Oh, that's great. That's marvelous. Except we can't. No, not for a while. Later, perhaps. Oh, well, don't worry about it. Listen, even in my day, and once in a while, it'd be problems. But they worked it out. You see your doctor, he does tests, etc., prescribes, and so forth. And then before you know it, you're pregnant. Just, just, just don't worry about it. If you don't mind my giving advice of a personal nature. <laughs> we can't because they gave us a yellow card instead. Not a pink or a blue card. A yellow card. You! I'm a yellow card? You 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 mean a, a yellow card is like me, unfrozen, instead of a baby? That is sort of it, yes. Well, how come? I mean, what kind of a world is this where you where you get me instead of a baby? Listen, maybe I better get another room. I I wouldn't want to be in your way. Even when I was alive before, I didn't stay with my kids. Emily and me, we we had a place of our own with our own TV, our own radio, the works. On Sundays, maybe we'd go see the grandchildren. I want you to understand I'm not the sort of a man who intrudes himself. Hmm. We'll just take back this for cock the furniture. I assume the store will take it back in return for the stuff you'll need for the nursery. And I'll look for another place. Uh, has the morning paper come yet? I'll look under the rentals and I'll pick out something where I'll be comfortable and I won't get in your hair. That's your room. 
in there. No, 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 no you, you don't understand. I'm, I'm going to move. Where's the morning paper? How can you move? How can I move? What kind of a dumb question is that? I'm, I, by moving, I move. How, how does anyone move? <sighs> you have to get a card which gives you permission to move, tells you where you must go. Applications for the card are available at the Living Assignments Building, but of course there's no valid reason for moving. They won't let you move. No one moves unless they need more space. You don't need more space, so since you've already been assigned a room, permission to move wouldn't be granted. I advise you not even to make an application. You'd end up in an undersea camp, and you'd turn orange, and no one would speak to you. I want to tell you something. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. It's too hard to explain. But as best I could, I told him what the world was like in the year 3115. I described the sunlights and the moonlights. I told him how we get from here to there and what we ate and what we did each day and so on. It was really a very surface sort of briefing and I, I cut it short because I noticed his eyes were beginning to glaze. As you've seen, Ralph Began is very, very thin and getting withered. And when his look grew blank, I stopped. And that began a period of waiting. Each morning, Ralph Began would wait for a morning newspaper that never came, because such a thing didn't exist. Then, out of some old habit, he'd leave the living quarters saying, See you this evening. When the sunlights had crossed from east to west, he'd return, astonished at the world he'd seen outside. No traffic! He'd yell. There's no cars and no streets, so there's no traffic! One evening, he said, How many people live around here? It's like ants down there. There must be a billion people standing around. <laughs> He'd ventured into the square during friendship hour when everyone who can meets to reassure themselves they're not alone. Then another day... Hey, listen. While we're waiting for that call, why don't we take a little trip? Travel, you know. You could show me what everything looks like. Travel is prohibited. What? Travel is prohibited. Why? And if everyone traveled, those going from here to there would run into those going from there to here. There's no room for them to pass one another, so travel is prohibited. He shook his head in disbelief. Then after moping around for a few days, one morning before the sunlights moved, he said, Okay, I've been thinking, and here's what. No calls today, right? Just like every other day, huh? No calls. None. There never are. I was unfrozen because they needed me, correct? Yes. Okay, then. How come there are no calls? They'll call you when you want it. Who will? They will. Who's they? The people who want you. Now, who are the people they want me? Those who decided to thaw you out. I understand that. Who wanted me thawed out? The people who needed you. Who are they is what I'm trying to find out. How would I know? We, we've never had this happen to us before. All right. Let's try it this way. Where did you get the yellow card? At the card issuing machine. At the card issuing machine, right. Were there people there? Of course there were people there. There are people everywhere. That's the problem. The planet's jammed with people. That's why you were assigned to us, because there's no room anywhere for one more person. There's no room on the land or on what's left of the sea or under the land or under what's left of the sea or above the land and the sea. There's nothing but people. Billions of trillions of people all over the place. Hey, that's very good how you got sore. You're a somebody. Yeah. Now here is what I'm trying to find out. When you got the yellow card, was there someone in authority there? The yellow card had instructions on it. It told us to go to the family unit card issuance station's yellow card section. And you went there and what? What was there? Another machine? A man. A man. A real person. Contact. There's a real honest-to-goodness man around. What's his name? Mr. Lawrence, 33. Well, now, there, you see... What? What you just told me about that man, Mr. Lawrence 33, that might very well solve everything for all of us. All right, kids, this is our final rehearsal for the Herky High version of Rapunzel. Okay. We'll pick it up with your scene, Prince, okay. where you rescue Rapunzel from the tower okay. and begin. Me. Rapunzel, Rapunzel, throw down your long hair. Now I'll climb, I'll climb, I'll slide, I'll try, I'm falling. Cut, hold it, Prince. I can't climb up her darn locks, they're greasy. Oh, no. uh, Rapunzel, I told you to shampoo your hair. I know, but it gets greasy fast. Th then use a Gree shampoo. A Gree? Sure, a Gree helps stop the greasies. Oh. See, a Gree has no greasy feeling additive, so your hair stays clean longer between shampoos. Okay, I'll try a Gree. Okay, we'll take an a Gree break, and Prince, yeah. when you draw your sword, right. don't yell bang, bang, you're dead, you dirty rat. I am, live that. Don't do it. Okay, I want For hair that stays clean longer, use a Gree shampoo and try a Gree cream rinse and conditioner. It helps stop the greasies, too. Rapunzel, your hair looked beautiful. Thanks to a Gree shampoo. But Prince, yeah. 
after you climb up the tower, don't yell, come and get me copper. I had lived that. Don't do it. Okay. Early the following morning, Mr. Began plastered his thin hair to his bony skull and made his way to the family unit card issuance station. He worked his way through the throngs who filled the area until he reached the yellow card station. There he entered a room which seemed to be occupied only by a computer. After waiting a minute or so, a section of wall opened and admitted Mr. Lawrence 33. He sat opposite Mr. Began. Mr. Lawrence 33? Yes. I suppose you're wondering who I am. I know who you are. But you don't know why I'm here, I'll bet. I want to make a deal. We were about to contact you. There's been a serious mistake for which your government is sorry. Oh, what mistake? Unfreezing you. You don't need me? No. But I'm thawed. Yes, terribly sorry. But your government is benign, your life is not in danger, and you've been supplied with living quarters, food allotment, and share of atmosphere. Is that correct? Yeah, but... uh... Those are yours. Don't be alarmed. We won't take them from you. Consider yourself part of our life. And good luck. Uh, yeah, 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 right, yeah. When Mr. Beacon came home that day, he was very depressed. Not at all his usual self. He told us how no deal could be made because they didn't need him, how his hopes had been dashed. He apologized over and over again, as though the fact that Helga Seven and I couldn't have a baby was his fault. For the next few weeks, he kept to himself, huddled in the womb chair in the third room, his room staring at the sunlights as they swung from east to west, and then at the moonlights as they threw their pale shadows. After a good deal of thought, he joined us one evening in the first room. Listen, I got a brain, and I've been using it. Do you want to hear what I think? Hey, did you two kids hear me? Yes. Well, l- let me tell you what I worked out. Now, I am going to remove myself from your life so you can have a little baby. Now, you want to know how I'm going to do that? A baby. Right, exactly. A little baby. And with me gone, you can do it. A little baby? How? I don't understand. All right, here is how. I am going to commit suicide. Uh, you're going to what? Commit commit suicide. Suicide? You, 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 you don't know suicide? No. No. Well, I'll be damned. Suicide? I, I'm going to kill myself. Take my life. Zop. How on earth do you do that? Well, there are hundreds of ways... Jump from a building or a bridge or a tower, shoot yourself with a rifle or a pistol or a shotgun, hang yourself with a rope or a necktie or something like that, take poison, rat or gopher or any kind, insecticide, say, or stab yourself or cut your throat or your wrists or... Let me see, you burn yourself up or lay down in front of a train or a car or a bus or a truck or swallow your tongue like some of the Chinese people used to do even before my time. Or listen, I I could go on and on. The point is, you'd be rid of me, and I wouldn't mind at all. Honest, I've already lived 75 years, and that's plenty. Besides which, I got a chance to look around in the year 3115, which is very unusual. That's more than you can say for most guys my age, so... Don't you give it another thought. I will commit suicide. How? How? Weren't you listening to me? What'd you do, doze off or something? I just now gave you a dozen examples off the top of my head, and there must be a million more besides what I mentioned. I I was listening. It's just that I don't understand how it's possible to kill yourself. If it were, there'd be a suicide every once in a while, and there isn't. That's right. Well, like I said, I, I, I jump off a bridge or a tower or a building, I, you, you know. We don't have bridges or towers. I've seen old pictures of what they look like, but we don't have them. A tower is a waste of space, and there's nothing to build a bridge over. Nothing to build a bridge? You, you, you got rivers, culverts, hollow places? Well, everything is either filled in or covered over or the center of something. Mostly filled in. They use those old moon cutouts. All right, then, I'll jump off a building, and I'll tell you how to do it. You go into a building, you see, and you either enter an apartment and open a window and jump out, or you go up on the roof and take off your jacket and tie and leave your wallet and a note, and as soon as there's a crowd gathered down in the street, you jump. Simple as pie. Open a window? Open a window, of course, open a window. Didn't you ever hear of opening a window? Windows don't open. It would throw off the atmospheric pressure. It's very carefully balanced when you consider the trillions of people it supplies. Jump from the roof, then. Roof? 
Right, roof, the top of the building. There's no roof. How can there be no roof? What's on top of the building? Floor 879. Rooms like these. Look, Eddie, I am not stupid. I know that. What I'm asking is what's on top of a floor what you said 879? The plastic cover. Didn't I tell you? The planet's covered with plastic. Every building goes right up to it, so no space is wasted. The only way you can get outside the plastic is through a rocket takeoff or a landing chute. And then you'd be standing on the plastic and there's nowhere to jump because the planet is encircled with plastic. There's no below, you see. It's all out or up. Hmm. And, and all, all them other things, I, like I said, like poison and stabbing and hanging and etc. Yeah, cetera. nothing would work. Because before they thawed you, they'd prepared a backup system. Yeah, spare parts, you mean. Yes, keep them in storage. Yeah, lungs, liver, kidneys, stomach, tongue, bones, eyes, ears, nose, throat, everything. Huh? Everything. Let me ask you a question. How do you die around here? Well, you get an application for death, and you fill it out, and, and then you file it with the authorities. If it's approved, they put you to sleep in your reserve space carton. Aha! That's it, then. Why didn't you tell me I'll get an application for death? You're not old enough. Me? I'm not old enough. I'm 75 years old. What do you mean I'm not old the enough? The minimum age is 163. You're really quite a young man. I am, huh? Hmm. I would have to say that I am a miserable old nerd. That's what I'd have to say. There was nothing any of us could do. The fact that Mr. Began was willing to take his own life so Helga Seven and I could have a baby drew us close together, and we became a family unit of sorts. We went out of our living quarters and showed Mr. Began the tree. That's it? That's the only tree? We used to have billions of them. More than you got people. One Sunday, we managed to get into the automobile run where a carefully preserved 1990 Chevrolet Tudor is driven once around a track. We had freeways for them things. There were so many of them, there was traffic jams. And then, of course, there was the oil trouble, and then, uh, imagine that. Only one car left. For a while, Mr. Began seemed to be in a trance. Events had been too much for him. He looked numb and walked aimlessly around the rooms of our living quarters. And I must admit, he, he became more than an annoyance. He was a burden. I don't want him here anymore. He reminds me all day long that I haven't got a little baby and that I'm not going to ever have a little baby. Yes, you are. How? Can you tell me that? How am I ever going to have a baby? We're going to get rid of that old man, that's how. Get rid of him? Exactly. We're going to kill Ralph Began. How many cold tablets do you take a day? Two? More. Four? More. Six? Yeah. A day? Uh-huh. And then more at night? Right. Why? Well, they're new. Take contact. One capsule helps all your congestive symptoms up to 12 hours. All day? And all night while you sleep. That's the wonder of contact. Hey, you're the guys on TV. <laughs> yeah, we're the guys on TV. Take your contact. Take it fast. Give your code to contact. Take only as direct. Photograph plugs and a tune-up done right Would have solved the problem I had one night I came home late with my car running rough Made a bang and a whistle and a wheeze and a puff Woke up my kids and a lazy old dog Woke up my wife who sleeps like a log I was really up a creek without a raft I need some help from Motorcraft Got a tune-up and plugs with a Motorcraft name My car ran smoother and my family got sane And now when it's late, I drive to the door And life's a lot sweeter, for sure Quality parts for all makes of cars Motorcraft, for sure Nimoy again with the fourth act of Yes, Sir, That's My Baby. There were times when I thought it was wrong even to be planning this terrible act. But then I recall cases I'd heard about where young couples in ecstatic determination had thrown discretion to the winds and stopped taking their his and her pills. In each case, the woman had become pregnant and they'd been called before the authorities. The punishment was severe. The husband or wife was ordered to give up their life to make room for the child. Uh, I couldn't face death, nor could I face what life would be like without Helga Seven. So I persisted. Then at last, I uncovered the information I needed. That night, when Mr. Began had gone to his room and to sleep, I told Helga. I don't want to know. The heart pump. It's been known to malfunction. When that happens, the person dies. Oh, my goodness. 
All I have to do is loosen one little pin right in plain view on the surface besides the air intake valve. And that's it. It'll malfunction and no one will ever know the difference. They'll give him a new pump. If the malfunction occurs just after he falls asleep, we won't know he's dead until morning. And by then, too much time will have gone by. Too much damage will have been done to save him. It'll be too late. The alarm bell. Didn't he say there was an alarm bell? I'll disconnect it. They've had malfunctions with the alarm bells, too. Why do you suppose they give you a lifetime guarantee if both the pump and the alarm can break? The lifetime guarantee isn't for the person. It's for the piece of equipment. You're covered for the life of the equipment. When are you going to... No, don't tell me. I waited until she was asleep and then slipped out of the bed and walked towards Mr. Began's room. I had a moment of panic when I realized he might be sleeping on his stomach where I couldn't reach the heart pump. But he lay on his back, his nightshirt open at the neck, so that the pump elements I needed were convenient to my hands. I located the tiny pin and the alarm bell connection and in two quick motions slid the pin loose and broke the alarm wire. The heart pump stopped. I couldn't look at him. I ran into the bedroom and lay down on the bed beside Helga Seven, who was still asleep. No sound came from Mr. Began's room. When I opened my eyes again, it was morning. Helga Seven was already awake, sitting up in bed, watching the sunlights begin to glow. When she saw that I was awake, she leaned over and kissed me. It's all right. It's all right. I did it. Last night, after you'd fallen asleep. I knew you had, just looking at you. Well... I'll call the authorities through the message board. They'll come and get him and take him away. Well, it was usually an informal hearing, I was told, and since we already have had the food space atmosphere ration in our name, they'll give us a pink or blue card, whichever we prefer. And we can have our baby. Yes, our baby. Hey, you kids up yet? You decent? Who? Uh, j- just a minute. <laughs> I'm not a ghost or anything, assuming you got things like that. Come on out. I uh, had to go out so the alarm bell connector could be fixed. Did you know they had an emergency station in Building 85? No, I, I didn't know that. I, I told him it busted on its own. I didn't, I didn't want to get you in trouble. Same reason I put the pin back last night, so you wouldn't get in any trouble. Put the pin back? Yeah, you got 30 seconds grace with these things. It's built in. The guy who installed mine told me. So after Eddie left last night, I put the pin back. I heard you talking about what you were going to do, and uh, I just couldn't let you do it. You'd spend the rest of your lives. Every time you looked at your kid, you'd be thinking he was there because you killed me. You know, kids should come out of love, like mine. I had three of them. <laughs> I'm glad you survived. I I don't know whether I could have made it if you hadn't. You'll recall in our early conversations on this matter of how to get rid of me, I never once mentioned you should kill me. This whole thing is my fault because of that dumb decision I made to be frozen. So, I got myself into it. I got to get myself out of it. There has got to be a system. There always was, so there is now. And I got to figure out what it is and then how to beat it. It's just that simple. Now, tell me about life here. Fill me in. I wanted to know about the his and hers pills, the backup system that had been devised to prevent unwanted pregnancies until the couple had their permission to bear a child card. We explained what the scale in the first room was for, how men and women weighed themselves for the record each week, protection against food thievery or pregnancy, since such things were easily uncovered by the Friday weigh-in. Then, one terrible Friday, it came time for the weigh-in. I stepped off the scale to make room for Helga Seven. In a minute, she said. I was astonished. It's time for your weigh-in, I told her. In a minute. Don't rush her. Yes, don't rush me. Are you all right? Me? All right? Yes, certainly. Why? Because you've never before delayed your weigh-in. Well, that proves there's always a first time. Have you something to hide? Are you pregnant? What? Have you been taking your hers pill? Yes. Have you been taking your his pills? Of course. Then how could I be pregnant? Attention, your immediate attention, Mr. and Mrs. Edward 23, Glendon 55. The computer reports Mrs. Glendon 55 has not used the scale. Go ahead. I I don't... Go go, go on, weigh yourself. 
Whatever it's about, we should know right now. Oh. <laughs> Why did you do it, Edward? You're more important to me than a baby. You shouldn't have done it. What, me? I didn't do it. Mrs. Glennon, 33's weight shows two variants. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Edward, 23, Glendon, 55, will report to the Family Planning Unit Headquarters building for a hearing within the hour. We were numb. We couldn't understand what had happened. Mr. Began, however, didn't seem disturbed. Don't worry. You, you kids worry too much. You're a fine one to talk. Nothing's going to happen to you. At the headquarters building, the three of us were directed by signs to the hearing room, where four men sat in great chairs behind an enormous table. They gestured that we were to sit opposite them, and we did. A blood sample was taken at the entrance tunnel. Yes, sir. I will come right to the point. You are with child. Oh, I, I don't know how It's not I... her fault. It's my fault. She knew nothing about it. I will accept your judgment. No. It was me. I did it. It's my fault. Oh, no. Sir? Yes, who are you? Ralph Began. Uh, no numbers. I'm the original. Oh, yes, the 4E. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> neither of their faults. I accept full responsibility. Here is the key to the matter. His, his pills and her, her pills. Three months supply. Where did you get those? I've been taking my pills. No. You've been taking what we used to call placebos. Fakes. I made them out of my food supplement pills. I kept this as evidence. Your Honors, I accept full responsibility. I'm sure your actions were well intended, but that doesn't change the situation. Some member of the family unit must give up his or her food space atmosphere for the newcomer, which excludes you. You're a sign family and a different status entirely. <laughs> uh, let, let me tell you a story. Ralph and Emily Bagan married back at the beginning of the 20th century. They had three kids who in turn had seven, which was the count when my heart quit and I got frozen. And these seven who had maybe 14 or so on. Now, who programmed the machine that gives out the blue or pink cards? The machines program themselves. Are you saying that new information is passed from computer to computer? Exactly. So at a birth, the machine keeps track of that person through marriage and so on to the next child and so forth? Exactly. Who do you suppose originally programmed the computers? Why, a man, of course. Ah, now you're cooking. What man and when? I'd only be humoring you. Humor me. <laughs> the computer was originally programmed in 2046. 24. Has anybody since then asked the computer how come they assign yellow cards to certain families? No. That is to say, I'm not certain. Ask it. Uh, humor me again. This is the last time, Mr. Began. We're at the end of our patience. The conclusion of our story, after these words. Listen, if you're an investor who's tired of being too late, too late when investments are heading up, too late when they're heading down. Listen, Barron's is the National Business and Financial Weekly published by Dow Jones. Every week, Barron's gives its readers more useful investment information than any other publication anywhere. Days, weeks, even months ahead. Every week, 34 pages of market statistics, in-depth studies of individual companies, exclusive analyses of companies and industries covering the whole world of investing, and more. Every week, all you need to know not to be too late. Every week in Barron's. And listen, if you phone eight. 800-228-5000. You can get a year's subscription to Barron's for just $43. Phone right now and you'll also get free an informative booklet called Understanding Technical Forecasting that shows you how to use Barron's the way the professional investors use it. A year of Barron's plus a revealing and useful booklet for only $43. Phone 800-228-5000 toll free. Now, before it's too late. <laughs> I am afraid that information is lost to us. The computer response was secret information. Secret, huh? Okay. Let me give you a for instance, which will explain why the computer's original programmer didn't make yellow card assignments helter-skelter. 
Suppose the machines were programmed so that a thaw E was turned over to his family, let's say. Now, if that was the case, when the machines took over and began programming themselves, they'd continue doing the same thing, huh? Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't know if you are or not. Did I tell you that I was frozen before my daughter was married? What's that got to do with our problem? All right, just listen to this. Now, this little piece of paper here, this, this was written by my daughter. I got it from the people where I was thawed. They found it in a little slot on the side of my freezer. And my daughter says, Dear Papa, when you're thought out, you'll be pleased to know I'm married to a wonderful man, Nathan Glendon, and I have two boys, Robert and Edward. I thought you'd like to know when you're thawed, you've got family somewhere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, now don't bother counting on your fingers. I'll save you the trouble. The elapsed time in generations from my grandson, Edward Glendon, to now is 55. What's your number again, Eddie? Glendon 55. You betcha. So you see, Your Honors... I'm not assigned family, which can't take the place of these kids. I'm family, a member of the unit. So when I say I'll give the new little baby my food and space and atmosphere ration, why, that's it. According to your own rules, I'm allowed to do that. There is a further problem. You have heard, I presume, of the application for death certificate? It is operable as a system because disposal provisions for an individual have been made at his birth. We have no place to dispose of four E's, none at all. Even ashes occupy space. Uh-huh. I thought of that. You ever hear of passing the buck? Passing the buck? When you got this kind of decision to make, you let somebody else worry about it. Pass the buck. This is the highest court on these matters. There's nowhere else to go. Where's the box I was frozen in? Still in the vault? Why, yes. And it's empty, right? Pass the buck. Refreeze me. Let somebody else worry about it in a couple of million years or whatever. Just let me wait around until the baby is born. I got the food space atmosphere card for it, agreed? And that's what happened. He stayed with us until the baby was born. A little boy we named Ralph too. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine I got to see my 56 times great-grandson born. <laughs> The authorities let him stay in the rooms for the first few weeks so he could play with the baby and hold him. Then, one day, he decided to leave. The medical staff at the refreezing station explained to him that he'd be frozen. And that would be it. Until someone else, someday, somewhere, needed his services for some reason and thought him out. We know that when that happens, he'll be with family. Which is why I'm enclosing this note. To explain to you who your great, great, how many ever times grandfather is... And what a really special man he is. Please, take good care of him. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. To someone else, it's just another rocking chair. When you move with us, we'll treat it like our own. us careful every day. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Yes Sir, That's My Baby, was written, produced, and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Herb Vigran, Noel North, and Robert Towers. Featured in the cast were Michael Rye and Marvin Miller. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. 
The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Vincent Price. That sound you hear is the whir and chatter of the huge People's Revolutionary Identified Computer within the index division of the Soviet First Directorate, the KGB. The men who control Soviet international subterfuge employ their computer to win a desperate race against time. Their most highly prized British sleeper agent, since Kim Philby, has been compromised and is currently hiding in a safe house in London's Soho district, awaiting the formulation of an escape route back to Moscow. In their agent's brilliant photographic mind rests the details of the blueprint for a new American rocket system, a system about to be deployed by Western Europe's NATO defense forces. Unfortunately for the KGB, this vital information can only be obtained through the use of hypnotic drugs under the specific questioning of Soviet rocketry scientists. An escape route must be found before the British MI5 closes in on their agent. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, An International Sport by Bruce Martin. Our stars, Shepard Mankin. Antoinette Bauer, and Larry Moss. Now from General Motors, the option for the 80s. Thinking about buying a new GM car or light-duty truck? GM has something you should think about. The GM Continuous Protection Plan. It offers comprehensive protection against the cost of major repairs, towing, emergency road service, and rental car expenses for three years or 36,000 miles. It makes good sense, but GM wants you to know there are other plans. We say compare. Look carefully at what parts are covered. Ask about the towing, road service, and rental car allowance. Then compare it to the GM Continuous Protection Plan. We don't think you'll find another plan that even comes close. Look for more details in an informative chart in our ad in many major magazines. And remember, when you go to your GM dealer, compare and don't settle for less than the GM Continuous Protection Plan. It takes care of you as well as your car. Bright sunlight gleams off the frozen pond in the picturesque park on the outskirts of Moscow. Were today a Sunday, the large oval pond would be filled with smiling children and adults of all ages, skating for an afternoon's entertainment. But today is Tuesday, and the crowds are gone. The ice belongs to a mere handful of skaters. Glide! That was not good. Bad, bad. Very unbecoming for a future people's champion. As you wish, Papa. Where are you going? Wait, wait! In Lenin's name, concentrate! Papa! 
Ah, our comrade will hear. Let them hear. I invoke Lenin's name with more respect than all the political commissars in Russia. Surely not with more respect than our own commissar, Karkov. With ten times more respect than that Lenin-quoting bureaucratic lackey. Papa, not so loud. You never know who is listening. Since we are standing all the way out in the middle of the pond, the only place for a spy to hide is under the ice. You were practically shouting. And you were not concentrating on your skating. You look stiff when you should be relaxed. You must display grace if you want to win the London tournament. Skating, skating. Always you think skating. The selection committee should send you to the London tournament, not me. I do not have your talent. Do you really think I will be selected to compete in London? Oh, I hope so. I have worked so hard. Of course you will be selected. Your potential is obvious to anyone, even your prejudiced father. Then there is something I must tell you before I go to London. We can talk freely out here and the tournament is only two weeks away. You are in love. <laughs> How did you know? Ah, Natalia, you are the only child of a lonely man. I have noticed the signs for almost a year, but I could not figure out who the lucky man is. He is a skater, too. He lives in London. His name is Roy Ayers. London? Papa, I plan to defect during the London tournament. Dear God! Please, please, keep my your voice only down. My flesh and blood will defect to the capitalists, and you want me to keep my voice down? Lower your voice before someone hears I you. I want them to hear. We are all children of the Russian earth. I love Roy, Papa. Ah, I see tears in your eyes, but you shed tears for the wrong reasons. A daughter should cry at the thought of never seeing Russia again, never seeing her father again. That is what defection means. Don't you think I know that? I cry for these things, too, especially for you. Head up, head up, head up. In case we are being watched. I'm sorry, Papa. But there is no other way Roy and I can be together. He will marry you? Yes, I think so. You think so, you think so. But you know he even loves you. We have written to each other ever since we met at the Moscow Invitational two years ago. We knew the KGB would read our mail, so we devised a little game. When we wrote about our feelings for our skating coaches, we were really writing about each other. This whole idea is a stupid game. It is not a game, Papa. It is love. <laughs> My sweet angel, in time you will forget him. I have not thought of any other man in two years. <sighs> This Roy, he, he... He knows you? Yes, Papa. I refuse to permit this foolish conversation to continue. What will you do? I don't know. Papa, if you tell Commissar Karkov I plan to defect, I will never see Roy again and my skating career will be finished. You know how the KGB punishes defectors. I will not speak to Karkov. Not yet. Papa... Please try to understand. I love Roy. Uh, I'm going for a drop of vodka. I'll meet you at home later. Please. Papa. Enter. Captain Karkov, Section 9, Department M, reporting as ordered, Karkov. Ah. You brought your copy of Anatala Zinoviev's file? As ordered, sir. Be seated, Captain Karkov. Smoke? Thank you, Colonel. I see from Miss Zinoviev's file that you have been her political commissar for three years. Yes, I had already been the skating things commissar for a year when Anatala was accepted. Then you were um, abreast of the situation when Miss Zinoviev had her affair with the English skater, uh, Roy Ayers, two years ago. Yes, I was. Ah. Officers of the First Directorate brought the incident to my attention, and I immediately informed the Index Division. Hence, Miss Zinoviev's politically unreliable status. Huh? Yes, I scratched her name from next week's London tournament. I see her coaches believe she has champion potential. In light of Miss Zinoviev's affair with the English skater, I felt her defection during the London tournament would be a likely possibility. Mm. Miss Zinoviev's continued correspondence with Roy Ayers supports your hypothesis. But 
Contrary to your recommendation, Miss Zinoviev and her father will both attend the London tournament. The father, too? He will question such an unusual appointment. Mm, you tell him the truth. We uh, send him to keep an eye on his playful daughter. Hmm? Now, you will need them both to secure the safe return of one of our agents from England. I see. A political commissar accompanying the people's national skating team should not raise too many questions, especially considering the current wave of unfortunate athletic defections. Yes, of course. Who will be my contact? Ian Blake. Here. This is the bus number and the schedule where you two will meet. Memorize it. Knightsbridge, number 16. I have it. The People's Revolutionary Computer selected Anatala Zinovia for this assignment. Now, your orders are to see that she cooperates. What status will the Zinoviev's travel under? Expendable. Your only concern is to get our agent out of England. Listen, if you're an investor who's tired of being too late, too late when investments are heading up, too late when they're heading down, listen. Barron's is the National Business and Financial Weekly published by Dow Jones. Every week, Barron's gives its readers more useful investment information than any other publication anywhere. Days, weeks, even months ahead. Every week, 34 pages of market statistics, in-depth studies of individual companies, exclusive analyses of companies and industries covering the whole world of investing, and more. Every week, all you need to know not to be too late. Every week in Barron's. And listen, if you phone 800 228-5000, you can get a year's subscription to Barron's for just $43. Phone right now, and you'll also get free an informative booklet called Understanding Technical Forecasting that shows you how to use Barron's the way the professional investors use it. A year of Barron's plus a revealing and useful booklet for only $43. Phone 800-228-5000, toll free. Now, before it's too late. By Moscow standards, Viktor Zinoviev and his daughter Anatala live in a luxurious apartment. Their furniture is attractive, if somewhat spartan, with private bedrooms, a television set, and even a private bath. It is the proper status, accorded a member of the Soviet national skating team. However, Muscovites understand that political status in their country is spun from a fragile weave. One visit from their political commissar, Yuri Kakov, could change the Zinoviev's lives overnight. I'll get it, Anatala. Good evening, uh, Comrade Zinoviev. I hope I'm not disturbing you and your daughter. Oh, please come in, Commissar Kakov. Anatala, we have company. Ah, here she is. Good evening, Commissar. Oh, sit here. It is our best chair. Thank you. I suppose you're wondering what brings me out on a bitter night like this. The London tournament. So that is why you are here. Do tell me, was I selected? Yes. You and your father. Me? You will accompany Anatara to London as her personal skating coach. How fantastic. Uh, this truly... It's been a shocking day. Perhaps we could celebrate with a little tea. Yes, tea would be good. Right before my father and I take our evening walk. I will be back in a minute. Do you do walk every evening? We try. Comrade, I must speak with you a moment while your daughter is out of the room. Uh, uh, please speak frankly. You must wonder why you have been permitted to accompany Anatara to London. Uh, it is an unusual event, I think. Uh, frankly, we at the center are concerned over the recent tide of defections of uh, some of our people's athletes and artists. Uh, I uh, have heard the rumors. Uh, I can tell you they are true. I was hoping that you would be willing to keep a discreet eye on Anatala during the London tournament uh, to prevent any possible political embarrassment, unimaginable as it may be. No, 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 don't worry, Commissar. Anatala will compete. Excellent. You may not know this. 
Your word is highly respected at the center. <laughs> you make an old man proud to be a Russian. Lenin said, give me a generation to train the children, and the seed I sow will never be uprooted. These defectors retard the inevitable victory of our beloved Lenin's principles. Defectors are bad seeds whose roots must be made barren. Tighten your scarf. You'll catch cold in this wind. You never stop worrying, do you, Papa? Uh, I would have been happier to talk back in our warm apartment. You promised not to mention a word about my defection in the apartment. The center may be listening to every word we say. Karkov was not worried about what words he said in our apartment. I do not trust Yuri Karkov. He speaks his mind like someone who knows he has nothing to fear. I respect his position, not the man. But I didn't think I'd be punished for my promise by having to walk around in the freezing cold. Oh. A question, Papa. Why does the center permit you to accompany me to London? Do you think they suspect? Uh, if the center knew what was in your heart, they would not permit either of us to leave Russia. Karkov was frank. He wants me to keep an eye on you in London. His hands will be full worrying about the rest of your teammates. Uh, then why don't you defect? With me? Anatala, your mother's grave is here in Moscow. Mother would want us to be together. We will be together in Moscow. You cannot stop the love I feel for Roy. What I can do is stop you from defecting. I will not let you out of my sight for one moment in London. <laughs> Comrade passengers, this is your pilot speaking. We have received clearance to land at Heathrow Airport. We will begin our descent shortly. To all members of the People's National Skating Team, we wish you great victory at the London Invitational Tournament. We are fortunate to hear Big Ben, comrades. Big Ben's chimes had not been ringing for some time. Now we must hurry if we are to make the tour of the Houses of Parliament. Oh! Anatala, oh. what's wrong? Uh, I twisted my ankle on the curb back oh. there. Oh, there, there's a bench on oh. the corner. Come, 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 sit down. Comrade Zinoviev, what, what has happened? Anatala twisted her ankle. Oh, no, not now. The tournament is tomorrow. Oh. I'm holding up the group. Uh, we, we can miss Parliament. The decline of English capitalist government is well documented. We don't have to see it firsthand. But it's, it's not fair to the others. I can take Anatala back to the hotel if necessary. Otherwise, we wait for you here. This is highly out of order, Comrade Zinoviev. Anatala's ankle may be an emergency or it may be nothing at all. All right. If you need help, wave toward the river. A friend will come. I understand. All right, comrades. We'll come back for Anatala after the Parliament tour. I knew the KGB watched us. Obviously, Karkov wants no embarrassment. Excuse me, I'm a doctor. I noticed the young lady appears to be in pain. My daughter twisted her ankle. A little rubbing would help. Papa, uh, let the doctor examine my ankle. Oh, how... Uh, it's here, does it? Not half as much as my heart has hurt for the sight of you, my love. Papa, this is Roy Ayers. So your ankle is only a little trick. Please don't look around, Mr. Zenobiev. Let us seem to concern ourselves with Anatala's ankle. You have not seen my daughter in two years. Are you wondering if I still love her? Of course I do. Anatala and I will marry, and then we'll skate together professionally. You could join us in London, Papa. A bus will stop near this bench any minute. The three of us could ride that bus to a new life. Anatala, you would leave me now? After I have given Karkov my word, you would compete in the tournament? You owe Karkov nothing. There is no other way. There is another way. Compete, then leave me. No, Anatala, it's too risky. Let me see you compete internationally just once. 
You and I have worked so hard for this day. Karkov might find me out and I would lose Roy. I have said not a word to Karkov about Roy. These things I will do. I will never forgive you if you desert Russia, but I will also never stop loving you. I see how much you love this man. I pray he truly loves you. Come with me now. Give me time and I'll prove my love for you. Papa, you accept my wish to defect? Yes, with a broken heart. Then I will compete in the tournament. No, too many things could go wrong between today and tomorrow. The KGB knows we've met. They'll check me out. Mr. Ayers, you must promise not to interfere until after the tournament. This is between my daughter and me. Roy, I want you to do what my father asks. It goes against my better judgment. But you will do it. Yes, because you want me to. Darling, we will be together after the tournament. I do so hope we will. We will. What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, they're Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. Helen, don't buy that pain reliever. Why not? They're all the same. Check the labels. Okay, uh, two tablets of regular Tylenol, 650 milligrams. Check the other pain relievers, too. Bayer, 650 milligrams. Bufferin, 650 milligrams. Anison, oh, 800 milligrams. I didn't know Anison had more pain reliever. That's what makes Anison different. More pain reliever and a special combination of medical ingredients. I'm switching to Anison. Get the Anison difference. Use only as directed. The double-decker bus on the Knightsbridge line is half full at ten in the evening. You wouldn't guess it by looking at them, but the smartly dressed Londoner and the Russian commissar Yuri Karkov, seated three rows away, have something more in common than the same stop. They have the same employer, the KGB. Pardon me, I did not mean to cut in front of you. Quite all right. We'll all get out the door. Yes. I always take the number 60 Knightsbridge when I travel to London. Uh, the neighborhoods along the way are so interesting. True, but these neighborhoods are not very English. Turn right at the corner. It is the best way. I recorded Antala Zinoviev's conversation with her English lover this afternoon. You are right. She intends to defect. If she defects before the tournament tomorrow morning, then we will have our hands full. Oh, you won't believe our bloody luck. That fool of a father of hers made Roy Ayers promise not to go with Anatala to the authorities until after the tournament. We cannot count on Ayers keeping his promise. Love is an impulsive emotion, therefore dangerous. Yes, yes. Anatala must disappear tomorrow morning. Will you have our friend ready in time? I'm on my way to our friend now. I've given her a new face. I worked on the computer identifit the last four nights. Uh -huh. The colonel assured me that if anyone could make the transformation, you could. It isn't a question of if. It's a question of time. Our friend will be ready. Where does our friend stay? A safe house in the Soho district. A flat above the Swansdown pub, number three. I will have Anatala there tomorrow morning. Our friend's new identity will be completed by then. I think it's best to let Viktor Zinoviev worry a little before we tell him what has happened to his daughter. He'll cooperate much more readily then. Uh, Zinoviev will cooperate because he's a great Russian patriot. <laughs> Your love has the mercenary's ring. I am a mercenary. For the winning side. Yes, who is it? Your skating coach and father. Good morning, Papa. Where are your roommates? Downstairs, still eating breakfast. <laughs> Anatoly, you surprised me. You haven't kissed me good morning since you made the national team. It was a kiss for luck. I don't know when I will have another chance to kiss you, Papa. Uh, we always hope there will come another chance, don't we? Always. 
Good morning, comrades. Uh, good morning, Commissar Karko. Did we sleep well? Very well, thank you. And you? I slept like a child. Victor, I was wondering if you would mind escorting the team on the bus to the tournament. I would not mind at all, but uh, aren't you coming too? I must go ahead to the hall and meet with the English officials. Uh, Anatala, since you are finished with breakfast, why don't you accompany me to the hall? I can promise you a head start on your warm-ups. I prefer to ride to the tournament with my father. No, 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 no. Go with Commissar Karkov. The more warm-up time you have on the ice, the less tension you will feel. You see what I wise Coach, your father is? I know. Dos vidanya, papa. Dos vidanya. We will see you at the tournament, comrade coach. Skaters, may I have your attention, please? We will begin with a 30 minute warm up period before we rehearse for the opening ceremonies. Ladies and gentlemen, the ice is yours. Comrade Commissar! Comrade Commissar! Yes, Victor, what is it? I'm on my way to a meeting with the judges. I can't find Anatala. Well, she's here. I brought her here to the hall myself only an hour ago. She's not on the ice. I already checked the dressing room. No one has seen Anatala. There are so many skaters on the ice. German, Spanish, English. Look again. Call me if you still can find her. I'll look one more time. Yes, look again. Ayers, over here. Mr. Zinovia, are you mad? You promised you would not let Anatala defect until after the tournament. I've kept my promise. Where is Anatala? Stop lying to me. Anatala is not here. I wondered why I didn't see her when the Russian team came out on the ice. Oh, my God. Then Anatala has not yet defected. You fool, you've blown everything. The KGB must have her. Wait, wait, wait. Where are you going? To get help for Anatala? No, no. I will talk to her political commissar. That is all for the best. Now Anatala will return to Russia where she belongs. Not if I can help it. Will Comrade Victor Zinoviev please report to the judges' booth? Hey, Ernst, don't interfere. It's no good. Victor Zinoviev, please report to the judges' booth immediately. Relax, Victor. Anatala just called. Where is she? At the hotel. What little Anatala ate for breakfast this morning has greatly upset her stomach. She will not be competing in the tournament. Anatala was not ill when she left the hotel with you. Her stomach attack came on quite suddenly. I think it wise, comrade, that you return to the hotel and attend to your daughter. Karkov, you must tell me what has happened to my daughter. You forget yourself, comrade. Your daughter is at the hotel. <laughs> Do walk in, comrade Zinoviev. Who are you? Where is Anatala? My name is Blake, but I think you're more concerned about your daughter at the moment. Anatala is freshening up in the bathroom. She has a nasty stomachache. Hello, father. Here's our little skater now. Anatala, why didn't you leave word for me? You are not Anatala. Keep calm, comrade. Believe me when I tell you there's nothing you can do about the situation. My disguise fooled even you. Only for a moment. Your voice would fool no one. I've taken care of that. Susan, I mean Anatala here, is ill. She's so weak she must speak in a whisper. What have you done to my daughter? Anatala is safe. Safe as long as you do exactly what you are told. You and your daughter have the honor of helping an important agent of the People's First Directorate return to Moscow. And who is that? Me. You do not understand. My daughter made plans to marry an English skater, Roy Ayers. Ayers will have the police here any minute. We know all about Ayers. When the police arrive, they will find that our Anatala has changed her mind. I could never give up my Russian heritage or my father. Naturally, to prevent any further embarrassment, you and my Anatala here will return to Moscow on tonight's Aeroflot flight. Help Susan pass through British immigration as your daughter, and we will see that Anatala is returned safely to you in Moscow. How do I know my Anatala is safe and will continue to be safe? Comrade, we are not monsters. Your daughter wanted to defect, but we forgive her mistake because you will help us in a very important matter. Anatala is a lucky girl. I can tell she has a loving father. All we ask is that you cooperate. 
I have no choice. Come, comrade. Those aren't the words of a true Russian patriot. My daughter's safety is my only concern. Good. Remember that concern tonight when you help Susan clear British immigration. Your Anatala's life depends on your success. A performance story from Phillips Petroleum. I'm inside a test car about 150 yards from a new kind of highway crash barrier. It's designed so a car and a skid could hit it at 50 miles an hour and the driver could walk away. The nose cone for this barrier has to be shatterproof so there's not a lot of stuff flying around in a wreck. The designers picked a plastic that Phillips Petroleum developed. Phillips asked me to carry this recorder during the test. I'm starting for the barrier. 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. The, the thing works. Phillips Petroleum. Good things for cars and the people who drive them. Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of An International Sport. Deceiving British immigration will not be easy. Think of me as your daughter from now until the time we board the plane tonight, and you will deceive them. So you was there, Victor? Yes. Who is it? Oh, yes, Mr. Zinovia. I brought the police. One moment. Susan, this will be your first performance as Anatala. I know my part. I lie on the bed, my mm-hmm. face in profile at all times. Yeah, good, good. Victor, I'll be in the bathroom listening. Remember, your daughter's fate is in your hands. You are ready, comrade? Yes. Let them in. Ah, there she is. Thank God you found her, Mr. Zinoviev. Well, what's the matter, darling? Now, why is she lying down? Anatala has a bad stomach illness. Uh, this man with you is English police? That's right, Mr. Zinoviev. I'm Inspector Chambers of Scotland Yard Special Branch. Mr. Ayers had the distinct impression that your daughter might be in some sort of danger. My daughter has a bad stomach, but it is nothing serious. No, I won't let you or the KGB take Anatala away from me. Inspector, it is true that Anatala once planned to defect to the West to marry this man, but last night we talked and my daughter (laughs) has come to her true feeling. Anatala, tell the inspector the truth. This is the truth. Our love is finished. They're forcing her to say these things. I want him out of here right away. Uh, We'd best leave, Mr. Ayers. Your young lady has obviously had a change of heart. No, wait. Now, we're leaving, Mr. Ayers. Come along. You both did that rather well. Thank you. The inspector had to drag Ayers out of the room. I'm proud of you, Victor. You were very convincing as the angry father. Uh, I am angry. Oh, you'll be happy when we send Anatala back to you in Moscow. Well, I must be off. You'll hear from Commissar Karkov before you leave for the airport. Good luck, comrade. Thank you. Comrade, you shouldn't worry. Once you help me take Anatala's place on the Moscow flight, our people will see she comes home to you. Would you believe that if you were me? Your bitterness annoys me. Think how bitter Commissar Karkov felt when he learned Anatala planned to defect. I will never forgive myself for stopping Anatala from defecting yesterday. She would be safe by now. You know what defectors are. Defectors are bad seeds, which must be made barren, so their roots all oh, no, let go of my arm. Karkov said those very words oh. to me in Moscow before Anatala and I left for oh. the tournament. You know where Karkov has hidden Anatala, oh. don't you? Yes, but what good will it do you if you hurt me or turn me over to the British? Anatala will die. When you live with wolves, oh. how like a wolf. Let Karkov find some other way to smuggle you out of England. Listen to me. The information I have is of paramount importance to Russia. No more important than my daughter's life. Where is she? A a flat above the swans down pub in Soho. Anatala had better be there when we arrive. We can't go there. The police were just here. They must be watching us. Then the police will see an old Russian father out for a walk with his pretty young daughter. You do realize that if I am not on the Moscow flight tonight, 
The center will hunt you and your daughter down until the day you die. The center <gasps> leaves no room for compromises. Oh. Now get your coat. Oh. It's cold outside. Oh. Will you please speed this up, Kachov? Anna Dalla's suicide note must appear authentic. What for? No one in the West will believe her death was a suicide after a full investigation. Her suicide is not intended for the West. It is the center's hope that when Anatala Zinoviev's love suicide is reported in Pravda, its message will not be lost on other Russian athletes entertaining thoughts of defection. Where is the vial? I left it open on the night table. <laughs> the newspapers will certainly point out that the prescription was filled in Roy Ayer's name. Uh, you will read for weeks about the beautiful Russian skater who tragically took her life because she was torn between separation from her father and the love of an English ice skater. I'll hear about it till it comes out of my ears. Let me put the suicide note and pen beside Anatala on the bed and we can leave. <laughs> The pub is through the door. Yes. This hallway leads to the flats upstairs in the pub. In which flat is Karkov holding Anatala? We could turn back now. I would never tell anyone you didn't cooperate. Tell me which door I want, or I will yell for everyone in that pub to come and help me find Anatala. Second door at the top of the stairs. You walk first up the stairs. This is one game you can't win. Walk! This room is supposed to be deserted. Put your gun away. Perhaps someone from the pub downstairs has lost his way. Answer it. I'll stand behind the door just in case. So, so, so I mean, Anatala, what are you doing here? You had your agent's name right the first time, Karkov. Comrade Zinoviev, I did not see you hiding there in the hallway. Come inside the room before someone from the pub sees you. No. Things are to be done my way. I hold your agent in the hall until my daughter comes out to me. Conrad, I order you inside this room. Argue with me and I shout for the police. Anatala, come to your father. You betray Russia, Zinoviev. What have you done to Anatala? She took a sleeping pill. Come in the room and I will explain everything. You explain now. Out of my way, Karkov. No, Blake, do not shoot him. Out of the way, he'll ruin us all. All right, it's Becker Chambers here. Put the gun down, Blake, and kindly turn your weapons over to my men, gentlemen. I prefer that we do not have an international incident here this afternoon. The center will not forget who betrayed us, Zinoviev. I did not intend to betray you, but you took Anatala from me. Everyone inside the room, please. Ah, hello, Susan. I don't know you. No, you forget we met in Mr. Zinoviev's hotel room. I didn't realize what a striking resemblance Anatala Zinoviev bore to Susan Honeycutt. Until you had your little scene with Roy Ayers. Inspector Chambers, they gave my daughter sleeping pills. Ah, well, my men will ring for an ambulance. You have no idea what harm you have done to Russia. There's no place on earth you and your daughter can hide, Zinoviev. Retribution is the center's lifeblood. That's enough of your threat. I have diplomatic immunity. My two comrades will go to a British prison. But you, Zinoviev, you will die. I said that was enough. All right, take him away. Anatala's pulse is very weak. Ah, one of you men make sure that ambulance is on its way. Paging Dr. Edwards. Paging Dr. Edwards. Mr. Zinoviev. Yes, oh. Oh, it's you, Roy. I rushed over here as soon as I got Inspector Chambers' call. How's Anatala doing? The doctors drained Anatala's stomach a little while ago. They said her condition is guarded. Oh, thank God for that. The way Chambers spoke on the phone, I feared the worst. Yeah. Sit down with me. <sighs> Did you hear who Anatala's imposter was? Susan Hanekut. She was a top KGB agent Moscow wanted back badly. Something to do with NATO. No, no. I had not heard. Naturally. Anatala is all you've had on your mind. Yeah. Then you haven't even considered where you and Anatala will go once she recovers? Go? Well, you wouldn't be safe in London after what's happened. Inspector Chambers told me about Karkov's threats. Perhaps Canada or maybe Australia would be good. 
Of course, there's always the United States. Uh, I'm too old to find a new homeland. You must look on the bright side of this. Anatala is alive and you can be together now. Things have worked out for the best. The best for who? For Anatala or British intelligence? I understand your bitterness. It's only natural. Especially with Kharkov's death threat hanging over your head. What hangs over my head does not worry me. But Kharkov is the past which will forever shape Anatala's future. That is why I am bitter. It's simply that Anatala will never be able to skate in amateur competition again. Eh. What about you? You mean, will I give up skating for Anatala? Anatala gave up everything for you, her country, her career. She was even prepared to abandon her father. All for you. Hmm? I hope you will at least be a man and tell Anatala how you feel. Oh, I intend to, Mr. Zinoviev. Excuse I... me, Mr. Zinoviev. Yes? Your daughter is awake now. The doctor said you could go in and see her for a few minutes. Thank you. How about you, young man? Are you coming with me? I am. The conclusion of our story after these words. If your house is too hot, if your house is too cold, well, maybe it's a house, but it's hardly a home. And if that fits your description... We've got the prescription, call your GE Climate Doctors, we've got the cure. We are the experts, we'll check out your house for free. We've got heating and cooling, that'll save you energy. Think it hurts to pay for central heating and cooling? See your participating GE Climate Doctor. Now through May 2nd, he'll give you GE's special preseason offer on many energy-saving systems. So call your Climate Doctor, your GE dealer, in the yellow pages under air conditioning equipment. Take advantage of this preseason offer. He's got the cure for painful heating and cooling costs. Call your GE Climate Doctors. We've got the cure. Call your GE Climate Doctors. General Electric, we bring good things to life. Please remember, gentlemen, that the doctor is permitting only a brief visit. We will remember. Anatala. Anatala, my little bird. Papa. <laughs> That's the voice of my little bird. Oh, my stomach hurts so. Karkov drugged you. Karkov, I remember. Karkov made me write something about Roy. What happened to Roy? I'm right here, Donnie. Roy. Oh, don't stand so far from the bed. Please give me your hand. Roy and I have been talking. Your hand is cold, Roy. Sorry. I'm a little nervous. But why? We're safe now, aren't we? Yes, Anatala. We are very safe now. Then why are you nervous, Roy? Because uh, there's something I want to ask you. Anatala, will you marry me? Oh, of course I will. This one question from your lips is what I've dreamed of for two long years. <sighs> You've made me a very happy man. Oh, I'm so happy, too. Papa, do we have your blessing? This is real? Yes, sir. This is very real. Oh, Papa. Must you ask? Just look at us. Da. Uh, da. Yes. Yes, we must celebrate with a little vodka. Uh, sometime soon. But I think right now Anatala's doctor would veto any alcoholic celebration. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy. I forgot my daughter is sick. We can still toast with our hearts. Papa. Wherever we call home, our hearts will be in the right place. Nine thousand people will put in a long day. Because AFCO is me. Well, there have been times when a customer's come into AFCO Financial Services on, say, a Friday night with a personal problem, so we've kept the office open and closed the loan. 9,000 people will go out of their way Because AFCO is me We make it a point to process paperwork real quick 
get you the money in one day if we can. I guess you could say we have a service attitude. 9,000 people simply want best. Tell they're the people when you follow you like best. If a customer needs some special help or some kind of personal attention, we'll go that extra distance. Our people put you in the best company because AFCO is me. Well, I've even been known to make house calls. Because AFCO. Scott Chamberlain, Stone Mountain, Georgia. Is me. The Avco people in your town put you in the best company. Look in the phone book for the office nearest you. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, An International Sport, was written by Bruce Martin and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Shepard Mencken, Antoinette Bauer, and Larry Moss. Featured in the cast were Len Berman, Ben Wright, Richard Peel, and June Whitley-Taylor. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riffle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. This is Leonard Nimoy. The spotter helicopter flits across the rose and blue summer sky of the polar regions in search of leviathan prey. The most tremendous creatures the world has ever known are not extinct. Not yet. The peaceful whales, twice the size of the largest dinosaur ever unearthed, were not always so wantonly slaughtered by man. Whales once ruled the oceans fearing nothing, neither great white shark nor man. They once breathed freely, mated, and suckled their young with milk. They once grew. Their persecution began less than 200 years ago. Not even a tiny tear in the eye of carbon-dated time. But enough time for man to push their species to the brink of extinction. Spotter 1 to ship. Sector 7 is empty. I'm now commencing sweep of Sector 6. The helicopter will radio for a capture boat when he makes whale contact. And the capture boat will respond bearing death at the end of an explosive-tipped harpoon. The whales have learned to sound, dive deep at the approach of a capture boat's engines. They must surface shortly for air. Violent death is inevitable, for the whales have small chance of evading the spotter helicopter. This is the story of one blue whale's revenge. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Whale Savers, by Bruce Martin. Our stars, Tommy Cook, Joan McCall, and True Boardman. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. Spring, it's already come to Sears, with a fresh selection of young folks' fashions now at 20% off. Boys' vested suits in sizes from toddlers to teens, and soft, dressy dresses in all the colors of spring. Grown-up looks for little ones, too, all in soft springtime fabrics, and in most larger Sears retail stores, all at a 20% savings till March 29th. Fresh young fashions for spring at Sears, where America shops for value. 
Helen, don't buy that pain reliever. Why not? They're all the same. Check the labels. Okay, uh, two tablets of regular Tylenol, 650 milligrams. Check the other pain relievers, too. Bayer, 650 milligrams. Bufferin, 650 milligrams. Anison, oh, 800 milligrams. I didn't know Anison had more pain reliever. That's what makes Anison different. More pain reliever and a special combination of medical ingredients. I'm switching to Anison. Get the Anison difference. Use only as directed. Seagulls circle the sky, high above the international queue of ships docked in England's thriving Liverpool Harbor. One ship, the Requiem, completes its preparations for a voyage different from that of any other ship in the harbor. The Requiem's voyage has but one purpose, to save whales. And that young man with a duffel bag slung over his shoulder, walking up the Requiem's gangplank, intends to join the crusade, one way or another. Hold on, mate. You're boarding the wrong ship. This is the Requiem, isn't it? It is. Well, then I've got the right ship. Captain Sutherland didn't mention that a Yank or anybody else would be signing aboard today. Well, maybe Captain Sutherland told the first mate to expect me and the first mate forgot to mention it to you. I am the first mate. Oh. I think you've got a delivery down there. Yes, it's our last load of fresh vegetables. Oh, button up, love. I know you're there. Look, the captain is expecting me. <sighs> All right. I can watch you the whole way up to the bridge from here. Keep one eye on my stuff, will you? Everything I own is in that duffel bag. <laughs> Come in. Captain Sutherland, I'm Mark Rogan. Who? Oh, you. How did you get aboard my ship? Well, your first mate sent me up. I wrote you in my letters that I'd be dropping by for an interview. Yes, I stopped answering your letters after the first two. I have no need for a photojournalist. Well, I wrote you I'd be willing to sign on in any capacity. Deckhand, coal stoker, cook, you name it, just for the experience. Whatever educational training you've had... Obviously failed to explain the concept of the word no. Captain, you can't say no. The Requiem is setting out on an adventure I just have to document. There's so little true adventure left in the world today. Mr. Grogan, you are not welcome aboard the Requiem. Please leave. Immediately. As I went down the stairs from the bridge to the deck... I remember how much I hated Captain Sutherland for standing between me and the story that would make my professional reputation. Later, a great blue whale would radically change my selfish attitude. But that was later. While I was walking down those stairs, I had almost given up the story until I overheard the conversation of two crew members walking ahead of me. In an instant, I realized they were my ticket aboard the Requiem. But, Sushi, you must take my turn. Always there are grumbles when I cook. I'm not grumbling. <laughs> you have not tasted my cooking yet. I grumble while I cook, and everybody else grumbles when they taste my cooking. Nigel, I don't enjoy cooking either. But since our galley cook decided marriage was more fun than spending three months at sea saving whales, we all have to take our turns. Excuse me. I couldn't help overhearing your conversation. You see, I just applied for the cook's position. Oh, this is wonderful news. Yes, yeah, my name's Mark Grogan. And I am Nigel Olson, a resident marine biologist aboard the Requiem. And this beautiful young lady standing here beside me is... Soshi Nakamura. Anyone who reads a newspaper would recognize your face, Miss Nakamura. You have a good memory, Mr. Grogan. I haven't been in the public eye for two years. But you were saying Captain Sutherland has signed you on as the Requiem's cook? Actually, he turned me down. Why? Do you have no experience? Well, I worked as a short order cook my last three years at college, and I can cook from a cookbook, which is no small talent. Why, compared to the rest of us, this young man is practically a chef. Did the captain say why he didn't hire you? I think it's because I'm not a committed conservationist like the rest of you. Then why do you want to sail with us? For the adventure. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth, but I do have ambitions of writing someday. What kind of writing do you do? Story writing. I hope to be a novelist. But the pay is small aboard this ship. I'd work for room and board. I want this experience that bad. Sushi, 
I think Mr. Grogan would be a welcome asset. I agree. Let's go talk to the captain. <laughs> you must be some charmer to bring this impressive delegation with you, Mr. Grogan. I'm just persistent, Captain. Yeah, that you are. Well, Saucy, Nigel, you're certain you both feel Mr. Grogan would fit in aboard the Requiem? Of course. A galley cook will allow your crew to concentrate on their duties instead of worrying about who cooks next. Yeah. And the fact that he plans to write about our voyage doesn't bother either one of you. And Mark told us about his writing. Very well, then. Now, uh, uh, before you assign ship's papers, Mr. Grogan, you should understand that any dereliction of duty is grounds for immediate dismissal. I'll drop you off at the nearest port. I understand. Of course, when we reach the Antarctic, there will be no nearest port. There will be no ports at all. We're sailing to the South Pole? Yes. We've had a first-hand report, a tip, that the Demus and a refrigeration ship are headed into Antarctic waters to hunt blue whales. What? Blue whales are protected by the International Whaling Commission. Nigel, why are you upset? You know pirate whalers don't recognize any of the International Whaling Commission's laws or quotas. When I am no longer outraged by illegal whaling, then the time is near when all whales may become extinct. I sign here, Captain. That's right. Saucy, please radio the harbor authorities that Mr. Mark Grogan has been officially added to the crew. Certainly, Captain. <laughs> I have the latest weather forecast, Captain. Good. And I brought the Harbor Authority's confirmation on Mark Rogan's listing. Yeah. How's the weather look? Cold and clear. Yeah, that's what I like to hear. You know, you know, you really surprised me walking in here with that Grogan. I didn't sign him on because I thought the last person you'd want to sail with would be a journalist. Then you suddenly... Mark didn't tell us he was a journalist. You said you knew all about his writing. He sees a big story in our confrontation with the Demas. I see. I can't believe how he misrepresented himself to Nigel and me. Well, too late to do anything about it now. Grogan signed his papers. I think he sees this voyage as his big chance to make a name for himself. Well, I won't help him. You can tell him that the first chance you get. Why don't you tell him yourself? It'll have more bite coming from you. Don't worry. I will. <laughs> We're going to pick up our new GM car and you're tearing recipes out of a magazine? Honey, I'm tearing out this ad that says when you buy your new GM car, make sure you compare service repair plans. Let me take a look at that. Let's see. The GM Continuous Protection Plan offers comprehensive protection against major repair bills for three years or 36,000 miles, whichever comes first. Then it says there are other repair plans. So we should compare. We'll take the ad and make a point-by-point -point comparison with any other plan. Okay. Uh, does GM's Continuous Protection Plan cover most major components of the engine? Yes. Uh, transmission? Yes. Front and rear wheel drive? Yes. Uh, steering? Yes. Uh, front suspension? Yes. Brakes? Yes. Electrical system? Yes. Air conditioner? Yes. Rental car and towing alarm? Yes, yes. No kidding. The GM Continuous Protection Plan says yes to just about everything. Yes. Don't settle for anything less than yes. Get genuine GM protection with the General Motors Continuous Protection Plan. <laughs> conservationist ship, Requiem, maintains its southerly heading through the cold Atlantic. She's bound for even colder waters in the Antarctic and a high seas confrontation with the pirate whaler, Demos. But the Requiem's quest is not exactly a harmonious adventure for the entire crew. Soshi, he surprised me. I'm looking for an egg beater. If you're here for a preview of tonight's dinner, it's breaded filet of sole. I can't believe your nerve, Mr. Grogan. Whoa, whoa, what, what's got into you? Quit playing so innocent. You lied to Nigel and me so we would help you get the cook's job aboard the Requiem. I didn't lie about anything. You lied when you neglected to tell us you were a reporter. Oh, well, okay, maybe I wasn't totally candid when you asked me what kind of writing I do. But I'm not here working on an assignment for anybody. I'm... I'm an aspiring journalist and photographer. Just be sure to leave my name out of your stories. I told you I'm not in the public eye anymore, and I want to keep it that way. Soshi, 
Two years ago, you were the most photographed, the most talked about model in New York. You still have a large public out there interested in you. You could be the story of the year. The story of the year is being killed by explosive harpoons in the oceans. As for me, I just want to be an ordinary person again. Understand? Okay. Okay, you call the shots. I meant what I said. Stay away from me. I bet most whalers are just ordinary men earning a living, supporting families. Ordinary men don't hunt blue whales. I wasn't talking about pirate whalers, Smithy. The sad part, Mark, is that what we whale preservationists are advocating, such things as population dynamics and stock assessments, are in the whalers' best interests. The only trouble is the whalers don't believe us. Ah. What do you think, Soshi? Uh, come and join us. Smithy and Nigel have been educating me in our big fish of the sea. You use the word fish, Mr. Grogan, the way the whalers do. Whales are mammals, like you and me. Pardon my semantics. Oh, we're a bit touchy this evening, Soshi. Must be those bad whale dreams you get. <laughs> the whales always die in Soshi's dreams. They've recurred ever since she was a young girl. What would make a young girl dream about dead whales? I suppose if I don't tell you, Nigel will. Well, now, if you prefer, my dear, we can change the subject. No, no, it's all right. When I uh, first moved to New York with my father, a large envelope was left outside our apartment door. Inside the envelope were horrible pictures of dead whales. Whales killed by catcher boats my father owned. It was conservationists who left the pictures for her father. Did you show the pictures to your father? Yes, he tore them up. Fashi's father is still a major stockholder in the Japanese whaling industry. Now I understand why you're aboard the Requiem. Oh, do you? Yes, I think I do. Tell me, why do the pirate whalers go to so much trouble to hunt the blue whales? Greed. That's why. Greed. Blue whales yield twice as much oil and meat as their closest cousin, the fin whale. Yes, there's great prestige, too, when a whaler kills a blue. Blue whales are clever and difficult to catch. What are you writing there in the dark? I'm uh, just jotting down a few notes. I wish I would have been warned I'd be quoted. They're only reference notes and facts. I'm not quoting anybody. I like not having to worry what I say with my friends in private. Good night, everyone. Uh, good night. Nah. Everything I do upsets that lady. Easy, mate. You're letting her get under your skin. That's trouble. No, not me, Smithy. I'm not interested in trouble. Of course I was lying. I knew I needed Soshi's interview to sell my story. The more she ignored me, the more interested in her I became. I didn't like the situation, but I accepted it as a hazard of the job. When the Requiem reached the coast of Argentina, I was on the bridge calmly discussing food spoilage with the captain. Well, someone obviously forgot to double-check the seal on the flour container. Otherwise, a week's worth of flour wouldn't have spoiled. Okay, I'll see that it doesn't happen again. Yeah, good. You do realize a food shortage could delay our pursuit of the Demas. I hope you're a better journalist than you are a galley cook. That's photojournalist, and I am. Captain Sutherland? Yes, I'll see. What is it? I just received this telex message out of Buenos Aires. It's from the Demas. Well, now we know that the Demas knows we're coming. Yeah, please read the telex, Sashi. Buenos Aires, October 2nd. Attention, Captain Requiem and crew. The Demas sails under the international laws of the sea. We will defend our right to fish sea lanes with force. The Demas possesses a peculiar view of international law. What are they expecting us to do when we find them? Start a war? It would appear that the Demas is prepared to fight one. I work all day, my job is rough. I need a boot that's good and tough. Ever drop a 20-inch wrench on your toe? This is Kurt Gowdy suggesting you get your feet in a safety red wing. Lace boot, pull on, or Oxford, you'll get all the comfort red wings are famous for. If your feet need on-the-job protection, don't compromise. You've earned your wings. Safety Red Wings. Earn my wings. I earn my wings. My Red Wings. 
Helen, don't buy that pain reliever. Why not? They're all the same. Check the labels. Okay, uh, two tablets of regular Tylenol, 650 milligrams. Check the other pain relievers, too. Bayer, 650 milligrams. Bufferin, 650 milligrams. Anison, oh, 800 milligrams. I didn't know Anison had more pain reliever. That's what makes Anison different. More pain reliever and a special combination of medical ingredients. I'm switching to Anison. Get the Anison difference. Use only as directed. The Requiem's pursuit of the pirate whaler Demos has taken her past Cape Horn, the tip of South America. Cape Horn's weather is recognized as the most violent in the world. 1,000 miles of gale force winds lie ahead of the Requiem before she reaches the South Georgia Islands, where the great blue whales feed on the abundant accumulations of floating mollusks amid towering icebergs. Here in these primordial Antarctic summer seas, the pirate whalers make their kills. Mark, your galley is the only warm place on the ship in this wind. Come on in and share the warmth, Nigel. Oh, thank you. Uh, the Requiem is a small ship, Mark. I Since the last week, you're not happy. It shows, huh? Yes. Whenever so, she enters the room. Yeah. So she's been crossing my wires all right. I'd hoped she'd changed her mind and grant me an interview by now, but she hasn't spoken to me since the night the four of us sat out on the deck talking about whales. I think so she forms a new opinion of you. Well, she should know I wouldn't write anything about her. She wouldn't want people to read. Well, maybe a little item. She needs time. She's had almost three weeks to change her mind about me. Three weeks. Other twelve. We've not yet even sighted the Demos. You're right. I won't press, Soshi. Oh! Ah! Nigel, are you all right? I, uh, I hit my shoulder. And you? Yeah, I'm fine. But lunch will have to be scraped up off the floor. Yes. Listen, no onions. We stopped dead in the water. What happened? Possibly we struck an iceberg. I'll grab my camera. Let's go have a look. Last but hurts. Watch, watch Smithy's leg. Careful carrying him below. Soshi, what happened to Smithy? Smithy broke his ankle in the collision. Oh, poor guy. He won't like being laid up. What did we hit? It An iceberg? Have, it might have been a, a submerged iceberg. No one's confirmed anything yet. Captain, look to port off the bow. Sweet saints alive. Will you get a load of the size of that whale? Incredible. I, I've never seen a blue whale to equal it. His tail flukes are like the wingspan of a small airplane. He's sounded now. I hope he wasn't hurt in the collision. Are you saying we struck that blue whale? That's right. We must have caught him napping. That whale stopped this 600-ton ship dead in the water? Whales sleep very close to the surface. Their power and strength are immense. Look! The, the blue surface. There, off the port bow. Uh, get your camera ready, Mark. Look! The blue is blowing right off our bow. His blow shot 20 feet into the air. I snapped a few shots for posterity. How big is that leviathan? The largest recorded blue whale was... 36 meters. Well, this blue is certainly in that class. How does that translate into feet, Nigel? More than 100 feet long and over 150 tons in weight. Wow! The blue whale is swimming around the ship. I doubt the collision hurt him. Hey, is it normal for a whale to circle a ship? Well, blue whales do possess a natural curiosity, but circling ships is a bit unusual. A bit? He's changed course. He's headed straight for our bow. He's going to ram us. <laughs> We stood transfixed with the wind in our ears and our hearts pounding wildly as the great blue whale closed on the ship. 200 yards, 100 yards, 60 yards. It was over in a matter of seconds. The great blue hurled his body out of the water. I swear the wind and my pounding heart both stopped at the sight of the great blue whale suspended in midair. It was as if we were the only witnesses to a mystical event. The greatest photograph of my career 
and I didn't even know my camera was in my hands. He's 40 meters at least, Knight. Four more. That's almost 150 feet, Mark. My God. He sounded again. What an incredible sight that was. The blue threw himself right out of the water, and I forgot to take his picture. During the next two days, when the Requiem passed the South Georgia Islands, I found my thoughts continually returning to the great blue whale. On the third day after we collided with the great blue, we found the floating slaughterhouse. A gutted whale was strapped on either side of the ship, and the smell of death hung heavy in the cold Antarctic air. So that's the Demas. That ship there isn't the Demas. That's a refrigeration ship. Whale well, meat rots within 48 hours. Without the refrigeration ship, the Demos would be out of business. At least the pirate whalers can't afford factory ships. That would be a real nightmare. A whole whale, bone and all, can be processed on a factory ship in half an hour. Bridge. Captain Sutherland, the captain of the Demos wishes to speak to you. The Demos is returning to the refrigeration ship now. I'll be in the radio room in a moment, Soshi. Mind if I tag along? All right. Smithy? You're in charge of the bridge. Ah, Captain. This is Dimitrios Papadoulos, Captain of the Demos. Captain Sutherland here. Captain Sutherland, did you receive my telex message? Oh, yes. The message wishing my crew and me bon voyage. You will discover I am not a man who jokes. Do not misjudge me as one either. Captain Papadoulos. Tomorrow, when you play your child's game with your rubber rafts, make certain your crew can evade my harpoons. I may miss the whale I'm hunting and seal your toy boat. The Demas has broken transmission, Captain. He sounds serious. Papadoulos is insane. Anyone sent overboard in polar waters wouldn't survive 20 minutes. Who's going out in the raft tomorrow? And Smithy was before he broke his ankle with a two-man crew. But uh, under the circumstances, I go alone. But, Captain, how can you go alone? You can't keep your eyes on the whales and the Demas at the same time. I've had some experience with pirate whalers. I'm quite capable of doing my own harpoon dodging. Captain, I didn't sign on as your galley cook just to end up shooting my whale pictures from the Requiem's poop deck. Are you volunteering to go out on the water with me tomorrow? Yes, I can operate the radio for you. That's ridiculous. Whales aren't his cause. Hey, I'm over 21. Don't tell me what my causes are. What's going to happen out there tomorrow is no joke. Captain, you could find a better man from the crew than Mr. Grogan to ride with you. Nobody in your crew wants to be out on that water more than I do tomorrow. I need those close-ups of the Demas if I'm going to sell the story someday. Just what I thought. Your cause is good old number one. Yeah, well, this will be one time when looking out for number one might save a couple of whales. I'm your man. All right, Mr. Grogan, it's settled then. Tomorrow, you and I will find out just how serious Captain Papadoulos is about harpooning two men in a rubber raft. There have been times when a customer's come into AFCO Financial Services on, say, a Friday night with a personal problem, so we've kept the office open and closed the loan. 9,000 people will go out of their way because AFCO is me. Well, they have been there for years. We make it a point to process paperwork real quick, get you the money in one day if we can. I guess you could say we have a service attitude. 9,000 people simply want best. Tell them the people when you follow, you like best. If a customer needs some special help or some kind of personal attention, we'll go that extra distance. Our people put you in the best company because AFCO is me. Well, I've even been known to make house calls. Because AFCO. Scott Chamberlain, Stone Mountain, Georgia. Is me. The AFCO people in your town put you in the best company. Look in the phone book for the office nearest you. <laughs> Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of The Whale Savers. 
Captain Sutherland had Smithy post a 24-hour watch in case the Demas attempted a clandestine departure during the night. For all the sleep I got that night, I could have stood the watch myself. So she found me smoking a cigarette in the corridor outside my cabin. Can't sleep, Mark? Do I look tired? No, I guess you don't. Hey, wait a minute. Let's run up the truce flag one more time. You just called me Mark. What happened to that Mr. Grogan jazz? I decided Mr. Grogan was too formal to call any man willing to risk his life to save whales, regardless of personal motives. I told you all along that I've been after a good feature story. You did? And I kept my distance from you because I wanted you to discover the real story of the year was the whales, not me. I'm still hoping you give me an interview. We could talk now, in your cabin. You see, Mark, my work aboard the Requiem put new purpose in my life. But I wouldn't be honest if I said I didn't occasionally miss the excitement of the social life I led in New York. The fishbowl attention from the media I don't miss. Does this reporter still bother you? I like this reporter. Well... Put a point up on the board for me. Soshi, we've been doing a lot of talking. Of course, you're tired. Maybe I'd better leave. No, 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 no. I I was just thinking. About what? About how nice it would be to kiss you. Oh. Then I will leave. Oh, I wish this cabin had a carpet. I need something to crawl under. Why? It was a nice thought. Yeah, sure. I just got carried away. I... I don't know what made me think you like me. I, I mean, how does it look? I use an interview to make a pass at you. You weren't being unprofessional because you picked up on my feelings for you. Now I'm really confused. You don't want me to kiss you, but you're glad I made a pass at you. I, is that it? No. What I'm saying is that under different circumstances, I'm not so sure I would refuse. Mark... Tonight's the first time since we met that I see something in you I like. You've changed somehow. Well, before I was only interested in making a name for myself. Now I'm concerned about saving whales. I think that's great. What we need is time to get to know one another. Like maybe on a date when we get back to England, huh? Yes, I'd like that. And in the meantime, we're just a couple of amiable shipmates aboard the Requiem. That's the way I'd like our relationship to be for now, okay? Okay. Okay. Good night, Soshi. If Soshi had hoped our conversation would help take my mind off the Demas, she succeeded. I spent the rest of the night thinking about her. Captain, this bounce back on the sonar screen shows what looks like a small group of whales... Two or three at most. Uh, could be whales or flows from a stray iceberg. Yeah, we have entered iceberg waters. Uh, whatever it is, the Demas must be picking it up, too. See how the bounce-back pattern varies a bit? I think we found whales. Mm. Oh, Mark, you're just in time. So she thinks she has a bounce-back on the sonar indicating whales nearby. Smithy has our raft ready. It is a whale bounce-back. The Demas is headed for the bounce-back reading. We better shove off, Mark. We have to beat the Demas to those whales. Well, you cannot run the Demas in your motorized draft. My camera's all packed, Captain. You lead. Mark, be careful. Oh, you you take care too, Captain Sutherland. Under Smithy's expert direction, it took the crew only five minutes to get our raft into the water and the captain and me over the side. This outboard's a bit of a puzzle to get started, but... Once she catches, there's no quitting until she runs out of gas. Captain Sutherland, do you read me? Soshi, this is Mark. We read you just fine. Nigel and I will keep in contact over the portable radio from the bridge. Uh, uh, that's the ticket. Soshi, we're off. Good luck to both of you. My camera's viewfinder was welded to my eye as Captain Sutherland steered straight for the Demas. I felt ridiculously small as we sailed alongside the 780-ton catcher boat at 15 knots, like a gnat buzzing the head of a lion. Your steering is too close.
close to the Demas. I'm flaunting our courage. Well, you better ease up, Captain. I'd like to save a little courage for another day. We're fighting a war of wills. Psychology and speed are our only weapons. A harpoon can put a big hole in your psychology. Let's play down the intimidation stuff. Not on your life. I was just about to remind Captain Sutherland that I was already risking my life when we passed the catcher boat's bow. Twelve feet above us, with one hand in the harpoon launcher, stood Captain Papadoulos. The hate etched across his face made a wonderful close-up through my zoom lens. I'm not right there. It's the whale source she spotted on the sonar screen. I see them! Look, a mother and her calf. The calf swimming alongside his mother. Under the IWC's laws, that makes the mother an illegal catch. Ah. IWC laws make no difference to the Demas. Well, what about the calf? Uh, the Demas will spare the calf only because there's no profit in the kill. For over an hour, Captain Sutherland jockeyed our rubber raft into position behind the fleeing whales. But the chase proved too much for the tiring calf, and the Demas closed to 50 yards, killing distance. Why don't the whales sound again? The calf's too tired. It's like asking a four-year-old child to keep pace in an Olympic marathon. Captain, I can see Papa Doulas lining up his harpoon on the mother whale. Huh? Papa Doulas is too close to miss at this range. If the mother doesn't abandon her calf, she'll die. She'll never abandon her calf. Now hold on for sweet life. I'm moving us in as close as possible to the mother. Wreck whale to lifeline. Lifeline, he's back. So she who's back? Over. The great blue. Nigel spotted the great blue whale 3,000 yards off your port bow on a 10 o'clock heading. Yes, I can see him blow now. Uh, the Demas has abandoned him, the mother and her calf for the great blue. Mark, Nigel's following the blue through his binoculars. He says the great blue just sounded. That was the first of 12 soundings. For five hours, the freezing salt water stung our faces as we blocked the Demas's path to the great blue. Captain Papadoulas pursued the great blue whale with fanatical determination. It proved to be the mistake of his life. The great blue can't shake the Demas. He's tried every trick he knows. Uh, Papadoulas is too experienced a whaler for the blue to evade him. Now prepare yourself, Mark. The blue's blowing again. I'm already drenched from the last half dozen blows. Captain, the Demas is turning. Which way? To starboard. We have to beat Papadoulas into position. Yeah, I'll give it my best. The Demas is gaining on us. Yeah, it's a good job of sailing, Mr. Wim. Papadoulas shaved ten yards off us on that last turn. Well, the Blues picked a hell of a time to slow his pace. What's wrong with him? He's been swimming full tilt for five hours. Even a creature his size gets tired. How close will Papadoulas bring the Demas before he fires? Fifty yards. Papadoulas will want a percentage shot. And the Demas is about 80 yards in closing. Yeah. We've got to help the blue hold Papadoulas off until dark. He could slip away in the night. Yeah, the night won't stop the Demas. Harpoon! Get your head down! Dear God! The blue whale's thrashing! You said Papadoulas wouldn't fire over 50 yards! Uh, that Papadoulas is a damned lucky shot. The water's turned crimson around the blue. <sighs> All we can do now is return to the Requiem. We were ten feet behind the blue when Papadoulas fired. It was a perfect shot. No, not perfect. See where the harpoon entered the blue? Behind the flipper. A bad spot for any whaler. This won't be a fast or an easy kill for the Demas. When we returned to the Requiem, so she met the captain and me with warm blankets and tears in her eyes. The great blue will die now, won't he, Captain? Ah, uh, Sosia, you know whalers seldom lose a harpoon whale. Here, yeah, wrap yourself in these blankets. You two are chilled to the bone. Uh, thank you, Smithy. We, we did everything we could. We really did. Uh, Papa Doulas landed a very lucky shot. I know. Captain, Nigel would like to speak with you in the radio room. There's hot coffee waiting there, too. Uh. See here on the sonar screen, Captain. Only five kilometers due south. Yeah, that's a frightfully large iceberg. Yeah, I'd prefer to avoid it. So are the Demas. I'll bet the sweetest draft of ale in Liverpool on that one. Due south is the very direction the Great Blue drags the Demas. The Great Blue is dragging the Demas now? 
Yes, at eight knots, even with the Demas engines in full reverse. How's it possible for a harpoon whale to drag three times its own weight? Well, whales display phenomenal strength when they're harpooned. And this blur is a phenomenal whale. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll be entering the iceberg area ourselves shortly. I'll have one of the crew establish an iceberg watch on the bow. Look at that sonar screen. The great blue just dragged the Demas into the iceberg area. <laughs> Another iceberg dead ahead, Captain. Oh, uh, the course change I just made should take us around this one. The Demas has managed to evade every iceberg in its path the way we have. So far, that is. I imagine the sonar operator aboard the Demas is an extremely disturbed man than all. Did you hear that? I heard it. Could be two icebergs colliding nearby. No, no, I watched it on the sonar screen. The Demas has struck an iceberg. The Great Blue did it! <laughs> It's as if the Great Blue had planned to drag the Demas into the iceberg area. Oh, no, no. I rather doubt that, Mark. But, Nigel, the Great Blue maintained a due south course throughout the entire hunt until he reached the iceberg area. Then, and only then, did the Great Blue constantly change direction. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th this is true. But then who would This believe... is Whaling Ship Demos. Mayday! Repeat, Mayday! It's Papa Dulles. When the Grey Blue won his battle, I forgot about the lives of the men aboard the Demas. We are attacking on water. Come in, Requiem. Smithy, get to the bridge. Put us on the Demas heading. Ah, oh, Captain. Mayday! Mayday! Come in, Requiem! I'll man the radio, Saucy. Captain Papadoulos, this is Captain Sutherland. We are maneuvering to answer your Mayday now. Repeat. The Requiem has begun immediate rescue operation. Thank you, Captain Sutherland. For a moment I feared your ship saved only whales, not whalers. My crew is not above saving human lives, Captain. Even the lives of pirate whalers. With bitterness, I thank you. The conclusion of our story after these words. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. At the store, they told me there's a powerful anti-itch drug I can buy without a doctor's prescription. Now, I use Bicozine Cream as directed. No more burning, embarrassing itching. No more scratching. Bicozine actually speeds healing. Bicozine Cream. What a relief. For constipation, remember X-Lax Pills, the overnight wonder. X-Lax Pills, the overnight wonder. X-Lax Pills, for occasional use only as directed. Captain, what are the odds that the Great Blue's still alive? I shouldn't imagine his chances are very good. Not with a harpoon in his side. But it is possible he'll survive. What do you think, Nigel? Whales suffer from pneumonia and tumors. Skin and teeth infections, even kidney stones. They suffer, adjust, and survive, Mark. I would not be surprised to hear someday of the sighting of a great blue whale with a harpoon in its side. No corroboration of the Requiem sighting of the great blue whale was ever made. Marine biologists who studied Mark Grogan's detailed photographs drew one conclusion... The harpooning of the great blue whale resulted in its death from loss of blood and from shock. They lamented the lost opportunity to study the largest animal that ever lived. And for a time, the story of the great blue whale's revenge captured the world's imagination. The International Whaling Commission once again opened serious debate on a 10-year whaling moratorium to rebuild the populations of all species, not just those in danger of extinction. But even at the height of this media attention, there remained those uninterested observers with a single question foremost in their minds. Why should I care whether the whales live or die? 
Possibly the best answer to this question was offered 100 years ago by an American named Henry David Thoreau when he said, I wish to know an entire heaven and an entire earth. This inherent right of mankind is the legacy which the whale savers work to pass on to future generations. Listen, if you're an investor who's tired of being too late, too late when investments are heading up, too late when they're heading down, listen. Barron's is the National Business and Financial Weekly published by Dow Jones. Every week, Barron's gives its readers more useful investment information than any other publication anywhere. Days, weeks, even months ahead. Every week, 34 pages of market statistics, in-depth studies of individual companies, exclusive analyses of companies and industries covering the whole world of investing, and more. Every week, all you need to know not to be too late. Every week in Barron's. And listen, if you phone 800-228-5000. You can get a year's subscription to Barron's for just $43. Phone right now and you'll also get free an informative booklet called Understanding Technical Forecasting that shows you how to use Barron's the way the professional investors use it. A year of Barron's plus a revealing and useful booklet for only $43. Phone 800-228-5000 toll free. Now, before it's too late. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Whale Savers, was written by Bruce Martin and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Tommy Cook, Joan McCall, and Drew Boardman. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear, Richard Peel, and Larry Moss. The music for radio theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Vincent Price. One contracts for a house to be built, for grain to be shipped, for an airplane to be constructed, and so on. And one can also contract to take another person's life. Listen to this. Yeah, I can hire somebody to bump off Kirkwood, but it'll cost you some dough. How much? Oh, like five or ten thousand bucks. Well, which is it, Bayard? Five or ten? You make it sound like a dime store. How much is it going to cost? Look, Mr. Ashland, I won't know for sure until I contact the hitman. You know one? Sure. His name's Cannon. Cannon? <laughs> Good name for a trigger man, eh? Cannon. Milford Cannon. You sure you want me to contact him? I want Kirkwood dead. Enough to pay for it? Enough. Has this Cannon done jobs for you before? No. How do you know he's any good? He's good. He won't go to the law. He won't even know who's hiring him. It's important my name be kept out of it. You'll never be mentioned. Well, how do I pay him? Half when he's hired, half when Kirkwood is eliminated. Well, go ahead, Bayard. Let me know how much Cannon wants for the job. Five or ten. I'll sign a contract. And that's just the beginning of our story. <laughs>
Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Contractor, by Ted Sherdeman. Our stars, Shepard Menken and Sidney Swire. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. For the National Association of Realtors, this is Greg Morris with On the Home Front. Selling your home calls for many important decisions. What's a fair asking price? What's the best way to attract buyers? How much fixing up should you do? Faced with questions like these, you can easily forget some little thing, like keeping the yard clean and the closets uncluttered. But these are important also. By presenting a neat, clean house in good repair, you show your house has been cared for, that it's worth buying. Remember, the decision to buy a new home is made with both the head and the heart. And the more presentable your home is, the easier it'll be for the buyer to fall in love with. For more tips, talk to a Realtor. Realtors support equal opportunity in housing. They know your market and want to help you sell your home quickly and easily. Realtors are members of the National Association of Realtors, working for America's property owners. Milford Cannon lived in a small apartment in a neighborhood that was aggressively middle class. He was an avid gun collector and coincidentally made his living as a contractor. He let it be known to the various town mobs that he was a hit man available for hire. He didn't think of the five men he'd killed already. <laughs> he thought of the first, but less of the second, and not at all of the third through the fifth. When you get used to something, you, you don't think of it much. And Cannon was used to doing what he did. So when the phone rang, he wasn't surprised by what he heard. Hello. Cannon? Who wants to know? This is Hartley Bayard. Is that you, Cannon? Uh, just a minute, I'll get him for you. Uh, you the guy that works for Ashland? I got a job for you. You want it or not? Yeah. How's the pay? Uh, 3500 Ah, oh, that was last year. Prices are up on everything. Like how much? Well, kind of depends on what you want me to do. It's a contract. Huh? On who? First, what's your price? Oh, four, maybe five grand. Well, which is it? Four or five? Four? Two down, two when the job's done. Okay, okay. Uh, who? Guy named Kirkwood. Kirkwood, Kirkwood. Never heard of him. Don't matter. Is it a deal? Yeah, okay. Where do I find him? Kirkwood spends a good deal of time at the athletic club. Kirkwood, athletic club. Yeah. Uh, when do I get the first payment? Tomorrow morning. Where shall we meet? The refreshment stand at Smyrna Park. Smyrna Park? Yeah. I'll have the money for you then. <laughs> He's all set, Mr. Ashland. How much does Cannon want to do the job, Baird? Ten grand. Five down, five when the job's done. <laughs> Kirkwood. Getting rid of him is worth it. I'm to deliver the five to Cannon tomorrow morning. And when am I going to be rid of Kirkwood? By tomorrow night or the next day, Mr. Ashland. The sooner the better. The, uh, five G's, Mr. Ashland. Oh. Yeah. Here. Hey, you don't have to count it, Baird. It's all there. <laughs> This must be the refreshment stand he mentioned. It's the only stand in Smyrna Park. And it's not open. Fine thing. Hitman doesn't show up. Of course, he didn't mention any special time. Just morning is all. Well, it's ten o'clock now, and I haven't seen a soul. I wish the stand was open. I could use a cup of coffee. Hey, wait a minute. Is that him? Is your name Cannon? 
Who wants to know? Hartley Bayard. Cannon. I, uh, I brought the money. Show me. Two grand, you said. It's all there. Uh, I don't count too fast. Finished now? Uh, th- this is only a down payment, you know. I know. Two now, two when the job's done. Hmm. Uh, this Kirkwood guy, uh, he's in the DA's office. That's right. And if the newspapers are right, he might put your boss away for a long time. Your only interest is getting rid of Kirkwood. Well, if I'd have known for sure you worked for Ashland, my fee would have been double. You agreed to take a contract on Kirkwood for 4000 Now, look, I don't go back on my word, Bayard. Okay. As I told you, you can find Kirkwood at the athletic club. He likes to play squash. That's no place to waste a guy. On a squash court? I don't care where you do it. I only told you where you can see the target. Okay. When? When what? When are you going to do it? Oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. I don't know. I got to tell my boss when. It'll be in a day or two. I told my boss you'd deliver soon. Well, just have the other two grand waiting for me, okay? Right here. As for your boss, he can read about it in the paper when it happens. So I can read about it in the papers when it happens. Cannon said he'd do it in a day or two. By that time, the whole world will know I'm guilty. I tried to pin him down, Mr. Ashland. You tried. You struck out. He said maybe it'd be today or tomorrow. Well, it better be. I want Kirkwood out of the picture now. If you don't know a good hip man, I'll find somebody who does. Look, Mr. Ashland, these things take time. Yeah, meanwhile, Kirkwood is painting me into a corner I can't get out of. Nobody can get me out of it. The judge will declare it a mistrial when Kirkwood fails to show up. If Kirkwood fails to show up. Cannon, don't miss Mr. Ashland. Not on his contracts. Hmm, two thousand bucks. Well, it's time you got to the supermarket, Milford. It's time to stock up on everything, including ammo. I better decide first what I'm going to use. He said the athletic club. Kirkwood likes to play squash. (laughs) Maybe I should stop there first and see what the target looks like. Then I can stop at the supermarket on the way back. (laughs) Hmm, yeah, that's what I'll do. Uh, is that Mr. Kirkwood there? Uh, no, he won't get here until after court is out. Uh, when's that? About three or four. Yeah. You okay if I watch till he shows up? Oh, sure. A hey, nice play there. <laughs> hey, you really chewed him up there. No, why not? He's a gangster. We got the dope on him. He's got a dope on him. <laughs> okay, okay, it's you, sir. Well, that's Mr. Kirkwood there. <laughs> Yeah, which one? Don't you know him? Uh, no, no, not by sight, no. Oh, there, the white, white-haired man. That old codger? Uh, he may have white hair, but he's spry as a 20-year-old. Hey, good shot. <laughs> the other one, who's he? A pigeon Kirkwood challenge from the looks of it. Hey, he's good. Kirkwood, one of the best. A loser buys one. Well, I've seen all I need to see. Oh, you're going? Oh, yeah, yeah. I got to get to the supermarket. No. If you use a long-lasting nasal spray, you ought to check the package. If it has a big 12 on it, you're getting the longest-lasting relief you can get. You're using Duration Nasal Spray. Duration is different because Duration has the longest-lasting nasal decongestant. So Duration gives you up to 12 hours of relief. That's up to 2 to 4 hours longer relief than most other long-lasting nasal sprays. Look for the nasal spray with the big 12 on it. Duration. The proof is on the package. The package with the big 12 on it. For occasional use only is directed. Forty love smashing. How she plays? No, how she looks. In action-proof eye makeup from Maybelline. Like ultra-big, ultra-lash mascara. Smear-proof, smudge-proof, waterproof. So long, longest-looking lashes stay in the thick of the action. Game, set, and match. Action-proof. Keeps you looking good after the action, too. Ultra-big, ultra-lash mascara. Incredibly long-looking lashes without flaky fibers. From Maybelline. Smashing. (laughs) 
Milford Cannon, hit man, has seen his target, a white-haired man named Kirkwood, who is a demon at playing squash. But now, with $2,000 in his pocket, Cannon is en route to the neighborhood supermarket to stock up. On the way, he reviews what gun he will select to fulfill his contract. He settles on a 357 Magnum he's been wanting to use ever since he bought it. He wonders whether he should make his victim squirm a little before delivering the lethal shot or just finish him off clean and easy. He decides the best course is the latter. A guy like Kirkwood won't squirm much, so it's better to finish him off clean and easy. There's less chance of being caught that way, too. He puts the contract out of his mind as he fills the shopping cart in the supermarket. He buys more than he intended because he finds himself following a lady with beautiful legs. She's a bit fat in the hips, but she has legs that won't quit and a face that's really beautiful. Cannon follows her all the way to the check stand and then finds another shopper has squeezed in behind her. So he has to take a different check stand. That'll be $44.33. <laughs> I can remember when the bill was about 20 bucks. <laughs> so can I. Well, here's your change. $5.67. Uh, thanks. You lose something, sir? No, no, no. no. Just looking around. Uh, you know that lady? Which lady? At the next check stand. Um, no. Hmm. Well, night. Night, sir. Oh! 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 oh, oh no! Oh. Look what you made me do. Uh, 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 I, I, I'm sorry. Oh! Oh, the milk! It's going all over the place. Oh! Why don't you watch where you're going? Oh, I'll, I'll help you. You've already done enough. Oh! Pumping into me like that, uh, making me drop a sack. Uh, look, pl look, please let me help you, will the you? The milk, it's running into everything. Well, you know the old saying. What old saying? No use crying over spilled milk. <laughs> Very funny. It's not your milk. <laughs> look, uh, I'm... Oh, uh, this is very hard for me, but uh, let me make this up to you, huh? How do you make up for what you've done? Well... You could have dinner with me. Dinner with you? Yeah, I'm a good cook. Uh, a chef, almost. Uh, look, look I, I, I'd be pleased to prepare dinner for you, huh? Are you trying to pick me up? Well, uh, no. I saw you eyeing me at the check stand. Well, yeah, I, I, uh, I was just trying to avoid bumping carts, that's all. You were eyeing me. Well... Frankly, I was, yes. And you bumped into me on purpose? No, no, that, that, that was an accident. Honest. Did you mean it? Mean what? About inviting me for dinner. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, I did, I did. At your place? Well, we can go somewhere else if you'd like. Let's go to your place. Oh, I think it's a terrific meal. On one condition. What's that? Only dinner. After you, madam. This is where you live? Yep, yep. Welcome to my abode, or flat, or whatever you call it. I'd call it a junk heap. What'd you say? Nothing. I guess you live here alone? <laughs> you guessed right. Make yourself at home while I fix dinner. You know, we don't even know each other's name. Oh, uh, I'm Milford Cannon. I'm Roxana Ellesmere. Uh -huh. At least that was my married name, Ellesmere. Oh, uh, you're a widow? No, I'm a divorcee. Dirty clothes, magazines all over the place. You've been living alone too long, Milford. Yeah. Uh, just throw them any old place, eh? Roxana. Wow. What a beautiful name. Thank you. I know. 
I'll clean up this place while you fix dinner. Oh, that, 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 that's not necessary. Come oh, yes, on. it is. I'll clean while you cook. Well, that wasn't part of the deal, Roxana. It is if I want to sit down. I'm fixing veal piccata, Roxana. That's nice, Milford. That's veal with lemon slices. I know. I haven't had it for years. And potato au gratin and snap beans, okay? Sounds wonderful. <laughs> I have the salad plates in the fridge so they'll get nice and cold. What kind of salad, Milford? Oh, just sliced tomatoes on lettuce leaves. But I have a wonderful Japanese dressing made of rice vinegar and sake to pour on. There. I'm through. It smells delicious what you're doing. Where did you learn to cook? Uh, from books. Yeah, uh, living alone and all, you know. Well, I had to do something. I suppose so. Well, what do you think, Milford? About what? Should I use my married name, Ellesmere? I was married to a real drip. Oh, yeah? For how long? Less than a year. It was the pits. What I want to know is, should I use Ellesmere or my own name before I became a bride? Well, that's it's up to you, you know. What was your name before? Kirkwood. <laughs> oh, you dropped a plate. Here, let me clean it up. Uh, 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 uh what did you say? I said I'd clean it up. Uh, is, is there a dustpan and a broom in this place? Y yeah. Here. I... I meant, uh, uh, what name, what, what name did you say? Oh, uh, Kirkwood. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, I thought that's what you said. I moved in with my folks right after the divorce. Should I use Ellesmere or Kirkwood? <gasps> you dropped another plate! It's really delicious, Milford. Thanks, Roxana. Oh, <laughs> oh, what a beautiful name. Thanks. You're not eating much. Well, that's the way it is with cooks, you know. Ha! You've never seen a really thin chef, have you? Well, some of them are, you know. You didn't answer me yet. About what? About whether I should change my name back to Kirkwood or keep on using Ellesmere. Well, you know, that, that depends. On what? Well... What does your father do? Oh, he's a lawyer with the DA's office mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Maybe the last honest lawyer you'll ever meet. Oh, boy. Why should I meet him? You never know when you'll need a good lawyer and an honest one. These tomatoes with that dressing are really delicious. Thank you. Everything is delicious. <laughs> Thank you again. What do you do for a living? What? What? You just don't sit around reading those magazines about guns. Oh. Maybe that's the reason. Uh, 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 the, the reason for what? Why you have so many. I was busy cleaning up and I put your shirts from the laundry in one of the drawers. I had to open a few drawers and they were filled with guns. Yeah. <laughs> why so many? Well, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm a hunter. With a handgun? Well, why not? <laughs> you mean you hunt and shoot animals? Uh, yep. <laughs> with handguns? Well, you know... I, I carry a handgun to protect myself from, uh, uh, well, d d snakes <laughs> and things like that, you know. But I counted at least eight of them, and I saw no rifle. Oh, well, uh, yeah, well, yeah, my hunting rifle's at the gunsmith's right now. It's, it's getting fixed, see? Mm, that must be the reason. Yeah. Uh, reason for what? You are a classic victim. Victim? Of what? Of the ads in all those magazines. You are an advertising writer's dream. You buy whatever the ad is selling. Oh, well, maybe so. But only if it's guns or ammunition. Right. That's the reason. Aren't you going to answer your phone? Oh, it'll stop ringing eventually. <laughs> you could stop it from ringing by answering it. Oh. Oh, well. All right. Hello. Cannon? Who wants to know? I know it's you. What are you doing sitting around home? Who wants to know? My boss wants to know when you're filling that contract on Kirkwood. Why is he so anxious? Come on, Cannon. He's got two G's invested, 
It'll pay another two when you deliver. Like I said, he can read about it in the paper. So, I, uh, I answered the phone, Roxana. Yep. I, uh, I'd like to meet your father. You would? Honest? Honest. Was that what that phone call was all about? I mean, are you mixed up in a... Do you have a case for my father? Do you need a good lawyer? No, I... I, I don't think so, no. That heel I was married to, he never once met my father. And here on our first time together, you asked to meet him. That does it. Does what? I'm not going to use that creep's lousy name anymore. I'm changing it back to Kirkwood. What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permaprest, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. There's no other deodorant soap more effective than Dial. You get that clean, fresh, confident feeling all day long with Dial. How would you plan that clean, fresh, confident feeling all day long with Dial? How would you plan? You'll be glad Dial's active deodorant ingredient keeps working all day long. That clean, fresh, confident feeling all day long with Dial. Milford Cannon is romantically smitten by the daughter of the man he's contracted to kill. What is he to do? Cannon tries to reason... Roxana Kirkwood will get over the death of her father in time, or will she? And what of Cannon? Will he ever be able to look at her glorious face again, knowing that he wasted her father? And he's already been paid 2000 as a down payment for the job. Not only that, but he must purchase a rifle right away to make good on his story of hunting game. But he's never hunted a wild animal in his life. In spite of his gloomy thoughts, Milford Cannon, being a creature of habit, sits in his car across from the athletic club. He sees the white-haired target come out and start to go to his car. Cannon has the three fifty seven Magnum out of its shoulder holster, and he aims the gun at Kirkwood's back. What the... I never did that before. Hello. You filled your contract yet, Cannon? Who's this, Bayard? Who are you expecting? Well, <laughs> a funny thing happened. I'm listening. Well, I, uh, I had a little bad luck. Like what? <laughs> Uh, I was sitting in my car across from the athletic club, and the target showed up, as I expected, and, uh, well, I forgot to load the piece. You what? You look, it could happen to anybody, Bayard. You forgot to... Oh, boy, I've heard everything. So I forgot. It was a new rod, and I... Look, Cannon, you got two grand already. I know all about that, and another two, and the job is done. I'll do it. Maybe tonight. You will if you want that fourth thou. My boss doesn't take kindly to people who welch on him. Who's welching? It was an accident. Which you'll meet with if you don't deliver. Goodbye, Cannon. What's that supposed to mean? Bayard? Bayard! Hey, he couldn't have had time to call back. Hello? Milford? Oh, it's Roxana. I've got something to tell you. You'll be at the apartment for a while? Why? I'll be right over. Th th then, I, then I, I'll wait for as long as it takes. I'm leaving now. This is important. Roxana? Roxana? And to think, if I'd have been talking to that creep Bayard, all my Roxana would have gotten is a busy signal. <sighs> I love that name. <laughs> Roxana. <laughs> Oh, 
is that? Roxana. Ah, my one and only. It's too important to talk about on the phone. What? That's why I had to see you. I'm glad. Do you know what my father found out? No. It was during the trial this morning. An assistant found out, or investigator or somebody. You ready for this? For what? Ashland has put out a contract on my father's life. Oh, come again? I said that Ashland is... Oh, I, I, I heard you. And he refuses to worry about it. Who? My father. Oh. The man who's behind it has already paid $5,000 to some hitman with another five after that, when the job's done. Uh, 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 come again with those figures. Five down, and five when my father no, is dead. No, it's two down, and two more when your father's dead. No, five and five... And... How do you know? Oh, well... <laughs> I'm just guessing... <laughs> Uh, I was never much good at math, you oh, see. My father isn't the least bit worried. Uh, do, uh, does he know who the guy is? What guy? The hitman. No, the investigator didn't know that, but he knew Ashland had contracted for my father's life. Yeah, and how much he'd pay? Five and five, not two and two. Well, how'd he find out? I don't know. I have a favor to ask of you, Milford. Oh, anything, Roxana. It's not a very big one because you've got lots of them. Yeah, but lo lots of what? Guns. Oh. The favor is, I want you to protect my father. You want me to protect... You've got handguns, and you know how to use them, well, don't you? Yeah, yeah I, I know how, but... I, it's it... very simple, really. Until this blows over and the police catch the hit man, you protect my father. Now, how... What, it... <laughs> uh, uh, come, you, you're not serious, are you? All you'd have to do is stay on the front porch of the house... Please, Milford. For me? Hey. You are serious. Oh, my. Oh, it's, it's hard to believe. What a stupid bunch... Yeah. Yeah, I'll see you in court tomorrow morning. Yeah, bye-bye. You know what my lawyer just told me. Well, how would I know? That lousy Kirkwood. How does he do it? How does he do what? My lawyer just told me the DA's office, the police, and Kirkwood know I got a contract out on him. No. And what I paid to have Kirkwood wasted. What? What you paid? They know everything but the trigger man's name. The 5000 down payment, the five grand when a job is done, everything. How did they find out? A good question, Bayard. How did they? Well, now, Mr. Ashland, you don't think I... I... Hey, 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 put away that gun. Who'd you go to first, Bayard? The DA's office or the police? I went to neither one. I, I didn't. Why should I? Yeah. Why should you? If it had been me, I'd have given them the name of their hitman, too, wouldn't I? Why didn't you, Bayard? I had nothing to do with them finding out. Honest. <sighs> Funny thing. But I believe you. <sighs> You know, I, I've always told you the truth, Mr. Ashland, about everything. I came down from my room to say good night, Milford. Ah, oh, you look beautiful, Roxana. Because I feel secure. You've got a gun? Yeah, right here in its shoulder holster. I feel real secure now. You on the porch here guarding my father inside? Well, you know, it's not exactly necessary. The joint is crawling with cops. That's not the point. I know they're inside and outside the house. But your being here on the front porch, well, it comforts me. I know you'll keep him safe. Yeah, well, what makes you so sure, Roxana? Because I know you love me and want me to be happy. Oh, yeah, I sure do. But what if the gorilla, the, the trigger man, gets to Kirkwood... Uh, to your father, in spite of everything, he, he might, you know. I'd still have you to love. Good night, Roxana. Good night, Bill. Love your name, Roxana. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I went inside and dusted off Kirkwood, I'd be a cinch to get caught with so many cops around. Oh, boy, then I'd fry for sure. And how about that Bayard who paid me only 2000 instead of the five he got... That means he's already made three thou on cash that he was supposed to pay me. And hey, maybe I'm hitting the wrong guy. Uh-oh. Who's this coming? Put up the gun. I'm a detective. Oh, yeah? How do I know? My name's Kenton. My wallet's in my hip pocket. Well, don't reach for it or you're dead. 
Then how do I prove who and what I am? Turn around real slow and keep your hands high. Yeah. Okay. I got the wallet. Yeah. Hey, you are a cop, and your name is Ken. I said I was. Well, I had to make sure, didn't I? Can I put my hands down now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's all right with me. You can put your gun away now. Oh, yeah, sure. Hey, uh, here's your wallet. Yeah, thanks. That's a fancy shoulder holster. Hey, thank you. And a mighty fancy handgun. 357? 357 Magnum. Uh, what are you doing here? The same as you, keeping an eye out for Mr. Kirkwood. At his request? No, no, no. Uh, Roxana's. Who? Roxana. Uh, she's his daughter. Oh, uh, moonlight now. Huh? What? Extra job, huh? From what? From your regular employment. You were a security guard? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I am now. Well, where'd you work? Hey, what is this, the third degree? You got a license to carry that gun? Well, what, what, what's that got to do with it? Answer the question. Well, sure. Show me. Well, I, I don't carry it on me. Where is it? it it's ho home. Home, that's where it is. Where do you live? Look, look, I, I don't know what you're doing. Relieving you of that gun. Now we'll go to your home and you'll show me the license you got to carry a concealed weapon or my gun's apt to go off. If you've been reading about wise money management in your favorite publications, you've undoubtedly heard about Dreyfus Liquid Assets, one of the world's largest money market funds, and about the big yields you can get on your money right now. Start with as little as $2,500. Make added investments as low as $100. With Dreyfus Liquid Assets, your money is yours whenever you need it. Phone for it or write a check for cash or to pay your larger bills. You keep right on earning that high yield compounded daily until your check clears. No penalties on interest, no sales charge, no charge charge for the checks. It's so simple, sensible, convenient. But find out for yourself. Call toll-free day or night 800-228-5454 for free information and a prospectus including management fee, charges, and expenses. Read the prospectus carefully before investing or sending money. Discover how Dreyfus Liquid Assets can help you get the lion's share of today's high money market rates. 800-228-5454, toll-free. 800-228-5454. Call now. Vincent Price again, and here's the fourth act of The Contractor. I've been thinking. About Kirkwood, no doubt. Yeah, Kirkwood. And that hitman, Cannon, that we hired to erase him. I've been thinking it'd be foolish if anything happened to Kirkwood now. What? Well, Kirkwood knows he's a marked man. How much was paid for the job on him? Call it off. Call it off? You heard me, Bayard. But what if Cannon's already done it? That's not likely or we'd have heard about it. Call it off. You're out some dough already. So I lost 5,000 bucks before. This way I'm saving five Gs. Oh, I don't know. I, I said call Kirkwood's death off. You get on the phone, contact the hitman, call off the deal. I don't want to risk it now. But the way Kirkwood's been going, you can get 20 years. Yeah, but I won't be tried for murder, which is what it'll be if anything happens to Kirkwood. I'll... I'll try. You do it. Tonight. My apartment's right at the top of the stairs. Mm -hmm. After you. It's locked. I always keep it locked. Yeah, it's good thinking. After you, sir? No, after you. You don't have to keep pointing that gun at me. I was just trying to be polite. Now the license. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, the license. Now, where did I put that thing? Well, I suggest you start with the desk, uh... This is a desk, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's sort of a desk, yes. More a chest of drawers. Well? Oh, well, I'll look for it. Must be here someplace. I'll be glad to help. No, 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 no. I'll find it. It's got to be here someplace. Wrong drawer, huh? Yeah. Let me think. Maybe you haven't got a license. Oh, I've got it all right. I'm just wondering where I put it. Do you have to keep pointing that gun at me all the time? Until you produce the license. Only until then. You see, I don't like to take chances. Well, can't you take my word for it? Nope. Mm. Well, let's try this one. Not there. Uh, you close that drawer awfully fast. Well, there's nothing there, honest. 
Well, what have we here? Now, don't move. There's nothing in there. Only a Smith & Wesson. Let's see. This is an outdoorsman, 38. And what is this? Oh, that's French made. It fires an 8 millimeter shell. <laughs> when you can get them. I see. It's hammerless and has a fold-down trigger. Yeah, yeah. You see, I'm sort of a collector. Yeah, so I see. Yeah, and I do a lot of hunting. Mm -hmm. Where are the rifles? Well, I... Uh, I, I only have one. It's at the gunsmith's. It's being repaired. Mm -hmm. What do you do with all these handguns? Well, I, I carry one when I go hunting uh, with my rifle. I see. You got a copy of your hunting license? No. Do they give you one? As a rule. Well, what do you think of that? You want to look some more or you just want to go down to the station with me? Uh, you want to answer that? Huh? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, if it's all right with you. Uh, then do so. Yeah. Uh, hello? Cannon? Yeah. I tried to get you earlier. Yeah, I was out. My boss has changed his mind. Yeah? Uh, about what? You're not to erase Kirkwood. The deal is off. Got that? You mean it? I do. The contract is off. Uh, what, what about the, uh... uh... Oh, okay. Huh. What do they What do they do to guys who, who carry guns without a license? I I, I mean, who, who can't find their license? Well, if there's a record of you uh, having one, nothing. If no license was ever issued, uh, it's a felony. A felony? Uh, that that means that... Yeah, depending on who you are, you could get a minimum of one year in a state prison. Hello? Roxana? Yes, who's this? Uh, Milford. Oh, where are you? Well, that's sort of hard to explain. You're not on the porch guarding my father. Oh, no, not now. Well, where are you? Roxana, you'll never believe this. Try me. I'm... I'm, I'm at police headquarters. Where? Well, you see, I, I didn't have a license and the law picked me up. I told you the place was crawling with cops. Milford, where are you? At the jailhouse. What did you do? Well, I... I I told you already, I didn't have a license to carry a gun. But I thought... Oh, dear. Roxana? Yes, Milford? I need a lawyer. I'll wake up my father. He'll be right down. And I'll come with him. Um, but one thing, Milford. What? You must tell my father everything. Everything? Everything. He's honest, and he only handles honest clients. <laughs> Well, after I got the job, I, I met your daughter, and, well, I guess I fell in love with her. Oh, Milford. Well, anyway, I was standing guard on your front porch when this flat... Foot... Officer, if you don't mind. Uh, excuse me, sir. This officer came up and asked if I had a license to carry the gun I had. And he didn't have one, sir, and none had been issued. We even went back to his apartment, and I found seven or eight other handguns in a chest of drawers. Just as I did, Milford. Well, I, I told him I used them when I went hunting. That's what you told me. I never hunted wild game or anything, Mr. Kirkwood. I, I, I don't even own a rifle. That figures. Then when Roxana told me about Mr. Ashland paying $5,000 plus another five when you cashed in your chips... Uh, I only got two grand, Mr. Kirkwood. And after Mr. Kirkwood's demise? Another two. I've got about 1,200 left from the first two. You were going to shoot my father? No, I couldn't, Roxana. Not after I fell in love with you. That's why you said two and two when I said five and five. Yeah. The guy named Bayard stood to make more out of the caper than I did. Six to my four. And he was just a messenger boy. Oh, you know, you can't trust anybody anymore. Well, Mr. Kirkwood, looks like we got your hit, man. The conclusion of our story after these words. I work all day, my job is rough. I need a boot that's good and tough. Red Wing Pecos boots are America's favorite pull-ons for work. Hi, Kurt Gowdy to tell you why. It's not just the way they look and wear. It's also the way their special construction forms itself around your foot for the heel-hugging fit you've always wanted. Red Wing Pecos pull-ons, because you've earned your wings. I've earned my wings. I've earned my wings. My Red Wings. <laughs> 
Yes. How many cold tablets do you take a day? Two? More. Four? More. Six? Yeah. A day? Uh-huh. And then more at night? Right. Why? Well, they're new. Take contact. One capsule helps all your congestive symptoms up to 12 hours. All day? And all night while you sleep. That's the wonder of contact. Hey, you're the guys on TV. <laughs> yeah, we're the guys on TV. Take your contact. Take it fast. Give your code to contact. Take only as direct. Very interesting. What is, Mr. Ashland? Well, according to the morning newspaper, your hitman Milford Cannon was picked up by the police. Cannon? A misdemeanor charge has been filed against him. Guess who's defending him? Well, how would I know? Mr. Kirkwood. Did, did Cannon talk? All the paper says is that he was paid $2,000 as a down payment. It, two? But you took five from me. Where's the other three, Baird? Why, he lied. I gave him five. Your face gives you away, Baird. You gave him two. Put up that gun, Mr. Ashland. I wouldn't cheat you. The three grand, Baird. You'll be up for murder if that goes off. The three... I... I... All right. Here's the three grand. You see? I'm counting it out for you. As for being up for murder, it depends on whether they ever find your body. Boys, give me some men overcoat and drop them in the river, will you? Money is key to people's lives, and when you deal with them on that basis, you have to assume a lot of personal responsibility. Nine thousand people rack nine thousand brains, because AFCO is me. We're not just lenders, we're often counselors, and at AFCO Financial Services, we feel that we are more professional. Nine thousand people are all working for the chance to prove that when you borrow, we know more. We feel we have a better quality person in our particular field than any competitor because we train harder. Our people put you in the best company because AFCO is me. I do my homework, I guarantee you. Because AFCO. Ron Wazelcheck, Somerset, Pennsylvania. Is me. The AFCO people in your town put you in the best company. Look in the phone book for the office nearest you. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Contractor, was written by Ted Sherdeman and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Shepard Mencken and Sidney Swire. Featured in the cast were Jack Crucian, Norman Alden, Byron Kane, and Carol Bilger. The music for Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. This is Leonard Nimoy. Our story concerns itself with one man's battle with the greatest monster any of us will ever face in any arena, his conscience. Armando Paz, better known to the aficion of all the countries of the world as El Encanto, was and is Batman. Before becoming El Encanto, the Enchanted One, he was usually called Armando, 
or a variety of other names usually reserved to describe a poverty-stricken stealer of oranges in southern Spain, or someone who loved the art of bullfighting so passionately that he would sneak into forbidden pastures and practice surviving the bull's deadly horns on moonless nights. Before Armando was El Encanto, he was nobody, and he never forgot it. Eje, Eje, Torito Bravo, such great, beautifully formed horns, so well armed by nature that you have only the monsters in this arena to fear. Eje, they force me to kill you. A profound symbol of freedom and strength. In order for them to experience the idea of death, you are real. They are shadows, screams, moans, creatures seeking second-hand reality. The sword sinks into the muscle of your great neck like butter, and your right horn graces my groin as you make the last charge of your life. We are joined now in a warm blur, suspended in time for a second. And I feel the sensation of your horn slashing a pattern into my guts. I live. Your horns die. The screams of the monster that forces us to live on each other's blood is the same. Always the same. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Amando Paz, El Encanto by Odie Hawkins. Our stars, Larry Moss, Tommy Cook, and Jack Crucian. Listen, if you're an investor who's tired of being too late, too late when investments are heading up, too late when they're heading down. Listen, Barron's is the national business and financial weekly published by Dow Jones. Every week, Barron's gives its readers more useful investment information than any other publication anywhere. Days, weeks, even months ahead. Every week, 34 pages of market statistics, in-depth studies of individual companies, exclusive analyses of companies and industries covering the whole world of investing, and more. Every week, all you need to know not to be too late. Every week in Barron's. And listen, if you phone eight. 228 you can get a year's subscription to Barron's for just $43. Phone right now, and you'll also get free an informative booklet called Understanding Technical Forecasting that shows you how to use Barron's the way the professional investors use it. A year of Barron's plus a revealing and useful booklet for only $43. Phone 800-228-5000 toll-free. Now, before it's too late. <laughs> Life is not always easy. No one can dispute that. But how many of us face death each time we go to work? Armando Paz, El Encanto, carved his noble name onto the hearts of the bullfight public today. Fighting three magnificent cathedrales from the ranch of Don Julio Belmonte, he offered an incredible display of cape work. Those critics who have accused El Encanto of being stingy with his cape work in the past would not have been able to make that complaint today. He expressed himself superbly in the opening movement by executing those statuesque passes that have justly earned him the nickname El Encanto. His movement from beginning to end was a logical interwoven pattern that could only be called extravagant, but refined and above all Turn terribly that elegant. Idiot off. He is... Armando, what is wrong? Don't you enjoy hearing about yourself anymore? I never did. Uh, but that isn't something I've been able to make you understand. Oh. According to you, I have never been able to understand a tremendous number of things. Oh, please, Mira, let's not argue. Come, come on, sit down over here beside me. I, I'm tired of fighting. Why are you so irritable these days? I wasn't aware that I was behaving any differently but than... But you are. You used to be so, so relaxed, so at ease with life. I remember thinking when I first met you, he said, 
possible that this man kills bulls for a living? How long has it been, Mira? Three years? Uh, three years is a long time to be El Encanto. But it is a choice you made in life. Why do you take it out on me? I'm not taking anything out on you. But you are. You bring these depressing moods into our relationship. It, it unnerves me. It makes me feel that... That I am not doing something right. That, that I'm failing you in some way. Who could know that better than you? Why do you make these sly remarks, Armando? Have I not created a beautiful lifestyle for us? Have I not made your life pleasant? Do you think that surrounding yourself, surrounding us with, with, with all, of these, all of these things, that, that, that some kind of happiness will automatically occur? <laughs> I mean, sometimes I think I was <laughs> happier when I had to steal oranges for a meal. Armando, what do you want? I don't understand. The more you have, the less satisfied you become. What the hell do you want? I want you, Mira. Amongst other things. What do you have, me, Armando? Uh, that's not what I mean. Ah, so we are back to this again. <laughs> Is that the way you think about it? Armando, I have told you a thousand times I am yours But I must reserve the privilege to be my own person Why must you feel that the people around you should belong to you, body and soul? That sounds like an odd question for someone to ask Who surrendered her so-called freedom for a half million pesetas <laughs> Are you a great one to talk? Think of how much of yourself you surrendered this afternoon for money. Think about how it feels like. E even the possibility of being gored in the thigh, in the stomach, the armpit, maybe the for eye. For money. No, not for money, Mira. I go to the balls because I am cold. I am forced. I don't understand when you say things like this. You are called to fight the bulls? I don't know if it would be possible to explain what that means to, to, to someone who, who only thinks in terms of supply and demand. Armando, for once, just for once, rather than trying to talk over my head, why don't you try to explain? Perhaps I can understand. You really want me to try to explain, huh? See, si, I'm very curious. All right, I'll try. But first, we must place ourselves outside of this petty conversation. I never engage myself in petty conversations. You asked me to explain something to you. If you want that explanation, you must be patient and listen to it. Hi. <sighs> See. Si. Go on. Good. I must explain to you what I know. What I feel in, in my own words. Because I, I haven't read the words of the people who write about my art. As a man, I am nothing. Nada. I am like other men, but, but as a creature who confronts death in the shape of a bull many times each season, I am El Encanto. I do not quite understand. I told you you wouldn't understand. But I did not say for you to stop. Should I go on then? See, of course go on. I, I am a sacrifice, you see, to, to a spirit in our world that is, that is older than religion. It is older than my Uncle Juan. <laughs> is there such a thing? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did not mean... I understand, Mira. I, I, I understand. Pour us some more wine. I see. There. Our best Jerez. Now, please, go on. Now, I say that I am a sacrifice to a spirit older than religion. Now, this is true. The spirit is fear. And I am used by the aficion, by the public, to, to overcome something that they do not want to confront. Death. I am the, the, the woman who... You are the what? <laughs> I, I, I know it sounds incredible, but, but, but in a way, symbolically... I am the, the woman in the pretty clothes, flirting with a supreme symbol of manhood, using the capote and muleta as fans. And yet, every man in the arena identifies himself with me. 
I wish Jose Flores could hear you now. Jose knows this already. It is what makes his afición so great. Ah, I see, see. I, I can understand all of this. I can understand all of what you say. Except for the part where you say you are forced to fight the bulls. But it is true. It is my calling. If I did not do it, someone else would have to do it. And they probably would not do it half as well. So, you think of yourself as a, some kind of a priest, eh? I spoke of myself as a sacrifice, not a priest. <laughs> Armando, you are an incredible man. Incredible. But you would not recognize reality if it gored you between the eyes. I guess it is my turn not to understand you. What are you talking about? I ask you a simple question that only concerns money, and you give me a lot of mystical nonsense about fear, about death. Why can't you make yourself understand that you are giving the public a thrill that they could get in no other way? I hope that isn't true. But it is true. That is why the Mexicanos are willing to pay you so much to see a fight between you and Ramon Garcia. Have you made up your mind? The money will be fantastic. Mira, you are hopeless. No matter what we talk about, we, we always come back to the same thing, money. Well, what else offers so many options? Uh. This magazine, Stanley, we don't kiss enough. Look, I get these cold sores. It hurts to kiss. Stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique. Just a touch of medically effective Camphophonique instantly stops pain of cold sores, helps speed healing by killing infectious germs and forming a protective Amadian shield. Bet our scores improved since a week ago. Mm, way above average. Stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique, the little green bottle full of first aid. Use only as directed. Forty love smashing. How she plays? No, how she looks. In action-proof eye makeup from Maybelline. Like ultra-big, ultra-lash mascara. Smear-proof, smudge-proof, waterproof. So long, longest-looking lashes stay in the thick of the action. Game, set, and match. Action-proof. Keeps you looking good after the action, too. Ultra-big, ultra-lash mascara. Incredibly long-looking lashes without flaky fibers. From Maybelline. Smashing. Going back and forth in time, we are quite often able to take mental pictures, emotional glances at our heroes, especially those of yesterday, as these men are doing, and as they remember and wonder. Tell me, Senor Cody, what do you think of the festival this year? Huh? Oh, I've seen better. <laughs> oh, I like that in you. One who has always seen better. <laughs> it gives you a great opportunity to avoid dealing with the present and very often with the recent past. <laughs> it offers you a great deal of safety, doesn't it? Would you say that running in front of the bulls yesterday morning was the way to safety? The annual test of bravery. Please, do not misunderstand, <laughs> Senor Cody. Please, Ernest. Ah, thank you, Ernest. Understand me, I do not doubt your courage, only your judgment. Especially when we concern ourselves with the quality of this year's festival as compared to those of past years. <laughs> Obviously, the same could be said about Matadores. Clearly! Oh, a waiter! Uh, more shrimp and beer for my amigo from America. I know what you're getting at, Senor Flores. Oh, please, uh, you may call me Jose. Jose, <laughs> I know what you're getting at. Since we occupied this table three days ago... You've been trying to get me to say that Armando Paz was, and is, if he was still fighting, the best that ever used the flannel. Mm, perhaps. <laughs> Salud. Salud. Are you saying that I should forget about the great bullfighters in history, uh, Manuel Rodriguez, Manolete, Joselito, Cagancho, Procuna, on a good day, Arusa? Well, not completely, but I have to say this honestly. <laughs> On a good day, El Encanto would have given them all the bath 
Oh, he was unique. Absolutely alone on the face of the planet in his perfection. <laughs> With a plate of such excellent shrimp in front of us, senor. Uh, Jose. <laughs> Thank you. I would find it very difficult to disagree too strongly with you. Uh, but aren't we forgetting someone? Oh, who is that? Ramon Garcia. Soberano. Oh, him. Well, it was generally conceded by most knowledgeable bullfight fans that the matchup they fought in Mexico was a classic example of a, a lesser-known talent giving the master a taste of the medicine he used to offer. Well, that's not true. I should know. I was there. Allow me to take the liberty of giving you the truth. Uh, that is, if you were not there yourself. Well, I wasn't there. I, I was covering a war at the time. Oh. That was unfortunate, because you are not present at an event that will always be a part of bullfighting history. <laughs> I will tell you what happened. Uh, before you begin, uh, waiter, two more of the same, please. As I am sure you recall, there had been a great deal of agitation from the Garcia people for a face-to-face -face match, a, a mano a mano. There were many who felt that El Encanto was, um, how do you say in English, uh, coasting. Oh, yes, coasting, uh, taking it easy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could never agree with that point of view. If you went to the Corrida and saw Armando Path, you were present at an event that carried extraordinary emotion. True? He lacked authentic competition, except for that fancy Dan Garcia, but he never coasted. The bulls would not permit it. Why was the fight held in Mexico? Oh, for the usual reason, my friend. Money. Uh -huh. The Mexican impresario Vargas made a fantastic offer, as I understand it. At any rate, at four o'clock in the afternoon, on a warm day in the Plaza Mexico. Matador Armando, be careful with this one. He hooks like a boxer with his left horn and looks smart enough to know Latin. Run him again, Juan. Show me how he moves. But we have already. I said again. Are you the matador or am I? You are, Armando. You are. There were also a number of disloyal types who felt that Armando was not only coasting, but that he had lost his nerve. The urge to fight the bulls. He used to ask me, Juanito, has there ever been another one like me? And he gave me the truth, old man. I guess at 40 to his 20, I did seem old. I know you've seen them all. Am I not unique in his art? I laughed at his arrogance of the greed. But I always cautioned him about making comparisons. Every great matador is a divine manifestation of grace under pressure, created to purge us ordinary people of certain emotional problems. They are priests, these men, the ones who perform honestly and with a strong sense of justice. My manager, what a shrewd uncle that one was. He had bribed every major bullfight critic in Spain to promote the fight between El Encanto and myself. He had schemed in ways that I would not like to discuss even at this point in time. He did whatever was necessary to get me into the ring with El Encanto, and it was one of the great lessons in my life. The opening pass with the capote was Armando's strong point. The pass is called a Veronica, supposedly named after a woman who wiped the sweat from the brow of our Lord on his way to be crucified. No one but Armando Paz could capture the tenderness of that emotion with his cape work. That uncle had something sacred in him. The bulls were what you would call in English uh, flag bulls. Torres Banderas. Yes, Torres Banderas. Each one as large as this room, armed with horns as wide as your arms spread, faster than a racehorse over a short distance, and filled with a violent belief that he was the god of all that his strength and horns could encounter. Oh, senor, real bulls. Real bulls! The beauty of his movement, the way in which he wrapped himself in his cape as he took his first bull away from the picador with the chicolines, the cape flapping gracefully from one side to the other, 
almost caused me to applaud. I knew I would have to dig deeply into myself for the performance needed to match his, if I wanted to have more contracts for the following season. The first man, Churro, made a treacherous stab as Armando was making his last pass at Bukite, slashing and jabbing with his left horn as Armando went down. If you use a long-lasting nasal spray, you ought to check the package. If it has a big 12 on it, you're getting the longest-lasting relief you can get. You're using Duration Nasal Spray. Duration is different because Duration has the longest-lasting nasal decongestant. So Duration gives you up to 12 hours of relief. That's up to two to four hours longer relief than most other long-lasting nasal sprays. Look for the nasal spray with the big 12 on it. Duration. The proof is on the package. The package with the big 12 on it. For occasional use only is directed. For battery-operated devices you use often or for long periods of time, you need powerful batteries like Rayovac heavy-duty supercells from True Value hardware stores. Hi, Pat Summerall to suggest you use these long-lasting batteries in flashlights, toys, radios, cameras, and more. And they hold their power for months when they're not in use, so they're ideal for devices you only use occasionally. Get Rayovac heavy-duty supercell batteries at participating True Value hardware stores and home centers. Most people say that the bullfight has three basic parts, and some say thousands of pieces. But all agree that death is always a prime ingredient for both the bull and the man. Juan Pelé, Armando's peon de confianza, the oldest, the most experienced member of his quadrilla, saved him from a serious goring with one bold slap on the bull's nose. Oh, I have never seen a man move toward danger with such courage. Armando calmly picked himself up and rewarded Juan with a series of Chicolines Antiguas that stole the breath from us. It was like watching a butterfly avoid the rush of a Tutan truck. It was as though the bull churro, sensing that my mind was far away from the arena, far from the monstrous appetite of the crowd, dumped me onto the sand and threatened my life to, to remind me of what I was. And what our purpose for being there was, I thanked Juan and Churro with one of the most grateful passes I could think of, the Chicoalina Antigua. The complaint has always been made. See, see, that there was not one to do a three-ring circus full of passes. Yes, not many beyond the Oh, basic. yes, yes, I have heard that. And it was true on this occasion also. But we must make the distinction between the matador who only knows a few passes and the master who weaves a spell with a few threads. My blood turned to fire when they began to scream for Armando to place his own banderillas. They knew it was something he never did. But on this occasion, he snatched the sticks from my hand, anger showing in his eyes at being asked to do so. The elegance with which he broke the sticks in half on the barrera, the fence around the ring, strolled to the center of the arena as though heaven belonged to him and earth was too dirty for him to place his feet on, is something I shall never forget. You know how critical the Mexicanos can be when they judge the placement of the sticks. I mean, after all, they have Amalita Chico, Carnizarito de Mexico, Procuna and Arusa, among others to look back to. And this Sunday, Armando Paz, El Encanto, was added to that list. I cannot say more. Old men sitting in the places where bullfighting is discussed, <laughs> such as this, <laughs> see, see, in such places as this, throughout the world, will always speak of those three pairs of banderillas. In Mexico, they are called El Encanto Sticks, Los Palos del Encanto. He placed one pair standing on the strip that circles the barrera. He placed another pair blind. Uh, that is to say, he sighted the bull for a charge, stood like a statue, and at the last second, faked to his left and dipped the shortened sticks into the bull's neck while looking up at me. At you? Uh, well, it seemed that way. It, it, it is an emotion that I later discussed with others. They say that they also felt that he was looking at them. Now, 
I am embarrassed to admit that my eyes were closed and I did not witness the last pair. He sighted the bull, turned his back, and I am told by those who had the strength to watch, faked the bull to the right side of his body and, as the bull swept under his right armpit, placed the six. Oh, that's impossible. Why, no! As I said, I could not watch. I was so certain that the horn would be slammed into his back. I have to smile even now when I think back to the dedication speech I made to Mira for Churro. Uh, those who were close enough to hear my words to her uh, at the Barrera, they could not believe their ears. I could tell from the shock that their faces registered. I said to her, To you, Mira Duran, I would like to dedicate this noble animal. I would like to dedicate it to you as a true representative of the beast that forces me to fight. To kill, to bleed, and maybe someday to die. (laughs) I remember the words of the dedication because I had rehearsed them for two days. Mira thanked me for my words with her, with her usual cynical smile. His domination of the bull was masterful. I have seen them all, the best. But this was like seeing it for the first time. At one point, as he dropped the bull's head with the left-handed natural and led the animal's face into the folds of the flannel, I had the illusion of seeing a man open a garden gate in slow motion. And during the course of his movement, as he slowly left the bull poised in one spot with a dazzling remate, he turned to us with a grave expression as though to say, I am doing this for you. I, an Encanto, the only one in the world able to do this. I hated him. And I loved him. I am told that a new record for fainting was set in the Plaza Mexico during the course of his faena. I found him a strange creature to watch. It all appeared to be a dream, the manner in which he led the bull past his body in a series of dream-like patterns as he casually studied the reactions of his audience. For long, slow moments, as he worked closer and closer to the horns, I felt myself being drawn into a brotherhood, one that only a few men on earth privilege to join. You would not believe it. The stupid women who fainted in the plaza. And it was not much better on the men's side. See, of course he was great. But couldn't they see he was simply playing on their emotions? You know, there was this odd thing that we all understood about Armando, that he hated to make the kill, which, after all, is the final function of, of the uh, matador. matador the killer of bull. Yeah, exactly. We understood this about him. But in some a strange way, this reluctance to kill made him a better killer. Whoa, now wait a minute. You've got to ease that one past me again. I missed something. Well, you see, his reluctance to kill made him want to do it and have done with it quickly. He was not one to hesitate when the moment arrived. The moment of truth. That becomes an hour for some. But never for Armando. Oh, he was a surgeon with the blade. The moment of truth was only for a moment. Some invisible force pressed upon my shoulders as Churro staggered to his knees. I found myself kneeling in front of his horns, crying. As his blood spilled onto the sand, I I felt some mysterious power was draining me. Somehow I, I could see myself through the bull's dying eyes. Armando the Rascal, they called me at one point, the thief of the orange groves, the crazy one who stopped full-grown bulls in the pastures at midnight with a, with a torn shirt. I had, I had never questioned what my role in life should be, what, what I might become other than a bullfighter. And with Churro, I found myself asking that question. People around me were out of their minds. 
Truro was an unbelievable experience. I witnessed it, but I didn't believe my eyes. I also witnessed Armando's third-rate performance with the two bulls that followed. During the course of his first fight, he had been a god. A god, do you understand? And then, nothing. Nada. With the two bulls they followed, he made stiff, half-hearted cape work. His rhythm was jerky. I cannot describe the filth that was screamed at him. The public felt that he was cheating them. During the course of his first fight, I had been put in the shade. Now, I walked in the sun. I showed them which one was number one. It was unbelievable. Truly, after having done so much with his first bull, one would think he was going to tear up the taurine world with the next two. It was not so. To put it bluntly, Armando blew it in Mexico. He showed all of the signs that the afición needed to know that he was washed up. I don't know what happened to him. What does it matter? I will always be accused of causing him to make a poor showing, no matter what. So, es la vida, no? Discover quality. And discover good values, too, on everything you want for Easter at Ben Franklin. You'll find Easter baskets for a dollar and up. And colorful Easter candies and stuffed animals to put in them. Save on egg coloring kits, Easter cards, and gift wraps too. All at your Ben Franklin store. Discover Ben Franklin, where quality is right at home. There's no other deodorant soap more effective than Dial. You get that clean, fresh, confident feeling all day long with Dial. You'll be glad Dial's active deodorant ingredient keeps working all day long. That clean, fresh, confident feeling all day long with Dial. Leonard Nimoy again. And here's the fourth act of El Encanto, the story of Armando Paz, Matador. I could never explain it, what had happened to him. He became a man at war with himself. He dragged me around with him nightly, into and out of the lowest dives of the city. He drank too much. He... More, more wine, more wine for us, for my friend Juan, for, for me, El Encanto. Armando Come, let us go home. We've had enough. Yeah, you're right, one little <laughs> What sense does it make if we'll only be sorry later for it? It was even rumored that he betrayed me with a dancer, Teresa Albatin. Oh, if I had found it to be true, I would have clawed her eyes out and his. Many of us in the profession thought that he had got the coleta, as we say, you know, that he had retired. Yes, it is true. I have to admit it. I, Jose Bienvida Flores, aficionado numero uno, fell into the trap of believing that Armando was, uh, how shall I say it, uh, washed up, if one had to be blunt about it, yes. I believed with many others that he was washed up a memory. And then... One morning, an announcement mysteriously appeared on the posts and walls of the city. The announcement was that he would fight bulls from six of the greatest ranches in España. A Mirura from Cabrera, a Paro Romero, a Domecq, one from De Los Gallardo, Vista Hermosa, and a Vista Villar. <laughs> Soccer suddenly seemed much less important than usual. <laughs> I have to admit that I went to see him prepared to see someone who had once been great make a fool of himself. It was a real puzzle in my mind as to why he needed six superb bulls to show the world how bad he had become. They were all mistaken. I had no need to prove anything. After my fight with Churro, the... There could not have been anything else. He was the bull of my life. <laughs> he was also, in some rare way, the, 
the germ of a feeling that I'd always concealed from myself. His death was my awakening. Any manner of speaking. Armando acted, well, let us say different towards me after Mexico. I cannot explain exactly what I felt in words. I could reach him no longer. Do you understand what I am saying? We had always had differences of opinion, even from the beginning. But this was different. He was different. He would stay out half the night and go to the church next morning, every morning. It was like living with a person in, in two different worlds. I thought perhaps it was the Gemini in him, you know, the divided personality coming out. I made a decision. The decision was to give the bulls one last chance. There were those who didn't understand. Mira didn't understand. Uh, but she never understood me very well anyway. Others called my decision arrogance or madness. I didn't feel it necessary to explain anything to them. I made my selection from the best ranchers because I was the best. And I wanted to fight the best one last time. <laughs> There was a slight breeze moving through the city on the day of the fight, but in the arena it was like a hurricane. The worst that could happen on the day of a fight, the wind. Armando joked about it. A little fresh air to blow the cigar smoke and cheap perfume out of the arena, eh, hey, Juan? As a member of the profession, I tried to put myself in his position. I couldn't. I didn't want to see him gored or killed, but I was impatient for the fight to begin, for the public to see that Armando was a husband. Oh, the bulls. They were beautiful monsters. There is no other word I could use to properly describe them. Each one was fully grown, well-muscled and armed with horns that seemed to have room for cradles in between the tips. And he fought them with the cold, elegant charm that had made him famous. You know, there was an element of something magical in what he did that afternoon. With the wind and the danger of his cape or his muleta misbehaving, there were times when it seemed that the only possible development from what he was doing had to result in tragedy. But it did not. He ignored the wind and the cynicism of the crowd, and he offered himself to the bulls. Pedricinas on his knees, Molinetes, Manoletinas, Afarolados with the left and the right hand, movements with his signature on them. <laughs> he dedicated the bull to five other persons beside myself. Oh, I treasure the experience of having witnessed his triumph. It was almost religious. He fought six of the most dangerous bulls in España, in the world. And he gave the money to charity. Can you imagine risking your life for nothing? It was done. I had offered the best of them a chance and survived. I could go onward to what I knew would be a more satisfying life. A life that would grant my soul peace. The conclusion of our story after this word. I work all day, my job is rough. I need a boot that's good and tough. Ever drop a 20-inch wrench on your toe? This is Kurt Gowdy suggesting you get your feet in the safety red wings. Lace boot, pull on, or Oxford, you'll get all the comfort red wings are famous for. If your feet need on-the-job protection, don't compromise. You've earned your wings. Safety red wings. I've earned my wings. I've earned my wings. My red wings. Our anniversary, Charlie, and you're not eating. You're not talking. My mouth hurts. I got canker sores. On our anniversary? Oh, honey, stop hurting. Start healing with Camphophonique. 
Just a touch of medically effective Camphophenic stops pain of canker sores instantly. Helps speed healing by killing infectious germs and forming a protective Amartian shield. You're still not talking. No, but I'm eating. Stop hurting, start healing with Camphophenic. The little green bottle full of first aid. Use only as directed. Each of us has to face life somehow. Some of us only do it in the mirror, at the surface. Armando Paz went much deeper. They scream for blood! For my blood! Blood! Oh, no, 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 stop! Stop and down, please! Oh, 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 oh. Are you all right? Are you all right? Yes, yes. I, I'm all right, Father. What was it? The bulls again, Father Pass? No. No, no, not, not the bulls, Father. The crowd. It's never the bulls that cause me to have nightmares. It's always the crowd, the memory of the crowd. And what a monster it was. From time to time I have this, this horrible dream of, of, of them, them charging me all together, the, the, the crowd charging me, howling, screaming at I me. I think I understand what you mean, Father Paz. I, I must admit I have been an aficionado all my life, and I recognize the beast you speak of. Yes. Shall, uh, shall we go to chapel to pray? Yes. Yeah, I, I think that is a very good idea. I would like to give thanks for for having escaped from the horns of the bulls and the public. Uh, uh, Father Paz, I have wanted to ask you, uh, what do you think of this rivalry between Ramon Garcia Soprano and Diego Ordonez? Uh, well, I, uh, I I would like to say, you know, to begin with, that uh, ne- neither of them is as good, <laughs> well, Lord forgive me you know, for my modesty, as good as I was. Uh, oh, Ramon, you know, with his great ego shows... What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. Turtle Extra. Car wax that gives you more than just a shine. Turtle Extra. There's more than sunshine and raindrops out there. Howling wind, bitter cold, fierce heat, mud, pollution. To protect against all that you need. Turtle Extra. The extra protection of polymers. The extra durability of silicones give you extra hard shell protection. Probably more protection than you'll ever need. Turtle Extra. Extra hard shell. Turtle Extra. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Armando Paz, El Encanto, was written by Odie Hawkins and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Leonard Demoy. Our stars were Larry Moss, Tommy Cook, and Jack Crucian. Featured in the cast were Stan Waxman, Lillian Baev, and Don Diamond. The music for radio theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. 
a name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Vincent Price. Scrooge was dead. Ebenezer Scrooge, a man feared, hated, finally loved, was dead. Oh, he didn't pass away, as you might have expected, surrounded by a mournful family of grateful Cratchits or his weeping nephew, as the parson commended Scrooge's soul heavenwards. Oh, no, dear friends. Scrooge was quite alone when he faced his maker. You see, he froze to death on a park bench in a deserted corner of Hyde Park as London's January wind swept over his tattered clothes and shoeless feet. Later, some whispered that he had been attacked by a gang or fallen prey to some evil night stalker. But this was simply not true. Scrooge froze to death. Like a thousand other homeless men, they found that bleak winter. Poor Ebenezer. His body lay unclaimed in a charnel house until the end of the week. Then he was placed in a meager wooden casket and lowered into a pauper's grave. It was an ignominious end to his life. A sad moment for a man who, who tried to atone for his mistakes. What had happened to this man of wealth to fall upon such pitiful times? Was not the mending of his ways enough to assure him a a glimpse of happiness? And what of his nephew? Certainly he could have taken steps to prevent his uncle's circumstances. What of Tiny Tim and the Cratchit family? Where were they in his time of need? Had Scrooge, as some had whispered, gone insane, escaped from an institution, and lost himself in London's teeming streets? The matter of his death was certainly something to ponder. Wasn't his conversion to love and charity enough to ease the burden of his guilty conscience, enough to allow others to accept him and care for him in his waning years? Apparently not, because he died alone. The harsh wind mixed with icy rain beating into his lifeless body. He died a man unwanted. Scrooge was dead, and not a soul was there to mourn him. And that's just the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Last of Scrooge, by Ken Gerard. Our star, Hans Conried. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears where America shops for value. Save now on tools that have earned the right to wear the name Craftsman. Save $100 on Sears Best Craftsman 10-inch table saw outfit with motor, leg set, and two extensions. Now $299.99. This is the minimum savings nationally. Regular prices vary in some markets. Or save 39% off regular separate tool catalog prices on this Craftsman 98-piece mechanics tool set with Craftsman toolbox included. Now $99.99 at Sears, where America shops for value. Sale ends April 26th. How many cold tablets do you take a day? Two? More. Four? More. Six? Yeah. A day? Uh Uh-huh. And then more at night? Right. Why? Well, they're new. Take contact. 
One capsule helps all your congestive symptoms up to 12 hours. All day? And all night while you sleep. That's the wonder of contact. Hey, you're the guys on TV. <laughs> yeah, we're the guys on TV. Take your contact. Take it fast. Give your code to contact. Take only as direct. What had befallen Scrooge after his miraculous transformation from skin flint to as good a man as the good old city knew? Wasn't his very being filled with love and charity enough to erase the harm of his former image? Or was it his intense desire to be loved that destroyed him in the end? Or was it madness? Well, I'll let you resolve those questions at the final curtain of this drama. For now, let us pick up the threads of our story. The days after Christmas were filled with joy and laughter. Scrooge could not have been merrier. His office ablaze with warmth. His heart was fired with kindness. So much so that his clients winked at each other knowingly. Had old Scrooge gone round the bend... <laughs> People could not accept this change in him. They still feared the old man because his reputation, carefully nurtured over the years, could not be altered in a single day, nor changed by his succeeding acts of compassion. Scrooge knew it, for he was no fool. He summoned his lawyer to his home. He devised a plan to prove to the world that he was truly a man to be loved. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Kempton. Uh, come in, sir, please. Yeah. How are you, Ebenezer? Oh, never better, thank you. Uh, oh, come, come, Mr. Kempton. We'll sit in the parlor and enjoy a roaring fire whilst we talk. Uh. Ah. Well, you've repainted the entire house. Oh, indeed. I couldn't look at those drab walls another day. Oh, I lived here in such depressing surroundings beyond me. Oh, yes, Mr. Kempton. A, a new life is ahead of me. I, you know, I... I relish the days. I, I want to live each moment to the fullest. I, I want others to enjoy it also. Uh, that's why I ask you here. Uh, please sit there. No, no, no. Take a seat by the fire. Uh, well, I marvel at your change, Ebenezer. It was quite sudden, but uh, nevertheless, uh, welcome. Well, if it hadn't been for the spirits, I, I never would have come to my senses. Spirits? Of course. First it was Marley's ghost, then the ghosts of Christmas, but the last hideous apparition, a, a phantom in black, was the cruelest. You know, Mr. Campton, he showed me the future, and it, it was horrible. I had died unwanted, alone. You, but the worst was the death of Tiny Tim. I could not bear that sight. You had visions of your own death? Of course, of course. I, I saw the future and the past. It was then that I realized my entire life had meant nothing. Yeah. I'd thrown away everything I loved. I was consumed by suspicion and hate. I knew I had to change. No, I, I knew I had to give, Campton. Give love and receive it in return. And th th that's why I've asked you here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, these visions, did they ever speak to you before? No. Did you saw... Jacob Marley's ghost? Oh, and spoke with him. Poor Jacob was in chains. I see. And, and, and did you talk to other visions? Oh, naturally. And I flew with him. We passed through the walls and were transported to old Fezziwig's ass. You say you flew and walked through walls? Several times. Ebenezer, have you told others this tale? No, no, I don't think so. Uh, good, good. Uh, let's keep it our secret. The, the others might... Uh, well, uh, some could get the wrong impression about the entire episode. I I, I believe you understand, don't you? <laughs> no, no, my dear Mr. Kempton. I, I'm not crazy. I'm, I, I'm cured. The visions, the ghosts, and Jacob's warning have given me a clearer picture than ever before. Oh, I'm quite sane. Oh, no, no, I, I didn't mean to imply anything. Oh, I know. It, it all seems so mad, so topsy-turvy, that, that I should turn over a new leaf and attempt to right my past mistakes. Call them dreams or visions, whatever you wish, it doesn't matter. The important fact remains that they changed my life for the better. 
Yes, well, uh, probably they were dreams. And often nightmares prod us to action where sweet reveries lull us into uh, complacency. Eh, well, uh, now what are we about? A new will, a lawsuit, I'm at your disposal. Oh, better than that, my dear Mr. Kempton. I want to dispose of all my earthly goods before I die. Well, that's simple. I can draw up a will in two days. Do you have a list of the bequests and the heirs? <laughs> no, no. I want to give everything away now, tomorrow. <laughs> you, you just, I mean, are, are you planning to enter the monastery? Oh, absolutely not. I, I fought you through to the last detail, to, to the last cup and saucer. I want people to enjoy my wealth while I am still alive. Uh, this is incredible. Uh, Ebenezer, you, you have to reconsider the idea. Now, where would you live? Who would care for you? Who would run the business? Oh, patience, my dear friend. I have it entirely settled in my mind. Oh, no, this is folly. This is it's madness. Oh, oddly, oddly. It, it's love and kindness I'm offering to repay those who endured my wrath and cruelty. Mr. Kempton, I must do this with your help. I must show those who snicker behind my back and call me fool that I am a loving fool. But you mustn't pay any attention to idle chatter. They'd malign the angels have given half the chance. Oh, but but I have to clear my name. Scrooge. The very sound has become synonymous with an art of flint, with a grasping old man laced with hate and greed. Suppose your name rang the devil's bell in others' hearts. Oh, I pray that that may never happen. My name is, is my cross, my burden... I must cleanse it of the very poison with which it infects the air. Each time a child points a finger in anger and utters Scrooge at his victim, my soul shrivels. I detest my name. I loathe it as much as I loathe what I've done to others. I want to burn the word from our vocabulary. I, I will not go down in history as a villain. Oh, help me, Tempton. Please help me right monstrous wrongs. Help me clear myself before I die. I want to be loved. I will buy my share of devotion, if it's necessary. And Kempton did assist Scrooge, though rather unwillingly. The concept was simple. Scrooge intended to give away all his possessions, his house, his furniture, the silver, and even the second set of china dishes. All this was to go to the Cratchits. Additionally, he set aside money for each of their children. Kempton shook his head with disbelief, but Scrooge was insistent. He made Kempton draw the papers with such clarity and precision that there could be little doubt who was to receive what. Scrooge made certain that everybody had a fair and equitable share of the fortune. To his faithful nephew, Fred, Scrooge would sign over 75% interest in his counting house. The remainder would be given to Bob Cratchit. Dutifully, Kempton drafted the proper legal documents and placed them in front of his client for his signature. I wish you'd reconsider this plan. Oh, why, if it brings such joy to others and relieves me of my troubles... Money cannot bring you happiness, Kempton. How will I know that? My house is nothing without laughter resounding off its walls. A business cannot thrive unless it gives service. No, no, no my mind is made up. I, I shan't be free until the Cratchits are in this house and Fred is in charge of my firm. Now, where must I sign the deed? Eh? Here, and once more on this document. Uh, 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 uh. And that seals it. I feel free, unburdened. I have fulfilled my visions. Pausing us to this flag of the United States of America, to the tropics of which it stands, one nation under God, invisible, and this is for living and for all. One nation under God, indivisible. It means the whole world is invisible. It means to God, because he's higher than us. He lives up in the sky, and we live down in earth. That's why it's one nation under God. With liberty and justice for all. I, I know what liberty means. Yeah, I know what that means. 
Well, um, when you, um, when you, I forget. From the Freedom's Foundation at Valley Forge. With a scratch of a pen, Scrooge had signed over all his assets to the Cratchits and his nephew. He had reversed the entire course of a lifetime within three weeks. Scrooge leaned back in the dark leather chair, satisfied that he had unburdened his soul and brought happiness to everyone. Lawyer Kempton looked at the documents and shook his head. It seemed foolhardy to give away the house, the business. Certainly Scrooge was acting rashly, or, or was it irrationally? Kempton wondered if he should mention any of the uh, visions or discussions with Marley to Ebenezer's nephew. No, no, surely not. Perhaps Scrooge was jesting. Of course, of course it was a joke, a, a play upon words. Kempton handed the papers back to Scrooge. Well, it's done, Ebenezer. You have given everything away. I've never felt more at peace with myself than at this moment, Mr. Kempton. Uh, I'm free. It's as if a, a millstone had been lifted off my entire being. Don't you realize how happy, truly happy I am? I'm trying to understand, Ebenezer. Oh, good. Please, go to the Cratchit's house, to my nephew's home. Bring all of them here. I, I want to see the joy on their faces when I tell them the news. In several hours, the Cratchits, the nephew Fred and his wife Anne and Mr. Kempton were assembled before the fire in Scrooge's parlor. It was a moment that Ebenezer hoped he would savor for the balance of his life. However, in reality, it was a bitter turning point, which would ultimately lead to his death. No, no, no. Uh, sit here, Mrs. Cratchit. Oh, thank you, Mr. Scrooge. Uh, yeah. Are you comfortable, Anne? Uh, why don't you take my chair? I'm fine, dear uncle. Uh, perhaps Mrs. Cratchit would care for my place. I'm quite satisfied, thank you, ma'am. But you look so uncomfortable. I'm used to straight chairs. The plainest of furniture fulfills my needs. It certainly does, my dear. Uh, and, gentlemen, are your glasses amply filled with sherry? <laughs> Absolutely, Uncle Ebenezer. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Scrooge. Oh, Bob, you, you must learn to call me Ebenezer. It's all different now, all changed, and for the better. I propose a toast to Mr. S uh, Ebenezer. Long may he live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your fellowship and warm sentiments. It must seem strange that in such a brief span I've moved from one extreme to the other. Oh, Uncle, you don't have to explain any of your actions. Fred and I rejoice that you have found peace within yourself. Oh, I will treasure those feelings for the balance of my days, because I know, or rather, I, I was shown that often you, you had little patience with me. That's not so... Dearest uncle, I never bore you any ill will. Well, if you did, it was well deserved, as I, I treated your husband with contempt and, and made him feel ridiculous. Oh, all in the past. There's no need to thrash old feelings about. This is the beginning of a new year and a new life for you, uncle. Well put, my boy. I, I wish to wipe the slate clean. I wish to propose another toast to Mr. Scrooge. Sit down, Bob. Hmm? Put the glass down. Put it down. <laughs> oh, Bob, it, it makes my heart light to see you so merry. He does nothing but sing your praises to the children when we're at home. Mm. Belinda constantly remembers you and her prayers each night before bed. Oh, it's so pleasant to hear her say, God bless us all and especially dear Mr. Scrooge. Mm. I, it brings tears to my eyes that she's included me in your family. I know mm. she'll never forget what happiness you've brought to all of us. Uh... And how many children do you have, my dear? None at present. Uh, we felt we should abstain from raising a proper family until we had sufficient means. I understand one of your sons is lame. What a pity, my dear. So sorry. Anne, please. You expect me to hold my tongue when that cheap fishwife, that... 
how please your uncle like a cello with her children's prayers and adoring smile. She makes me ill. We'll discuss it afterwards. <clears throat> well, I've asked you here to unfold some of my plans. I've decided to make reparations to all of you whilst I'm still alive and can share your happiness. I don't understand. Well, I'm giving my fortune away now. What? Mr. Campton, would you please read the document? Uh, yes, of course, Scrooge. <clears throat> I, uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, being of sound mind, do hereby instruct my attorneys to prepare the documents. One, my home and chattels therein, be given to Robert Cratchit. You, you're giving us this ass? And all the furniture, the dishes, the towels, even the mousetrap. It's a small compensation for the disservice I've done to your family. The old man's a raving lunatic. And to each of the Cratchit children I put in trust the sum of 5,000 pounds to be divided among them when they reach legal maturity. God bless you, sir. In addition... I place in trust with Kempton and Kempton Esquires the sum of two thousand pounds which shall be disbursed for medical treatment as needed by Master Timothy Cratchit. You have all Tim's undying love. And fourthly, I give to my faithful friend Robert Cratchit the sum of three thousand pounds. <gasps> I can't believe this. <laughs> You're just too kind, Mr. Scrooge. Too kind. Yes, well, I've instructed the bank to issue you a draft for the entire time in the morning. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. An ass in feathers is still an ass. And to my dearest nephew, Frederick, I give the sum of 3,000 pounds. Most gracious of you, Uncle. Oh, right, right. There's more. Read on, Mr. Kempter, read on. And sixthly, I assign a 75% interest in my business... To my nephew, Fred, what? and the remaining 25% to my devoted clerk, Robert Cratchit. <gasps> Thus ends the gifts and trust. <laughs> Ain't it wonderful? Fred and Bob partners. I cannot tell you how overjoyed this has made me. We can only thank the Spectres for this wonderful moment. <laughs> What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck & Company. Join hands with care to improve the lives of the world's needy children. Tomorrow's world is in our hands. We can help make it a better place for all the children. Join hands with people everywhere. Each of us can do our share in Cares Crusade for Children. Please send your check or money order to Care Crusade for Children Overseas, Box 576, New York 10016. Scrooge's revelation stunned Mrs. Cratchit and his niece, Anne. Both women smiled politely, but inwardly seized with anger and jealousy. Lawyer Kempton watched their show of happiness, realizing that beneath the charming veneer, they hated each other. Mr. Campton, did you hear what Mrs. Crutchie said? Uh, oh, oh uh, no, no, I didn't. I'm sorry, Ebenezer. I was rereading the deed um, uh, to your house. We want Mr. Scrooge to live with us. Well, it wouldn't seem right to have him give up his comforts, even though we'll be there. Isn't that right, Bob? Oh, for certain. The children would love to be with you. Tiny Tim already thinks of you as his grandfather. <laughs> You hear that, Mr. Campton? I'm a grandfather. Yes, you're, you're very lucky, Ebenezer. Very lucky. Oh, it'll be wonderful. Mr. Scrooge sitting by the fire, reading to the children and helping Bob to learn the business and spoiling Belinda with preach. We'd be a real family, a very happy family. Oh, you see, Mr. Campton, you see, it's a dream come true. I, I hope so. I sincerely do. Mr. Campton, don't be so worried. Of 
course the Cratchits will take good care of Uncle Ebenezer. Isn't that right, Mrs. Cratchit? Well, well yes, yes, of course. We, we'll always have a place for him. See, it's settled. I'm delighted. But, uh, well, never mind. Uh, now, now, I am. Speak on. I, I sense something's bothering you. It's not my place, Uncle. No, I insist. Well, what is it? I was thinking how the Cratchits needed time, especially those darling children, uh, to acclimate themselves to their new home. I guess it's foolish, but I would want to have matters settled, uh, yes, settled, before I could graciously receive any visitors or relatives. Oh, yes, I understand. You're quite right. I'm selfish. You, the Cratchit should be alone when they take possession of the house. Oh, not at all. I, uh, well, we want you to stay. Tell him, Bob. Uh, perhaps Miss Anne has a point. Not that we don't want you, Mr. Scrooge, but the hubbub of the children might be disturbing to you. The children aren't any trouble. And this still is Mr. Scrooge's residence. Oh, now, now, dear lady, as of this day, this is your own. Why don't you stay with us while the Cratchits acquaint themselves with newer surroundings? Oh, yes, I insist, Uncle. There's more than enough room. The change would do you wonders, and we can discuss the details of your business at leisure. You see, I want to take advantage of your years of knowledge in order to make Scrooge and Marley thrive. Oh, <laughs> There's great sense of this. Indeed, I'll, I'll pack this afternoon and, and I'll come round for dinner. Oh, I'm so disappointed. Won't you reconsider, Mr. Kempton? Beg him to stay. I feel as if I'd forced you out of the house. Odious woman. Harpy. I've won, you snivelling witch. You might own the house, but I'll have him. I wish I could tear those blonde curls out of her head. I'll have your back, you old man, before she's poisoned your mind. True to his word, Scrooge moved in with his nephew, while the Cratchits took possession of the home. Daily, Scrooge would accompany Fred to the counting house where they would pore over loans and interest rates and collections. Bob Cratchit often listened to their discussions, but inevitably returned to his desk to add columns of figures. Ebenezer was pleased that his nephew had such a grasp of the business and expressed his pleasure to Anne that evening at dinner. Oh, and I marvel at your husband's ability. He's learned my business within days. You're too kind. I'm sure there's much more for him to know. What took you years of wisdom and experience to understand can't be understood in such a short time. You flatter him, Uncle Ebenezer. Oh, indeed not. I, I thank the spirits that I had the good sense to turn everything over to Fred. Not everything, but uh, we're more than satisfied. Your company is payment enough. A toast to Uncle Ebenezer and the spirit of Christmas. Oh, spirits, Fred, spirits. <laughs> I hope they haven't bothered you since you've been here. Oh, not at all. I, I only talked to Jacob at night. You've uh, seen Jacob Marley? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, every night as I lie in bed and wait for him to materialize. And then we talk. For hours. He's, I've told him how happy I am, how Fred's progressing. What's happened to the Cratchits? Oh, Jacob, Jacob is pleased, very pleased. <laughs> they're, they're dreams, Uncle, like the other time. Well, dreams, if you wish, but, but Marley does with it with me. Have you ever discussed these apparitions with Mr. Kempton? Oh, certainly. He knows all about them. There's nothing I would hide from my attorney. Most sensible, Uncle, and uh, most important. Did he feel the spirits had guided you unwisely in the past weeks? Wow, you, you know, Mr. Kempton, he's a man of logic, of fact. His mind, it works like a clock. He thought my voices were a fever that had swayed my judgment. <laughs> Poor man, he, he has little imagination and too much reason. Did he question your actions? Uh, did he feel giving your home to the Cratchits a sound decision? Well, it wasn't his decision or mine. It was a will of the spirits. I've told you that before. Anne and Fred sat facing each other in the parlor after Scrooge had gone to bed. Despite their silence, they thought along similar lines. 
Finally, Anne spoke. I'm glad he's insane. Oh, you mustn't say that. No? You want him living here the rest of his life? You want to hear his wheezing and hacking in the dead of night? Or do you want to remain partners with a simpleton? A petty, low-class fool whose main ambition is to add rows of numbers? You want that, dear? (laughs) I'm the laughing stock of our circle because my husband shares a business with... uh, uh, Clark. He's harmless. He's there. I want him judged incompetent. I want the lawyers to pour over all the legal documents he's prepared and find them the work of a deranged old man. A madman. I want her out of that house. I want her groveling in the streets and her children picking rags. Stop, stop. Your cruelty goes beyond reason. They're harmless people who have never had anything. Let them live. Be content, Anne. Be satisfied. Oh, my darling, I only want you to receive your rightful share. Of course, the Cratchits are entitled to something, but what? He has given them much more than they deserve. Am I wrong? Can you honestly tell me that the house is rightfully theirs, or that you cherish the idea of sharing your efforts with Bob Cratchit? (sighs) What should we do? Have Scrooge declared unfit, throw the issue of property into the courts, let them find for us. It's out of our hands. Once he's examined, they'll know he's mad. Let the spirits help him then. We've waited too long to let this opportunity elude us. We'll have Kempton act in our behalf. Yes, let him institute the proceedings. Scrooge is mad. I want him locked in the darkest corner of the asylum. Let him tell the rats and the spiders about Marley and the visions. What's that? Who's there? Uncle Scrooge. We didn't hear you come downstairs. Apparently not. But he's heard everything, haven't you, old man? Yes, you scheming viper. Good. I'm glad. I hate you. And when we're finished, you'll be remembered for your insanity, not your meanness. Nine thousand people work and study and train. Because AFCO is me. Money is key to people's lives, and when you deal with them on that basis, you have to assume a lot of personal responsibility. Nine thousand people rack nine thousand brains, because Apple is me. We're not just lenders, we're often counselors, and at Avco Financial Services, we feel that we are more professional. Nine thousand people are all working for the chance to prove that when you borrow, we know more. We feel we have a better quality person in our particular field than any competitor because we train harder. Our people put you in the best company because Avco is me. I do my homework, I guarantee you. Because Avco. Ron Wazelcheck, Somerset, Pennsylvania. Is me. The Avco people in your town put you in the best company. Look in the phone book for the office nearest you. Scrooge ran from the house in the dead of night. Tears streamed down his cheeks as Anne's words echoed in his brain. Help me. Oh, dear God. Turn this horror from a reality into a simple nightmare. Let me wake in my bed. Please, please let this be a tortured dream as penance for my sins. <laughs> cold. I'm cold inside and out. Where to, Scrooge? Oh, he's not yet lost. I'll go home. To my fire. Yes, yes, sir, to my house. What's done can be undone. I'll be myself again. Open! Open! Upon my soul, Mr. Scrooge. Oh, damn your soul. Close the door. Yes, sir. But you're soaked to the skin. Come sit by the fire. Move aside, you fool. Who is it, Bob? Oh, Ebenezer! Well, you're sopping. Bob, get his robe and some blankets. Well, quickly, men. 
Oh, give me your coat. Oh, take it. Turn the chair. Face of the fire, you fast. Yes, sir. Uh, fetch my comforter and get out. I said get out, didn't you hear me, you fat-faced little gut? A snipe, get out. Ill, sir. Ill? No, no, I'm cured. And I see you for what you are. You get out now. Oh, well, sir, this is your niece's handiwork. Well, she's done a proper job, and in such a short time, with that pompous witch. Oh, you're all witches, lying, ungrateful trolls. Such a mouthy old man. How dare you. Get out of my house. Take your pack of disgusting children, your feeble-minded husband, and get out. You sit down. Sit down and be still. Well, I'll have the bailiffs throw you out into the deepest part of the prison and make sure that your brats never leave the workhouse. If you speak once more, just once, I'll bend this poke across your wretched head. You see? No. no, no. I loathe you, Scrooge. I've hated you for years. Even this Christmas dinner of ours stuck in my throat when Bob raised his glass to you. Fander of the feast, indeed. Why, well, you're an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man. Your name casts an evil shadow on this ass. My ass, you old fool. Well, it belongs to me now. Well, not for long. You'll be out of here tomorrow. Campton will see to that. Oh, hardly, dearie. Didn't you sign the deed over to us? Didn't you give freely and without stipulation the money to the children and a share of the business to Bob? You did all that. It's signed and ours. All ours. Oh, not quite, not quite. You, you see, my dear, I'm, I'm going to contest the transaction. I, I'm going to have the old matter tra- reversed. I'll be my case on, on, on temporary insanity brought on by, by food poisoning. And then everything will be thrown into a conservator's hands, Mr. Kempton's hands, and you and these miserable brats will be forced from my home. Scrooge will be Scrooge once more. Oh, I see you dead before one of my children sleeps among the lice and roaches again. You're burning hell as you deserve. Insane. You're just mad, but to my advantage. Look at you, dressed in sopping clothes. Why, you're just nothing but a raving lunatic. What's signed and sealed will never be undone by the likes of you. Your darling niece has played the hand for both of us. Now get out, Scrooge. Get out of my ass. Let the wind and rain freeze your wretched heart. Contemptible slut. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Put that poker down. Don't come near me now. Get out, you filthy. Don't you dare touch me. Out. With that. Don't. Run, old man. Run to your death. Scrooge ran through the night as the wind and the rain pelted his face and soaked his clothes. The rain turned to sleet and the wind howled around the corners of London's deserted streets. Scrooge's eyes glistened like a man possessed. He scurried from building to building like a hunted animal. Finally, exhausted and shivering, he pounded on Mr. Kempton's door. Oh, my God. Ebenezer, come in, ma'am. Come in. Take off those shoes. Yeah. Give me your coat. Here. Mm-hmm. And put this blanket round yourself. Uh, what happened? Oh, Mr. Kempton, I, I've seen more evil, more hate than I ever thought existed in the entire world. The devils have turned on me. Oh, Kempton, it's all gone wrong. Everything has turned upside down. I, I'm a fool. A stupid fool whose mind is twisted with love and hate. Did Fred cause this? Yeah. Fred? <laughs> Bob or Hardly, poor simple man, dances with bibs controlled by scheming women. <laughs> Come to pass too quickly, too soon. You knew this would happen, didn't you? Yes. Why didn't you stop me? Would you have listened? No. No, I wouldn't. The idea was too set in my mind. My emotions would have rejected the, the best of reason. Well, now, enough sadness for one night. You'll take the spare bedroom and we'll talk in the morning. Kempton. Kempton, am I insane? Well, this, this is... It's, it's not the time to discuss these questions. Am I, Kempton? Am I? I think your heart has been filled with anger for years and it, it forced you to act unreasonably. Your hatred of mankind certainly stems from the irrational uh, as... Do your actions of hate. Uh, I've always known you were a man possessed with unspeakable pain and with a galaxy of fears. Uh, That's true. It's quite true. I didn't want to become what I've become. My life was, and still is, 
I'll live in hell. Oh, no, hush, 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 hush. Now, let's oh, leave this Captain, until the morning. Captain, I've never been loved. Now, please, oh, Ebenezer. It's a fact. How can anyone give love when they've never received it? I was, I was always the outcast. My father detested the side of me. I, I never knew why. What had I done except being born? Captain, Captain, I've been so alone, so lonely. I only wanted to spend the last years being loved. Being loved. Was that too much to ask? The conclusion of our story after these words. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Hello? Hi, Mama. How are you? Joey! What's wrong? Nothing's wrong, Mom. It's Sylvia. Her back went out again. No, Mom. Sylvia's great. The kids got the flu. Mom, the kids are fine. You're okay. Mm -hmm. Sylvia and the kids are all well. You got it, Mom. Then how come you called? No reason. Just because I love you. Well, why don't you call more often? Reach out the bell system. Reach out and touch someone. Your lung association loves your little babies and wants to help you keep them healthy. Little ones put things in their mouth sometimes, like pins or peanuts. They can choke on them or swallow them down wrong. Your lung association has this free information on how to protect your baby's life and breath. Write for it now. That's really loving little babies a lot. Whether it's a breathing problem for babies or any other lung problem, your lung association cares about every breath you take. Kimpton guided Scrooge up the stairs and into the spare bedroom. He closed the door, leaving the old man to prepare himself for bed. Poor Ebenezer, he thought. Poor demented man. A whole life wasted. Kempton trudged sadly to his chambers and fell into a fitful sleep. However, Scrooge was awake. His eyes darted across the room, searching the shadows and peering into the blackness. Suddenly he... He cocked his head. Who's there? Molly? Spirit? Is that you, Jacob? Speak to me. Who is in this room? I can't see you. No more. Haven't I paid enough for my sins? Aren't you satisfied? I can't take no more suffering. My whole life has been a punishment before. What more do you want of me? Father? Father, is that really you? What? What? Father, you want me to follow you? Oh, <laughs> gladly, gladly. <laughs> you sorry? Oh, I forgive you. You want to be with me? With me alone? Oh, yes, yeah, yes, I'll come. I'll come gladly. I've waited, waited such a long time for you, Father. It's been so lonely without you. They found him the next morning. He was frozen to death on a bench in Hyde Park. He was just another faceless old man who was buried in a pauper's grave on that bleak winter. Kempton never suspected he had died, and the others didn't care. Back in 1893, when Dave Lennox built his first furnace, the coolest spot in town was on the ice wagon. In time, Dave turned his attention to air conditioning. Lennox soon became a leader in cooling. In comfort and efficiency, today's Lennox two-speed condenser obsoletes older single-speed units. It saves money because it uses less energy. Take it from Dave Lennox. To modernize your home, call your independent Lennox dealer. He's in the yellow pages. a boy, Dave. There's no other deodorant soap more effective than Dial. You get that clean, fresh, confident feeling all day long with Dial. How did you 
You'll be glad Dial's active deodorant ingredient keeps working all day long. That clean, fresh, confident feeling all day long with Dial. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Last of Scrooge, was written by Ken Gerard and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our star was Hans Conried. Featured in the cast were Ben Wright, Len Berman, Betty Harford, Valerie Cooney, and Ivor Barry. The music for radio theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. This is Leonard Nimoy. We're in Piraeus, the port of Athens, Greece, and it's a dark and stormy night. A night for trouble if you don't watch out. Careful, lady, that gangplank is wet. Yes, so I discovered. The captain, please. What is it about? Personal. Oh, oh, I should have known. Right over there, man. Thank you. Um, I was looking for Captain Clay. Evening, ma'am. I am Captain Braga, new skipper of the Golden Girl. A new skipper? Clay got sick. Pneumonia or something. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Then could I have a word with Mr. Perez? A personal matter. Perez? Your first mate. Oh, we get all new officers on the bridge, ma'am. A new skipper likes to work with people he's used to. Oh, I see. Well, then I'm sorry I wasted your time, Captain. Good night. Good night. Well, that was quick. Everything all right? Thank you, yes. Uh, But would you send a message to John Cooper for me? John Cooper? Who's he? Your steward. Our steward's name is Abdullah. Oh, thank you. Good night. Something is very wrong. A new skipper. A new first mate. Yes, of course. It can happen easily enough. But a new steward as well? Maybe it makes sense, but this young woman seems to think it doesn't. Perhaps that's because she's engaged in a very deadly business. A business in which human life counts for very little indeed. It's just the money that matters. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, A Nearly Perfect Crime by Alan Caillou. Our stars, Lloyd Bachner and Janet Waldo. What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. 
Names that are a part of your life today, like Permaprest, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck & Company. Sinus flares up. I'm clogged up. Headaches. My whole face hurts. Hell. Send for... Sign off. Sign off helps relieve your pain, helps clear congestion, ease sinus pressure and post nasal drip. Sign off does it all. Send for. Sign off. And for the fastest known form of congestion relief, sign off spray. S I N E O F F. Sign off. The sinus medicines in the bright red box. Is here. For occasional use only as directed. The young woman we just met is named Joni, Joni Trent. She looks, talks, and behaves just like an ordinary tourist. In fact, she's very bright, attractive, and anything but a tourist. She's not as frightened as she ought to be, because Greece is a quiet and peaceful sort of country, and very safe. Well, usually, anyway. Well, how does it look, Johnny? Worse than a brother's murder. Hmm? Rank. It smells to heaven. The whole crew has been replaced right down to the steward. And the guard on the gangplank had a gun tucked away under his arm. Good. Good. I like it. That's all we need to know. Where to now? Hungry? Mmm, famished. And all this vast amount of money floating around, my darling, just begging to be picked up, makes me think of a really expensive dinner. Oh. What's that up there? A detour, Hillary. Watch it. A detour? That barricade wasn't there when we drove up. What goes on? Ah! Are you all right? Uh, no, no. Uh, yes. Yeah, don't worry about it. I didn't congratulate you, Mr. Pyrrhus, did I, on your purchase of the Golden Girl? At such a good price, too. No, you did not, Braga. That was very remiss of you. Then I do so now. The price wasn't good, either. I paid more than I wanted to. It was a mistake. You made a worse mistake than that. Oh? And what was that? Trying to kill that girl and her companion last night, even though you failed. It was a foolish move. What, 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 girl? You didn't know? Tell me what you're talking about, Captain Braga. You mean it wasn't you? Tell me! Just after two bells last night, this young woman came aboard looking, so she said, for Captain Clay. She got sought up as she left the harbor. And if it wasn't you, I'd like to know who the hell it was. Ah, that will be Mr. Souza. I'll get it myself. Ah, my dear Mr. Piros, how good to see you again. Mr. Souza, do come in. You two know each other, of course. Of course. And I am correct, no doubt, in assuming that the briefcase you are holding contains... Final payment on the Golden Girl, a hundred thousand dollars in cash. And that envelope, I am sure, contains the insurance papers I need. It does indeed. Insurance on the vessel for half a million, on her cargo for five million. Ah, Masios! Perfect! You are now the full owner of the splendid Golden Girl and uh, custodian, for the moment at least, of her very valuable cargo, uh, which is for delivery, as you already know, to Mr. Aman of Singapore. A poor fellow. Five million dollars worth of munitions can fetch almost as much in Singapore as they can in... Uh, Shall I say Beirut? I prefer not to have heard that comment, my dear Mr. Souza. Of course. And how right you are. The watchword is always a security. It is why I have lasted so long, Mr. Souza. And it's my earnest hope that we may do business again soon, dear Mr. Piros. Perhaps. Tell me where I might find you in a few days' time. Beirut, perhaps? Then I thank you and bid you good night. As we Greeks say, dear Mr. Souza, Stinyasas, health be on you. 
And as we Arabs say, Salam Alaikum, peace be on you. And peace on you too, dear friend. All right, Braga, now tell me about that young woman last night. You said she had a companion. Did you find out about them? I thought you'd never ask. Well? I made a few inquiries, of course. Her name is Joni Trent. This is Hilary Marshall, registered at the Grand Bretagne Hotel as just a visiting businessman. But the word's out, Mr. Piros, all over the underworld. Go on. Hilary Marshall is a gun runner. You nearly knocked off a good customer, Mr. Piros. I told you it wasn't me. Okay, okay, I believe you. When do we sail for Beirut? At once. That's your new TV commercial, Mr. Sloak, for Snacky Crackies with Raisin Pits. How much did that actually cost me? Cost? Yes. <clears throat> well, we're still adding it all up here. 42000 TV is so expensive. Hmm, not as long as there aren't any changes. Did, did I mention there may soon be a worldwide shortage of Raisin Pits? One TV version without Raisin Pits. How much will that add to the... 3000 and, and we want to tell Health Nuts we make Snackies with... Uh, Health nuts. Uh, 279. And we need a version that will talk to the financial community. Put the singing mouse and the dancing bunny in a business suit for Let me have uh, that one for you. 300 if business conditions make it necessary, with radio you can afford to change commercials fast. If you want to really target consumer groups, it won't cost a fortune to make commercials that fit each audience. Put amazingly flexible radio to work as a primary medium. Radio, it's red hot. For the red hot facts, call this station or the Radio Advertising Bureau. They brought you this message. Freighters are not bought and sold quite like trucks. You'd never sell a loaded truck, for example, in the hope that its cargo would promptly reach its proper destination. But ocean-going vessels are commonly traded in dock or on the high seas, loaded or empty. There's nothing unusual about it at all. Sometimes, indeed, a ship will change hands several times while she's en route from one harbor to another. Under maritime law, Delivery of the cargo in such cases is mandatory. It makes it very easy for the thieves, who carry briefcases rather than guns. And when there's a particularly valuable cargo aboard, all kinds of exciting things are liable to happen. Johnny, over here. Oh, there you are. One of the nice things about working for you, Hillary, is that you always find such good places to eat. <sighs> Well, what have you got for me? Mm, what have you got for me? I'm ravenous. Oh, uh, a waiter, another bottle of wine, please. Hillary. Uh, and uh, have some more of that lobster. Mm. Yeah, come Coming, sir. So the golden girl has left port. Or do we know where she's headed? The satellite readout says she's on a course of 152 degrees. Her port clearance papers say she's headed for Port Said, the entrance to the Suez Canal, then on to Singapore. Canal documents have been issued to her, and everything is simply marvelous. Could I have some of your wine while I'm waiting? Of course. Marvelous, except for what? Mm. Port Said and the canal are on a bearing of 170, not 152. Oh, now, isn't that interesting? And have you, my darling Joni, discovered by any chance where a course of 152 will take her? Not by chance, but by design. I looked it up. It will take her to Beirut. Splendid. One of my favorite cities anywhere. Why don't you take a cab over to the airport and pick up some tickets for us? Hillary, I have already done that. We leave in a little under three hours. And where's my lobster? One bottle of Atsina, one plate of good lobster. Mmm, it does smell good, doesn't it? I can't see a thing in this fog. It's getting worse. Good. It means we can't be seen either. Why do you think we are running without lights? I tell you, we come to very dangerous waters now, full of Israeli patrol boats. If they find out from their spies in Greece that we are carrying all those guns, 
I tell you, I don't want no trouble with the Israelis. You're a very nervous sort of man, aren't you, Braga? No, just careful. You know, the Christians and the Muslims in Beirut have started fighting again. Boom, 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 everywhere. Braga, if you want to make us a great deal of money quickly, then just bring this ship into port and leave the worrying to me. There are so many options open to us now. So many ways to get rich. Didn't I hear you say, Hillary, in a moment of weakness that Beirut was one of your favorite cities? It is indeed. It has lots of character. They're all killing each other out there. Uh, put it down to a kind of Arab exuberance. Uh, now, uh, please close that window, my love, and draw the drapes. We have to be careful, even in the hallowed enclaves of a first-class hotel. Hmm. The beautiful people are all lounging around the pool down there as though it were the safest place in the world. Don't they know? All this militant nonsense, my dear Johnny, cannot be allowed to interfere with business as usual. Now, Beirut is a dead city, but it's still very much alive. Uh, let me see the file again, would you? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm So, what have we got? Piros will be here soon with a golden girl, which he owns, carrying five million dollars worth of armaments, which he does not own, destined for a certain Mr. Aman of Singapore. Now, poor Mr. Aman, he will have paid for them in full at the time of the loading, won't he? It's customary. So, 30,000 Kalishnikov machine pistols, 12,000 MG-42 light machine guns, 7,088 millimeter rocket launchers, <sighs> anti-tank rifles, heavy machine guns, landmines, hand grenades, enough ammunition to start a major war with. Uh, every gun runner in town will be after this. We'd better see Piros the moment he gets in. Yes. Um, I hope you realize how very dangerous it will be, Hillary. Why should it be? I'm a cash-on-the-barrel customer. In any case, you'll be there to hold my hand, won't you? It's just that I don't want anything to... to happen to you. I... 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 I, I really am in, in love with you, Hillary. Oh, come, come, we can't have tears at a time like this. <sighs> We're on the verge of pulling off yet another very satisfying job. And I, I... I think that perhaps I'm in love with you too, my darling. Oh. Hello? Yes, this is Mr. Marshall's secretary. Who? Hold on, I'll see if he's in. Hillary, you won't believe it, but John Cooper is here to see you. Hmm. The ex-steward of the Golden Girl. Y you find that interesting? Very. Yes. Send him up, please. Hillary, you really do. Find it interesting? Yes, of course. No. You really do love me? Oh, 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 that, that. Um, well, yes, it's a distinct possibility, I'd say. Uh, <gasps> Offhand and without too much reflection. Oh, Hillary... Come in, Mr. Cooper. Uh, thank you, Miss. I'm Hilary Marshall. What can I do for you, Mr. Cooper? It's, uh... Well, I can do for you, Mr. Marshall, sir. I got uh, some information for sale. It might interest you quite a bit. And why should you think that? Because I know who you are. I was in Athens when you were making inquiries about the Golden Girl. I used to work on her. I was her steward. And was it you who fired on us when we left the harbour? No. No, I didn't even know about that. I'm not a gunman, sir. I'm just a steward. But I'm not a fool either. I worked it all out and put two and two together. You're an insurance investigator, aren't you? Well, that's a very amusing deduction. I do go on. And I know the insurance companies are rolling in money. A thousand dollars? Since I don't know what your information is, let's say 500 and start talking. Well, two months ago, I was steward on another ship called the Animos. She was carrying half a million dollars worth of scrap brass for a man named Aman in Singapore. But the Animos was sold en route and a new owner diverted her to Beirut. 
uh, for, for so-called repairs. And while she was here, the cargo got secretly offloaded and sold on the black market. She put out the sea again, caught fire and sank. The new owner picked up the insurance on both the ship and the cargo. Very interesting. And when the Annie Moss sank, there just happened to be a small boat standing by to take off the crew under Captain Braga. That new owner, Mr. Marshall, sir, was a Greek named Pyrrhos. He's now the new owner of the Golden Girl, and he's planning the same thing for her, too. And if that isn't worth a lot of money to you, then I don't know what is. Jerry, give Cooper his $500, will you? Yes. And I will give him some very valuable advice. Cooper, if you choose to run around Beirut, of all places, where everybody is a spy, telling these things to everyone you happen to think might be on the side of law and order, then your life just might be in very grave danger. Happen to think... Oh, Lord. You mean... Mr. Cooper, I am not an insurance investigator, heaven forfend. I am a customer for the Golden Girls Cargo. And my valuable advice is, take your money and get out of here fast. Go to your adoring Maria, perhaps. How do you know about Maria? Never mind. But go to her before I start wondering what the orthodox way might be of disposing a body in a suite of a first-class hotel. Oh, my Lord. I thought... Uh, I thought... No, Cooper, you didn't think, and that is your problem. Take your money, Mr. Cooper, and run. Yes. yes I, I, I won't breathe a word, not a word to, to anybody. Goodbye, Mr. Cooper. So nice to have met you. Yes. Yes, uh, goodbye. That is a very frightened man. And he has every reason to be. There's no room in this business for amateurs. When Mr. and Mrs. George Steger's old central air conditioner broke down under the heat of the Texas summer, they replaced it with a Lennox two-speed air conditioner. The quiet and comfort are heavenly. And it saves money. Our Lennox two-speed air conditioner costs less to operate because it uses less electricity. It can save 24% over a single-speed unit. With savings like that, how can we afford not to have Lennox? Take it from Dave Lennox. To modernize your home, call your independent Lennox dealer. He's in the Yellow Pages. At the store, they told me there's a powerful anti-itch drug I can buy without a doctor's prescription. Now, I use Bicozine Cream as directed. No more burning, embarrassing itching. No more scratching. Bicozine actually speeds healing. Bicozine Cream. What a relief. For constipation, remember X-Lax Pills, the overnight wonder. X-Lax Pills, the overnight wonder. X-Lax Pills, for occasional use only as directed. <laughs> We're talking about one of the most profitable rackets in the history of double dealing. You buy a ship loaded down with a good cargo. You divert it, as the legitimate owner, to a friendly port. You sell that cargo on the black market, because physical possession is everything. It's simple, neat, tidy, profitable. It's also quite perilous. It's me, John. Open up, quickly. Oh, my darling, what is it? You're so pale. Because I'm scared, Maria. Scared out of my wits. I looked the death angel right in the face and I got away. Oh, John, what happened? This fellow Marshall, I told you about him. Yes, yes, the insurance investigator. No, no, I was wrong there. A mistake that could have cost me my life. That's what I thought he was. But he's not, Maria. He's one of them, a gunrunner. Oh, no! There's no doubt about it at all. I told him all about Pyrrhos and Braga and the munitions on board the Golden Girl. John, they could have killed you! I know it. Pour me a drink, please, a large one. Oh, yes, of course. They, they could have killed me. They should have killed me. There. They, they chose to buy me off instead the easy way, I think. Five hundred dollars... 
There, I didn't stop the conduct. I just got out of there fast. And I ran all the way to your place. I didn't dare go home because they threatened me, Maria. They told me I'm not safe here now. Another, please. Yes, yes, anything you want. Oh, John. Gun runners are a very dangerous breed. Hide me till the golden girl has left port. She just got in two, three days to dispose of a, a the cargo. Cellar. The cellar. I'll make it comfortable for you, John. Oh, oh thank you, my darling. Ah! Get down! Behind the sofa! And I told you! I told you! Maria, I'm dying! Oh, I love you, Maria. I'll get you to a doctor now. You don't know how much I love you. Turn the damn radio of Braga. Find me some bazookies. We don't have bazookies in Beirut. Uh, where do you want me to burn the golden girl and sink her? Same place we sank the animals? The water is deep there. No chance for inquisitive divers. No, I, I don't think we'll do that this time. It, it seems a shame to waste such a profitable ship. We can we can use her name to present the banks with forged bills of lading for non-existent cargoes, which we can then sell. Mm, we get away with that once, twice, no more than that. Uh, you're quite wrong, Braga. The banks are only obligated to check documents, which can easily be forged. They don't ever bother to check cargoes. Mm, maybe. That means... Each time we must change the ship's name. Precisely. And what could be easier? Once we have disposed of our munitions to the highest bidder here, you will take the Golden Girl out of harbor, ostensibly en route to Singapore, and supposedly with her cargo still intact. But you will put in at the municipiers down the coast in Sidon. The Muni brothers are friends of mine, and I have already made the necessary arrangements. There our fine ship will suffer... Minor surgery. Surgery? One must to be removed. She will be repainted and renamed. A fine ship for which we can attract good cargoes by offering very low rates. <laughs> you see where this will lead us? Genius. I do have certain talents, Braga. But that is not all. While the golden girl is being disguised, you will take a fast launch out to deep water. You will sound out a May Day on your radio, announcing yourself as the golden girl and saying that you are on fire and rapidly sinking. By the time help arrives, you will have speeded back to Beirut and there will be no trace left of the ship. Except perhaps a few sharp pieces of timber that you might get to take along uh, with you to toss overboard and mark the golden girl's passing. We'll collect insurance of the ship and her cargo. We will already have sold the cargo by then, and we will still have a fine ship with which we can start over. Very soon, my dear Braga, we will both be very rich. Oh, sheer genius. There is no other word for it. Yes, I will agree. This is an almost perfect crime. Uh, Mr. Marshall to see you, sir, with his secretary. He says it's important. M Marshall? Do I know him? No, oh, Mr. Paris, you do not. My name is Hilary Marshall. This is my assistant, Miss Trent. Miss Trent? Mr. Piros. And your business, sir? My business, Mr. Piros, is making money. Ah, then please be seated. I'm a busy man, Mr. Piros. I won't waste time on preliminaries. I want your munitions from the Golden Girl. I understand they're insured for five million... I offer you a firm two million dollars. Three. Two? I do have another buyer, you know, waiting impatiently. A two and a quarter. That's final. Gus? A letter of credit on the Arab Bank of Beirut. Excuse me, then. Two and a half? Uh, that depends. Ah. Ah, my dear Mr. Souza, this is your equally dear friend, Mr. Piros. I have an offer of two and a half million for my merchandise. If you would care to raise it. No, my dear friend, no haggling. We're not carpet salesmen, are we? And that is your final offer? Hold on, please. I have a firm two nine, Mr. Marshall. Then I go to three. Final. Excuse me. Three million, Mr. Sosa, will you top it? 
Oh, what a shame. Uh, but I have another deal that you might be interested in. I can sell you the Golden Girl, repainted, well disguised, and renamed. And then, when you have a suitably valuable cargo for her, I will buy her back from you at twice what you paid for her. And give you also first refusal on that cargo. That, dear Mr. Sousa, is a is an offer you cannot refuse, huh? Done. And we too have a deal, Mr. Pierce. We do indeed, Mr. Marcel. Hmm. Then, where may I inspect the merchandise? I will take you to its hiding place, Mr. Marcel, as soon as the letter of credit is in my hands. Of course, accept it. I'll go to the bank at once. Good day, Mr. Pierce. Mr. Marcel, and uh, perhaps uh, we can do business again soon? I do believe perhaps we can. Miss Trent? Mr. Pierce? Well, that went off rather nicely, I thought. I think he'd have settled for two and a half. In a deal like this, speed itself is priceless. Marshall! Oh. Why are you shoot my man? But look out! On the roof there, she's got a gun! Oh. 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 Darling, are you all right? No, my leg. Oh. Uh, don't worry about it. Oh. Did you see who it was? Yes, it was John Cooper's girl, Maria. <laughs> Oh, Hillary, I'm beginning to believe that you're very shooting prone. I find that sad. Every time we go from point A to point B, someone starts shooting, and you finish up invariably on the receiving end. It's ridiculous. Thank you for the sympathy. Hello, Ibrahim? Ibi, this is Hillary. I want a counterfeit letter of credit on the Arab Bank of Beirut in favor of Mr. Grigory Piros for three million dollars. I'm buying his armaments. What do you mean it's illegal? Don't be foolish. Now, a really good counterfeit, Ibi, that will stand up to very careful inspection. And I want it just as fast as you can make it. Good. Room service. Oh, yes, I ordered a bottle of Scots Johnny. <gasps> oh, dear. Please don't anyone make any excited moves or I will shoot. Please be sure of that. You are Miss Johnny Trent, I believe. And over there is Mr. Hilary Marshall. I am Mr. Amman from Singapore. Nothing beats a great pair of legs. Can you imagine a dancer with wrinkles around her ankles? Hi, I'm Juliet Prowse. As a dancer, my pantyhose must fit perfectly. So I wear legs regular pantyhose with memory yarn. Stretches out and back. Fits whether I'm kicking high or bending low. Legs regular pantyhose with memory yarn and a pure cotton panel. Believe me, Juliet Prowse. Nothing beats a great pair of legs. Hi, this is Barry Manilow. Today, young men and women are finding the adjustment to military life easier because of an army of volunteers, the USO. The USO is thousands of people like you and me, people contributing their time and money to help American service personnel here and abroad. The USO has been providing relocation and housing assistance, entertainment, and a taste of home for nearly 40 years. Service is their middle name. Please support the USO through your local USO campaign or the United Way. Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of A Nearly Perfect Crime. Mr. Amman from Singapore, and I am an honest and very angry businessman, tired of being robbed by you, you, you pirates! Mr. Amman, calm yourself, please. I am not uh, what you perhaps take me to be. Oh, you can't fool me, Mr. Marshall. I know exactly what you are. Ever since Pyrrhus offloaded my cargo of scrap brass from the Alamos a couple of months ago and sold it on the black market here, I have had a spy in his bureau office. And I know what you are doing. You are paying three million dollars for my munitions that I paid good money for at the time of their loading. Can you think of any intelligent reason why I should not kill you both now? Mr. Rahman, I bleed for your terrible loss. But years of experience have taught me never to try to reason with a man who holds a gun pointed at my stomach. And 
Again, did you? Really? Come on, down to the lobby. We'll be safer in a crowd of people. Please, please, no! I am Mr. Abiyat, hotel manager. I cannot allow shooting pistols in my lobby. Outside, on street, it's okay, but not in hotel. Remember, we are civilized people, only outside shooting, please. Where did they go, Abiyad? Where? Who? Oh. You, you, you mean Commissioner Marshall and his lady? Yes, where did they... Commissioner Marshall? Oh, did I say Commissioner? I meant, of course, Mr. Marshall. No, if a little money were to change hands. Yes, 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 there's, there's a hundred. No, 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 tell me. Thank you, sir. And in fair exchange, I will confess that, well, like almost everybody else in Beirut these days, I am, forgive me, a spy. Oh, yes, yes, tell me, for tell, me Russians, tell me, mostly, tell me about Marshall. But also for oh, the Americans, oh. the Syrians, the Israelis, the PLO, in short, for anyone who will help to enlarge my miserable stipend. I am not interested it in your means, miserable stipend. I have to be well informed about at all my hotel guests. Mr. Marshall is registered here as businessman, but that is just his cover. We all know that he is actually a gun runner. Oh, I know that. They told me so in Greece. They told me so here ah, in Beirut. But that is a cover story too, very expertly planted on all of us, both here and in Athens. And under those two cover stories is the real Commissioner Marshall, who is a very senior officer from Interpol. Oh, from Interpol? Truly. Oh, and I have been shooting at him. Oh, oh, what am I going to do? He'll have my head. I suggest, Mr. Aman, that you make your amends by whatever means you can devise at the very earliest opportunity. Hmm. Ah, fortify yourself with that. Bandage not too tight? Thank you. The bandage is fine. Mm. And you really are a sort of natural target, aren't you? You'd think they'd get lucky the third time. But they did not. And I'm a little miffed over your behavior with Mr. Amman. Hmm? Miffed? But whatever for? He was shooting at me, and you chose to run. I find that an extraordinary way to behave. But, darling, you told me to. I, 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 I was obeying orders. The instruction was merely a gentlemanly courtesy. I expected you to remain and help me. The only decent thing to do. Hmm. Who is it? Special delivery envelope uh, for Mr. Marshall. Thank you. You mean in the middle of all this fighting, they still have special delivery? In Beirut, it usually means seven young thugs in a jeep, all armed to the teeth. Mm. Now, let me have that. Aha, my letter of credit for three million dollars. Do you know, that is as good a forgery as I've ever seen. Oh. Really, quite marvelous. Now, if we could only contact the impulsive Mr. Amman with a modicum of safety... Who is it? Mr. Amman, bearing a flag of truce. What do I do, Hillary? Open the door, my dear. Oh, Mr. Marshall, sir, you see before you a most contrite man, seeking your pardon for, for a most dreadful mistake. Can you find it in your heart to forgive me? I have just discovered that you are a law enforcement officer, a very senior one, and I have no wish to be hounded to the end of the earth by Interpol. 
Well, so much for my cover. Now, was it you who shot at us in Athens, Mr. Amman? Oh, 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 yes. I ought to clap you in irons. Oh, how can I make amends? I am a very wealthy man, Mr. Marshall. No, no, I can't accept money, I'm afraid. But I'm not a man to hold a grudge, and perhaps I could persuade myself to accept, um... Well, what about a case of champagne? Well, done, sir. Done. And, and I cannot thank you enough. For myself, I have already been sorely punished for my foolishness. I've lost five million dollars worth of munitions I could have sold for twice that sum. Uh, perhaps not, Mr. Avon. Oh? It so happens that I have in my possession a letter of credit on the Arab Bank of Beirut in favor of Mr. Piros for three million dollars. When it's presented to him, he will deliver the stolen cargo to me or to my chosen representative. Uh, perhaps you'd like to find someone to accept it on your behalf. Oh? Oh? Oh, Mr. Marshall, my dear friend, what a noble gesture. And I promise you, not a case of champagne, but a whole shipload. Yes, I swear it. Oh, how nice. You know, ever since I first became nubile, I've always wanted to try a champagne bath. I mean, all those bubbles creeping up. <laughs> Lovely. Then, then we really have only one more problem on our hands, do we not? Which is? The matter of Mr. Pyrrhus. Quite so. The conclusion of our story after these words. I work all day, my job is rough. I need a boot that's good and tough. Red Wing Pecos boots are America's favorite pull-ons for work. Hi, Kurt Gowdy to tell you why. It's not just the way they look and wear. It's also the way their special construction forms itself around your foot for the heel-hugging fit you've always wanted. Red Wing Pecos pull-ons, because you've earned your wing. Do you know how to get on or off mailing lists, sir? Oh, Steve, I don't want to get on or off any mail list. I want to switch list. Right now, I'm just getting stuff from electronic calculators and fireplaces, and they don't look good at all. <laughs> look good? <laughs> yes, I decorate my home with them. Can't you help me get mail for art books and Florida vacations? But, sir, you're not supposed to decorate with the mail. You're supposed to send away for the books and pictures and decorate with them. Oh, what a dummy. Want more or less direct mail? Write DMMA, Box 2728, New York, 10017. I am only unhappy that Mr. Pyrrhus will go free. <laughs> Even though his financial loss will be very considerable, will it not? Oh, how so, Mr. Avon? Because your letter of credit, I am convinced, must certainly be counterfeit. Uh, yes. How very astute of you. But even those of us who enforce the law must on occasion bend it a little. And it's a very good forgery indeed. It'll fool Pyrrhus completely, and perhaps even the bank, too. Uh, unless, of course, someone happened to tip them off after the cargo is delivered and before the letter is actually cashed. Ah, I am sure there might be just one honest man in Beirut to do that. Moreover, neither Piros nor Braga will go free. Braga is currently disguising the Golden Girl and giving her a new name at a shipyard in Sidon. Now, Beirut lives on its sea commerce, and that is a very serious offense here. The police will raid the shipyard, find the work in progress, <laughs> and both Piros and Braga will spend the next ten years of their lives in prison where they belong. Oh, delightful, delightful. Uh, and um, just for my own satisfaction, was it you who shot John Cooper, too? Oh, oh dear, I, I feel so terribly guilty about that. But I thought that you and he were in partnership to steal my cargo. I'll never be able to make it up to him. He, he was not seriously hurt, I hope. My marksmanship was never very good. Uh, John Cooper is recovering nicely in St. Mary's Hospital. But why don't you just send the poor fellow a case of beer? I'm sure he'd appreciate it. And would you care for a whiskey and soda, Mr. Armand? <laughs> and you, Hillary? Uh, yeah, a, a, a quick one. We have a plane to catch. <laughs> Oh, 
What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winner 2. And, of course, there's Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck & Company. You're as perfect as this keepsake diamond ring. It's a symbol of our love. It shows how much you care. This perfect keepsake diamond ring reflects the love we share. Make sure it's a keepsake perfect diamond ring. Select from a wide range of styles at your local keepsake dealer. Listed in the yellow pages under jewelers. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, A Nearly Perfect Crime, was written by Alan Caillou and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Lloyd Bachner and Janet Waldo. Featured in the cast were Richard Peel, Marvin Miller, Larry Moss, Gladys Holland, and Alan Caillou. The music for Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is production supervisor. Recording engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lauren Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Vincent Price. Here's another item for your Bermuda Triangle scrapbook. This one we will solve for you within the hour. The solution will be more simple, more complete, and more reasonable than most you have heard from that mysterious area. And yet, when you hear the solution, you may find it more disquieting than the mystery. For well, then you will always wonder when you've made a simple purchase at the store, a loaf of bread, a pair of shoes, a palatial new yacht, what else may be wrapped up in the package? But Henry, dear, it's an absolute dream boat. Now, isn't it? Well, it is a pretty boat, Celia. And the price. Who would imagine that you and I could buy a boat like this at such a price? Oh, Mr. Merrickin's price is good, my love. So good, in fact, that... That what, dear? That I wonder what's the matter with the boat. Is it haunted? That's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Voyage of No Return by Edward Borges. Our stars, Jeanette Nolan, Harley Bear, and Eddie Firestone. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears where America shops for value. Arnold Palmer, back home in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. He got a start on the golf course here. 
sitting on his father's lap, helping to steer the tractor that mowed the fairways. This is where he learned two things he never forgot, his golf and his continuing concern for the meticulous care and upkeep of equipment. In those days, I was in school. When they were really maintaining the equipment, I was uh, helping do all aspects of it, putting the pins oil in to actually rinsing the parts when we were tearing the plugs out. And, of course, it was my business to know what to do with all those things. Pennzoil motor oil. Arnold Palmer got to know his Pennzoil early. Having uh, lived here in Pennsylvania and not very far from where Pennzoil originated, why, it was a natural thing for me. The natural thing. You know, it seems like asking for Pennzoil motor oil is the natural thing with all kinds of people who know a lot and do a lot. Pennzoil. Ask for it. The story you are about to hear starts with a newspaper clipping. That clipping is from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And here's what it says. Guests at the Tropica Hotel who came out for an early morning swim today found a bizarre spectacle waiting for them down on the beach. Two corpses washed up side by side each in full evening attire. No wounds, but quite dead. Police have tentatively identified the couple as Mr. and Mrs. George Willoughby of Akron, Ohio. A retired factory executive, Willoughby, moved to Miami Beach with his wife about a month ago. There they are reported to have purchased a beautiful, ocean-going yacht, the Flamingo. Since neither Mr. and Mrs. Willoughby had ever dipped their toes into an ocean before this month, it's unthinkable that they would have been so rash as to set out to sea alone in their new yacht. But the Flamingo, which three days ago was tied securely to its Miami Beach moorings, has now vanished. Another weird blank from the world's most sinister stretch of ocean. Well, that's the clipping. Right at this moment, it doesn't mean a thing to Henry and Celia Grant, recently of Tripola, Iowa. Henry and Celia have been driving south down the west coast of Florida. At an out-of-the-way spot called Benson's Cove, they used a substantial part of their savings to make the purchase of their lives, a luxury yacht that they've named the Harvester. Right now, there's nothing on their minds except that life-fulfilled dream. But soon, they will remember the clipping. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. They'll remember. Well, Celia, I reckon we better stop gawking and get on board. What are you up to, Henry? Well, the harvester's not going to do us much good tied up here at the dock. I'm going to figure out how to start the motor, and away we'll go. Henry, you can't do that. You've never been in anything bigger than a rowboat. Oh, I think the old combine was as big as this yacht. And I imagine the machinery was about equally complicated. I've spent most of my life on one kind of machine or another. Have you forgotten already? Oh, Henry, you're terribly smart around the farm, and you know I've never questioned that. And I don't mind drowning any more than you will. But I am not going to have you backing half our life savings into an ocean liner just because you happen to pull a wrong lever. Want to run it yourself, my love? <laughs> now listen, honey. We have to find someone who knows all about ocean yachts and hire him as our crew. At least until you've had a chance to learn how everything works. Well, I don't see that that's really... Hallelujah. Going to be much... Your prayers are answered. Praise the Lord. <laughs> he must have been very attentive. I wasn't even aware that I was asking... The... Henry, don't be awful. Uh... What did you mean, young man? Vernon Wallace, ma'am, and I can see you understand how a man talks when he's been saved, always praising. Of course. And Henry understands, too. Sometimes he just gets a little cantankerous. Oh, I know how it is. I know how it is, and I don't mind a bit. Now, uh, would you be brother Henry and sister Celia? We are not brother and sister. We're married. Oh, I get it. I get it, old timer. <laughs> Some kidder. Some kidder. Well, now, Mother Grant, uh, Brother Marican tells me he just sold this boat to a couple of rich Iowa farmers who don't know the stem from the stern. And if they don't want to just stand there on the docks drooling at it, he says they're praying right now for an expert navigator. And you're an expert navigator? It is the way I make my living, so praise the Lord. Oh, Henry, how wonderful. We will take him, won't we? 
Now, I expect it'll be all right to watch somebody else for a few days till I get the hang of it myself. Great, great, great. Now, that's the spirit, old timer. Listen, I'll just get my sea bag and I'll be right with you. Henry, why are you so hostile to that fine young man? Not hostile, Celia. Maybe not entirely convinced. Of what? Surely you're not going to be suspicious of a man who has been saved. Not as a general rule. But of course, there's always... Always what? Always the case of Judas Iscariot. Rock of Ages. Left oh, there me. he goes again. Henry, surely you're not objecting to a young man who'd rather sing one of the great hymns instead of that heathen rock and roll. No, no, I'm... It's very inspiring. Maybe before we get back to land, he'll learn another hymn. I like it. Well, Henry, I see you're wood carving again. Yeah. I'm going to settle down to some serious time wasting now. Especially till I learn how to run this boat for myself. Well, is that... The... It is. It's the harvester you're modeling. Yeah. And that's why you've been doing all the measuring all over the boat. Well, it wouldn't do not to have the proportions right. Are you worried about shavings on this spotless deck, my love? Oh, of course not. One sweep of the broom and they'll all be in the ocean. Gone forever. Henry, I do like a young man strong in the faith. Me too, Celia. But the real religious folks don't go around shoving you into line. The ones who shove you are after something that's not good for you. Honey, he carries his Bible with him all the time. And those pamphlets about salvation in his pocket. And he's always singing hymns. Yep, packaged like soda crackers. To sell. To sell what, Henry? I don't know. Himself, maybe. Oh, what's that? Thunder, my dear. Oh, but that means a storm. Only a few minutes ago, everything was so calm and sunshiny and beautiful... Now, look, look at that horizon. Well, it's often like that, even in Iowa. Uh, Celia, I think you'd better know. I've been prowling around the boat in odd places, taking measurements. Yes, for your wood carving. Yeah. This is going to be to absolute scale, inside and out. <laughs> uh, down in the hole, where normally neither one of us would ever look... Under the firehouse, I found a loaded revolver. Good gracious. Now, what's a Bible-carrying, pamphlet-packing, saved young man doing with a loaded revolver? Well, I... Now, wait, Henry. How do you know that's Vernon's gun? Is it yours? Well, it could have belonged to the previous owners. Well, that's what I'd like to imagine, Celia. I'd like to imagine Vernon Wallace doesn't even know it's there. That's there, mates. Squall's ahead. Time for landlubbers to go below. Do we... Should we go, Henry? Why, of course, my love. In a storm, the waves will sweep anyone off the deck. Just like the wood shavings. Yes, yes, I'm sure you're right, Henry. Let's go below. seldom makes anything more fun, my dear. And we're trapped in here. In in case... Well, out there, all he'd have to do would be to shoot, and we'd fall in the water in here, at least. Henry, what's this on the dresser? What? Oh, oh, that. And I, that's something else I found while I was prowling around this morning. I took up the mattress to measure the exact dimensions of the bunk from the floor. And there this was, between the mattress and the bunk. Why, it's a gold watch. How could yes, it have... I, I know, old-fashioned type, but new. Now, it must have belonged to the original owner of the harvester. I want to try to get it back to him. I guess he mislaid it. <laughs> and whatever Marikin did to redecorate the boat before he sold it again, he sure didn't take up the mattress. 
so he didn't find Willoughby's watch. Willoughby? Well, I deduced that, my love, from the inscription here. To George Willoughby from the gang at the plant Akron, 1979, and there's a big 35 in the middle, I expect. That's how long he worked there. Willoughby, Henry... Didn't I read in the paper about a Mr. and Mrs. George Willoughby of Akron? <laughs> no doubt, my dear. Hundreds of Willoughbys in the world. Well, that's funny. Watch seems to be all wound up, but it doesn't go. Now, that's odd for a practically new watch. Let me take off the back here and see. What... Well. What is it? Well, no wonder the watch won't go. It's got a piece of paper stuck in the works here. Fold it up like a message. Is there a message, dear? Yes, my love. There's a message. And I guess George Willoughby hoped the next owners of this boat would find it. What's the message, Henry? One word. Looks hastily scrawled. Murder. Smashing. How she plays? No, how she looks. In action-proof eye makeup from Maybelline. Like ultra-big, ultra-lash mascara. Smear-proof, smudge-proof, waterproof. So long, longest-looking lashes stay in the thick of the action. Game, set, and match. Action-proof. Keeps you looking good after the action, too. Ultra-big, ultra-lash mascara. Incredibly long-looking lashes without flaky fibers. From Maybelline. Smashing. It's athletes versus MS. Meet golf champion Lee Trevino. One day you're a happy guy like me, Lee Trevino, walking around, swinging your clubs, and out of the blue, you get struck down by multiple sclerosis, the great crippler of young adults. Right now, there's no cure for MS, but there's hope through research. Half a million victims of MS and related disorders may be invalids, one way or the other, all their lives. Join Lee Trevino. Support your local chapter of the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. I'm sure you've all had a visit from a relative you really didn't want to see or a guest who just wouldn't go home at bedtime but I hope you've never found yourself with a visitor who might be a threat to your life or again might not that's now Henry and Celia Grant's problem with their navigator on the harvester you remember dear the Willoughby's of Akron Washed up on shore in their formal clothes, both dead. Willoughby. Yes, I do remember now. And they had bought a boat, the Flamingo. A boat a lot like this one. They were high society, not farmers. Uh, uh -huh. Probably they usually celebrated by dressing for dinner, and if they were out on the ocean celebrating their new boat... Yes, if they were out on the ocean, what happened at that dinner party? What... Oh... That watch me. Hi, old Tom. Evening, Mother Graham. Hello, Good Graham. evening. Well, what's the matter? My old friend's sound on edge. Here. We are. Yeah, the ocean's getting a little rough, I will admit. Are you seasick? Uh, no. No, we got on the other side of that, but no. Good. Good, great. You old timers always did set the pace for us, youngsters. And a storm at sea can be pretty scary, too. Every crack of thunder sounds like it's going to split your rotten too. And every time a wave hits, old tub pitches just like it's headed for the bottom. I won't blame you if you get uneasy. We're not afraid of the storm, Vernon. And you are right, old Tama. Tie the old stick in place, head straight into the waves and relax. Ride right through a tidal wave. Vernon, this afternoon down in the hold, Henry found a gun. Oh, this gun, you mean? Yes, Vernon. That gun. Well, now, I didn't mention it to you folks, because I didn't want to worry. What would worry us, Vernon? I told you that anything that had to do with navigation, I'd take care of. And I can, and I will. Yes, Vernon. 
But in the past few years, in the Bermuda Triangle, there have been lots of boats like this. Yeah? They sailed out to sea with expert navigators at the helm and the weather perfect. But they disappeared without a trace. Well, now, how, uh, how could that be, Bernard? Well, there is buried treasure in these parts, and adventurers go looking for it. And sometimes those adventurers run into pirates, real 1980 pirates, complete with planes and battleships, see? And that's what this gun is really about, because I want to take good care of you folks. One pistol against planes and battleships. We're not even looking for buried treasure. Ah, but you see, your inner treasure, the fl- I mean, the harvest. These pirates pick up a boat here, a boat there, just by getting rid of its owners. And they sail this stolen vessel into an old, out-of-the-way cove. Like somebody... uh, Benson's Cove, for instance? Sure, old time, I like Benson's Cove. They alter the boat's outward appearance, they repaint it and equip it with forged papers, they sell it again as soon as they can. At a bargain price? Of course. And so long as they didn't overwork any one spot too often, they could keep up this kind of piracy forever without being caught. Right on the money. But how could these pirates get hold of their stolen boats in the first place? (laughs) That's easy, Mother Grant. When they sell a stolen boat, they just sell it to someone who have to have a crew. And they arrange for one of their own men to be that crew. They give them a Bible, a few salvation tracts picked up from local revival meetings. They tell them to mumble a few hymns he's learned on the farm before he went to a farm school. Create credibility among the gullible agents. Credibility is the magic word today. Oh, yeah, right, right on, right on. <laughs> With credibility, you can always find some rich dummies who's got lots of dough but no brains. And they'll invest a fortune in a boat when they don't even know which end sails forward. Yeah, but you'd, you'd never fall into such a dumb trap, would you, old Tom? But I still don't understand. Just ask me, Mother Grant. What happens to the owner's of a stolen boat. Why, this rogue the suckers trusted just waits for a good storm. And he just points a gun, like this one, at his victims, like this. And he orders them up on deck. And then seconds away from the storm just take care of the owners. Even if their bodies are washed up on shore, there'd be no sign of any violence on them. Another... Strange mystery of the sea. Victims of the Bermuda Triangle. Just like the newspaper said. You're right, Mother Grant. Dead right. But, uh, what if the victims refuse to go? Refuse to go? Yes. What if the victims won't do what the villain says? <laughs> Product value. Sears Laboratories work to maximize that value for you. Its manufacturing consultants work with products and their manufacturers to cut production costs. One example is our power spray carpet cleaner. Its plastic parts require molds to form them. Molds are expensive, especially certain designs. So our manufacturing consultants recommended designs that cut mold costs. End result, a better value for you. Sears Laboratories. One reason Sears is where America shops for value. The Consumer Information Center of the U.S. government presents an easy way to get useful information. Just send the coupon portion of your radio to Pueblo, Colorado for a catalog listing more than 200 helpful federal publications, more than half of them free. If the coupon from your radio is missing, send your name and address on a plain piece of paper to free catalog, Pueblo, Colorado, 81009. That's Pueblo, Colorado, 81009. Send no radios, please. What if they refuse to go? What kind of a question is that for a helpless elderly man staring into the business end of a revolver? And if the man holding the gun is asked a question like that, what can he answer? What do you mean, what if they refuse to go? What if they refuse to be this bad man's suckers? Oh. Well, in that case, this fella just aimed his gun at the tomb. 
pull the trigger twice like this. When I found that gun, Vernon, I removed the firing pin and dropped it overboard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I see you did. Now, how'd you manage that? Farmers these days spend most of their lives with machinery. Taking apart a firearm is simpler than most jobs I used to have in a day. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess it is, huh? Well, you spend a few years in the city, you forget what life on a farm is really like. Well. Well. In a case like this, a nasty pirate fella'd have to go at it the mess of way, wouldn't he? What would that be, Vernon? You'd have to use this pistol for a hammer and beat out the brains of his stubborn victims. But uh, he'd run into a problem there, too. Oh, really? Such as? Uh, one hint, Vernon. If you go on with this kind of work, don't ever call your elders old-timer. Oh, they don't like it. And what's more to the point, for your business, they don't trust anybody who does it. You remember I've been carving wood off and on ever since we put out sea? Yeah, 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 I remember well, that. Since I found that gun, I've been careful to keep the knife right here in my pocket. And you can see it's unusually sharp, and I'm quite expert with it. Well, well, well. More goes on in the minds of you old codgers than one might think, huh? Now, I know, Vernon, at some point you're planning to throw that gun in my face. That's what I'd think of in your fix, but I advise you, don't try it. Why not? Well, in the first place, old codgers also dodge a lot quicker than you think. In the second place, the boat's pitching pretty wildly now, and the chances of your aim going true are very slight. And in the third place, if you try it, I shall most certainly stick you with this in the front and out the back. <sighs> nice old man like you. I've killed more hogs than you have mosquitoes, young man. Now, if I were you, I'd drop that gun. Thank you. Listen, you ice-blooded pig sticker. When you found that pistol, why didn't you just take it and shoot me? Without being sure what you were, why, that would have been murder, young man. Now, I have one more question for you. Uh, Celia, hand me that watch. Yes, sir. What is George Willoughby's watch doing? Willoughby's watch? You're mad. With this message, Vernon. No, come murder. On. Come on, now, who are you and what are you doing here? And what's that name you keep confusing with the harvester... Young man, are we the new tenants of the Flamingo? Give me the watch! Get the sand back! Ah, Look out, you young Give me that! Oh. Ah. Oh. Me, are you all right? Yes. Yes, my dear, I'm all right, but... <coughs> I think Mr. Wallace may need a little nursing. I'll keep my eye on him, but... You can take a look at him. I'll just do that, Henry. Be careful, see you. I will. Dear... Henry, no one can help Vernon now. Oh, oh my. I, I didn't mean to kill him. Honestly, Celia. I believe you, Henry. As he came at me, the, the boat lurched, and I fell right against his chest with... He was intending to kill us, dear. We were only defending ourselves. If you had an accident, anyone could see that. Yes, 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 of course. At least I think so. What do you mean, Henry? Well, you know, you thought he was such a wonderful young man. Yes, I did. Clean, cut, courteous, considerate. Right, and helpful, and safe. Yes, but that was all a fake. He is... He was a thief and, and a killer. Yes, we know that now, but who else knows it? Perhaps he's done this sort of thing before. Oh, I'm sure he has. But the only people who know that are at the bottom of the sea where he intended to put us. Something dropped out of his inner coat pocket. What? His Bible. And those papers on Yeah, it. just religious tracts. See, it says on the cover here... Yes. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Oh, no. It's a message. Us. Oh, Celia, you just said it was an accident. Yes, but you said who else would know it. Yes, 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 I did. 
Anybody else who knew him might have thought of him just as you did at first. Henry, there has to be some proof of who he was and what he was. Something we can show people and they'd be certain to believe us. Well, we, we, we've never... We've never looked into his cabin. It wouldn't have been nice. Well, we'd better look now. Steady, steady. My dear. We're really getting rough. Yes, Here's his cabin. Oh, he's locked the door. Uh, he always did, but of course it is our boat, and I have a key, too. There we go. I found the light switch. Careful. Oh, look. How neat everything is. The bed made, everything picked up. My goodness, our Raymond never kept a room like this, I must say. Oh, well, boys don't, you know, dear. At least not ordinary boys. Well, here's his suitcase. Yeah, let me get it up on the bed. It's locked. Well, I'll open it with a knife. Henry, that's that's the knife. I know. I I wiped the blood off on his clothes. I, here, let me get at that lock. Oh, Henry, I'm afraid. Of what now? We don't know what's inside the suitcase. No, but we've got to find out. must be hundreds of dollars in bills and, and also neatly bundled. You'd expect that. Where do you think you got him? I'd... Well, from... from his evangelism, maybe. You remember he said he did take up collections. And sometimes there's lots of money in even one of those collections. So if anyone found him with all this money, he could say it was from the Lord for the Lord's work. Perhaps it was, Henry. He did seem like such a nice young man. Celia, have you forgotten the gun in his hand when he ordered us on deck? And the clicks when he tried to shoot us? But, Henry, maybe he thought we were trying to kill him. Maybe he was a nice young man, but he carried the gun to protect himself from... from people like us. Oh, come on. You don't really believe that. But other people might... They very well might, especially if they found us here with his corpse and his suitcase and all his money. Well, it... well, if they do that, no, no, by thunder, they won't do that. Why won't they? Henry? No one saw us leave. So if if we just dispose of Vernon's body, dispose, chuck it overboard, Celia. Into the sea. But the body might someday wash ashore. Even so, they could never prove, never even suspect that the body came from this boat. But Henry... Yes? What if there's been a mistake? What kind of a mistake? I don't know if I knew. It, it wouldn't be a mistake. My dear, there is always a possible mistake. But our worst mistake would be not to take reasonable precautions. Perhaps so, Henry. Then let's do it. Right away. Ah! Celia, what is it? Out oh, the porthole there! Toward the horizon! I, I don't see anything. It's gone now. But there in the sky, there was a light. A light? Oh, you mean lightning. No, Henry, a light! Round, steady, in one place, glowing like a giant sea monster's eye. Celia, you're letting your imagination run away with you now. Well, you know, Vernon did say this is a very strange part of the ocean. Some people have brought back weird, weird, frightening tales. Who knows what might be out there? Celia, we have plenty of problems right inside this boat without worrying about spooks outside. Now, come on. Let's get this young man overboard. Of course, Henry. You know best. That's your new TV commercial, Mr. Sloak, for Snacky Crackies with Raisin Pits. How much did that actually cost me? Cost? Yes. <clears throat> 
Well, we're still adding it all up here. Forty-two thousand. Gee, TV is so expensive. Hmm, not as long as there aren't any changes. Did, did I mention there may soon be a worldwide shortage of raisin pits? One TV version without raisin. How pits, much will that add? Three thousand. And, and we want to tell Health Nuts we make snackies with uh, Health, Health Nuts. Two hundred and seventy-nine. And we need a version that will talk to the financial community. Put the singing mouse and the dancing bunny in a business suit for. Let me have uh, that one for you. Three hundred. If business conditions make it necessary, with radio you can afford to change commercial fast. If you want to really target consumer groups, it won't cost a fortune to make commercials that fit each audience. Put amazingly flexible radio to work as a primary medium. Radio, it's red hot. For the red hot facts, call this station or the Radio Advertising Bureau. They brought you this message. Vincent Price again. And here's the fourth act of the voyage of no return. You know, Henry. Yes, my love. When we've disposed of Vernon. Yes, Celia. Well, it'll be just as he said. What do you mean? He was right. Neither you nor I know the first thing about navigating a boat, even in perfect weather. We'll never. Come on, Celia. Let's get back to Vernon. We've got to face this situation as we've faced everything else for the last forty-three years, one thing at a time. Yes, Henry. Of course. <gasps> no, no. Steady. There's nothing to fear from Vernon anymore. Poor boy. He looks almost like our Raymond to sleep, doesn't he? Well, Raymond never tried to kill us that I know of. Come on. We gotta get rid of him. One thing, he's just bled in front there. There won't be any messy cleaning up to do. No, it won't be like the time Raymond cut his foot with the axe. Oh, dear. My dear, I, I'm afraid I'm not quite strong enough to do this alone. Could you, would you take his other leg and help me? Yes, of course, Henry. You see it? Uh, Let me get this door open. Uh, there. Uh, don't go out on deck. Just push him out of the way. We'll take care of the rest. Oh! Oh! Henry! The boat gave such a lurch and flung me out here on the deck. I know. Me too. And it slammed the door after us. Where? Where is Vernon? He went over with that first wave. Then... We'll never see him again. No, but if we don't get back inside fast, we'll join him. Now, watch your footing. Ah! The water's made the deck as slippery as oil. Ah! Ah! No, 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 it's all right. Ah! Just a few more inches and... Henry! That light! What? It's blinding me! Yeah. Oh! What's he saying? He, he, he wants us back inside. And we better go, too. Oh, I... I can't get the door open. The wind's blowing so hard. Let, let me help. Now, come on, with. We'll, we'll both hold. Oh. Hard. Hard as you can. That wave almost got us. Yes, and the next one will pull their pole. Oh. 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 There. <coughs> there now. We're safe. Safe? With that light hanging in the sky above us and that voice. What could it... Wait. I know. I know. Wait, what do you know, my dear? Henry! Don't you see? Out the porthole in that last flash of lightning, about half a mile away, there's a ship out there, a giant ship. Yeah. Yes, I thought I saw something. Do it. It, it, it could have been... And that light hanging in the sky, don't you understand? It's a helicopter from that ship. Yes. Yes, that, that would explain that voice. But but why in this terrible storm? Oh, Henry, darling, it's all too clear. Vernon was a pirate. Oh, one man, a pirate, Celia. For heaven's sakes, pirates traveled together in... Oh. In... Oh, good heavens. Yes, Exactly. In ships like that one out there. They might even be going to land on our deck with that helicopter, and then they'll... Yeah, Celia, 
Listen to me now. Go back to Vernon's room, turn out the light, and lock the door. Do you hear? Unlock it only if you hear me say so. Well, what will you do? This knife isn't much, but they'll have to get past me to get to you. No! I won't leave you, Henry. Whatever is going to happen to you is going to happen to us. Celia, I insist. I demand. Henry! It's going to be all right. What? What's going to be all right? In that flash of lightning, I saw the helicopter right out that porthole, and below it, two men on a rope ladder. Well, then they'll be here in no time at all. Yes, but on the underside of the helicopter, I saw red stripes and the words United States Coast Guard. Oh, thank God, thank God, thank God. We'll be safe now. And I I suppose there's no sign of Vernon. Not a trace. Oh, Oh, but Henry, you know that money. We must try to get it back to the people it belongs to. Celia, there's no way to find out who they were or who owns which part of what. What do you think we should do with it, Henry? Perhaps some worthy cause. Oh, heavens. What, Henry? That money. If those Coast Guardsmen should get suspicious... But why should they? They said... You said there wasn't any trace... Of Vernon. But how could we explain all that money in his suitcase? Oh, I see what you mean. It looked more than ever as though we've killed Vernon for his money and disposed of him. Celia. Come on, open up. It's the United States Coast Guard. Uh, open the door. It's... It's not locked. Don't move. We've got you covered. I'm... I'm not moving. Where? Where's the man who was just with you? Henry, he's right. He's... He was here just a moment ago. I don't know where he is now. Watch her. I'll look around. Uh, we saw him in the searchlight. He has to be here. Oh, Henry's here, young man. He was just standing beside me. But you be careful what you do. Henry may be frightened, but he wouldn't hurt a fly. And don't you hurt him. Don't worry, ma'am. We know what we're doing. Where's the crew for this boat, ma'am? There's no crew, young man. Uh, we're checking all boats from southern Florida now out at sea. Why should you do that? We're looking for a young man. We've trailed as far as a place called Benson's Cove. And there we lost him. His name is Vernon Wallace. Oh, what about this Vernon Wallace? Oh! What have you done to my husband? Well, it, it, take it easy, lady. Now, just relax. Henry! Sir, no one will be hurt. What have you done? No, no, no. All oh, right, see the just a little distraction for the officers. Davidson, I think the storm has jarred this man's brain. How so, sir? Well, I found him in the aft cabin, standing on the bunk, throwing his suitcase out the porthole. When I ordered him to put up his hands, he tried to climb out the porthole himself. He didn't stop when I fired a shot into the air. I, I had to drag him back. Yeah, I'm 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 all right now, officer. I I'm afraid the terror of being adrift in this storm unhinged me for a moment. Don't worry about it, sir. We all have our wobbly moments in the face of the unknown. Hey, this night must have been pretty terrible for both of you. Oh, it was that, young man. Yeah, well, I could tell you some stories. Not now. Yes, sir. Uh, you'd probably like to have Davidson here pilot the boat back to harbor for you. Oh, we'd be so grateful, officer. The helicopter and the patrol boat out there will both be keeping an eye on you. Oh, uh, splendid. Before I leave, is there anything else? Uh, why? Uh, what else would there be? I was hoping you might be able to give us some word about young Vernon Wallace. Why? The authorities want to talk with him. He fits the description of a mystery man who's been specializing in robbery and murder on the high seas. Oh. Oh, there's some harebrained talk about a Vernon Wallace being connected with a 20th century pirate gang. Uh, that's crazy, of course. Oh, yes. Uh, crazy. But since you can't tell me anything about him, uh, I'll be on my way. Uh, wait. Uh, yes, sir? I, uh... I do have something to tell you about Vernon Wallace. Henry. The conclusion of our story after these words. Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet, eating her curds and whey. Along came a spider and sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. Children are naturally frightened of many things. 
creepy crawly bugs sleeping in the dark, or maybe just baiting their own fish hook. And millions of children are unnaturally frightened by something else, child abuse. Every year, millions of children suffer physical, emotional, or sexual abuse or neglect at the hands of their own confused parents, neighbors, or relatives. You can do something to change that. Please help. This is Roy Rogers. And Dale Evans reminding you that child abuse can be prevented. Write Prevent Child Abuse, Box 2866, Chicago, Illinois, 60690. That's Prevent Child Abuse, Box 2866, Chicago. Abused children are helpless unless you help. A public service message of this station, the Advertising Council, and the National Committee for Prevention of Child Abuse. Wise. Wise and urgent. As you say, Commander, the shock of all this did unhinge me for the moment, though not quite in the way you think. Why are you doing this, Henry? Because there is a man in Benson's Cove who must be arrested at the earliest possible instant. Benson's Cove, sir? Gregor Marikian, the man who sold us the flamingo. I think I can tell you things you ought to know about him, about international pirates, and... and about Vernon Wallace. I'm especially glad you changed your mind about Wallace. Especially glad about Wallace? Well, you can see lying right there, sir. His name on the cover of that Bible. And the Bible soaked in fresh blood. Naturally, uh, we'd have always wondered... Well, there have been times when our customers come into Avco Financial Services on, say, a Friday night with a personal problem, so we've kept the office open and closed the loan. 9,000 people will go out of their way because Avco is neat. We make it a point to process paperwork real quick, get you the money in one day if we can. I guess you could say we have a service attitude. 9,000 people simply want best. Tell them the people when you borrow you like best. If a customer needs some special help or some kind of personal attention, we'll go that extra distance. Our people put you in the best company because Apco is me. Well, I've even been known to make house calls. Because Apco. Scott Chamberlain, Stone Mountain, Georgia. Is me. The Avco people in your town put you in the best company. Look in the phone book for the office nearest you. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Voyage of No Return, was written by Edward Borgers and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Jeanette Nolan, Harley Bear, and Eddie Firestone. Featured in the cast were John Shea and Michael Rye. The music for Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces. This is Leonard Nimoy. The year is 1922, and we are in Egypt, in the Valley of the Tombs of the Kings. In ancient times, when the pharaohs were still buried here, 
It was called the City of the Dead. It has always been a barren and desolate place. Now, across the empty landscape, walled in by rocky cliffs, all that meets the eye is a small cluster of tents. In one of them, perspiring in the desert heat, is an American archaeologist, Dr. Malcolm Lambert. He is preparing a report to the Gralty Foundation, which finances his work here in Egypt. Now, let's see. Because the newspapers have made such an outrageous melodrama of the dreadful tragedy that has recently happened here, I wish the Foundation to have an accurate account of it and of the bizarre series of events that preceded it. This report was compiled from interviews with members of my team and from my journal. I will start the story on January 25th, 1922. I was in my tent at the site. It was early morning, and the diggers and basket boys had collected to begin the day's work. Suddenly, my young assistant, Gerald Boardman, burst into the tent. Oh, boy, Dr. Lambert, that's it. We're out of business. Good morning, Gerald. What is it this time? The tools have been stolen. What? Shovels, picks, everything. But how could that happen? There really is a pharaoh's tomb here. We're never going to find it. I don't know who's trying to bring our work to a halt, but this time, they've succeeded. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater. A new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Lover of Silence by Robert Ellis. Our stars, Howard Culver, Tommy Cook, and Shepard Mencken. Nothing beats a great pair of legs. Can you imagine a dancer with wrinkles around her ankles? Hi, I'm Juliet Prowse. As a dancer, my pantyhose must fit perfectly. So I wear legs regular pantyhose with memory yarn. Stretches out and back. Fits whether I'm kicking high or bending low. Legs regular pantyhose with memory yarn and a pure cotton panel. Believe me, Juliet Prowse. Nothing beats a great pair of legs. Your American Cancer Society presents Athletes Against Cancer. I'm Johnny Bench with football great Bob Greasy. Thanks, John. You're a catcher and I'm a quarterback, yet we share common concerns. Calling signals, crucial part of any ball game. And we're both deeply concerned about cancer, and here the signals are even more crucial. Cancer's early warning signals. I wish everyone would learn them. We owe it to ourselves. And give generously. Remember, it's your American Cancer Society. For thousands of years, the golden treasures of the Egyptian pharaohs have appealed to the noblest and the basest of man's instincts. Many have gazed in awe at the exquisite beauty of the royal furnishings. Others have carefully studied them, seeking to learn the history of a great and banished civilization. But still others have looted the tombs and carried off the wealth to satisfy their own personal greed. Now, in 1922, the time of our story, little is left. The Egyptian government deals harshly with thieves and carefully regulates the number of historical treasures that may be taken out of the country. Two separate teams of archaeologists are at work at opposite ends of the Valley of the Kings. A British expedition, led by Howard Carter, will soon uncover the fabulous treasures of King Tutankhamun. But our story concerns Dr. Malcolm Lambert's team. And just now, with their tools gone and their diggers standing idle, prospects are dim indeed. Were all the tools stolen, Gerald? Every last one. I... I wonder if someone really is trying to stop our work here. Well, it certainly looks that way to me. Our problems began at the very start of the season, didn't they? With that mix-up about the government permits. I really had to use a lot of pressure to get the papers out at all. Then we had the fire in the laboratory tent. Yes, that was a close call. It was just lucky I had the records in my tent that night. Otherwise, we'd have lost everything. And now the tools have been stolen. I guess the next question is, who's behind all this? And why? I can't imagine. 
Why should anyone want to interfere with our excavations? How about our friends, the British team at the other end of the valley? Howard Carter, preposterous. Uh, professional rivalry, that, that sort of thing. I've known Howard for years. I'd stake my life on his integrity. Well, just a thought. In the meantime, there's no way we can get any more digging done. Well, where's Fuad? I have no idea. He can go back to his desk job in Cairo, as far as I'm concerned. No, no, no. This is his first field assignment, remember. Besides, he's as helpful as any liaison officer I've ever worked with. Ah, uh, let's see how good he is at tracking down some new tools for us. There's only about a month left of this season. We're running out of time. Yes, and running out of money, too, I'm afraid. Oh, that foundation gives me a pain. I'm not surprised they're thinking of cutting off our funds... Nearly three full seasons here, and all we have to show for it is one worthless scarab. If we had to find a scarab, why couldn't it be a really good one? Wouldn't it be great to be able to tell the Foundation and Howard Carter and everybody else that we've dug up a fabulously valuable scarab covered with gold and no, jewels No, no, no. And... Easy, easy, Gerald. Don't get carried away. <laughs> we have some pressing problems to... Shh, shh. What, what, what was that? I didn't hear anything. Shh. I think that someone's outside the tent. I is that you, Fuad? It is only me, good Dr. Lambert. Oh, Moharab, good morning. Uh, do you know where your Uncle Fuad is? Yes, 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 Doctor. I just now saw him talking to one of the guards. Were you here in camp last night, Moharab? Oh, yes, Mr. Bodman. Yes, yes. Did you see anyone near the tool enclosure? I am extremely sorry. No, Mr. Bodman. I did not look out of our tent all night. Extremely sorry. Would you please tell your uncle that we'd like to see him? Yes, 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 good Dr. Lambert. I will run all the way. A fairly fast walk would have been quite all right. <laughs> It's hard to believe that any young man can really be so servile. I'm glad Fuad doesn't let him visit the dig very often. He makes my skin crawl. Meanwhile, we have some basic questions to settle. Do you think we're justified in spending still more of the Foundation's money this late in the season? Buying new tools? Of course we are. I wish I felt that certain. Look at it this way. We've still got a month. And if we don't dig, we won't find anything, will we? Yes, that's right. Good morning, Dr. Lambert. Mr. Bordman. Good morning, Ford. Uh, please come in. What can you tell us about the tools? Very little, I fear. It appears that at an unknown time, during the night, the enclosure was broken into and the tools were carried off. There are whole gangs of thieves hanging around outside the camp, just waiting to grab something, anything they can sell. Oh, now, that's a little exaggerated, don't you think? Regrettably, Mr. Boardman is quite nearly correct. My country is not a wealthy one, and many poor people are forced by the circumstances of poverty to steal in order to live. However, they do not operate as a general rule in gangs. But in this particular case... They did. It, that appears to be probable. Several men would be required to carry away all the tools at one descent. And yet no one saw anything. That's strange. Though Ahmed is foreman and not myself, Dr. Lambert, I suggested to him that he should discharge the guard whose patrol included the tool enclosure. You suspect the guard of theft? Ah, one cannot be certain. In any event... I believe it is wise to show the men that they must all perform their duties excellently. I'll have to go to Cairo for new tools. Ah, a pity. Uh, when time is so precious. It can't be helped. It'll take me at least... If I may interject, I might save a substantial period by telegraphing to my superiors at the Department of Antiquities. Uh, I would ask them to have the tools purchased and assembled at their warehouse. You, Mr. Boardman, would need only to go there, settle a single account, and bring the tools here. That's a fine idea. Great. I should... Uh, let, let's see now. I should be able to catch the 9.30 train from Luxor. And I shall telegraph at once. Oh, 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 Dr. Lambert, may I recall to you your wish to re-examine the cliffs across the valley? Oh, yes. I, uh... Yes, this would be a good time. Could you ask Ahmed to have the donkeys ready in half an hour? Oh, certainly, Dr. Lambert. And we'll be back this evening. I will meet with you eagerly at that time. Oh, thank you, Fuad. 
I wonder if his Arabic is as strange as his English. In any case, with all the confusion this morning, we've forgotten about my daughter. Oh, Carolyn, yes. When is it she's arriving? Her ship gets into Alexandria day after tomorrow. Hey, hey, I could meet her there. I'll be as close as Cairo anyway. Oh, that would be splendid. Uh, is she really as pretty as you say she is? <laughs> yes, she is. Oh, then we're going to get along fine. <laughs> you probably will. Ahmed and I rode our donkeys over to the opposite side of the valley and tethered them in the shade of a rocky ledge. Howard Carter had told me about some rumors he'd heard of a mysterious sarcophagus hidden in one of the shallow caves that the hot desert wind had hollowed out of the cliffs here. We spent several hours walking along the rough trail at the base of the cliff, looking into every likely opening. Find nothing, Doctor. No, Ahmed, nothing at all. Now let's stop here in the shade and rest a few minutes. Yes, Doctor. Ah... Uh... Oh, that's better. As a matter of fact, our entire dig hasn't turned up much more, has it? A scarab, Doctor? No, I'm afraid that doesn't amount to anything. Important. I only wish it were. No, we really have nothing to show for all our work. And now, with one setback after another... A setback? Setback, Doctor? Oh, uh, uh, difficulty, a problem. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Do you think there's really a... Did... did you hear something? Maybe... wind? Yes. Yes, I, I guess I'm imagining things. <laughs> well, do you think someone's really trying to keep us from digging here, Ahmed? It's strange, Doctor. Yes, yes it is. Can you guess at what... No! My... No, can't guess. Bad to guess. Yes, but if we all try to understand what's... Doctor! Ahmed, those rocks. Why, if you hadn't pushed me... Doctor, is all right? Yes. Yes, I... Thanks to you. What happened? Rocks came from clifftop. And fell here. They could have killed us both. Thanks heavens you moved so fast. Why, why Ahmed, you're trembling. Must go home. Yes, yes, certainly. Let's get started. No, no. You go home to America. What, what do you mean? Danger. Doctor can do nothing here. But if... Can do nothing. Scarab. Curse of Pharaoh. Hi, this is Ben Vereen from March of Dimes. I'll bet the last thing you expect from me is a message about newborn babies. That's what I want to talk about. It's important to me. The way I see it, a newborn child belongs to two people, and both of them are equally responsible. So, when we are going to have a baby, we make sure that we follow the March of Dimes advice. My wife gets the best prenatal care possible. We see a doctor early and often, and I help her to remember that. We both make an effort to see that she eats right, that she exercises, and that no drugs are taken without a doctor's approval. With guidelines from the March of Dimes, our baby has every possible chance to make a healthy entrance into this world. A happy one. Hey! Maybe even singing. Jerry Boardman returned to the Valley of the Kings, bringing both Carolyn Lambert and the new tools with him. Father and daughter were happily reunited after their long separation. The girl's pretty smile and easygoing charm brought a welcome change to the Spartan atmosphere that normally prevailed at the dig. At last, the men were able to go back to work in the trench. Ahmed had calmed down a bit, but he seemed nervous and apprehensive. I took Carolyn on a tour of the dig. Workmen with wicker baskets full of sand and rock filed up the steep path out of the trench on their way to the dump. Far below us, Gerald was directing the diggers at the very bottom of the trench. I just can't bear that man. <laughs> You've told me that so often since you arrived. 
I suspect you're trying to convince yourself of it. Your field is archaeology, Father, not psychology. I forget the silly reason you gave me for disliking you. It's not silly. I think he's trying to push you out of the directorship of the dig so he can take oh, over. That's nonsense. And next you'll be telling me he sneaked off the train, came back here, and pushed those rocks down on Ahmed and me. I wish you wouldn't treat that so lightly. Well, I can't go around forever in fear of my life, Carolyn. I'm thankful what? that... It... What's that? I, I didn't think I... Well, that strange sound. Don't you hear it? No, I don't hear anything. In fact, it seems unusually quiet for... Oh, that's it. <laughs> the diggers have stopped work for a few minutes. It's the silence you noticed. Oh, oh, I guess I'm getting jumpy. But I'm worried about you, Father. You've got to be careful. Everyone's nagging me about that. Gerald's been after oh, me ever since... Oh, that man. Do you know he spent the entire train trip telling me that you're doing everything wrong here? Carolyn, my dear girl, that doesn't mean anything. He got so technical. I didn't even know what he was talking about half the time. He said the sides of the trench were too steep, that it was liable to cave in. Oh, he and I have discussed that, but I've been digging in this kind of rock and gravel for 30 years, and you develop a feeling for what you can and can't do with it. The trench is perfectly all right. Fuad agrees with me. And you know I wouldn't endanger the men. Oh, I told Jerry he was crazy. Well, now, he's young, he's excitable, conscientious, but not really crazy. Oh, Father, you always like everybody. He's also a first-class assistant. I'm lucky to have him. <laughs> All right, don't overdo it. And he most certainly doesn't want me out of the way. Oh, but there is some sort of plot, isn't there? Oh, I, I really don't think so, Carolyn. But you're not completely sure, are you? Gerald convinced me at last that he and I should talk seriously about our succession of accidents. They simply could not be plain bad luck, he said. An unknown person was trying to bring our work to a halt. He pointed out that since Ahmed and I had nearly been killed by the rock slide, our enemy, that was his word, would stop at nothing. At Gerald's urging, I posted special guards around my tent to be sure that no one would eavesdrop, and he and I met inside to discuss our situation. When you get right down to it, Dr. Lambert, your daughter Carolyn is the only person here who can't be a suspect. Really, Gerald, if you're going to pick on Come every... on now, you agreed that we should talk. Reluctantly. Well, even so, you agreed. Now, Carolyn didn't get here till after the so-called accident, so She can... suspects you, by the way. What? Me? Really? Oh, yes, yes, she's quite firm about it. <laughs> well, you tell her... Uh, that I wouldn't plot against you till after you've actually found a pharaoh's tomb. Once you've done all the hard work, then I'll get rid of you and take over. Why don't you speak to her yourself? Because she's avoiding me. Oh, that won't last long. What does she really think my motive is? Pretty much just what you said, that you'd like to take over the dig? Well, I suppose that does look like a possibility. Okay, I'm a suspect. Now, what about, um... Out of the question... He was with me when the rocks fell. But he wasn't hurt, was he? Well, no, but... Also, the workmen consider him the boss, not you. And don't forget, we allow Ahmed to distribute their pay. I don't see your point. I only mean that he's got a whole crew of willing accomplices. All right. Ahmed's second on the list. Now, let's consider Fuad. He's an even less likely suspect than Ahmed. And he'd need accomplices, too. He couldn't have carried off the tools all by himself, and the workmen don't even like him, as far as I can tell. No, he acts pretty superior most of the time. Oh, he's an extremely intelligent man and well-educated. In Egypt, that puts him in a special class. He's also comparatively well-paid, I imagine, which means that he could hire accomplices. Doubtful, I think, but, well, let's put his name down. Now, who else is there? Mohareb, our own Uriah Heep. <laughs> we actually don't know much about Mohareb, do we? No, not really. He's Fuad's nephew. He's uh, nearly finished school, seems to like visiting the dig, but I can't remember when he was here and when he wasn't. Neither can I. Well, in any case, on my list of suspects, Mohareb's the least likely. The kid's afraid of his own shadow. Hmm. What uh, about motive? Considering Ahmed first, he'd be out of a job if we shut down, so I can't imagine why... Come to think of it, just before the rock slide, he and I were talking about... Uh, that's not important. No, no, no. What did he say? Well, he mentioned the scarab and... You never told me that. Well, it hardly seemed necessary. What is the only thing, other than tons of gravel, that we have dug up so far? The scarab, of course. Exactly, the scarab. 
And I think that's the key to the whole plot. But it's nothing, Jerry. It's plaster. It's even badly made. Probably a clumsy attempt by an apprentice jeweler. You and I know that because we're looking at it as American archaeologists. Uh, you mean that someone who doesn't know what it really is might think it was enormously valuable? Or enormously important. Oh, well, now that's interesting. Ahmed appears to think it's important. He said so. That's just my point. Some Egyptians might very well see all sorts of religious or political significance in it. Things that you and I would never dream of. All right, suppose we take the scarab over to Howard Carter's camp. He may know more about this aspect of it than we do. Okay. Where is the thing, anyway? Right here on the table, under the maps. No, no, I don't see it. Here, it's in this box with a... Good heavens, it's gone. Oh, it must be here somewhere... No, Maybe no, I looked uh, at it just this afternoon. I'm positive I put it back in the box. Gerald, it's been stolen. Turtle Extra. Car wax that gives you more than just a shine. Turtle Extra. There's more than sunshine and raindrops out there. Howling wind, bitter cold, fierce heat, mud, pollution. To protect against all that you need. Turtle Extra. The extra protection of polymers. The extra durability of silicones give you extra hard shell protection. Probably more protection than you'll ever need. Turtle Extra. Extra hard shell. Turtle Extra. Young, bright, eager to learn, but without resources. It's a helpless, hopeless feeling. Project Seed, the American Chemical Society program, brings help and hope to economically disadvantaged students. We've given aid to nearly 1,000 students in the 10 years since we started. We're not the biggest aid program, but the break we give students may be the only one they will ever get or need. Project Seed. The American Chemical Society. The night is hot and still, and a strange air of foreboding hangs over the camp. Carolyn, unable to sleep, climbs to the top of the hill that overlooks the dig. The guards recognize her and continue on their rounds. She stands there alone, looking out across the valley lost in thought. Suddenly, there's a noise behind her. <gasps> My dear Miss Lambert. Oh, Fuad, oh, he startled me. Oh, I'm profoundly sorry, Miss Lambert. But surely you should be in your tent at this hour. Oh, but it's so peaceful up here. I felt as if I were the only living person for miles around. I too have felt that same sensation here, Miss Lambert. There is a special atmosphere, a feeling of solitude... In silence. Yes. It's so terribly quiet. It was so even in ancient times. Do you see that mountain peak up above us there against the sky? The highest one? It looks like a pyramid. Ah, precisely so. That peak was believed to be the home of the goddess Myrut Saigar, who presided over the royal tombs, the city of the dead. She was called the lover of silence. I wonder... I wonder if the goddess was a lover of beauty, too. <laughs> How extraordinary that you should say so, Miss Lambert. Oh, it's so lovely by moonlight. Your pyramid mountain up there looks like solid silver. It almost has a ghostly glow. There are ghosts all about us, Miss Lambert. <laughs> oh, you aren't trying to frighten me, are you? Oh, no, 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 no. That would be ungallant. I meant only that... Ghosts are quite nearly all that is left here in the Valley of the Kings. Ghosts and empty tombs. Empty? But what about the mummies of the pharaohs and all the gold and jewels? Oh, gone long ago, Miss Lambert. Most of the treasure was stolen by tomb robbers in ancient times. Scientists and collectors have since carried off the remainder. Oh, but my father... There thinks... may still be a hidden tomb that no one has yet found. Mr. Howard Carter thinks so, and your good father also believes he is quite near to one. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful for him if he could make a really spectacular discovery? That happens but rarely. Uh, but one of the most spectacular finds of all scarcely involved either gold or jewels. Really? What was it? During the 21st dynasty, in order to thwart the tomb robbers, the priests of Amon secretly moved the sacred remains of the pharaohs from their original tombs to other, 
more secure resting places. At last, most of the mummies were collected in two hidden depositories. Did anyone ever find them? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But before that happened, the pharaohs remained safe and undisturbed for more than 3,000 years. 3,000 years. One of those hiding places was discovered when I was a young child. But in this event, happily, the Egyptian government secured control. The Department of Antiquities sent down a German gentleman to take charge. The mummies had been placed in a vast secret crypt deep under the cliffs. The German gentleman needed to lower himself by rope. At the bottom of the shaft... He lit a torch and held it high to illuminate the huge chamber. The stone coffins of the pharaohs lay about in great numbers. In the flickering light, he gazed upon the sarcophagi of the most powerful rulers of our ancient world. The pharaoh Thotmos III was there, and the great Ramses. The German gentleman discovered that he was standing amidst the earthly remains of forty pharaohs. Forty? Goodness! Oh, what a wonderful day that must have been for archaeology. For Egypt, Miss Lambert. The sarcophagi containing the mummies of the pharaohs were taken by barge down the Nile to the museum at Cairo. The Egyptian people reacted as if they were witnessing the funeral of a beloved monarch recently dead. They lined the riverbanks to watch. My father held me high up on his shoulder so I could see. My mother murmured prayers as the boat glided slowly past. Men fired their rifles in salute. Women followed along at the water's edge, tearing their hair and wailing a high, shrill cry of grief. I... I can hear it still. A lamentation for long-gone glories. An ancient cry of mourning echoing down from the days of the pharaohs themselves. The work here in the valley means a great deal to you, doesn't it, Fuad? I... I like to think, my dear Miss Lambert, that my work here is of value. But uh, I ramble too much. No, really? Yes, 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 it is a serious failing. The moon has nearly set behind the hills, and you should get some sleep. Well... Perhaps you're right. Oh, assuredly so. I hope we can talk again soon, Fuad. That would be charming. Good night, Miss Lambert. I'm not sure I fully understand you, Ahmed. You mean you actually saw Muharab in my tent? Not in, Doctor. Maybe come out. Do you think he might have taken the scarab? Maybe, Doctor. Where were you when you saw him? With workmen, far away. And this was yesterday afternoon? Yes, Doctor. Well, Ahmed, thank you for telling us. I see Muharab's down there at the bottom of the trench. Would you ask him to come up here, please? Yes, Doctor. I can't believe it. Is Muharab the one behind all this? Well, I'm shocked, too. How could that little pipsqueak cause so much trouble? I wouldn't have thought he had the nerve to sneeze. But we must be sure to give him every chance to tell his story. You wanted me, good Dr. Lambert? Yes, Muharab. I might as well come right out to it. You were seen near my tent yesterday at the time the scarab disappeared. I may have been, Dr. Lambert, uh, Mr. Bortman, but I did not take it. I would not steal from friends who have been so good to me. But we have a witness, Moharab. Impossible, good Mr. Bortman. I have not stolen anything. And all the time you go around here as if you're eager to kiss our boots. But, but I like to be polite to show my appreciation. Moharab, for... did you take the scarab? No, 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 good Dr. Lambert. Never. It'd be pretty dumb to steal a worthless scarab anyway. I swear on the heart of my mother that... Moharab, what's the matter? Why are you staring like that? Scarab is worthless? But you... You said it was fabulously valuable. When did I say that? Oh, so you were listening outside the tent the other day. You spoke of gold and jewels. I was talking about something else, Moharab. The scarab you stole is worth only a few dollars. You tricked me. No one tricked you, Moharab. You did. I I humiliated myself day after day and... You are devils. Devils. So all that groveling really was just an act. Moharab, I know you're not here at the dig very often, but... Devils! 
Go back to America where you belong. It was you all the time. Oh, I might have known. Your Uncle Fuad will be extremely... Hey, hey, hey. Un- what's going on down there in the trench? Well, I, I don't know. Something's happened. Now, what have you done now, you Guard. miserable... Guard. Yes, Doctor. Take charge of Muharab, and don't let him out of your sight. Yes, Doctor. Here comes Ahmed up from the trench. He's running. Doctor! Doctor! Mr. Fordman! Ahmed, what is it? What's wrong? Steps, Doctor. Steps, Mr. Boardman. Steps? What do you mean? Stairway cut into stone. A stairway? I can hardly believe it. Gerald, do you realize what this means? Yes, sir. After all this time, we found it. We found our tomb. I like pepperoni, but it doesn't like me. Feel better fast with Digel. With the ingredients in Digel, relief from acid indigestion and gas starts in less than a minute. I like corned beef. I like cabbage. I like franks. I like beans. I like spaghetti. And meatballs. But they don't like me. If you like something that doesn't like you, feel better fast with Digel. Digel relief starts in less than a minute. For occasional use only as directed. Forty love smashing. How she plays? No, how she looks. In action-proof eye makeup from Maybelline, like ultra big, ultra lash mascara, smear-proof, smudge-proof, waterproof. So long, longest-looking lashes stay in the thick of the action. Game set and match. Action-proof keeps you looking good after the action too. Ultra big, ultra lash mascara. Incredibly long-looking lashes without flaky fibers from Maybelline. Smashing. Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of The Lover of Silence. February 3rd, 1922. Events moved swiftly after the discovery of the steps at the bottom of the trench. We quickly cleared away enough gravel to reveal the entire stairway cut into the rock, leading steeply downward. At its foot, we came upon a tunnel, large enough to stand up in, also cut into the rock. But it, too, was filled with debris and gravel, and still more backbreaking work was required. By late afternoon, the tunnel was cleared. We assembled in the eerie half-light at the far end of it, deep under the rock. In front of us was a sealed doorway, blocked with rubble and plastered over. A pharaoh's tomb for sure, Dr. Lambert. Yes, and the seals are unbroken. It's it's incredible. Oh, I wish we had more flashlights. It's, It's too late in the day to clear the door completely. I thought I might use this chisel to make a small hole here, at least enough to to see what's on the other side. Let me slip in beside you. All right. Yes. Scrape a little along the lower edge there. All right. Good. Now, let me... Can you get it? Is it moving? Yeah, I I think... Ah, It's out. (laughs) Jerry, what's the matter? It's bad air. Dust, perhaps. It'll be gone right away. Possibly you should not exert yourself for a moment, Mr. Borden. Maybe not. Dr. Lambert, you should be the first (coughs) to look through anyway. Oh, yes, Father. Won't you take my light, Dr. Lambert? Thank you, Fuad. Father, can you see anything? I... I I never... Are you all right? Oh, yes. Yes. What do you see? Such... Such beautiful things, exquisite wall paintings, furniture, statues, many statues, a a great carved chest, bundles heaped on the floor. Can you see any gold? Yes, my dear, gold everywhere. I prepared a statement for Fua to send to the Department of Antiquities, asking them to notify the press and requesting additional police. We arranged to take turns standing watch that night at the door of the tomb. Gerald chose the first shift. I relieved him at 10 o'clock, and the hours from then until 2 a.m. passed very slowly. Thoughts raced through my mind without any rational order. In the excitement of our great discovery, Carolyn and Gerald seemed to have patched up their differences. Muharab was still temporarily in the custody of our guards. There had been no time to deal with him, but at least he could cause no further difficulties for us. We were all safe. The tomb had been found, and in a few more hours, we would open it. 
Ah, Fuad, I'm glad to see you. Ah, yes, Dr. Lambert. I've got to confess, it's been a lonely four hours down here. Precisely so. There's no point in my going back up to the tent. I'm thoroughly wide awake. Would you mind if I stayed here and chatted with you? The tunnel is stifling, Dr. Lambert. You should go outside into the clean air. Oh, I will soon. But I wanted to tell you how grateful I am for all your help. There is no need for gratitude. Oh, but there is. We've had so many difficulties lately, and you've always been... It was not my plan to tell you in this manner, but you are entitled to a special explanation. An explanation of what? You speak euphemistically of difficulties. Is it a surprise to hear that your Mr. Boardman is responsible for those difficulties? Well, that's inconceivable. Quite naturally. Mr. Boardman does not know that he was a participant. At the department offices... He caused an outrageous disturbance when there was a small delay in issuing your permits to dig. He acted as if he had personally come to rescue Egypt from the Dark Ages. Now, Fuad, surely that's an exaggeration. I have seen many foreign archaeologists call it the department. They all have the same overbearing attitude. The manner that seems to say, you poor Egyptians should feel honored that we are willing to invest our money and talent in your miserable little country. Really, Fuad, I think... We have had too much of foreign arrogance. It has prevailed for years. I myself resolved to act. I applied for a position in the field with your team. But what's this got to do with... It was I who started the fire in the laboratory tent. I who arranged for the theft of the tools. You... But I thought Moharab was... No, 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 no. You were in error there. I am not very pleased with my nephew. He plays at being the groveler, but who knows what his mind is doing. He will never be capable of anything but petty and selfish designs. I know nothing of his stealing the scarab. The other difficulties, as you term them, were all part of my plan. It was also I who arranged the rock slide near the cliffs. You... Tried to kill us? Certainly not. If I wanted to kill anyone, I should not use so clumsy and imprecise a weapon. I wished only to frighten you. But the rocks very nearly hit Ahmed. Ahmed is a peasant. I... I I must ask you to go up to your tent at once. But why did you do all this, Fuad? I wish the foreign excavators to leave my country. Egypt is entitled to keep all of her treasures, not merely a part of them. But now you have found the tomb. It promises to be one of the most splendid of discoveries. And so, there is no more time. I... I have therefore formed a new plan. Fuad, that's at least four times you've taken out your watch and looked at it. What's wrong? You must leave. Go up to the surface and stay there. Tell me why. You are always the kind and considerate gentleman, Dr. Lambert. Not like the others. I could not bear it. I I do not want you to be killed. Killed? There is an explosive here. My God, the tomb. No, 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 no. The tomb is safe. I would not harm it. But then where's the explosive? Fuad? It is hidden in the trench. I'll find it. No, 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 you cannot. No time is left. You must go. What? What about you, Fuad? I remain here. No. Ah, It is the moment for a dramatic gesture. I have sent a statement of my own to Cairo in company with yours. Our news is already going out and the eyes of the world are turning on to this spot. This is 1922, Dr. Lambert. Egypt must be rid of foreign domination in archaeology, in everything. That is my proclamation. (laughs) Proclamation is the correct word, is it not? Fuad, please. The whole world will see how desperately we need our own scientists. Perhaps then authentic philanthropists will come to our aid, those that genuinely wish to help my country. I would die to achieve that. No, Fuad. The tomb can readily be excavated again. There will be only a temporary interruption But it is our national heritage, ours. We must keep a firm grip on our glorious past. And soon, sometime in the future, my dear country will once again... Not this way, Fuad. There's so much you can do, so much... What was that? Someone's coming. No. No! Father, are you down there? Carolyn, stop! 
Don't come down here. Carolyn. Carolyn, stop. Go back. What's wrong? Don't come down here. Father, what is it? Stay up there where you are. Don't move. The conclusion of our story after these words. You know, a hometown is never just a place on a map. It's more like a feeling, something to hold on to when things go wrong. That hometown feeling is especially important to the men and women you know in our armed services. Men and women who may be thousands of miles away from home for months or even years, who go through the same emergencies and personal traumas that come to us all. Well, there are some folks around who see that those service people are never out of touch with home. They're the people at the Red Cross chapter with a special service to the armed forces, a service that carries messages about an illness or a newborn child that can make a loan or a grant for an emergency trip home. It's only with our help that the Red Cross chapter just down the street can also be just down the street from every service person you know, and that's where hometown ought to be. Red Cross is counting on you to help. Oh, Father, thank God you weren't hurt. Just just a little out of breath, that's all. What happened? It it was Fuad. He put an explosive in the trench and... And he's buried down there. Fuad? Oh, I, I can't believe it. Why would he do such a thing? He said it was a... A gesture. That's as good a word as any, I suppose. A sad and and splendid gesture. Carolyn and I were still clinging to each other when Gerald came running up to us. We three stood silently, looking back on the spreading pall of dust, ghostly in the moonlight, that hung over the jumbled rocks where our trench had been. That scene will stay with me forever. Above it all, high up on the horizon, rose the pyramid of living rock, shining like a silver monument. The home of the lover of silence. What's it a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, they're Sears Best Products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck and Company. There's a place for everyone in the PTA. When we became a single-parent family, problems at home were affecting my kids in school. But working with the PTA made it easier to cope. As a teacher, I know that children benefit when there's trust between parents and teachers. The PTA makes this possible. My wife and I feel the PTA is a place to solve school problems. Everyone gets involved. There's a place for everyone in the PTA. How about you? Write National PTA, 700 North Rush, Chicago 60611. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Lover of Silence, was written by Robert Ellis and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Howard Culver, Tommy Cook, and Shepard Mencken. Featured in the cast were Linda K. Henning and Corey Burton. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle, John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is production supervisor. Recording engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI.
Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value, a name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Vincent Price. Have you ever thought of going on a real African safari without benefit of travel guide and phony hoopla, climaxing with a lion hunt? This is Arch Ovalor. I'm not going to start this by modestly telling you that I'm an ordinary guy. I'm not. Neither are you. Whether you're male or female... All of us are quite extraordinary, members of a species that can fling ourselves to the stars in pioneering ecstasy or slaughter each other with atomic fire over transient differences of transient opinions. All this is to prepare you for our going on a lion hunt. Yes, you and I, ordinary, extraordinary people on a safari in Africa. Now, it all happened about a handful of years ago when, with the very first tape recorder to cross the border into what was then a politically unsophisticated Africa, I went on a lion hunt. After many months in the so-called dark continent, watching the visitors from all over the world being crisscrossed and double-crossed by so-called experts and explorers and exploiters, My eyes, to say the least, were very weary and very, very skeptical. Let me tell you of that lion hunt, yours and mine. Mutual Radio Theater. A new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Lion Hunt by Arch Obler. Our stars, Elliot Lewis and Ben Wright. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears. A name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet, eating her curds and whey. Along came a spider and sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. Children are naturally frightened of many things. Creepy, crawly bugs sleeping in the dark, or maybe just baiting their own fish hook. And millions of children are unnaturally frightened by something else. Child abuse. Every year, millions of children suffer physical, emotional, or sexual abuse or neglect at the hands of their own confused parents, neighbors, or relatives. You can do something to change that. Please help. This is Roy Rogers. And Dale Evans reminding you that child abuse can be prevented. Write Prevent Child Abuse, Box 2866, Chicago, Illinois, 60690. That's Prevent Child Abuse, Box 2866, Chicago. Abused children are helpless unless you help. A public service message of this station, the Advertising Council, and the National Committee for Prevention of Child Abuse. This is Vincent Price again. I'm often asked, where do those writers get the ideas for those plays? Well, I can certainly answer that question as far as the author of the play you are about to hear is concerned. Award-winning playwright Arch Obler actually went to Africa a while back, and he actually went on a lion hunt against a rogue lion who had killed a native. So the events you are about to hear, yes, and even the animal sounds, are really factual. 
So get your pith helmet on and check your cholera shots as we start on our safari through Archobler's extraordinary play, Lion Hunt. <laughs> Now, a lion hunt in yesterday's Africa didn't happen easily. You rode many miles along hot, dust-clouded, rutted roads that snapped auto springs like tired bits of toothpick. Then you made camp and you got ready for the hunt. Native scouts to be sent out to find the lion's spoor, a zebra to be killed and the meat staked out as bait, guns to be checked and ammunition readied. But always a lion hunt was waiting and waiting. The hush talk when you sat in the black African night, listening to the sounds of the night jungle. Your only companion, one Jock Harder, the so-called master white hunter. A master at so many uninflated dollars per hour. Mr. Robler. Uh, yes, Mr. Harder. Uh, did you know there was a leopard here last night within a few yards of the tent? This tent? This tent. Well, now, and how can you tell it was a leopard? Well, you can tell a leopard by his grunt. He makes a noise like this. <coughs> <coughs> well, we we certainly don't need a throat-clearing leopard tonight, do we? <laughs> well, you never can tell. And um, Might I ask, uh, have you ever hunted before? Oh, of course I caught a frog, big one, in a forest preserve right outside the wilds of Chicago. Is that a wee bit of a joke? <laughs> it's a matter of opinion. You know, this is certainly like something out of Hemingway. Hemingway? He was an American writer, a very chested fellow. Wrote about the real Africa. Is that a fact? As facts go. Uh, tell me, Mr. Harder. Confidentially, do you go out on many of these pay-as-you-go lion hunts? Only when the officials tell me there's a rogue lion killing off the cattle of the Maasai. A rogue lion, eh? Aye. <sighs> Your gun bearers are so quiet. Aye. Are they Maasai? Hmm. Wakamba. I keep wondering, where are the drum beats, the dancing, the mumbo-jumbo of the travel circular? What? What? That's a hyena. Big one. Yeah. Yeah, they're always big, aren't they, when it's too dark to see them. They're only scavengers, aren't they? No, but not only. What do you mean? They hunt in packs sometimes when they're hungry. I've I've seen the thigh bone of a man's leg crushed by one bite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you really think we'll get a lion tonight? Well, you never know. There are plenty in this district. This is real Maasai lion country. You'll hear the animals soon when they come to the water hole. They go... <coughs> Quite an animal sound man, aren't you? Mr. Harder, I'm going to be perfectly frank with you. I think it's about time. All this sitting out here in the blackness waiting for a lion to bite into that zebra meat is very, uh, what's the word? Uh, full of atmosphere. Regular Hollywood stuff. But truthfully, isn't it all a shade, forgive the word, phony? You don't answer me? All right, that's answer enough. Believe me, I understand. You paid professionals are serving up thrills to the American visitors at so many dollars per thrill. Okay. A lion hunt is supposed to be a prime kick, a thrill experience. So here we sit in the dark. But but I happen to know that your king of the beasts is a scavenger. Yeah, a, a carrion eater like those hyenas out there. Oh, if you wound him and push him, he'll turn and fight. But hell, a six-inch rat will do that. So what do you say we close out the farce and I'll pay you off and we'll get back to Nairobi? As you wish. Uh, Mr. Robler, uh, may I tell you about a pair of those scavengers? Uh, Mr. Harder, do I have a choice? Well, it was over 40 years ago. It's uh, all a matter of public record. They were building the first railroad in East Africa. The heat, the uh, sickness, hmm, Africa itself. It was not going too well for the thousands of coolies who'd been brought all the way from India to cut the jungle brush and grade the way for the laying of the tracks. But uh, nothing stopped the work until the rails reached a place called Tsavo. And an engineer by the name of 
Patterson. I can't believe it, Doctor. I absolutely won't believe it. Oh, take it easy, Mr. Patterson. It's much too hot a day. But it's my responsibility. If the work isn't done, I get the blame. I've failed. No one else. I prescribed ten grains of quinine. They're liars. That's what they are. Any excuse to get out of work. Well, I won't have it. They will work. No, Patterson. You're only exciting yourself. Needlessly. Always after you with a million imaginary sicknesses to keep from working, aren't they? Well, this is parallel. You know medicine. All right. I know lions. Man, look for yourself. Hundreds of coolies. Campfires. No lion born of a lion would ever come within a mile of this place. But those two men have disappeared. Run away, that's all. Run away from work and the others are using it as an excuse. But it won't work. Not with me. I'm shoving this railroad through and no lazy, work-dodging pack of rice... Ah! Patterson, what? I heard, I heard. It's just part of their little game to make me believe. So clever, aren't they? Job's getting too tough, so they think I'll ship them back to Bombay with a thank you. Sorry I took your time. Sub, well, it won't work. Sub, come, shaitan, he has killed, sub, sub. Stop it, sub. man. Stop clawing sub, at me. Sub, sub, come, sub. Patterson, Patterson, let him talk. Abdullah, what's the matter? What, what? Simba, shaitan, Simba, he killed my friend. Come, sir. You too, you drunken idiot. Get out no, of here. No, Patterson, leave him alone. We better go see. Come, come See come. what? Bunch of drunken Indians in a brawl? There is no lion in this camp. There never was, and there never will be. <laughs> If you had a friend who was dying, how much would you do to save him? Would you give your blood? Would you give your money? Sure you would. That's what friends are for. But every year, 23,000 people die in car crashes because they have too much to drink and then try to drive. And all those people have friends, and all those friends don't do a thing to save a life. If your friend has too much to drink and drives, your friend could die. It would be so simple to save him. It doesn't take blood. It doesn't take money. It just takes caring. Caring enough not to make excuses, not to laugh it off as your friend stumbles down the steps. Take his car keys. Call him a cab. Let him sleep it off on your sofa. Drive him yourself. Maybe you'll have a little trouble convincing him, but it'll be worth it. It won't end your friendship. It'll save it. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. A public service message on behalf of the U.S. Department of Transportation. We now return to Arch Obler's story of Africa. Abdullah! Abdullah, get out of the way. How can we see where to go if you keep blocking us off? You'll see well enough. Another native with a knife at his back. Look at them all, round their fires, laughing at us. Two fools full of panic. Mm. Which tent, Abdullah? Where? Here, here, Saib. This, this is one. This is where Simba... All right, all right. Pull back the tent flap so we can see. No, no, I... Uh, Give me the please. lantern, you yellow... Partisan, wait. Let me... Oh. Oh. I... Dear God. I... No. Oh, wait a minute. This man. Look closely, Doctor. A knife fight. Yeah. Someone ripped him. I mean, someone... With teeth that tore him in half, bit through his skull. I saw the engineer saw and believed at last that a, a lion had come through the fires through the thousands of men and had killed and eaten. What's this, Patterson? Why are you shooting? Sighting in my gun, Doctor. Just sighting it in. Ah. It's been a long time since I used this one. I wanted it ready. For tonight? Yes. 
But uh, how can you be sure the lion will return? A man-eating lion is one that's old or crippled. Can't catch game in the normal manner. So he turns to killing man as easy prey. This one must be very desperate for food. Sick. That's why he takes these chances. Yeah. That's why you can depend on the fact that he'll come back as soon as it's dark to finish his meal. So that night, aye, maybe a night like this one, the two men waited in a little thorn shelter by the body of the dead. Patterson. Yes. How much longer? I don't know. His hunger will bring it. Oh, my legs, so cramped. Don't move. Oh, so dark. The moon. I've had a time for clouds. There's light enough. Remarkable. What? Oh, all those, all those thousands of coolies and. Not a sound in camp. They're all waiting, just, 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 just waiting. I, I, I wonder if quiet. What? Shh. The brush. The head. Yes. Coming. Closer. I, I, I can't see. Come ahead, you devil. Harrison. Shh. shh. What? What is? There's something behind us. Oh, doctor. What? Blasted clouds, I can't see. <laughs> Doctor! Doctor! Blame gun. Jammed. Doctor! I can't see what. I, I, I'm here. Oh, oh, my back. Lantern. Where? Matches. Oh! Doctor! Oh! oh. Doctor! Oh. Oh. Where are you? What? Here! Here! I, here! Let me see. What? Oh, my back. It's torn. Look. Claws. But how... The lion was ahead of us. Oh, hold the, hold the lantern. Hoy. Hoy. The body. It's gone. Harrison, listen to me. There were two. Two lions. <laughs> Man! Man, listen to me! Be still! Nyamazini! Kaparam! Yes, Abi! Tell them to be still and I will tell the truth to them. Yezini! Yezini! Abai Sadi! Wai Shemeshana! Tell them Singh died as a brave man dies. Singh Jiriwa! Tell them that now that we know our enemy, we will destroy them. No lion born of a lion can stand up against a high-powered rifle bullet. Kaparam, what did that one say? He said, what proof is there that the white man's bullet can kill Shaitan the devil. Listen to me, all of you. Listen, you have come here to Africa to build a railroad, the first, and that railroad will be built. Two lions, mangy, toothless lions, driven to human flesh out of their very weakness. These miserable creatures cannot stop us if we act and behave like men. I give you my pledge. They will be destroyed. From this moment on, I dedicate myself to their destruction. So go back to work. It is broad daylight. You are all safe. As soon as it's dark, I will track down those miserable creatures. Kaparam, what? At the edge of the crowd, the lions, they have seized the man. My rifle. Get me my rifle. Hi, Mr. Rowe. In broad daylight, 
as if to fling Patterson's words in his face, the man-eaters came back and each seized the coolie and disappeared into the thornbush jungle. And Patterson saw through the swirl of panicking natives, he saw that far from crippled, aged creatures, these, these were great lions in their prime, deliberately man-eaters. Wake up, wake up. Hmm? Wake up, listen. What? What? What the devil is this? See for yourself. On the hillside. What? The men. What are they? It's a death chant. The call is. They've been joined by the Maasai. The chant? What? I've heard it once before. Many years ago, during a cholera plague. They're saying that they are going to die. No. I'll stop that. No, no, wait, Patterson, wait. Wait, 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 wait. Listen. Don't just come pointing at me. I've got to... Listen to me, I beg you. I, 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 I've got to tell you. Uh, about me. What? What? Please, please stay and listen to me. All right, all right. Uh, well, no, I'm not a young man anymore. I, I'm an old man. During the night when I, when I couldn't sleep, all thoughts came back to me. Uh, memories when I... But I was as you are, young and full of the fire of young blood. Listen to me. I've got to stop their panic. Doctor, finish what you're saying. Well, I'm going away. What? What are you talking about? To Mombasa. To Ireland. I want to live long enough to see Ireland again. But, but if you go, they'll panic. With you gone, then... I'm not panicking. I, I told you, I... I haven't the time left you have. Get someone else to help you. Damn the railroad. Damn Africa. Product value. Sears Laboratories work to maximize that value for you. Its manufacturing consultants work with products and their manufacturers to cut production costs. One example is our power spray carpet cleaner. Its plastic parts require molds to form them. Molds are expensive, especially certain designs. So our manufacturing consultants recommended designs that cut mold costs. End result, a better value for you. Sears Laboratories. One reason Sears is where America shops for value. You know, it doesn't make any sense to come down here to the Caribbean and blow money on foods, plants, and animal products you can't take back home. Because they're prohibited? Right. Well, that's why I brought this free booklet along. It explains that if you bring in just one plant full of bugs or one sick animal, you can start an epidemic. It tells you what the law is. Really? Even one can hurt, so wait for travel's tips. Write Traveler's Tips, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington 20250. It's free. We return to Lion Hunt as night deepens in the jungle. So in the night, the old doctor crept away and sent back a district police official. And on another night, young Patterson and the police inspector hunted through the brush once more. Wait! Wait, Inspector! I've lost the trail. Well, I lost it ten miles back. I never dreamed that going would be like this. All right. All right. Rest a minute. Gladly. You should have sent for me sooner, Patterson. Why didn't you? I... I thought I could... Get them myself. How long has it been? A week. And a dozen men have died. Yes, indeed, young man, you should have sent for me sooner. Well, no matter. We'll get those devils today and that'll end it. Will we? What? What's that you say? Nothing. I, I mean, let's get on. It's getting late. Oh, of course, of course. Hmm. Spool's mighty cold. I'm not so sure that this is the way. If we could only... Look, man, look. 
Mars. I see. Stopped here to eat. No doubt of that. Who was this poor devil? Kaparim. Eh? My personal boy. Interpreter. Is that a fact? When did this... Tent uh... next to mine. Last night. Look there. That scratching trail. His fingers. The poor devil's fingers scratched the ground as the lion carried him into the brush. Patterson. Here. What are you doing? Bury him. He was only 16. He told me only yesterday morning he'd come to Africa to earn enough so that his family... I swear. I swear, you devils. I'll get you. <laughs> Well, it's one thing to take an oath, it's another to do. And the days crawled under the hot sun, and the nights went swiftly, and men died. Twenty, thirty, forty, and were dragged into the bush and eaten. But the murderers lived. No matter how Patterson tried, ambush, poison, the man-eating lions of Savo lived. No beasts ever were more hunted or were more clever in escaping the hunter or more terrible in their murderous fury. And the thousands of coolies waited in terror. No way to go back through the jungle. All they could do was wait for the lions to come for them. All right, men, stand clear. Release the rope. Well, Patterson, I must say, you built a good trap, yes, eh? Uh, indeed. I hope so, Inspector. But will those devils really come this way? <laughs> now I'm the one who questions. Oh, I need a drink. A dozen for duty or not. Bring up the goat, men. Inside the trap, you fools. Inside. Up with the gate. All right, now tie him securely. Mumbiotra Dino Kaku. Patterson, do you realize I've been out here in the jungle in a week? The natives dragged every night, and I haven't fired a single shot. All I think about is Mombasa and whiskey. All right, now take your places, all of you. The moment the trap drops... Shoot. Shoot and keep shooting. Another thing I never thought to see. These biders actually helping. All right, all of you. Up the trees in silence. Oizi kusana kokwa. Etorabi lakima naukili. Inspector. You get up to the platform, too. I'll follow. All right. Oh, yes, of course. Well, feed up. Is it enough? I mean, what if they leap it? Why not the head? Oh, I was so sure. Now I don't know anything. Perhaps you better get back to camp, Inspector. And be dragged out of me tent by my heels like that poor shrieking... No, thank you. I'll stay up here where at least... One week ago, I was telling you to keep your head... Now I keep hearing the screams. I keep hearing All the... All right, Inspector. Sorry. Patterson, listen. Perhaps I'd better get down from here. I don't feel as if I... As if I could start another night of waiting. Quiet, man. What? Shh. What? Listen. Something below. No. To the right. No, there's nothing. I see nothing. Got him. He's in the trap. Shoot. Shoot, man. Shoot. Gun, what did I do with my gun? We got him. We got him. Bullets. Hey, give me some more bullets. All right. Hapana. Hapana. Mahuit, the lantern. Light it. Hold it high. 
Oh, oh we got him all right, Patterson. At least one of them finished. My whip! Stop fumbling! Hold the lantern! Oh, no! What? What? what the is trap! That? The trap is empty. The bullets broke away the bars. He got out. No, no. We got one. I saw it. Blood trial. Come, get to see there's blood. What in the name of hell? The shrieking. The shrieking again. Come on. Inspector, no. Stop. Stop it, man. I've got to get to camp. I can't leave you. Inspector. What? What? Shaitan. Simba. There in the hospital. Killing the sick. Another dozen dead. Two bodies dragged through the thorn fence and gone. And the next morning, the inspector stumbled back along the rusting iron rails away from the lions of Savo. And behind him, running in panic, went another 500 coolies, willing to face the dangers of the long, terrible way back to Mombasa rather than the greater terror of the lions. And in the British House of Lords, a statement was made. Three weeks delay, my lord. Three weeks in idleness, while our investment world asks why. It's hard to believe, my lord, that in this age, in these enlightened times, our nation's great colonial endeavor must wait upon the will of beasts of prey. They're called man-eaters, no less. Dad, my skin is all itchy. You have a rash. Uh, dear, do we have anything for Amy's rash? Uh-huh, Cordaid. Cordaid? Cordaid, the new hydrocortisone cream. What I used for my eczema. And what I used for my dermatitis. Hmm, Cordaid. Cordaid also gives temporary relief for poison ivy, insect bites, and other itches and rashes. And I can use it, too? Yes, even for you, Amy. For skin irritation, itches, and rashes, Cordaid's the one. A new breakthrough, Cordaid with hydrocortisone. Ask your pharmacist or doctor about Cordaid. Read and follow label directions. One nation under God, indivisible. It means to God, because he's higher than us. He lives up in the sky, and we live down in earth. That's why it's one nation under God. With liberty and justice for all. Yeah, I know what that means. Um, when you... Um, when you... I forget. From the Freedom's Foundation at Valley Forge. We return to our story of Lion Hunt as the age-old duel of man versus animal continues. Aye, and every night more men died. High walls of thorn and bush, fire barricades, nothing helped. Did Patterson hunt here yet? The lion struck there. Did the natives dig caves? Well, the lions dug them out. And did they hide in the thorn trees? The lion dragged them down. And every night, the shrieks arose. And another, and another of the poor coolies tore at the ground while the great cat dragged them away. And Patterson was alone now. No one to help him. Grew old in a night. Until the final night. Sab, do not go out there this night. I beg you. What? What did you say? Tomorrow, we will all go. All who are still here. You leading us back to Mombasa? We will leave this jungle to the devils and go? Hmm? Tomorrow, Sab? Tomorrow. I don't know tomorrow. My gun. Hand it to me. Oh, Sab, Allah, the understanding, the all-powerful watch over you tonight. There is no moon. And shaitan come when the moon is in. Trap. 
tree. Seems higher every night. Ah. Uh. Uh. Moon? No. <laughs> Shaitan comes when there is no moon. Shaitan. Devil. Are you devils, Simba? Are you both full of, as they say, the evil of all the men you have eaten? Uh, sleep. If I could sleep one night. No, no. Wake. Stay awake. Stay awake for the two of you. Are you two? Or are you all the lions of all Africa come here to kill all of us? Leave the jungle full of lions dancing on our bones. Oh, tired. 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 Jungle so quiet. Waiting. Waiting. Ah. Yes. I hear you. Hear you. Waiting for you. But you won't come for me, will you? Every night. Same thing. Hear you. But you don't come for me. Devils. What? Moon. Where did you... The moon. See you. Devil, I see you. There, at the edge. Coming for me. Yes. Closer. Closer. Oh, moon. Stay out. Just another second. Another second. Now. Miss Fire. Miss Fire. I can't. Devil. Gun. I will fire. Got you. Devil. Got you. Climb down. Go see. No. Moon's gone. Dark. So dark. You're dead. One of you must be dead. Who? The other one. Stalking me. I hear you. I hear you, devil. If the moon... It's so dark. Oh, God, let the moon... Just a little... I hear you. You're not afraid, are you? You know I can't see. Well, if only the moon... It will. It will. Moon, I see you, devil. By the dead one. Devil turning to me. Coming to me. Slow. All right. Now I'll end you too. Jammed. Rifle jammed. Devil. Are you the devil? Slow. Slow. No hurry, I... You know. Why have you stopped? What are you waiting for? The moon to go? Come for me in the light. Come. 
come for me, devil. Move. Gun fired. Hits you. Hits you. No. Getting up. No more bullets. Fallen. Fallen again. Dead. You're dead. You're... No. Up again. Coming again. Devil. Devil. No. Fallen. The last time. <laughs> you won't get up again, will you? You won't get up again. And so they died. The man eaters of Tsavo. After killing, some say, over a hundred human beings, two lions, you stopped for a little while. The building of the first railroad to bring our Western civilization into their jungle world. Huh? Perhaps the lions knew. Eh? No matter. Scavengers, Mr. Obler? No, I don't think so. In a moment, the exciting conclusion of Lion Hunt. There'll be blue. Hello, this is Robert Merrill. Ever hear of the silent killer? The killer is high blood pressure. It's silent because it has no symptoms. It's a killer because it can cause stroke, heart attack, heart failure, or kidney failure. Nobody knows the cause, and there is no cure. High blood pressure can strike any of us, men and women, young and old, blacks and whites. The best way to block out the silent killer is to have your blood pressure checked regularly. If it's high, your doctor can give you medicine to control it. You may have to lose weight. Controlling high blood pressure is a team effort. For more information, contact the American Heart Association. They're fighting for your life. This is Arch Obler again. I promised you a lion hunt. I apologize. Because the real hunt happened many years ago, and only bones are left today. The skeletons of the man-eaters, they're in a museum of all places in Chicago. And the bones of the hunters, Engineer Patterson, the inspector, the hundreds of workmen who completed the railroad, all are moldering dust in the endless chain of life and death that links us all on this small, spinning globe of home Earth. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of fine names to make Sears names stand for quality. Names you've always counted on, like Kenmore, Craftsman, Easy Living, and Die Hard. Names that kids and moms cheer, like Winnie the Pooh and Tough Skins. Names that are a part of your life today, like Permapress, Klingalon, and Winter 2. And, of course, they're Sears Best products in everything from T-shirts to tractors. What's in a name? Well, it takes a lot of truly dependable names to make our name. Sears Roebuck & Company. Oh, well, nobody's perfect. Sure, nobody's perfect. But we all try to be safe on the job. Well, most do. And there's one group of people who try even harder than the rest. They're handicapped workers. They have an 8% better safety record than the rest of us. Something to keep in mind when filling that next job, suggests the President's Committee on Employment of the Handicapped. They can tell.
The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Lion Hunt, was written, produced, and directed by Arch Obler. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Elliot Lewis and Ben Wright. Featured in the cast were Richard Peel, Hal Perry, and Jack Crucian. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Cicely Tyson. Join us tomorrow when I'll have another story that illustrates one of love's many faces.